but the price was heavy, altogether, 118 tanks were lost this day, compared with the Germans' loss of three, even so, the British tank strength was still ten times as large as Rommel's. But the miscarriage of the initial attack had such a damping effect that little further effort was made to resume the attack and use the potentially overwhelming weight of the forces on the British side. After four days' interval, for reorganization and regrouping, one further attempt was made to break through Rommel's front, by a thrust in the north. It opened well with the Australians' capture of the Maitairaya Ridge by moonlight, and the 50th Division to the south of the Malsa made a good start. But the commander of the 1st Armoured Division, which was to follow up and pass through, was not satisfied that a sufficiently wide gap had been cleared in the minefield. His delay spoiled the prospects of the attack as a whole. It was mid-morning before the leading tanks started to move through the minefield, and they were then pinned down by German tanks which had been rushed north. The infantry on the far side of the minefield were cut off, and then cut up by a counter-attack. Meanwhile, the Australians had also been driven off the ridge, and a part of them similarly trapped. Ochinlek now reluctantly decided to suspend the attack. Many of the troops were showing signs of exhaustion after the prolonged struggle, and an increasing tendency to surrender if isolated. It was also clear that the defense had the advantage on such a restricted front, and that the advantage would grow with the reinforcements that were now at last reaching Rommel. By the start of August his tank strength increased to more than five times what it had been on July 22. While the battle ended in disappointment for the British, their situation was far better than when it opened. The final sentence of Rommel's account of the battle utters the final verdict, although the British losses in this alum fighting had been higher than ours, yet the price to Orchinlek had not been excessive, for the one thing that had mattered to him was to halt our advance, and that, unfortunately, he had done. Although the 8th Army had suffered over 13,000 casualties during the July battle at Alum, it had taken over 7,000 prisoners, including more than a thousand Germans. The price would have been lower, and the gains much greater, if the execution of the plans had been more vigorous and efficient. But, even as it was, the difference in the total loss on either side was not large, and Rommel was much less able to afford the loss. His frustration was almost certainly bound to prove fatal in view of the flood of British reinforcements that was now pouring into Egypt. His own account makes it clear how perilously close to defeat he came by mid-July. Even clearer is his own confession at the time, in a letter to his wife on the 18th, yesterday was a particularly hard and critical day. We pulled through again. But it can't go on like it for long, otherwise the front will crack. Militarily, this is the most difficult period I've ever been through. There's help in sight, of course, but whether we will live to see it is a question. Four days later, with reserves still fewer, his troops had to meet an even weightier blow, and were fortunate in surviving it. Rommel's subsequent account of the battle pays a high tribute to the British commander-in-chief, General Orchinlek who had taken over command himself at El Alam was handling his forces with very considerable skill. He seemed to view the situation with decided coolness, for he was not allowing himself to be rushed into accepting a second-class solution by any moves we made. This was to be particularly evident in what followed. Ibid, p. 248. But each of the successive first-class solutions which Or Chinlek devised, with the aid of his fertile-minded chief staff officer, Dorman Smith, went wrong in the third class compartments of the executant's train. Its corridors also became blocked. One important cause of blockage was the presence of such a mixture of contingents from the different countries of the British Commonwealth, under such conditions of strain, and the way that the commanders were distracted by anxious questions and cautions from their respective governments. While such anxiety was very natural after the unhappy experience of recent months, it multiplied the usual friction of war. It was also natural that the prevailing disappointment at the end of the battle in July should have renewed the impression of bad leadership left by the disaster in June, 
and developed an impulsive feeling that drastic changes were needed in the higher command. As usual, criticism was focused on the top of the ladder, rather than where the slips and bungles had occurred, lower down. There was better justification in the need to restore the confidence of the troops, which had been shaken afresh by the failure of Orchin Lek's counter-offensive. In such conditions, a change of command is the easiest way to provide a tonic and may be essential as a stimulant, however unjust to the commander who is replaced. Churchill decided to fly out to Egypt, to size up the situation, and arrived in Cairo on August 4, the fateful anniversary of Britain's entry into World War I. Although Ochinlek had stemmed the adverse tide, as Churchill recognized and said, it was not so apparent that the tide had actually turned, as can be seen in retrospect. Rommel still stood barely 60 miles from Alexandria and the Nile Delta, disturbingly close. Churchill was already thinking of making a change in the command, and his inclination turned into decision after finding that Orchinlek strongly resisted his pressure for an early renewal of the offensive and insisted that it must be deferred until September in order to give the new reinforcements time to become acclimatized and have some training in desert conditions. His decision was also influenced and fortified by discussion with Field Marshal Smuts, the South African Prime Minister, who had flown to Egypt at his request. Churchill's first idea was to offer the command to the very able Chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Sir Alan Brooke. But Brooke, from motives of delicacy as well as of policy, did not wish to leave the war office and take Orchin Lek's place. So after further discussion, Churchill telegraphed to the other members of the war cabinet in London that he proposed to appoint Alexander as commander-in-chief, and to give the command of the Eighth Army to Gott, a surprising choice in the light of this gallant soldier's fumbling performance as a corps commander in the recent battles but Gott was killed in an air crash next day, on his way to Cairo. Montgomery was then, fortunately, brought out from England to fill the vacancy. Two fresh corps commanders were also flown out, Lieutenant General Sir Oliver Lees to take over the 30th Corps and Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks to fill the vacancy in the 13th. But an ironical result of these changes was that the resumption of the British offensive was put off to a much later date than Orchinlek had proposed. For the impatient Prime Minister had to give way to Montgomery's firm determination to wait until preparations and training were completed. This entailed leaving the initiative to Rommel, and allowing him another chance to bid for victory in what was to be called the Battle of Alam Haifa, but in effect only gave him enough rope to hang himself. During August only two fresh formations arrived to reinforce Rommel, a German parachute brigade and an Italian parachute division. Both came dismounted, for employment as infantry. But the losses in the divisions already engaged were made up to a considerable extent by drafts and fresh supplies of equipment, although much more arrived for the Italian divisions than for the German. By the eve of the attack, which Rommel was planning to deliver at the end of August, he had about 200 gun arm tanks in the two panzer divisions, and 240 in the two Italian armoured divisions. While the Italian tanks were still of the old model, now more obsolete than ever, the German panzer is included 74 with the long 50mm gun, and 27 of the panzer ribs mounted the new long 75mm gun. That was an important qualitative gain. But the British tank strength at the front had been brought up to a total of over 700, of which some 160 were grants. In the event, only some 500 were used in the armoured battle, which this time was brief. The fortified front was still held by the same four infantry divisions as in July, with strength rebuilt, and the 7th, light, armoured division remained while the 1st Armoured Division went back to refit and was replaced by the 10th, commanded by Major General A. H. Gatehouse, which comprised two armoured brigades, the 22nd and the newly arrived 8th, while the re-equipped 23rd was also put under its command after the battle started. A newly arrived infantry division was also brought to the front to hold the rearward position on the Alam Hafer Ridge. 
no radical change was made in the defense that had been designed by Dorman Smith and approved by Orchinlek while he was still in command. After the battle was won, it was widely reported that the plan was completely recast following the change of command. So it should be emphasized that Alexander, in his dispatch, stated the facts with an honesty shattering to such stories and claims. He said that when he took over the command from Orchinlek, the plan was to hold as strongly as possible the area between the sea and Rueyazat ridge and to threaten from the flank any enemy advance south of the ridge from a strongly defended prepared position on the Alam El Harfa ridge. General Montgomery, now in command of 8th Army, accepted this plan in principle, to which I agreed, and hoped that if the enemy should give us enough time he would be able to improve our positions by strengthening the left or southern flank. The Alam Haifa position was reinforced before Ommel attacked, but its defense was not seriously tested, for the issue of the battle was decided by the well-judged positioning of the armor, and its very effective defensive action. The northern and central sectors of the front were so strongly fortified that the southern stretch of 15 miles, between the New Zealanders' box on the Alam Nail Ridge and the Katara Depression, was the only part of the front where a quick penetration could possibly succeed. Thus in trying to achieve a breakthrough Rommel was bound to take that line of advance. That was obvious, and was what the defense plan evolved under Orchinlek had been designed to produce. Surprise in aim point was thus impossible, so Rommel had to depend on achieving surprise in time and speed. He hoped that if he broke through the southern sector quickly, and got astride the 8th Army's communications, it would be thrown off balance and its defense disjointed. His plan was to capture the mind belt by a night attack, after which the Africa Corps with part of the Italian Mobile Corps would drive on eastward for about 30 miles before daylight, and then wheel northeast to the coast towards the 8th Army's supply area. This threat, he hoped, would lead the British armor into a chase, giving him the chance to trap and destroy it. Meanwhile the 90th Light Division and the rest of the Italian Mobile Corps were to form a protective corridor strong enough to resist counter-attacks from the north until he had won the armoured battle, in the British rear. In his own account, he says that he placed particular reliance on the slow reaction of the British command, for experience had shown us that it always took them some time to reach decisions and put them into effect. But when the attack was launched, on the night of August 30th, it was found that the mind belt was much deeper than expected. At daylight, Rommel's spearheads were only eight miles beyond it, and the bulk of the Africa Corps was not able to start on its eastward drive until nearly 10 a.m. By that time its mass of vehicles was being heavily bombed by the British Air Force. The Corps commander, General Walter Nehring, was wounded at an early stage, and during the rest of the battle, the Africa Corps was commanded by its Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Fritz Bailn. When it was clear that any surprise effect had vanished, and that the rate of advance was badly behind time, Rommel thought of breaking off the attack. But after discussion with Bailn, and following his own natural inclination, he decided to continue it, although with modified aims and more limited objectives. As it was obvious that the British armor had been allowed time to take up its battle positions, and could thus threaten the flank of a deeply extended drive, he felt bound to make an earlier turn north than we had intended. He therefore ordered the Africa Corps to make an immediate wheel, so that it headed for point 132, the dominant feature of the Alam Hafer Ridge. This change of direction brought it towards the area where the 22nd Armoured Brigade was posted, and also towards an area of soft sand, cramping to maneuver. The line of thrust originally planned had been well clear of this sticky area. The 8th Armoured Brigade's battle positions were some 10 miles distant, to the southeast, from the 22nd, more directly placed to check a bypassing move, instead of trusting to the indirect check and threat of a flanking position. In accepting the risk of posting the brigades so far apart, Montgomery could rely on the fact that each of them was almost as strong in armor as the whole Africa Corps, and should therefore be capable of holding out until the other brigade arrived to support it. The 8th, however, 
did not reach its assigned position until 4.30 am it was fortunate that the enemy had been so much delayed, for under Rommel's original plan the Africa Corps had been directed on that same area and intended to arrive there before dawn. A collision in the dark, or assault in the morning, before the 8th was firmly in position, might have produced an awkward situation, especially for troops who were in action for the first time. As a result of Rommel having to wheel north earlier than he had intended, the attack fell directly on the 22nd Armoured Brigade, and on that alone, but not until late in the day. Four continued air attacks, and the delayed arrival of fuel and ammunition convoys, had such a retarding effect on the advance that the Africa Corps did not begin even the shortened northward wheel until the afternoon. On approaching Alam Hafer, and the battle positions of the 22nd Armoured Brigade, the panzer columns came under a storm of fire from the well-sighted tanks and then from the supporting artillery of this all-arms brigade group, which was ably handled by its new and young commander, Pip Roberts. Repeated advances and attempted local flank moves were checked, until nightfall closed down the fight, bringing well-earned respite to the defenders and spreading depression among the attackers. The abortiveness of the attack was due, however, not only to these actual repulses. For fuel was so short in the Africa Corps that in mid-afternoon Rommel had cancelled his orders for an all-out effort to capture point 132. Even when morning came on September 1st, there was still such a shortage of fuel that Rommel was forced to give up the idea of carrying out any large operation that day. The most that he could attempt was a local and limited attack with one division, the 15th Panzer to seize the Alam Hafer Ridge. The Africa Corps was now in a very awkward predicament, and it suffered growing loss as the battering it had endured during the night from British bombers and the artillery of Horrocks's 13th Corps continued throughout the day. The diminished attacks of the German armor were successively checked, by a reinforced defense, for early that same morning Montgomery, now sure that the enemy was not driving on east towards his rear had ordered the two other armoured brigades to concentrate alongside Roberts's. By the afternoon Montgomery ordered planning to begin for a counterstroke which would give us the initiative. The idea was, by a wheeling attack southward from the New Zealanders' position, to cork the neck of the bottle into which the Germans had pushed. He also made arrangements to bring up the headquarters of the 10th Corps to command a pursuit force that was to be prepared to push through to Daba with all reserves available. The Panzer army now had only one day's fuel a year left in hand, a quantity sufficient only for about 60 miles movement for its units. So, after a second night of almost continuous bombing, Rommel had decided to break off the offensive, and make a gradual withdrawal. During the day, the Germans facing Alam Hafer were seen to be thinning out and starting to move westward. But requests for permission to follow them up were refused, for it was Montgomery's policy to avoid the risk of his armor being lured into Rommel's traps, as had happened so often before. At the same time Montgomery gave orders that the southward attack by New Zealanders, reinforced by other troops, was to start on the next night but one, September 3-4. But on September 3 Rommel's forces began a general withdrawal, and were only followed up by patrols. The bottling attack was launched that night, against the enemy's rear flank, which was being guarded by the 90th Light and Trees divisions. The attack became badly mixed up, suffering heavy loss, and was broken off. On the next two days, September 4 and 5, the Africa Corps continued its gradual withdrawal, and no further effort was made to cut it off, while it was only followed up in a very cautious way, by small advanced parties. On the 6th the Germans halted on a line of high ground six miles east of their original front, and were obviously intending to make a strong stand there. Next day, Montgomery decided, with Alexander's approval, to break off the battle so Rommel was left in possession of this limited gain of ground in the south. It was small consolation for his losses, and the decisive frustration of his original aims. For the troops of the 8th Army, the fact of seeing the enemy in retreat, even though only a few short steps back, 
far outweighed the disappointment of failing to cut him off. It was a clear sign that the tide had turned. Montgomery had already created a new spirit of confidence in the troops, and their confidence in him was confirmed. The question remains, however, whether a great opportunity was missed of destroying the enemy's capacity for further resistance while the Africa Corps was bottled. That would have saved all the later trouble and heavy cost of assaulting him in his prepared positions. But so far as it went the Battle of Alamhafer was a great success for the British. When it ended, Rommel had definitely lost the initiative, and, in view of the swelling stream of reinforcements to the British, the next battle was bound to be for Rommel a battle without hope, as he himself aptly called it. In the clearer light of post-war knowledge of the respective forces and resources, it can be seen that Rommel's eventual defeat became probable from the moment his dash into Egypt was originally checked, in the July Battle of First Alam, and this accordingly may be considered the effective turning point. Nevertheless, he still looked a great menace when he launched his renewed and reinforced attack at the end of August, and as the strength of the two sides was nearer to an even balance than it was either before or later, he still had a possibility of victory and might have achieved it if his opponents had faltered or fumbled as they had done on several previous occasions when their advantage had seemed more sure. But in the event the possibility vanished beyond possibility of recovery. The crucial significance of Alam Haifa is symbolized in the fact that although it was fought out in the same area as the other battles of Alam, it has been given a separate and distinctive name. Tactically, too, this battle has a special interest. For it was not only won by the defending side, but decided by pure defense, without any counter-offensive, or even any serious attempt to develop a counter-offensive. It thus provides a contrast to most of the turning point battles of the Second World War, and earlier wars. While Montgomery's decision to abstain from following up his defensive success in an offensive way forfeited the chance of trapping and destroying Rommel's forces momentarily a very good chance, it did not impair the underlying decisiveness of the battle as a turning point in the campaign. From that time onwards, the British troops had an assurance of ultimate success which heightened their morale, while the opposing forces labored under a sense of hopelessness, feeling that whatever their efforts and sacrifices they could achieve no more than a temporary postponement of the end. There is also much to be learned from its tactical technique. The positioning of the British forces, and the choice of ground, had a great influence upon the issue. So did the flexibility of the dispositions. Most important of all was the well-gauged combination of air power with the ground forces plan. Its effectiveness was facilitated by the defensive pattern of the battle, with the ground forces holding the ring while the air forces constantly bombed the arena, now a trap, into which Rommel's troops had pushed. In the pattern of this battle, the air forces could operate the more freely and effectively because of being able to count on all troops within the ring as being enemy, and thus targets, in contrast to the way that air action is handicapped in a more fluid kind of battle. Seven weeks passed before the British launched their offensive. An impatient Prime Minister chafed at the delay, but Montgomery was determined to wait until his preparations were complete and he could be reasonably sure of success and Alexander supported him. So Churchill, whose political position was at this time very shaky after the series of British disasters since the start of the year, had to bow to their arguments for putting off the attack until late in October. The exact date of D-Day was determined by the phases of the moon, for the offensive was planned to start with a night assault, to hamper the enemy's defensive fire while adequate moonlight was needed for the process of clearing gaps in his minefields. So the delivery of the assault was fixed for the night of October 23rd, full moon being on the 24th. One key factor in Churchill's desire for an earlier attack was that the great project of a combined American and British landing in French North Africa, named Operation Torch, was now planned for launching early in November. A decisive victory over Rommel at Alam would encourage the French to welcome the torchbearers of liberation from Axis domination, and would also help to make General Franco more disinclined to welcome the entry of German forces into Spain and Spanish Morocco, a counter move that could upset and endanger the Allied landings. 
but Alexander considered that if his attack, Operation Lightfoot, was launched a fortnight in advance of Torch, that interval would be long enough to destroy the greater part of the Axis army facing us, but on the other hand it would be too short for the enemy to start reinforcing Africa on any significant scale. In any case, he felt, it was essential to make sure of success at his end of North Africa if there was a good result from the new landings at the other end. The decisive factor was that I was certain that to attack before I was ready would be to risk failure if not to court disaster. These arguments prevailed, and although the date he now proposed was nearly a month later than Churchill had earlier suggested to Auchinleck, the postponement to October 23rd was accepted by him. By that time, the British superiority in strength, both in numbers and quality, was greater than ever before. On the customary reckoning by divisions, the two sides had the appearance of being evenly matched, as each had twelve divisions, of which four were of armoured type. But in actual number of troops the balance was very different, the Eighth Army's fighting strength being 230,000, while Rommel had less than 80,000, of which only 27,000 were German. Moreover the Eighth Army had seven armoured brigades, and a total of 23 armoured regiments, compared with Rommel's total of four German and seven Italian tank battalions. More striking still is the comparison in actual tank strength. When the battle opened the 8th Army had a total of 1,440 gun-armed tanks, of which 1,229 were ready for action while in a prolonged battle it could draw on some of the further thousand that were now in the base depots and workshops in Egypt. Rommel had only 260 German tanks, of which 20 were under repair, and 30 were light panzeries, and 280 Italian tanks, all of obsolete types. Only the 210 gun armed German medium tanks could be counted upon in the armoured battle, so that, in terms of reality, the British started with a 6 to 1 superiority in numbers fit for action, backed by a much greater capacity to make good their losses. In fighting power, for tank versus tank action, the British advantage was even greater, since the Grand tanks were now reinforced by the still newer, and superior, Sherman tanks that were arriving from America in large numbers. By the start of the battle the 8th Army had more than 500 Shermans and Grants, with more on the way, while Rommel had only 30, four more than at Alamhafer, of the new Panzer Ives, with the high-velocity 75mm gun, that could match these new American tanks. Moreover, Rommel had lost his earlier advantage in anti-tank guns. His strength in anti-tank 88s had been brought up to 86 and although these had been supplemented by the arrival of 68 captured Russian 76s, his standard German 50mm anti-tank guns could not penetrate the armor of the Shermans and Grants, or the Valentines, except at close range. That was all the worse handicaps since the new American tanks were provided with high explosive shells that enabled them to knock out opposing anti-tank guns at long ranges. In the air, the British also enjoyed a greater superiority than ever before. Sir Arthur Tedder, the air commander-in-chief in the Middle East, now had 96 operational squadrons at his disposal, including 13 American, 13 South African and 1 Rhodesian five Australian, two Greek, one French and one Yugoslav. They amounted to more than 1,500 first-line aircraft. Of this total, 1,200 serviceable aircraft based in Egypt and Palestine were ready to aid the Eighth Army's attack, whereas the Germans and Italians together had only some 350 serviceable in Africa to support the Panzer Army. This air superiority was of great value in harassing the Panzer Army's movements and the immediate supply of its divisions, as well as in protecting the Eighth Army's flow of supplies from similar interruption. But much more important for the issue of the battle was the indirect and strategic action of the Air Force, together with the British Navy's submarines, in strangling the Panzer Army's sea arteries of supply. During September, Nearly a third of the supplies shipped to it were sunk in crossing the Mediterranean, while many vessels were forced to turn back. In October, 
the interruption of supplies became still greater, and less than half of what was sent arrived in Africa. Artillery ammunition became so short that little was available for countering the British bombardment. The heaviest loss of all was the sinking of oil tankers, and none reached Africa during the weeks immediately preceding the British offensive, so that the Panzer Army was left with only three issues of fuel in hand when the battle opened, instead of the thirty issues which were considered the minimum reserve required. That severe shortage cramped countermaneuver in every way. It compelled piecemeal distribution of the mobile forces, prevented their quick concentration at the points of attack, and increasingly immobilized them as the struggle continued. The loss of food supplies was also an important factor in the spread of sickness among the troops. It was multiplied by the bad sanitary condition of the trenches, particularly those held by the Italians. Even in the July battle, the British had often been driven by the filth and smell to evacuate Italian trenches which they captured, and had thereby been caught in the open on several occasions by German armor before they could dig fresh trenches. But the disregard of sanitation eventually became a boomerang, spreading dysentery and infectious jaundice not only among the Italian troops but also among their German allies, and the victims included some of the key officers of the Panzer Army. The most important sick casualty of all was Rommel himself. He had been laid up in August, before the Alam Haifa attack. He recovered sufficiently to exercise command during that battle but medical pressure subsequently prevailed, and in September he went back to Europe for treatment and rest. He was temporarily replaced by General Stumm, while the vacant command of the Africa Corps was filled by General von Terma, both of these commanders coming from the Russian front. Rommel's absence, and their inexperience of desert conditions, was an additional handicap in the planning and preparation of the measures to meet the impending British offensive. On the day after this opened, Stum drove up to the front, ran into a heavy burst of fire, fell off his car, and died from a heart attack. That evening, Rommel's convalescence in Austria was cut short by a telephone call from Hitler to ask if he could return to Africa. He flew back the next day, October 25, arriving near Alamn in the evening, to take charge of a defense which had by then been deeply dented and had lost nearly half its effective tanks that day in fruitless counter-attacks. Originally, Montgomery's plan had been to deliver simultaneous right and left hand punches, by Oliver Lees's 30th Corps in the north and Brian Horrocks's 13th Corps in the south, and then push through the mass of his armor concentrated under Herbert Lumsden in the 10th Corps, to get to stride the enemy's supply routes. But early in October he came to the conclusion that it was too ambitious, because of shortcomings in the standard of training in the army, and changed to a more limited plan. In this new plan, Operation Lightfoot, the thrust was concentrated in the north, near the coast, in the four-mile stretch between the Tel Elisa and Maitairaya ridges, while the 13th Corps was to make a secondary attack in the south, to distract the enemy, but not to press it unless the defense crumbled. This cautiously limited plan led to a protracted and costly struggle, which might have been avoided by the bolder original plan, taking account of the 8th Army's immense superiority in strength. The battle became a process of attrition, of hard slogging rather than of maneuver, and for a time the effort appeared to hover on the brink of failure. But the disparity of strength between the two sides was so large that even a very disparate ratio of attrition was bound to work in favor of Montgomery's purpose, pressed with the unflinching determination that was characteristic of him in all he undertook. Within the chosen limits of his planning, he also showed consummate ability in varying the direction of his thrusts and developing a tactical leverage to work the opponent off balance. After 15 minutes hurricane bombardment by more than a thousand guns, the infantry assault was launched at 10 o'clock on the night of Friday, October 23rd. It had a successful start, helped by the enemy's shortage of shells, which led Stum to stop his artillery from bombarding the British assembly positions. But the depth and density of the minefields proved a greater obstacle, and took longer to clear, than had been reckoned so that when daylight came the British armor was still in the lanes or held up just beyond them. 
It was only on the second morning, after further night attacks by the infantry, that four brigades of armor succeeded in deploying on the far side, six miles behind the original front, and they had suffered much loss in the process of pushing through such constricted passages. Meanwhile, the subsidiary attack of the 13th Corps in the south had met similar trouble, and was abandoned on the second day, the 25th. But the wedge that had been driven into the defenses in the north looked so menacing that the defending commanders threw in their tanks piecemeal during that day in efforts to prevent the expansion of the wedge. This action fulfilled Montgomery's calculation and enabled his armor, now established in good positions, to inflict heavy losses on these spasmodic counter-attacks. By evening the 15th Panzer Division had only a quarter of its tank strength left fit for action, the 21st Panzer Division was still in the southern sector. Next day, October 26, the British resumed the attack, but their attempt to push forward was checked, and their armor paid a heavy price for the abortive effort. The chance of developing the break into a breakthrough had faded, and the massive British armored wedge was embedded in a strong ring of German anti tank guns. Lumsden and his divisional commanders had already raised objections on the second night to the way that the armor was being used, to ram a passage through such narrow lanes, and the feeling that it was being misused became increasingly widespread among officers and men as losses multiplied in the still narrow fronted pushes. While maintaining an air of supreme confidence, Montgomery shrewdly realized that his initial thrust had failed, that the breach was blocked, that he must devise a fresh plan, and meanwhile give his main striking forces a rest. His readiness to vary his aim according to circumstances, on this and later occasions, was a better tonic to the troops and a greater tribute to his generalship than his habit of talking in retrospect as if everything had gone according to plan. Ironically, that habit has tended to obscure and diminish the credit due to him for his adaptability and versatility. The new plan was christened Operation Supercharge, a good name to impress the executants that it was decisively different and carried a better promise of success. The 7th Armored Division was brought north as a reinforcement. But Rommel also took the opportunity of regrouping his forces during the lull, and the 21st Panzer Division was already on its way north followed by the Ariat. The secondary attack in the south by the British 13th Corps had not fulfilled its purpose of distracting the enemy's attention and making him keep part of his armor in the south. The switch northward, and the consequent closer concentration of both armies there, was tactically an advantage to Rommel. It left the British more dependent on sheer slogging power, and attrition. Fortunately for them, their numerical advantage was so large that attrition, even at a very adverse ratio, was bound to decide the issue in their favor if the killing process was pursued with unflinching determination. Montgomery's new offensive opened on the night of October 28, with a northward thrust towards the coast, from the big wedge that had been driven into the enemy's front. Montgomery's intention was to pinch off the enemy's coastal pocket apostrophe, and then start an exploiting drive westward along the coast road, towards Dabba and Fuca. But the new thrust became hung up in the minefield, and its prospects waned with Rommel's quick counter move in switching the 90th Light Division to this flank. Even so, Rommel counted himself lucky when this attack came to a halt, for by now his resources were running low. The Afrika Corps had only 90 tanks left, while the 8th Army still had more than 800 serviceable tanks on the spot so that although it had paid a price of nearly four British tanks for one German, its ratio of superiority had risen, and was now eleven to one. Writing to his wife on the 29th, Rommel said, I haven't much hope left. At night I lie with my eyes wide open, unable to sleep, for the load that is on my shoulders. In the day I'm dead tired. What will happen if things go wrong here? That is the thought that torments me day and night. I can see no way out if that happens. It is very evident from this letter that the strain was wearing down not only the troops but also their commander, who was still a sick man. Early that morning he had thought of ordering a withdrawal to the Fuca position, 60 miles to the westward, 
but had been reluctant to take such a step back because it meant sacrificing a large part of his immobile infantry, and therefore deferred such a fateful decision in the hope that one more check would lead Montgomery to break off his offensive. In the sequel, the check to the coastward attack turned out to the British advantage. For if Rommel had slipped away at this moment, all the British planning would have been thrown out of gear. As soon as Montgomery saw that his coastward thrust had miscarried, he decided to revert to his original line of thrust, hoping to profit by the northward shift of the enemy's scanty reserves. It was a well-judged decision, and another example of his own flexibility. But his forces were not as flexible, and the time consumed in regrouping prevented the fresh thrust being launched until November 2nd. This further pause, following the repeated checks, deepened the depression and anxiety in London. Churchill was feeling bitter disappointment about the slow progress of the offensive, and was with difficulty restrained from sending off an acid telegram to Alexander. The brunt fell on the CIGS, General Sir Alan Brooke, who strove to reassure the cabinet, but inwardly had growing doubts, and anxiously wondered whether I was wrong and Monty was beat. Even Montgomery himself was no longer so confident as he outwardly appeared, and privately confessed his anxiety. The start of the new attack, in the early hours of November 2, was again damping, and increased the feeling that the offensive might have to be broken off. For, once again, the minefields caused more delay, and the resistance proved tougher, than expected. When daylight came, the leading armoured brigade found itself on the muzzles of the powerful screen of anti-tank guns on the Raman track, instead of beyond it as had been planned. In that cramped position it was counter-attacked by what remained of Rommel's armour, and in the day's fighting lost three quarters of its tank strength. The remainder gallantly held on, and thus enabled the follow-up brigades to push through the gap, but they in turn were held up just beyond the Raman track. When nightfall put an end to the fight, the British had lost nearly 200 more tanks in combat and mechanical casualties. Gloomy as the situation looked after this further check, particularly when viewed from afar, the cloud was about to lift. For by the end of the day Rommel was at the end of his resources. It is amazing that the defence had held out so long. The hard core of it was the two panzer divisions of the Africa Corps. But even at the start of the battle, their fighting strength had been only 9,000, and had withered in the fire to little more than 2,000. Worse still, the Africa Corps was left with barely 30 tanks fit for action, whereas the British still had more than 600, so that their superiority over the Germans was now 20 to 1. As for the thin skinned Italian tanks, they had been pulverized by the British fire and many of the survivors had vanished from the battlefield in westward flight. That night Rommel took the decision to fall back to the Fuca position in a two-step withdrawal. This was well in progress when, soon after midday on the 3rd, an overriding order came from Hitler, insisting that the Alam position must be held at all costs. So Rommel, who had not previously suffered from Hitler's interference, nor learned the necessity of disobedience, Stop the withdrawal and recall the columns that were already on the way back. The turnabout was fatal to the chance of making an effective stand farther back, while the attempt to resume a standard alum was futile. The westward withdrawal had been spotted and reported from the air early on the 3rd, and naturally stimulated Montgomery to continue and intensify his efforts. Although two attempts to get round the enemy's screen were checked during the day, a fresh infantry attack that night, by the 51st Highland and 4th Indian Divisions, made with a southwesterly slant, succeeded in piercing the joint between the Africa Corps and the Italians. Soon after dawn on the 4th, the three armoured divisions passed through the breach and deployed, with orders to swing northward and bar the enemy's line of retreat along the coast road. Their exploiting drive was reinforced by the motorised New Zealand Division and a 4th Armoured Brigade, under its command. There was now a magnificent opportunity of cutting off and destroying Rommel's entire army. The chance was all the greater because the commander of the Africa Corps, Terma, was captured in the confusion of the morning, 
and the order for retreat was not given until the afternoon, while Hitler's belated permission was not received until next day. But as soon as the retreat order was given by Rommel, the German troops moved very fast, packed into such motor transport as remained to them, while the British exploitation suffered from its old faults of caution, hesitation, slow motion, and narrow maneuver. After passing through the gap and deploying, the three armored divisions were directed northward to the coast road at Gazel, only ten miles behind the broken front. That narrow wheel gave the remnant of the Africa Corps a chance to block them, by a quick and short sidestep. After advancing a few miles they were checked by this thin screen, and kept in check until the afternoon, when the Panzer Army began to withdraw as ordered. Then when darkness came the British cautiously halted for the night. That was the more unfortunate because they were well beyond, and behind, the bulk of what remained of the Panzer Army. Next day, November 5, the cutting off moves were again too narrow and too slow. The 1st and 7th armored divisions were at first directed on Dabba, only 10 miles beyond Ghazl, and the leading troops did not arrive at Dabba until midday, to find that the retreating enemy had slipped past them. The 10th had been directed on Gal, 15 miles further west, and the caught the enemy's tail, capturing some 40 tanks, most of these being Italian tanks that had run out of fuel. No effort was made to chase the main retreating columns until the evening, and the British armor then halted for the night as usual, after a short advance of 11 miles, when six miles short of its new objective, the escarpment at Fuca. The New Zealand division and its attached armor had been told to go for Fuca when the breakthrough was achieved, but it was delayed in following the armored divisions through the gap, partly owing to bad traffic control, and then lost more time in mopping up Italians in its path. So it was less than halfway to Fuca when it halted at nightfall on the 4th. It arrived near its objective at midday on the 5th, but then halted in face of a suspected minefield, which was, in fact, a dummy that the British had laid to cover their own retreat to Alam. Darkness was approaching before the New Zealanders pushed through it. Meanwhile the 7th Armoured Division, after its too early wheel inwards at Dabba, had been sent back into the desert to drive for back, 15 miles beyond Fuca. But it was delayed in crossing the New Zealanders' tail, as well as by the suspected minefield, and then halted for the night. Next morning these three pursuing divisions closed in around Fuca and back, but the retreating enemy had already slipped away westward. All they caught were a few hundred stragglers and a few tanks that had ran out of fuel. The main hope now of catching Rommel's columns depended on the 1st Armoured Division, which, after missing them at Dabba, had been ordered to make a longer circuit through the desert and cut the coast road west of Mersamatru but its drive was twice halted by fuel shortage, the second time when only a few miles from the coast road. That was all the more exasperating to its commander, because he and others had urged that at least one of the armored divisions should be prepared for a long pursuit, to Solom, by replacing some of the ammunition in the transport with extra fuel. In the afternoon of November 6, rain started to fall in the coastal belt and became very heavy during the night. That put a break on all the pursuit moves, and ensured Rommel's getaway. After the event, it formed the main excuse for the failure to cut off his retreat. But, in analysis, it becomes clear that the best opportunities had already been forfeited before the rain intervened, by too narrow moves, by too much caution, by too little sense of the time factor, by unwillingness to push on in the dark and by concentrating too closely on the battle to keep in mind the essential requirements of its decisive exploitation. If the pursuit had driven deeper through the desert, to reach a more distant blocking point such as the steep escarpment at Solom, it would have avoided the risk of interception either by resistance or weather, for while rain is a likely risk in the coastal belt it is rare in the desert interior. During the night of the 7th Rommel withdrew from Ursa Matri to Sidi Barani and they made another brief stand while his transport columns were filtering through the frontier bottleneck by the passes up the escarpment at Solom and Half Fire, which were being heavily bombed by the British Air Force. 
For a time there was a huge traffic jam on the coast road, a queue 25 miles long, but with well-organized traffic control most of it got through on the following night, despite the British bombing. So on the 9th, although about a thousand vehicles still had to pass through the bottleneck, Rommel ordered his rearguards to withdraw to the frontier. Meanwhile Montgomery had organized a special pursuit force, consisting of the 7th Armoured and New Zealand Divisions, and grounded the other two armoured divisions as a safeguard against running out of fuel and giving Rommel a chance for one of his riposts, against a stranded force. This longer pursuit started on the 8th, but the New Zealanders did not reach the frontier until the 11th, and although the two armoured brigades of the 7th Armoured Division, advancing through the desert south of the coast road crossed it the afternoon before. They just missed catching the enemy's tail when it passed through Kapuzzo on the 11th. While Rommel had slipped out of Montgomery's clutches, successfully evading each successive attempt to cut off his retreat, he was too weak to re-establish a new defense line on the frontier, or farther back in Cyrenaica. His fighting strength at the moment was about 5,000 Germans and 2,500 Italians, with 11 German and 10 Italian tanks, 35 German anti-tank guns, 65 German field guns, and a few Italian guns. For although some 15,000 German fighting troops had got away, safely, two-thirds of them had lost all their fighting equipment and a still larger proportion of the Italians who had escaped had left theirs behind. The 8th Army, besides killing several thousand, had captured some 10,000 Germans and over 20,000 Italians, including administrative personnel, together with some 450 tanks and over 1,000 guns. That was a very big compensation for its own 13,500 casualties, as well as for the disappointment of seeing Rommel slip away to fight again another day. After a short pause to bring up supplies, the British advance was resumed. But it was a follow-up rather than a pursuit, and Rommel's past counter-strokes had left so deep an impression that the advance proceeded cautiously along the coastal circuit instead of driving across the desert cord of the Benghazi Arc. The leading armor did not reach Mursa Brega until November 26 more than two weeks after crossing the eastern frontier of Cyrenaica, and long after Rommel had regained the shelter of that bottleneck position. The only serious trouble and danger to his forces during the retreat through Cyrenaica had come from shortage of fuel. At Mersa Brega he was reinforced by a fresh Italian armoured division, the Centro, and elements of three Italian infantry divisions, although these, being unmotorized, were more of a complication than an asset. There was now a further fortnight's pause while the British brought up reinforcements and supplies for an assault on the Mercer Brega position. Montgomery again prepared a plan to annihilate the enemy in his defences, by pinning Rommel with a strong frontal assault, while sending another strong force on a wide outflanking manoeuvre to block his line of retreat. The frontal assault was to be launched on December 14, preceded by large-scale raids on the night of the 11th-12th to distract attention from the outflanking maneuver, which then started on its desert circuit. But Trommel slipped away during the night of the 12th, thus stultifying the British plan. He went back in a rapid bound to a position near Burat, 250 miles west of Mersa Brega, and doubled the distance beyond the 8th Army's new advanced base at Benghazi. Rommel was still holding the Burat position when the year ended, for this time there was a month's pause, for a move up and build up, before Montgomery was ready to resume his drive. But it was nonetheless clear that the tide of war in Africa had definitely turned. For there was little chance that Rommel's army could be brought up again to a strength capable of matching the 8th Army's build up capacity, while his rear areas, and possible rearward positions, were now imperiled by the Anglo-American First Army's advance eastward from Algeria into Tunisia. Yet Hitler's illusions soon revived, while Mussolini desperately clung to his because he could not bear to see Italy's African Empire crumbling away. Indeed, their illusions had become uppermost again even while it was still uncertain whether Rommel would succeed in evading his pursuers and extricating the remnants of his battered army.
On reaching Mersa Brega safely he had received orders to hold that line at all costs, and prevent the British from penetrating into Tripolitania. As a reinforcement to the dreamland demand he was also put under Marshal Bastico's command again, as he had been before the advance into Egypt, when he saw Bastico on November 22 he had told him bluntly that the order resist to the end on that desert frontier spelt the certain destruction of the remaining troops, we either lose the position four days earlier and save the army, or lose both position and army four days later. Then Cavallero and Kesselring came to see Rommel on the 24th and he told them that, as barely 5,000 of his German troops had weapons, to hold the Mercer Brega position he would need the speedy delivery, before Montgomery attacked, of 50 Panzer IV tanks armed with the new long barreled 75mm guns, and 50 anti tank guns of the same kind, besides an adequate supply of fuel and ammunition. It was a modest estimate of his need, but it was all too evident that there was no likelihood of its being met, as most of the available equipment and reinforcements was being diverted to Tunisia. Yet they still pressed the order to stand at Mersa Brega. So, in the hope of getting Hitler to face the realities of the situation, Rommel flew to the Führer's headquarters near Assenberg, in the East Prussian forests. He had a chilly reception, and when he suggested that the wisest course would be to evacuate North Africa, Hitler flew into a fury, and would not listen to any further argument. This explosion did more than anything before to shake Rommel's faith in his Führer. As he wrote in his journal, I began to realize that Adolf Hitler simply did not want to see the situation as it was, and that he reacted emotionally against what his intelligence must have told him was right. Hitler insisted that it was a political necessity to continue to hold a major bridgehead in Africa and there would, therefore, be no withdrawal from the Mersuel Brega line. But when Rommel went to Rome on the way back he found Mussolini more open to reason, while more aware of the difficulties of shipping sufficient supplies to Tripoli and getting them forward to Mersa Brega. So he had managed to obtain Mussolini's permission to prepare an intermediate position at Burat to move the non-motorized Italian infantry back there in good time and to withdraw the rest of his slender force if and when the British attacked. Rommel had been prompt to act on this permission and slip away in the darkness immediately the British showed signs of launching their attack. Moreover, he had made up his own mind that he was not going to stop at Burat or in front of Tripoli, and provide Montgomery with a chance of trapping him. His plan, already formed, was to withdraw right back to the Tunisian frontier and the Gabe's bottleneck, where he could not easily be outflanked and could deliver an effective counterstroke with the reinforcements that would be more closely at hand there. Chapter 21, Torch, The New Tide from the Atlantic The Allied landings in French North Africa took place on November 8, 1942. This entry into northwest Africa came a fortnight after the launching of the British offensive on Rommel's position at Alam, in the extreme northeast of Africa, and four days after the collapse of that position. At the Arcadia Conference in Washington at Christmas 1941, the first Allied conference following the Japanese stroke at Pearl Harbor which brought the United States into the war, Mr. Churchill put forward the Northwest Africa project as a step towards closing and tightening the ring around Germany. He told the Americans that there was already a plan, gymnast, for a landing in Algeria if the Eighth Army gained a sufficiently decisive success in Cyrenaica for it to push westward to the Tunisian border. He went on to propose that at the same time United States forces, assuming French agreement, should proceed to land on the Moroccan coast by invitation. President Roosevelt favored the project, being quick to see its political advantages in grand strategy, but his service advisors were dubious about its practicability while anxious lest it should interfere with the prospects of an early and more direct attack against Hitler's hold on Europe. The most they were willing to agree was that study of the operation, now rechristened Super Gymnast, should continue. During the next few months discussion concentrated on the project of a cross-channel attack, to be launched in August or September, to meet Stalin's demand for the opening of a second front. The Cotentin, Cherbourg, Peninsula came to be the most favored site, as urged by General Marshall. 
the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, and by Major General Eisenhower, whom he had chosen and sent to London as commander of the American forces in the European theatre. The British emphasized the drawbacks of a premature landing in Europe with inadequate strength, pointing out the risks of such a bridgehead being bottled up, or overwhelmed, without bringing appreciable relief to the Russians. But President Roosevelt swung his weight in support of the project, and committed himself, when Molotov visited Washington at the end of May, to an assurance that he hoped and expected to create a second front in Europe in 1942. A reversion to the project of a landing in northwest Africa was spurred on by the unexpected British collapse in northeast Africa which occurred in June, following Rommel's forestalling attack on the Ghazala line. The Battle of Ghazala had already taken a bad turn when Churchill flew to Washington on June 17, with his chiefs of staff, for a fresh conference. On arrival Churchill went on by air to Hyde Park, Roosevelt's family home on the Hudson for a private talk. Here he re-emphasized the drawbacks and dangers of a premature landing in France, while suggesting the revival of gymnast as a better alternative. The British and American chiefs of staff, meeting in Washington on June 21, had disagreed over the Cherbourg project but found themselves in complete agreement that the North Africa project was unsound. Their combined negative conclusion about this project was soon reversed by the pressure of events, combined with Roosevelt's pressing desire for some positive action in 1942 that would fulfill, even if not so directly as intended, his promise to the Russians. On June 21, news came that the fortress of Torbuk had fallen to Rommel's assault and that the remains of the British Eighth Army were in retreat to Egypt. During the weeks that followed, the British situation worsened, and the argument for direct or indirect American intervention in Africa was correspondingly strengthened. By the end of June, Rommel reached and started to attack the Alum Line, following on the heels of the British retreat. On July 8 Churchill cabled to Roosevelt that sledgehammer, the plan for a landing in France that year, must be discarded, and went on to urge, once again, the case for Jim Nast. He followed it up with a message through Field Marshal Sir John Dill, who was now head of the British Joint Staff Mission in Washington, Gymnast affords the sole means by which the U.S. can strike at Hitler in 1942, and that otherwise both the Western Allies would have to remain motionless in 1942. The American Chiefs of Staff reacted to this contention with renewed objections to Gymnast. Marshall's condemnation of it as expensive and ineffectual was supported by Admiral King's declaration that it was impossible to fulfill naval commitments in other theaters and at the same time to provide the shipping and escorts which would be essential should that operation be undertaken. They also agreed in viewing the British refusal to attempt a landing in France in 1942 as clear evidence that the British did not really want to risk it even in 1943. So Marshall readily supported by King, proposed a radical change of strategy, that unless the British accepted the American plan for an early cross-channel attack we should turn to the Pacific and strike decisively against Japan, in other words assume a defensive attitude against Germany, except for air operations, and use all available means in the Pacific. But the President objected to the idea of delivering such an ultimatum to his British allies expressed his disapproval of the proposed strategic switch, and told his chiefs of staff that unless they could persuade the British to undertake a cross-channel operation in 1942 they must either launch one into French North Africa or send a strong reinforcement to the Middle East. He emphasized that it was politically imperative to take some striking action before the year ended. Faced with the President's decision, the chiefs of staff might have been expected to choose the course of temporarily reinforcing the British in the Middle East, rather than embarking on the gymnast plan which they had so strongly and persistently opposed. Moreover, after reviewing the two courses, Marshall's planning staff reached the conclusion that the former was the lesser of two evils. But contrary to expectation, he and King swung round in favor of gymnast. This became their preferred alternative when they flew to London in mid-July along with Harry Hopkins, as the President's representatives, 
and found that the British Chiefs of Staff were firmly opposed to Eisenhower's plan for an early landing near Cherbourg. In choosing Northwest Africa as the alternative, rather than a reinforcement to the Middle East, Marshall's prime reason, according to Harry Hopkins, was the difficulty of mixing our troops with the British in Egypt. While a mixture would also occur in the case of a combined operation in Northwest Africa, it was obvious that American reinforcements to the Middle East would have come under a British commander-in-chief. The adoption of Super Gymnast was formulated at two further meetings of the combined chiefs of staff, American and British, in London on July 24 and 25, and promptly endorsed by Roosevelt. Moreover, he emphasized in his cable that the landing should be planned to take place not later than October 30th apostrophe, a directive that Hopkins had suggested, in a personal message, as a means to avoid procrastination and delays. On Churchill's initiative the operation was rechristened Torch, as a more inspiring name. It was also agreed that the supreme command should be given to an American an ointment to the sore feelings of the American service chiefs that Churchill was very ready to provide, and on the 26th Eisenhower was told, by Marshall, that he was to have the post. While the decision for Torch was now definite, it had been made before the questions of time and sight were settled, or even fully examined. Thus fresh conflicts of view arose over both these problems. On the question of time the British Chiefs of Staff, spurred by Churchill, proposed October 7 as the target date. But the American Chiefs of Staff recommended November 7, as being the earliest reasonable date for landing of the forces based on availability of combat loaders. On the question of sight, the respective views were even wider apart. The British urged that the landings should be made on the north coast of Africa, inside the Mediterranean, so that a quick advance to Tunisia would be possible. But the American chiefs of staff stuck to the limited objective of the gymnast plan, as modified in June, when it was envisaged as a purely American operation, and were anxious to confine the landings to the Casablanca area on the west coast, the Atlantic coast, of Morocco. They feared not only the dangers of French opposition but of hostile Spanish reaction and a German counterstroke to block the gateway into the Mediterranean by seizing Gibraltar. The British on this issue were dismayed by such a cautious approach to the strategic problem. They argued that it would allow the Germans time to seize Tunisia, stiffen or replace French opposition in Algeria and Morocco, and thus frustrate the aim of the Allied operation. Eisenhower and his staff were inclined to agree with the British view. His first outline plan, formulated on August 9, was devised as a compromise. It proposed simultaneous landings inside and outside the Mediterranean, but not farther eastward than Algiers, because of the risk of enemy air attacks from Sicily and Sardinia, except for a minor one at Bone to seize the airfield there. Bone is 270 miles east of Algiers but 130 miles short of Bizeta. This compromise did not satisfy the British planners, as it did not seem likely to fulfill the principal condition of success, which they defined as being, we must have occupied the key points of Tunisia within 26 days of passing Gibraltar and preferably within 14 days. In their view, a major landing at Bone, or even farther east, was essential to achieve a quick enough advance to Tunisia. These arguments impressed the President, who directed Marshall and King to re-study the project. They had also impressed Eisenhower, who reported to Washington that the American members of his staff were now convinced of the soundness of the British reasoning, and that he was now drawing up a new plan that would eliminate the Casablanca landings, and advance the date of the others. His staff produced on August 21, a second outline plan which largely followed the British idea. Discarding the Casablanca landing, it provided for an American landing at Oran, 250 miles east of Gibraltar, as well as for British landings at Algiers and Bone. But Eisenhower's own endorsement of it was tepid, and emphasized that such an expedition, wholly inside the Mediterranean, would be badly exposed on its flank. That conclusion tuned in with Marshall's opinion. 
The second outline plan was as unpalatable to the American chiefs of staff as the first had been to the British. Marshall told the president that a single line of communication through the straits is far too hazardous and he was against any landing being made inside the Mediterranean farther east than Oran, 600 miles short of Bizeta. Churchill received the news of this cautious turn after returning from his visits with General Brooke to Egypt and Moscow, where Stalin had taunted them about the failure of the Western powers to open a second front, with such scornful questions as are you going to let us do all the work while you look on? Are you never going to start fighting? You will find it is not too bad when once you start. That had, naturally, stung Churchill but he had managed to arouse Stalin's interest in the potentialities of torch, and had vividly depicted how it could indirectly relieve the pressure on Russia. So he was shocked to find that the Americans were proposing to whittle down the plan. On August 27 he sent off a long cable to Roosevelt protesting that the changes which the American chiefs of staff suggested might be fatal to the whole plan, and that the whole pith of the operation will be lost if we do not take Algiers as well as Oran on the first day. He emphasized the bad impression that a narrowing of the aim would have on Stalin. Roosevelt's reply, on the 30th, insisted that under any circumstances one of our landings must be on the Atlantic. So he proposed that the Americans should carry out the Casablanca and Oran landings, leaving the British to make the eastward ones. Moreover, mindful of British military action against Vichy French forces in North Africa, Syria and elsewhere, he raised a fresh issue. I feel very strongly that the initial attacks must be made by an exclusively American ground force. I would even go so far as to say I am reasonably sure a simultaneous landing by British and Americans would result in full resistance by all French in Africa, whereas an initial American landing without British ground forces offers a real chance that there would be no French resistance, or only a token resistance. It is our belief that German air or parachute troops cannot get to Algiers or Tunis in any large force for at least two weeks after the initial attack. The British were appalled at the idea of a week's pause before making eastward landings, more important and urgent for the strategic goal than the westerly ones, and were far from happy about the Americans' optimistic estimate that the Germans could not intervene effectively in less than two weeks. Churchill was very willing to profit from the persuasive influence of the American ambassador to the Vichy government, Admiral Leahy towards easing the way politically and psychologically. While he was anxious to preserve the American character of the expedition, and therefore willing to keep the British forces as much in the background as was physically possible, he did not believe it possible to conceal the fact that the larger part of the shipping, the air support, and the naval forces would be British, and these elements would become visible first, before the ground forces. He touched on these points in a tactful reply to Roosevelt on September 1st, and emphasized that if the political bloodless victory, for which I agree with you there is a good chance, should go amiss, a military disaster of very great consequences would ensue. He continued. Finally, in spite of the difficulties it seems to us vital that Algiers should be occupied simultaneously with Casablanca and Oran. Here is the most friendly and hopeful spot where the political reaction would be most decisive throughout North Africa. To give up Algiers for the sake of the doubtfully practicable landing at Casablanca seems to us a very serious decision. If it led to the Germans forestalling us not only in Tunis but in Algeria, the results on balance would be lamentable throughout the Mediterranean. Ibid, pages 479-80 this good argument for maintaining the landing at Algiers as part of the plan did not mention the importance of landings farther east, and near Abizata, an omission, and concession, which was of fateful consequence to the chances of early strategic success. Replying to Churchill's cable, on September 3rd, Roosevelt agreed that a landing at Algiers should be included in the plan while suggesting that American troops should land first followed within an hour by British troops. Churchill immediately accepted this solution, provided that there was such a reduction in the force earmarked for Casablanca as to make the Algiers landing effective. 
to this Roosevelt agreed, in a modified form, suggesting a reduction of one regimental combat team at Casablanca, and another at Oran, to provide 10,000 men for use at Algiers. Churchill cabled back on September 5, we agree to the military layout you propose. We have plenty of troops highly trained for landing. If convenient they can wear your uniform. They will be proud to do so. Shipping will be all right. That same day, Roosevelt replied in a one-word cable hurrah. Thus the matter was finally settled in this exchange of cables between Roosevelt and Churchill. Three days later Eisenhower specified November 8 as the date of the landings, while declining Churchill's offer to put the British commandos in American uniform, as he was anxious to preserve an all-American look to the initial landings. Churchill reconciled himself to the delay, and to the modification of the plan. Indeed, in a subsequent cable to Roosevelt on September 15, he submissively said, in the whole of torch, military and political, I consider myself your lieutenant, asking only to put my viewpoint plainly before you. Roosevelt's Hurrah! Cable on September 5 settled what was aptly called the transatlantic essay competition, although Marshall continued to express doubts, while his immediate political chief, Henry Stimson, the Secretary for War, that is for the Army, made a bitter complaint to the President about the decision to land in North Africa. But the President's decision enabled detailed planning to be pushed on in a hurried effort to remedy the effects of procrastination. The plan, however, carried the two-edged effects of a compromise. By diminishing the chances of a quickly decisive success in North Africa it made more certain the prolonged diversion of Allied effort in the Mediterranean, as American official historians have recognized and emphasized. See, in particular, the very able and penetrating analysis in strategic planning for coalition warfare 1941-1942, by Morris Matloff and Edwin M. Snell. In the final plan, the Atlantic coast landing to capture Casablanca was to be made by the All-American Force under Major General George S. Patton, with 24, 500 troops, carried by the Western Naval Task Force under Rear Admiral H. Kent Hewitt. It sailed direct from America, the main part from Hampton Roads in Virginia, and consisted of 102 ships, of which 29 were transports. The capture of Oran was entrusted to the Center Task Force, which comprised 18,500 American troops under Major General Lloyd Alfred Endell, but was escorted by a British naval force under Commodore Thomas Strewbridge. It sailed from the Clyde, as it was composed of American troops who had been brought over to Scotland and Northern Ireland early in August. For the operation against Algiers, the Eastern Naval Task Force was also entirely British, commanded by Rear Admiral Sir Harold Burroughs, but the assault force consisted of 9,000 British and 9,000 American troops, and its commander, Major General Charles Ryder, was American. Moreover, American troops were incorporated in the two 000 strong British commando units. This curiously mixed composition was inspired by the hope that putting Americans in the front of the shop window would lead the French to assume that the assault force was all American. On November 9, the day after the landings, overall command of all the Allied troops in Algeria was taken over by the commander of the newly created British First Army, Lieutenant General Kenneth Anderson. The assault forces for both Oran and Algiers sailed together from Britain in two large convoys, a slow one starting on October 22 and a fast one four days later. This timing was arranged so that they could pass through the Straits of Gibraltar simultaneously during the night of November 5, and from there they were covered by part of the British Mediterranean fleet under Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham. Its presence sufficed to deter the Italian fleet from interfering even after the landings, so that, as Cunningham regretfully remarked, his powerful force had to be kept cruising idly. But he had plenty of work on his hands, as he was Allied naval commander, under Eisenhower, and thus responsible for the whole of the maritime side of Torch. Including store ships that had come in advance convoys early in October, over 250 merchantmen sailed from Britain, of which some 40 were transport. 
including three American, while the British naval force employed in the operation, as escort and cover, amounted to 160 warships of various types. The diplomatic prelude to the landings was akin to a mixture of a spy story and a western, with comic interludes, carried into the field of history. Robert Murphy, the chief American diplomatic representative in North Africa, had been active in preparing the way for the landings by discreet sounding among French officers whom he felt were likely to be in sympathy with, and to give aid to, the project. He relied particularly on one general mast, commander of the troops in the Algiers sector, and previously chief of staff to General Juin, the commander-in-chief, and General Bethwart who commanded the troops in the Casablanca sector, although that sector as a whole was under the command of Admiral Michelia, a fact that the Americans failed to realize. Mast had urged that a senior allied military representative should come secretly to Algiers for backstage talks, and discussion of plans, with Jew in and others. Accordingly General Mark Clark, who had just been appointed Deputy Commander-in-Chief for Torch, flew to Gibraltar with four key staff officers, and the party were carried on by a British submarine, HMS Seraph, Lieutenant N. A. A. Jewel, to a rendezvous at a villa on the coast some sixty miles west of Algiers. The submarine arrived off the coast early on October 21 but too late to land Mark Clark's party before daylight, so had to stay submerged all day, while the puzzled and disappointed French party went home. A message from the submarine to Gibraltar, relayed to Algiers over a secret radio chain, brought Murphy and some of the French back to the villa the next night, when Clark's party came ashore in four canvas canoes one of which upset when they embarked. They had been guided to the meeting place by a lamp, with a white blanket behind, shining through a window. Mark Clark told Mast, in a broad way, that a large American force was being prepared for dispatch to North Africa, and would be supported by British air and sea forces, a statement which was lacking in frankness. Moreover he abstained, in the interests of security from giving Mast a clear idea of the time and places of the Allied landings. This excess of secrecy in dealing with a man whose help was of key importance was unwise, since it deprived him and his associates of the information and time necessary to plan, and take, cooperative steps. Clark authorized Murphy to inform Mast immediately before the landings of the date, but even then not of the places. That was too late for Mast to notify his associates in Morocco. The conference was temporarily, and dramatically, interrupted by the appearance on the scene of suspicious French police. Mark Clark and his companions were hurriedly hidden in an empty wine cellar while the police searched the villa. Danger became more acute when one of the British commando officers who had piloted the party began coughing. Mark Clark passed him a bit of chewing gum as a remedy but he soon asked for more, saying that it had not got much taste, to which Clark replied, that is not surprising, as I have been chewing it for two hours. After the police at last went away, still suspicious and likely to return, Clark and his party ran into fresh trouble when they tried to re-embark at dusk, for the surf had become heavy, and he had a narrow escape from drowning when his canoe overturned. At a further attempt shortly before dawn, the others capsized, but all of the party got through the breakers in the end and reached the submarine, safe though soaked. The next day they were transferred to a flying boat, which carried them back to Gibraltar. An important issue which came into further discussion at this conference was the choice of the most suitable French leader to rally the French forces in North Africa to the Allied side. While Juin, their commander-in-chief, had privately expressed a favorable inclination, he showed a tendency to sit on the fence as long as possible, and a reluctance to take the initiative. His chief subordinate commanders lacked sufficient prestige, and were no less reluctant to take any definite step in disregard or defiance of orders from the Vichy government. Admiral Darlan, the commander-in-chief of its forces as a whole, and potential head of state if the aged Marshal Bidane were to die, 
had hinted to Leahy in 1941 and more recently to Murphy that he might be willing to break away from the policy of collaboration with Germany and bring the French over to the Allied side if assured of American military aid on a sufficiently large scale. But he had played in with Hitler so long that his hints did not inspire confidence. Moreover he had an anti-British bias, which had naturally been increased by the British action against the French fleet at Oran and elsewhere, after the collapse of France in 1940. This made his attitude all the more doubtful in view of the difficulty of disguising the fact that the British were playing a large part in torch. General de Gaulle was ruled out for the opposite reason that his defiance of Bataille in 1940 and subsequent part in Churchill's moves against Dakar, Syria, and Madagascar would make all French officers who had remained loyal to the Vichy government unwilling to accept his leadership, even those who were most eager to throw off the German yoke. That was emphasized by Murphy and readily assumed by Roosevelt, who had developed a deep distrust of de Gaulle's judgment and dislike of his arrogance. Churchill who had recently dubbed himself your lieutenant, bowed to his master's voice, and de Gaulle was given no information of the project until the landings had taken place. In these circumstances the Americans, from the president downward, readily accepted the view of General Mast and his associates that General Giraud was the most desirable and acceptable candidate for the leadership of the French in North Africa, as Murphy had already conveyed before the conference took place. Giraud, an army commander in May 1940, had been taken prisoner by the Germans, but had managed to escape in April 1942, and reached the unoccupied part of France, where he was allowed to stay, on promising to support Badain's authority. He took up residence near Lyon. From there, although under surveillance, he got into communication with many officers, both in France itself and in North Africa, who shared his desire to organize a revolt against German domination with American help. Giraud's viewpoint was expressed in a letter to one of his supporters, General Odic, we don't want the Americans to free us, we want them to help us free ourselves, which is not quite the same. Moreover, in his private negotiations with them he made it one of his conditions that he should be commander-in-chief of allied troops in French territory wherever French troops were fighting. From a message he received he understood that his conditions were accepted by Roosevelt, but they came as a complete surprise to Eisenhower when Giraud arrived at Gibraltar to meet him on November 7, the eve of the landings. Giraud had been picked up, at a rendezvous on the south coast of France, by the same British submarine, HMS Seraf, that had carried Mark Clark on his secret mission to the Algerian coast. He was then transferred to a flying boat, though nearly drowned in doing so, and carried on to Gibraltar. On reaching there, he was staggered at the news that the Allied landings in North Africa were taking place early next morning, as he had been told that they were planned for the following month, and also by the discovery that the command of them was in the hands of Eisenhower, instead of his own. This led to a heated argument, in which he based himself on his higher rank as well as on the assurances he had received and constantly reiterated that to take anything less than supreme command would be a surrender of his country's prestige and his own. But when talks were resumed in the morning, of the 8th, he reconciled himself to the situation, after explicit assurance that he would be head of the French forces and administration in North Africa, a promise that was soon to be set aside on grounds of expediency and the superior assets of Admiral Darlan. In bringing the torch of liberty to French North Africa, the Americans had achieved surprise too fully, throwing their friends and helpers into confusion, more confusion than was caused on the enemy's side. Their French collaborators were caught unready to aid effectively in clearing the way, and under the shock of the sudden invasion most of the French commanders reacted in the way that was natural in such circumstances, and in conformity with their loyalty to legitimate authority embodied in Marshal Badain at Vichy. Thus the landings met resistance initially, although less at Algiers than at Oran and Casablanca. At Casablanca, General Bethwart, the French divisional commander, received a message late in the evening of the 7th that the landing would take place at 2 a.m. on the 8th. 
he sent off parties of his troops to arrest the German armistice commissions, and posted some of his officers to welcome the Americans on the beach at Rabat, 50 miles to the north, as he assumed that they would land there, since it had no coast defense batteries and was the seat of French government in Morocco. After these preliminary steps, Bethwart himself went with a battalion to occupy army headquarters at Rabat, and sent the army commander off under escort. Bethwart had also dispatched letters to General Nogues, the resident general, and overall commander-in-chief, in Morocco, and to Admiral Michelia, informing them that the Americans were about to land, that Giraud was coming to take over command of French North Africa as a whole and that he himself had been appointed by Giraud to take over command of the army in Morocco. His letter to Nogues and Michelier asked them to back the order he had issued for allowing the Americans to land unopposed, or else to keep out of the way until it was more convenient for them to accept the Fetak armed plea. On receiving the letter, Nogues tried to sit on the fence until the situation was clearer. While Nogues hesitated, Michelier took prompt action. His air and submarine patrols had not spotted the approaching armada before nightfall, so he jumped to the conclusion that Bethwart was deluded or hoaxed. Mishlia's assurance that no strong force had been sighted off the coast so impressed Nogues that even when the first reports of the landing reached him, shortly after 5 a.m., he believed that they were no more than commando raids. He therefore jumped down off the fence, on the anti-American side, and ordered the French forces to resist the landings, while putting Bethwart under arrest on a charge of treason. Baton's main landing was made at Fodla, 15 miles north of Casablanca, with subsidiary ones at Media, 55 miles farther north, and Safi, 140 miles south of Casablanca. Fodla offered the nearest suitable landing beaches to that city and its strongly defended harbour, the only large and well-equipped one on the Atlantic coast of Morocco. Media was chosen because it was the nearest landing place to the Port Lyotte airfield, the only one in Morocco with a concrete runway. Safi was chosen because a right-wing force operating the might ward off the strong French garrison of the inland city of Marrakesh from intervening at Casablanca, and also because it had a harbour where medium tanks could be disembarked for the new LSTS landing ship's tank, then being produced were not ready in time for torch. As the American Armada approached the coast of Morocco on November 6, after a smooth ocean passage, heavy seas were reported there and the forecast for the 8th was that the surf would be so high as to make landings impossible. But Admiral Hewitt's own weather expert predicted that the storm would pass away and he decided to take the risk of pursuing the plan of landing on the Atlantic coast. On the 7th the sea began to subside, and on the 8th it was calm, with only a moderate ground swell. The surf was slighter than on any morning in the month. Even so, many mishaps and delays arose from inexperience. But things at least went better than Patton had forecast in a characteristically bombastic blood and guts speech at the final conference before embarkation, when he had caustically told the naval members that their elaborate landing plans would break down in the first five minutes and gone on to declare, never in history has the Navy landed an army at the planned time and place. But if you land us anywhere within fifty miles of Fiddler and within one week of D-Day, I'll go ahead and win. It was fortunate that the confusion and hesitation among the French was such that the landing attack waves were safely ashore before the defenders' fire became serious, and by then the light was good enough to help the American naval gunners in subduing the coastal batteries. But fresh trouble developed in the beachhead, and in extending it, from the inexperience and muddles of the army's sure parties, so that Patton switched his explosive criticism to the faults of his own force and service. Both the troops and the boats had been overloaded. Although the advance on Casablanca got going on the second day, and met no serious opposition, it was abruptly halted by the pull on its tail that was caused by lack of equipment, which was piling up on the beaches but failed to come forward to the combat troops. Little progress was made on the third day and there was an increase of opposition, so that the outlook became gloomy. 
the situation would have been more serious if the French naval threat had not been quelled on the first day. This was achieved in a battle off Casablanca that had an older style flavor. It started just before 7 a.m., when the coast defense battery on Capel Hank and Jean Bart in the harbor, this was the newest French battleship but still uncompleted, and unable to move from her berth, opened fire on Rear Admiral R. L. Giffen's covering group, which comprised the battleship Massachusetts, two heavy cruisers and four destroyers. These suffered no hits, although there were several near misses, and their reply was sufficiently effective to silence temporarily both the L. Hank battery and Jean Bart. But they became so absorbed in this lively action that they neglected their task of keeping the other French ships penned there. By 9 a.m. one light cruiser, seven destroyers and eight submarines had slipped out. The destroyers headed for Fodler, where the American transports were sitting ducks. Fortunately they were headed off and driven to withdraw by a heavy cruiser, a light cruiser and two destroyers which Admiral Hewitt had ordered to intercept them. Then, on his summons, the covering group came up to cut off their retreat. Thanks to able seamanship, the skillful use of smoke screens, and the disturbing effect of a relief attack by their submarines, the French managed to survive this overwhelming concentration of heavyweight fire with the loss of only one destroyer, and then made another gallant effort to reach the transport area. In this second engagement, however, another was sunk, and only one of the eight French ships returned to harbor undamaged. The two more sank and others were further crippled by bombing. But the result was not decisive as the L. Hank batteries and Jean Bart's 15-inch guns had come to life again, while the American ships had used up so much of their ammunition that they might not have been able to drive off the French warships based on Dakar if these had come up, as it was feared they might. Fortunately, the situation at Casablanca, and on the Atlantic coast as a whole, was decisively changed by favorable political developments in Algiers. In the late afternoon General Nogues heard indirectly that the French authorities there, headed by Admiral Darlan, had on the 10th issued an order to stop fighting. Nogues was prompt to act on this unconfirmed report, and ordered his own subordinate commanders to cease active resistance pending an armistice. Meanwhile, the American landings at Oran had met somewhat stiffer opposition than those of the Western Naval Task Force in the Casablanca area. Yet there was remarkably good joint planning and cooperation between the American military task force and the British naval force which brought it to the scene and delivered it ashore. Moreover its spearhead, the U.S. 1st Infantry Division, commanded by Major General Terry Allen, was a highly trained formation, and it was backed up by half the 1st Armored Division. The plan was to capture the port and city of Oran by a double envelopment. Two of Terry Allen's regimental combat teams landing on beaches in the Gulf of Arze, 24 miles to the cast, while the third, under Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, landed on beaches at Ley and Louses, 14 miles to the west of the city. Then a light armored column was to drive inland from the beachhead at Arze, and a smaller one from a further landing point at Mersabu Zedja, 30 miles west of Oran to capture the airfields south of Oran and close on the city to the rear. To shut it off quickly was the more important because, as estimated, its garrison of 10,000 troops could be almost doubled within 24 hours by reinforcement from inland stations. The operation started well. At nightfall on November 7 the convoy had deceptively passed Oran, heading east, but then doubled back in the dark. The landings began promptly to time, 1 a.m., at Arze and only half an hour late at Leand Louses and Mersabu's Edja. Surprise was complete and no opposition was met on the beaches. Although 13 coast defense batteries covered this stretch, there was no harassing fire until after daylight, and even then it caused very little damage, thanks to effective naval support and the cloak it provided with smoke screens. Disembarkation and unloading went smoothly on the whole, although slowed down by the overloading of the troops, who were carrying nearly 90 pounds of equipment apiece. 
the medium tanks were carried in transports and unloaded on the quay after the harbour at Aza was captured. The only serious reverse was suffered in an attempt to take Oran Harbour by direct assault, to forestall sabotage of its apparatus and the ships lying there. Two small British cutters, HMS Walney and Hartland, carrying 400 American troops, and accompanied by two motor launches, were employed to carry out this daring plan, which the American naval authorities had deprecated as rash. The outcome confirmed their view that it was a suicide mission. Unwisely, it was timed to start two hours after H hour, just when the French had been aroused by the landings elsewhere. The precaution of displaying a large American flag failed to deter the French from replying with sustained blasts of fire which crippled both cutters, killed half of their crews and troops, while the remainder, mostly wounded, were taken prisoner. The advance from the beachheads got going by 9 a.m. or earlier, and soon after 11 a.m. Colonel Waters' light armored column from Azar reached Tafarawi airfield, which was reported an hour later as ready to receive aircraft from Gibraltar. But when the column turned north it was checked short of La Senyan airfield, and so was Colonel Robinett's column from Ursabu's edger. The converging infantry advances from Maze and Lay and Louses also became hung up when they met resistance as they approached Oran. On the second day little progress was made, as French resistance stiffened and a counter-attack on the flank of the Aza beach had dislocated the whole plan of operations through the threat being magnified by lurid reports, which led General Fridenhall to divert forces from other missions. While La Seigneur airfield was captured in the afternoon, most of the French aircraft had already flown off, and it could not be used because of persistent shell fire. A concentric attack towards Oran was mounted on the third morning, after some of the islands of resistance on the approach roads had been bypassed during the night. The infantry attacks from east and west again met checks, but helped to fix the attention of the defenders, while advance parties of the two light armored columns drove into the city from the south without being opposed, apart from occasional sniping, and reached the French military headquarters before midday. The French commanders then agreed to surrender. The American casualties in the three days fighting on land were under 400, and the French even less. These light losses, and particularly the diminishing resistance on the final day, were influenced by the French commanders' awareness that negotiations were proceeding at Algiers. The landings at Algiers had run a smoother and shorter course, thanks largely to the local commander, General Mast, and his collaborating associates. No serious resistance was met anywhere, except in trying to force an early entry into the harbor, as at Oran. One transport, USS Thomas Stone, was temporarily disabled at daybreak on the 7th by a torpedo fired by a U-boat when 150 miles short of Algiers, but after that the seaborne approach deeper into the Mediterranean met no further trouble. Although sighted by a few enemy observation planes, no air attack came before the convoy made its southward turn after dark to the landing beaches. One group landed near Cap Matafu, some 15 miles east of Algiers, another near Cap Sidi Faraj, 10 miles west of the city, and the third group 10 miles further west near Castiglian. For political camouflage the landings nearest Algiers were made by the Americans, with an admixture of British commandos, and the main British one was on the more westerly beaches near Castiglian. Here the landings began promptly at 1 a.m., and proceeded without mishap despite rough and dangerous beaches. French troops met a short way inland said that they had been instructed to offer no resistance. Bleeder airfield was reached about 9 a.m. on the eastern side of Algiers the landings were a little late and suffered some confusion but in the absence of resistance it was possible to straighten out the situation quickly. The important Maison Blanche airfield was reached soon after 6 a.m. and occupied after a few shots had been fired as token resistance. The advance on Algiers itself, however, met a village strong point that refused passage and was then brought to a stop by a threat of attack from three French tanks. The coast battery on Cap Matifu also rejected calls to surrender 
and only yielded after being twice bombarded by warships and dive-bombed in the afternoon. The attempt to rush the port of Algiers fared worse. The British destroyers, Broke and Malcolm, flying large American flags and carrying an American infantry battalion, were used for this venture, which was planned to enter the harbour three hours after the landings, in the hope that the defenders would have been drawn off, even if their acquiescence had not been secured. Instead, the destroyers came under heavy fire as soon as they approached the entrance. Malcolm was badly hit and withdrew. Broke, at the fourth try, succeeded in running the gauntlet, and berthed alongside a quay, where her troops disembarked. At first they were allowed to occupy installations unopposed, but about 8 am guns started to shell Broke, forcing her to cast off and withdraw. The landing party was hemmed in by French African troops, and surrendered soon after midday, as its ammunition was running low and there were no signs of relief by the main force. The French fire, however, had been directed to keep the landing party in check rather than to destroy it. In the landings west of Algiers near Cap City for Uch there was much more delay and confusion, while a number of the landing craft went astray and arrived on the British beaches further west. Components of each battalion were scattered over 15 miles of coast, while many of the landing craft were wrecked in the surf or delayed by engine trouble. Fortunately, the troops had a friendly or passive reception at first, Mast and some of his officers coming to meet them and clear the way, otherwise these landings would have turned into a costly fiasco. But when, after hasty reorganization, columns pushed on towards Algiers they encountered resistance in several places. For Mast had by now been relieved of command, his orders for cooperation cancelled, and his troops bidden to oppose the Allied advance. The Allies' collaborators in Algiers had played their part remarkably well under the difficulties caused by the very short notice they had been given of the landing, and the little they had been told about its objectives. Their own plans to aid such a landing were promptly put into action. Officers were posted along the coast to welcome and guide the Americans, control points seized by organized parties, the telephone service largely blocked police headquarters and outlying stations occupied, unsympathetic higher officials locked up, and the radio station taken over in readiness for a broadcast by Giraud or on his behalf which it was hoped would be of decisive effect. In sum, the collaborators achieved enough to paralyze opposition by the time that the landings took place, and they kept control of the city until about 7 am longer than they had reckoned on doing or had regarded as necessary. But the advance from the landing beaches was too slow to match the need. When the Americans failed to appear by 7 a.m., the limitations of the collaborators' influence on their countrymen became manifest. Moreover, when they broadcast an appeal in the name of Giraud, who had also failed to arrive as expected, this fell so flat as to show that the weight of his name had been overestimated by them. They soon began to lose control of the situation and were brushed aside or put under arrest. Meanwhile fateful discussions were proceeding on a higher level. Half an hour after midnight Robert Murphy had gone to see General Jewin, broken the news to him that overwhelmingly strong forces were about to land, and urged him to cooperate by prompt instructions that they were not to be resisted. Murphy said that they had come on the invitation of Giraud, to help France in liberating herself. Jewin showed no readiness to accept Giraud's leadership or regard his authority as sufficient, and said that the appeal must be submitted to Admiral Darlan, who was, by chance, in Algiers at that moment, having flown there to see his son, who had fallen dangerously ill. Darlan was awakened by a telephone call and asked to come to Jewin's villa to receive an urgent message from Murphy. On arrival, when told of the impending stroke, his first reaction was to exclaim angrily, I have known for a long time that the British were stupid, but I always believed that the Americans were more intelligent. I begin to believe that you make as many mistakes as they do. After some discussion he eventually agreed to send a radio message to Marshal Bidane reporting the situation and asking for authorization to deal with it freely on the Marshal's behalf. Meanwhile the villa had been surrounded by an armed band of anti-Vichy French, 
so that Darlan was virtually under guard. But a little later they were driven off by a detachment of guard mobiles, who put Murphy under arrest. Then Darlan and Juin, eyeing one another like suspicious cats, went off to the headquarters in Algiers. From here Juin took steps to regain control, releasing General Coelts and other officers who had been arrested by Mast and his associates, while putting the latter under arrest in their turn. Darlan, however, sent a further telegram to Marshal Pitain, just before 8 a.m., in which he emphasized that, the situation is getting worse and the defenses will soon be overwhelmed, a palpable hint that it would be wise to bow to force measure. Pitain's reply gave the authorization requested. Just after 9 a.m. the American charge Daphne Vichy, Pinkney Tuck, had gone to see Pitain and deliver Roosevelt's letter requesting his cooperation. Pitain handed him a reply, already prepared by then, expressing bewilderment and sadness at American aggression, and declaring that France would resist attack on her empire even by old friends, this is the order I give. But his attitude to Tuck was very pleasant, and he seemed to be far from sad. Indeed, his behavior conveyed the impression that his formal reply was really meant to allay German suspicions and intervention. But a few hours later Pierre Laval, the Prime Minister, accepted under Hitler's pressure an offer of German air support, and by evening the Axis powers were preparing forces for dispatch to Tunisia. Meanwhile Darlan, on his own responsibility, had issued orders to the French troops and ships in the Algiers area to cease firing. Although this order did not apply to the Oran and Casablanca areas, Darlan authorized Jew in to arrange a settlement for the whole of North Africa. Moreover it was agreed early in the evening that control of Algiers should be transferred to the Americans at 8 p.m. and that the Allies should have the use of the harbor from first light the next morning, the 9th. The afternoon of the 9th saw the arrival of Mark Clark to conduct the fuller negotiations necessary and of Kenneth Anderson to assume command of the Allied troops for the advance to Tunisia. Giraud also arrived, a little earlier, but found that he was far from welcome among his chief compatriots there, and took refuge with a family who lived in an out-of-the-way place. Mark Clark remarks he practically went underground, although he emerged next morning for Clark's first conference with Darlan, Juin, and their chief subordinates. Here Clark pressed Darlan to order an immediate ceasefire everywhere in French North Africa, and when he hesitated, arguing that he had sent a summary of the terms to Vichy and must await word from there, Clark began pounding the table and said that he would get Giraud to issue the order in his place. At that, Darlan pointed out Giraud's lack of legal authority or sufficient personal weight. He also declared that such an order would result in the immediate occupation of southern France by the Germans, a forecast that was soon borne out. After some more argument, with an accompaniment of table pounding, Clark pungently told Darlan that unless he issued the order immediately he would be taken into custody, Clark having taken the precaution of posting an armed guard around the building. Darlan then, after a brief discussion with his staff, accepted this ultimatum and his order was sent out at 11.20 a.m. When it was reported to Vichy, Badain's own reaction was to approve it. But when Level heard of it en route to Munich, in response to a brusque summons from Hitler, he got on the telephone to Badain and induced him to disavow it. Early in the afternoon, Clark received the news that Vichy had rejected the armistice. When Darlan was told of this by Clark, he dejectedly said, there is nothing I can do but revoke the order I signed this morning. Thereupon Clark retorted, you will do nothing of the kind. There will be no revocation of these orders, and, to make it certain, I shall hold you in custody. Darlan, who had already hinted at this solution, showed himself very ready to accept it, and sent the reply to Pitain, I annul my orders and constitute myself a prisoner, the annulment being only for VC and German cars. Next day, under pressure from Hitler via Laval, Badain announced that all authority in North Africa had been transferred from Darlan to Nogues, but had already sent Darlan a secret message that the disavowal had been made under German pressure and was contrary to his own wishes. 
Such double talk was a subterfuge compelled by the perilous situation in France, but left the situation and French commanders in North Africa, outside Algiers, still confused. Fortunately, Hitler helped to clarify it and resolve their doubts by ordering his forces to invade the unoccupied part of France that, by the 1940 armistice agreement, had been left under the control of the Vichy government. On November 8 and 9 Vichy had stalled on the offers of armed support which Hitler pressed on them, making reservations which inflamed his suspicions. On the 10th Laval arrived in Munich to face Hitler and Mussolini, and that afternoon Hitler insisted that the ports and air bases in Tunisia must be made available to the Axis forces. Laval still tried to hedge, saying that France could not agree to the Italians moving in, and that in any case only Pertain could decide. Hitler then lost all patience, and soon after the talk ended gave orders for his forces to drive into the unoccupied part of France at midnight, a move already mounted in readiness, as well as to seize the Tunisian air and sea bases, along with the Italians. Southern France was speedily overrun by the German mechanized forces while six Italian divisions marched in from the east. German planes had started to arrive on an airfield near Tunis in the afternoon of the 9th, together with an escort of troops to protect them on the ground, but had been confined to the airfield by a ring of French troops. Now, from the 11th onward, the airlift was multiplied. The adjacent French troops disarmed, while tanks, guns, transport vehicles and stores were brought over by sea to Bizeter. By the end of the month 15,000 German troops had arrived, with about 100 tanks, although a large proportion were administrative personnel to organize the base. Some 9,000 Italians had also arrived, largely by road from Tripoli, and were primarily used to cover the southern flank. For a hastily improvised move, at a time when the Axis forces were hard-pressed everywhere, that was a fine achievement. But such a scale of force was very small compared with what the Allies had brought to French North Africa, and would have had slight chance of resisting them if the torch plan had provided for a larger proportion of the Allied expeditionary force to be used for the advance to Tunisia, or if the Allied command had developed the advance more rapidly than it did. The German invasion of southern France did more than anything else to help the Allied situation in Africa by the shock it gave to the French commanders there. On the morning of the 11th, before the news came, there had been another seesaw in Algiers. The first sign was when Clark went to see Darlan, and pressed him to take two urgent steps, to order the French fleet at Toulon to come to a North African port, and to order the governor of Tunisia, Admiral Estiva, to resist the Germans' entry. Darlan was at first evasive, arguing that his orders might not be obeyed in view of the broadcast announcement that he had been dismissed from command of the French forces, and, when further pressed, he refused to comply with Clark's demands. Clark marched out of the house, slamming the door to relieve his feelings. But in the afternoon he had a telephone message asking him to see Darlan again, and Darlan now agreed to comply with Clark's wishes, in view of developments in France, although his message to the commander of the fleet at Toulon was worded as urgent advice rather than as an order. Another favorable turn was that General Noakes, Darlan's Vichy-nominated successor, agreed to come to Algiers for a conference next day. But in the early hours of the 12th Clark had a fresh jolt on hearing that Darlan's order for resistance in Tunisia had been revoked. Summoning Darlan and Jew into his hotel, it soon became apparent that the change was due to Juin, who argued that it was not a revocation but only a suspension of the previous order pending the arrival of Nogues, who was now his legitimate superior. Such scruples about legality, while characteristic of the French military code appeared to Clark as merely legalistic quibbles. Although they bowed to his insistence that the order to Tunisia must be reissued immediately, without waiting for the arrival of Nogues, his suspicion was renewed by their reluctance to accept Giraud's participation in the conference. Clark was so exasperated at their procrastination that he spoke of putting all the French leaders under arrest, and locking them up aboard a ship in the harbour, 
unless they came to a satisfactory decision within 24 hours. Meanwhile, Darlan's position in relation to the other French leaders in Africa had been strengthened by the receipt of a second clandestine message from Pétain reaffirming his confidence in Darlan and emphasizing that he himself was in accord in time with President Roosevelt, although he could not speak his mind openly because of the Germans' presence. This helped Darlan, who had a shrewder sense of realities than many of his compatriots to secure the agreement of Nogues and the others for a working agreement with the Allies, including the recognition of Giraud. Their discussions at a further conference on the 13th were expedited by a fresh threat by Clark that he would lock up the lot. That afternoon it was settled, and promptly endorsed by Eisenhower who had just flown over from Gibraltar. Under its terms, Darlan was to be High Commissioner and Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces, Giraud to be Commander-in-Chief of Ground and Air Forces, Juin, Commander of the Eastern Sector, Nogues, Commander of the Western Sector, as well as Resident General of French Morocco. Active cooperation with the Allies in liberating Tunisia was to begin immediately. Eisenhower endorsed the agreement all the more readily because he had come to realize, like Clark, that Darlan was the only man who could bring the French round to the Allied side, and also because he remembered Churchill's remark to him just before he left London, if I could meet Darlan, much as I hate him, I would cheerfully crawl on my hands and knees for a mile if by doing so I could get him to bring that fleet of his into the circle of the Allied forces. Eisenhower's decision was no less promptly endorsed by Roosevelt and Churchill. But such a deal with Darlan who had so long been presented in the press as a sinister pro-Nazi figure, aroused a storm of protest in Britain and America, a worse storm than either Churchill or Roosevelt had foreseen. In Britain it was the greater, since de Gaulle was there, and his supporters did their utmost to increase the outburst of popular indignation. Roosevelt sought to calm the tumult by a public statement of explanation in which he adopted a phrase from Churchill's private cable to him, saying that the arrangement with Darlan is only a temporary expedient, justified solely by the stress of battle. Moreover, in an off-the-record press conference, he described it as an application of an old proverb of the Orthodox Church, My children, it is permitted you in time of grave danger to walk with the devil until you have crossed the bridge. Roosevelt's way of explaining away the arrangement as only a temporary expedient naturally came as a shock to Darlan, who felt that he had been tricked. In a letter of protest to Mark Clark he bitterly remarked that both public statement and private word appeared to show that he was regarded as only a lemon which the Americans will drop after they have squeezed it dry. Roosevelt's statement was still more hotly resented by the French commanders who had supported Darlan in reaching an agreement with the Allies. Eisenhower, very perturbed, cabled to Washington emphasizing that existing French sentiment docks not even remotely resemble prior calculation, and it is of utmost importance that no precipitate action be taken which will upset such equilibrium as we have been able to establish. General Smuts who flew to Algiers on his way back from London to South Africa, cabled to Churchill, as regards Darlan, statements published have had unsettling effect on local French leaders, and it would be dangerous to go further on these lines. Nogues has threatened to resign, and as he controls the Moroccan population the results of such a step may be far-reaching. Meanwhile, Darlan had made a definite and detailed agreement with Clark for cooperative action. He also induced the French leaders in West Africa to follow his lead, and make the key port of Dakar, together with the air bases, available to the Allies. But, on Christmas Eve, he was assassinated by a fanatical young man, Bonnier de la Chapelle, who belonged to the Royalist and Gaullist circle, which had been pressing for Darlan's removal from power. That accelerated removal helped to solve the Allies' awkward political problem, and to clear the way for de Gaulle's advent, while the Allies had already reaped the benefit of their deal with Darlan. Churchill's comments in his memoirs, Darlan's murder, however criminal, relieved the Allies of their embarrassment in working with him, and at the same time left them with all the advantages he had been able to bestow during the vital hours of the Allied landings. 
His assassin was promptly tried by court-martial on Giraud's orders, and quickly executed. On the following day the French leaders agreed to choose Giraud as High Commissioner in succession to Darlan. He filled the gap, for a short time. If the Allies had not succeeded in enlisting Darlan's help their problem would have been much tougher than it turned out. For there were nearly 120,000 French troops in North Africa, about 55,000 in Morocco, 50,000 in Algeria, and 15,000 in Tunisia. Although widely spread, they could have provided formidable opposition if they had continued to resist the Allies. The only important respect in which Darlan's aid and authority failed to achieve the desired effect was over bringing the main French fleet across from Toulon to North Africa. Its commander, Admiral de la Borde, hesitated to respond to Darlan's summons without confirming word from Pétain, and a special emissary sent by Darlan to convince him was picked up by the Germans. La Borde's hesitation was prolonged, and his anxiety lulled by the Germans' shrewdness in halting on the outskirts of the naval base and allowing it to remain an unoccupied zone garrisoned by French troops. Meanwhile they prepared a plan for a coup to seize the fleet intact, and launched it on November 27, after blocking the harbour exits with a minefield. But although delay had forfeited the chance of breaking out, the French managed to carry out their prepared plan for scuttling the fleet quickly enough to frustrate the German attempt to capture it, thus fulfilling the assurance that Darlan had given in his initial conference with Clark at Algiers on November 10, in no circumstances will our fleet fall into German hands. The Allies' disappointment that it had not come to North Africa was outweighed by their relief that the danger of it being used against them had vanished with its sinking. Another cause of relief during this critical period, and especially the first few days, was that the Spanish had abstained from any intervention and that Hitler had not attempted to strike back through Spain against the western gateway into the Mediterranean. The Spanish army could have made the harbour and airfield at Gibraltar unusable by artillery fire from Algeciras, and could also have cut communications between Patton's force and the Allied forces in Algeria as the railway from Casablanca to Oran ran close to the border of Spanish Morocco, as close as 20 miles. When torch was being planned, the British had said that if Franco were to intervene it would be impossible to preserve the use of Gibraltar, while Eisenhower's planning staff reckoned that a force of five divisions would be necessary to occupy Spanish Morocco and that the task would take three and a half months. Fortunately Franco was content to stay quiet as a non-belligerent ally of the Axis, and the more contentedly because the Americans were both buying Spanish products and allowing him to obtain oil from the Caribbean. Moreover, the Axis archives show that Hitler, after his earlier experience of Franco's skill in evading his desires for a move through Spain against Gibraltar, did not really consider attempting such a counterstroke in November 1942. The idea was only revived, and then by Mussolini, the following April, when the Axis forces in Tunisia were hard-pressed and an early Allied invasion of Italy was feared. Even then Hitler turned down Mussolini's plea, both because he feared that a move through Spain would be fiercely and stubbornly resisted by his non-belligerent ally, and because he remained confident that the Axis forces could maintain their hold on Tunisia. That confidence of his was bolstered by the remarkable success of the very slender Axis forces sent to Tunisia by the end of November in holding up the Allied advance at that time. Chapter 22, The Race for Tunis The advance on Tunis and Byzata started with a seaborne move, but one of very short extent, to the port of Bagui, about a hundred miles east of Algiers and only a quarter of the distance to Byzata. This was a diminution of the original plan which, assuming full and prompt French cooperation, was to use parachute troops and seaborne commandos to seize the airfields at Bone, Byzada, and Tunis on successive days, November 11, 12, and 13, while a floating reserve of the force landed at Algiers was to sail for, and seize, the port of Bagui and the Jidjali airfield 40 miles beyond the forward base. But in the state of uncertainty after the landing at Algiers, this plan was considered too hazardous, and the more distant moves were dropped. 
Instead, it was decided on the 9th to occupy Bagi and the airfield, and then rush a force to a railhead at Suka as close to the Tunisian border, while a second seaborne and airborne force occupied Bone. On the early evening of the 10th two well-protected convoys sailed from Algiers, carrying the leading brigade group, the 36th, of the British 78th Division, Major General Vivian Eve Leg, and the stores for the expedition. It arrived off Bagi early next morning, but lost time by landing on nearby beaches, in heavy surf, from fear of a hostile reception, although in the event it proved a friendly one. Because of heavy surf unintended landing close to Jidjali was not attempted, and the airfield was not occupied in time to provide effective fighter protection until two days later, so that several ships were destroyed in air raids. Early on the 12th, however, a commando force slipped into the port of Bone and a parachute detachment dropped on the airfield, both being well received by the French there. For maps, CPP. 280. 404, 414. By the 13th the brigade group at Bagi was moving forward, while other elements of the division were advancing overland from Algiers, quickly followed by Blade Force, an armoured column just landed, which was composed of the 17th-21 ST Lancers and attached troops, under Colonel R. A. Hull, it was the leading contingent of the 6th Armoured Division. To pave the way it was planned that on the 15th the British parachute battalion would be dropped ahead at Sukalabu 80 miles from Tunis inside the Tunisian border, and an American parachute battalion near Tebasa to cover the southern flank and secure a forward airfield there. The American drop was carried out as planned, and two days later this battalion, under Colonel E. D. Raff, made an 80 miles bound southeastward to secure the airfield at Gafsa barely 70 miles from the Gulf of Gabes and the bottleneck approach from Tripoli. The British drop was delayed a day because of weather conditions, and the leading ground troops came up so fast that they also reached Sukalaba on the 16th. By then, too, the small Tunisian port of Tabaka, on the road to Bizata, was reached by another column advancing along the coast road. Next day, the 17th, General Anderson gave orders for the 78th Division to advance on Tunis and destroy the Axis forces after completing its forward concentration. That pause to concentrate, however desirable it seemed, was unfortunate in view of the slenderness of the Axis forces that had so far arrived, an understrength parachute regiment of two battalions at Tunis, which had been flown over from Italy on the 11th, and two battalions at Bizata, one of parachute engineers, and one of infantry. On the 16th General Nehring, the former commander of the Africa Corps, who had been badly wounded in the Alam Haifa battle and just recovered, arrived with a solitary staff officer to command this nucleus, some 3,000 troops of what was entitled the 90th Corps. Even at the end of the month it had only the strength of a division. The Germans, without waiting to concentrate, quickly thrust to the westward, and by that boldness disguised their weakness. The French troops in Tunisia, although much more numerous, fell back before them to avoid a premature clash before Allied reinforcements arrived. On the 17th a German parachute battalion, of some 300 men only, under Captain Nock pushed out along the Tunis-Algiers road, and the French group posted the withdrew to the road center of Medjez el Bab. 35 miles west of Tunis, with its important bridge across the Medjida River. Here the French were reinforced on the night of the 18th by elements of blade force, including a British parachute battalion and an American field artillery battalion. The 17th-21 ST Lancers and their tanks had not yet arrived, the leading squadron reached Sukalaba on the 18th, but was not sent forward. At 4 a.m. the French commander in Tunisia, General Barr, was called there to meet a German envoy who presented an ultimatum from Nehring that French troops must withdraw to a line near the border of Tunisia. Barr tried to parley, but the Germans realized that it was merely an attempt to gain time, and early morning reconnaissance spotted the presence of Allied troops. So at 9 a.m. they broke off parleys, 
and a quarter of an hour later opened fire. An hour and a half later German dive bombers came on the scene to add punch to the bluff. Following up the bombing attacks, which shook the defenders badly, the paratroopers made two small ground attacks, and that air of vigorous effect created an exaggerated impression of their strength. The opposing commanders felt that they could not hold out unless further reinforcements came to the rescue, and General Anderson's instructions curbed such aid pending the completion of the Allied concentration for the planned advance on Tunis. After dark Captain Knox sent small parties to swim across the river, and these very effectively simulated an attack with growing strength. The Allied troops fell back from the bridge, leaving it intact. Just before midnight the local British commander called the French commander to his command post and insisted that an immediate withdrawal should be made to a more secure position on the high ground eight miles back. This was done, and the Germans occupied Medjez el Bab. It was a striking example of bluff achieved by boldness by a small detachment less than a tenth of the size of the force in possession. Farther north, Major Witzig's parachute engineer battalion from Bizeta, with some tanks, had pushed west along the coast road, and met the leading battalion of the 36th Infantry Brigade Group, the 6th Royal West Kents, at Jebel Abiod. But although the Germans overran part of the battalion it held on until the rest of the brigade came up to its relief. Meantime smaller German parties, sent south, had secured the key towns on the approach from Tripoli, Sousse, Sfax, and Gabes. Some fifty paratroopers, carried by air, bluffed the French garrison into evacuating Gabes. They were reinforced on the 20th by two Italian battalions marching from Tripoli which arrived just in time to foil an American move on Gabes by Colonel Ruff's paratroopers. On the 22nd a small German armoured column drove the French out of the Central Road Junction at Spitler, and installed an Italian detachment there before returning to Tunis, but this was promptly expelled by another detachment of Ruff's battalion. Nevertheless, Nehring's skeleton force had not only preserved their bridgeheads at Tunis and Bizeta, but extended these into a very large bridgehead embracing most of the northern half of Tunisia. Anderson's planned offensive to capture Tunis did not start until the 25th. During the interval the slender German strength had been trebled, although its close combat component comprised only two small parachute regiments, of two battalions apiece, a battalion of parachute engineers, three infantry draft holding battalions, and two companies of a panzer battalion, the 190th, with 30 tanks. These included a number of the new model Panzer IV with the long 75mm gun, an important asset. Thus the extreme disparity between the Axis and Allied forces had diminished through Anderson's lengthy pause near the border of Tunisia to complete the process of concentration. He himself on the 21st expressed doubt whether his strength was sufficient to gain that objective. So he was hurriedly reinforced with more American units on Eisenhower's orders, particularly Combat Command B of the 1st Armored Division, which came all the way from Moran, 700 miles back, the wheeled and half-track vehicles by road, and the tanks by rail. Only part of this, however, arrived in time for the start of the operation. It was a three-pronged offensive, the 36th Infantry Brigade group on the left near the coast, the much larger blade force in the center, and the 11th Infantry Brigade group on the right along the main highway, each reinforced with American armored and artillery units. The left prong, on the hilly coastal road, started a day late and advanced only six miles on each of the first two days, in a cautious way. Witzig's small battalion of parachute engineers falling back before it. Then on the 28th it pushed on twice as far, but ran into an ambush that Witzig had laid in a pass near Jeffner Station, and the leading battalion was badly mauled. A larger attack on the 30th failed against a strengthened defense, and the attack was then abandoned. That repulse, in turn, led to the failure of an amphibious move by a mixed Anglo-American commando which landed on the coast north of Jeffna early next morning, and blocked the road behind, east of Maytu'er, 
but was driven to withdraw three days later, as no sign of relief had come and its supplies were running low. The center prong was formed by blade force, which had been further strengthened by the inclusion of an American light tank battalion, the 1st Battalion, 1st Armored Regiment, equipped with Stuarts, so that it now had well over a hundred tanks. It thrust forward 30 miles on the 25th to the Chuigui Pass, after breaking through an outpost line held by a small Axis detachment. Next morning, however, a check came from a German detachment, a panzer company of 10 tanks followed by two foot fighting companies, which struck southward from May to Ur. Eight of these tanks were knocked out, most by the American 37mm anti-tank guns but their sacrifice in creating this flank threat led the British higher command to break off blade forces thrust, and distribute this force to cover the flank of the right prong. Both sides were groping in the fog of war but such caution at a crucial moment was in unwise contrast to the Germans' boldness, and all the more because on the previous afternoon a small detachment of blade force had by chance given the German higher command a bad fright. Hull had ordered Lieutenant Colonel John K. Waters, commanding the American Light Tank Battalion, to reconnoitre the bridges across the Medjid River near to Babunjdeba. Company C, under Major Rudolf Barlow, was sent on this mission and thus happened to arrive on the edge of the Jdeedan airfield, newly brought into use. Seeing and seizing the opportunity, Barlow swept over the airfield with his 17 tanks and destroyed some 20 aircraft. In reports it was magnified to 40. This deep penetration, also magnified in the reports that reached Nehring, came as such a shock that he pulled back his forces for a close in defense of Tunis. The Allied right prong, on the main highway, had met an early check in attacking Medjez el Bab, and small counterattacks produced a disorganized retirement. But after nightfall on the 25th Nehring, shaken by the Jdeida raid, ordered the defenders to withdraw, fearing that they might be overwhelmed by a renewed attack. Following them up, the Allied column occupied Tababa, 20 miles further on, in the early hours of the 27th. But after a short advance next day it was abruptly checked at Tzida, 12 miles from Tunis, by a mixed battalion group. A renewed assault on the 29th was also repulsed. General Evleg then advised a pause until further reinforcements came up and closer fighter protection had been provided against the German dive bombers, which had harassed Allied troops increasingly and frayed their nerves. This recommendation was accepted by Anderson, and by Eisenhower. He visited the forward area on those two days, and was greeted by American officers with the constant plaint, where is this bloody air force of ours? Why do we see nothing but Heine's? In his memoirs he remarks, every conversation along the roadside brought out astounding exaggerations about the damage, but it was nonetheless ominous to hear such comments as, our troops will surely have to retreat, humans cannot exist in these conditions. Meanwhile Field Marshal Kesselring, who visited Tunis at the same time, was reproaching Nehring for being too cautious and defensive. He brushed aside arguments about the much larger strength of the Allied forces, and the fact that the inflow of Axis reinforcements was being badly hindered by Allied bombing of the airfields. Criticizing the decision to withdraw from Medjez el Bab, he ordered him to regain the lost ground, as far as Tobabu at least. So, on December 1, a counter thrust was delivered by three panzer companies with some 40 tanks and a few supporting elements including a field battery of three guns and two companies of anti-tank guns. The counter-thrust was aimed, not direct at the force which had attacked Zida, but from the north towards the Chuigui Pass, on the flank, with the intention of swinging round onto its rear near to Baba. The Germans, in two converging columns, first hit blade force, which suffered from being widely distributed in its flank protective role, part of it being overrun and destroyed? Then, in the afternoon, the Germans pushed towards Tababa but were checked by artillery fire and bombing before they reached their objective and got astride the main road. The leading elements of the 10th Panzer Division had just arrived in Tunisia, and included two companies of a fresh Panzer Battalion, 
with 32 Panzeris and two of the new model Panzer Rivs. These two companies were immediately used for the counter thrust along with one company of the Panzer Battalion that had arrived earlier. But their continued pressure produced such a close threat to this artery that the Allies spearhead at Cheda was pulled back to a position near Atababa. On the third the pressure was increased to strangling pitch, and became concentric as nearing through in all the other German detachments that were within reach, leaving only a tiny handful on guard in the city of Tunis. That night the Allies' spearhead force was squeezed out of Tababa, and barely managed to escape, by using a dirt track along the river bank, which entailed the abandonment of much equipment and transport. The Germans in their counterstroke took more than a thousand prisoners, and their bag also included more than fifty tanks. It deserves mention that the recent German reinforcements included five of the new 56-ton Tiger tanks mounting a long 88 mm gun. These monsters were a secret weapon, but Hitler had decided to send a few to Tunis for test in combat, and two of them were attached to the Jdida combat group in this fight for Tababa. In the days that followed, the Allied commanders planned an early renewal of their offensive, with increased strength. But the prospect was soon diminished by Nehring's early action to extend his gains. He now planned to use his small armoured force to recapture Medjez el Bab by a wide outflanking move south of the Medjida River. Here Combat Command B of the US 1st Armoured Division had just been deployed, with a view both to the renewed advance and to keeping it separate from the British, so that it could fight as an integrated team. An advanced detachment was posted at Jebel el Gesser, a piece of high ground southwest of Tababa which overlooked the flat country further south. As a preliminary to their own outflanking move, the Germans attacked this observation point early on December 6, and overran its defenders, who had become disorganized in a hasty attempt to withdraw. Reinforcements had been sent, but were slow in starting, and when they arrived on the scene suffered a costly repulse. This fresh German stroke, and threat, caused the newly arrived commander of the British V Corps, Lieutenant General Alfrey, to order a withdrawal of his troops north of the river, from their position near to the Bata one near Hill 290, which the British had named Longstop Hill, closer to Medjez el Bab. Moreover, he advised along the withdrawal, to a line west of Medjez el Bab. This proposal was endorsed by Anderson but turned down by Eisenhower. Longstop Hill, however, was evacuated. Writing on the 7th to a friend, General Handy, Eisenhower remarked, I think the best way to describe our operations to date is that they have violated every recognized principle of war, are in conflict with all operational and logistic methods laid down in textbooks, and will be condemned in their entirety by all Leavenworth and War College classes for the next 25 years. Resuming their flank thrust on December 10th, with a force including about 30 medium and two Tiger tanks, the Germans were checked two miles short of Medjez el Bab by a well-posted French battery, became temporarily bogged when they tried to move off the road to outflank it, and were then led to withdraw by an American threat to their own rear from a detachment of Combat Command B but they scored an indirect and unforeseen success when Combat Command B started to withdraw after dark from its exposed position became confused, reversed course on a false rumor of German threat, and turned off along a muddy track near the river, where many of its remaining tanks and other vehicles became stuck, and were abandoned. This disaster was temporarily crippling, while very damaging to the prospect of an early resumption of the Allied push for Tunis. For the moment, Combat Command B had only 44 tanks left fit for action, barely a quarter of its full strength. The two German counter-strokes had all too effectively upset the Allies' plan and prospects. Meanwhile Colonel General Jürgen von Arnim had been sent by Hitler to take supreme command of the Axis forces, which were rechristened the 5th Panzer Army. He took over from Nehring on the 9th and, with the arrival of further reinforcements, proceeded to expand the two perimeters covering Tunis and Byzata into a general bridgehead formed by a hundred-mile chain of defense posts, 
and stretching from the coast some 20 miles west of Baiza to Tuenfidavil on the east coast. It was divided into three sectors, the northern one held by the improvised division von Broich, named after its commander, the central one, from west of Tuigui to just beyond Pont du Fars, by the 10th Panzer Division, which had been arriving in driblets, and the southern sector by the Italian Supiga Division. The Allied intelligence estimated the Axis forces in mid-December as about 25,000 fighting troops and 10,000 administrative personnel, with 80 tanks, an estimate which was in excess of the mark. The Allies' effective fighting troops numbered close on 40,000, some 20,000 British, 12,000 American, and 7,000 French, and their total strength was much larger, as their administrative organization was more lavish. Delays in the build-up, partly due to bad weather, led Anderson to postpone the renewal of the offensive. But on the 16th he decided that it should start on the 24th, so as to utilize a full moon for an infantry night assault. It was to be delivered by the British 78th Division and 6th Armoured Divisions, together with part of the US 1st Infantry Division. To gain room for deployment. Preliminary attacks were made to regain Longstop Hill and also Hill 466 on the more northerly line of approach to Tubaba. Both suffered from confusion in bad weather and developed into protracted seesaw battles, so that the main attack had to be postponed. By the 25th the Germans had completely regained their original positions, and, very naturally, now gave Longstop Hill the name Christmas Hill. Already, on Christmas Eve, Eisenhower and Anderson had reluctantly decided to abandon the intended offensive in view of these setbacks and the torrential rain, which was turning the battleground into a morass. The Allies had lost the race for Tunis. Yet, by the irony of luck, this failure turned out one of the biggest blessings in disguise that could have happened. For without such a failure Hitler and Mussolini would not have had the time or encouragement to pour very large reinforcements into Tunisia and build up the defense of that bridgehead to a strength of over a quarter of a million men, who had to fight with an enemy dominated sea at their back, and if defeated would be trapped. When the Axis forces were eventually overwhelmed, in May, the south of Europe was left almost bare so that the follow-up Allied invasion of Sicily in July had an easy run. But for the Allied failure in December which led to that huge bag in May, it is all too probable that the Allied re-entry into Europe would have been repelled. What Churchill was fond of calling the soft underbelly was so mountainous as to be very hard country for an invading force, and only became soft when there was a lack of defenders. Chapter 23 The Tide Turns in the Pacific Japan's offensive aims in the Pacific, to establish what she called the Greater East Asia Go Prosperity Sphere, had been virtually achieved within four months. By that time Malaya and the Dutch East Indies had been completely conquered, as well as Hong Kong, so had almost the entire Philippines and the southern part of Burma. Within another month the surrender of the island fortress of Corregido brought the fall of America's last foothold in the Philippines. A week later the British had been driven out of Burma, back into India, and China was thus cut off from her allies. This vast run of conquest had cost the Japanese only about 15,000 men, 380 aircraft, and four destroyers. After such a series of easy triumphs the Japanese were, naturally, reluctant to change over to the defensive, as their strategic plan ordained. They feared that such a change might bring a gradual decline of fighting spirit, while giving their western opponents, economically much stronger, a breathing space for recovery. The Japanese navy, in particular, was anxious to eliminate the two possible bases for an American comeback in the Pacific, Hawaii and Australia. As they pointed out, the US Navy's carrier force could still operate from Hawaii, while Australia was obviously being turned into a springboard as well as a stronghold. The Japanese army, with its mind still focused on China and Manchuria, was unwilling to release the troops required for such expeditions, which in the case of an expedition to invade Australia would have to be large. It had already declined to cooperate in a plan of the combined fleet staff to take Ceylon. The navy, however, 
hope that by a further successful stroke in either direction it might overcome the army chief's objection and induce them to provide the troops required for one or other of these expeditions, but was itself divided in mind about the best direction. Admiral Yamamoto and the combined fleet staff favored a plan to take Midway Island, 1,100 miles west of Pearl Harbor, as a bait to draw the U.S. Pacific Fleet to action, and crush it. The naval staff, however, preferred a thrust through the Solomon Islands to take New Caledonia, Fiji, and Samoa, and, by capturing this island chain, block the sea routes between America and Australia. A weighty argument for the latter plan, of isolating Australia, was that the Japanese had already gone a long way towards completing the ring. For by the end of March they had advanced from Rabaul into the Solomon Islands as well as into the northern coast of New Guinea. The debate between the alternative naval plans was interrupted, and diverted, by the American air raid on Tokyo, of April 18, 1942. The Tokyo Raid This airstrike at the Japanese capital, the heart of Japan's homeland, was inspired by the idea of retaliation for Pearl Harbor, and planning for it had begun in January. As the distance from any surviving American base was too far, the raid must necessarily be made from naval carriers. But as the Japanese were known to have a picket boat patrol operating 500 miles out from the mainland, the strike aircraft would have to be launched from a distance of about 550 miles, involving an out and back flight of at least 1,100 miles which was too far for naval carrier planes. Moreover the U.S. Navy's few, and precious, carriers would be endangered if they had to wait in the area until the raiding planes returned. So it was decided to use U.S. Army Air Force bombers, of longer range, and also that they should fly westward after bombing Tokyo to land on Chinese airfields. That entailed a flight of more than 2,000 miles, and the ability to take off from carriers. So the B.25 Mitchell was selected. These bombers, with extra fuel tanks fitted, could carry a 2,000 pounds bomber load for 2,400 miles. The pilots, led by Lieutenant Colonel James H. Doolittle, practiced short takeoffs and long overwater flights. Only 16 planes were employed, as they were too large to be stowed below deck, while they had to be allowed sufficient space for the takeoff. On April 2 the carrier selected for the task, Hornet, sailed from San Francisco with its escort of cruisers and destroyers. On the 13th it was joined by Task Force 16, organized round the carrier Enterprise, which was to give air support, as the Hornet's own planes were stowed below deck. Early on the 18th the carrier force was sighted by a Japanese patrol boat while still more than 650 miles from Tokyo. The naval commander, Vice Admiral William F. Halsey, conferred with Doolittle, and they agreed that it would be better to launch the bombers immediately despite the extra distance involved. It proved a wise and fortunate decision. Taking off in a heavy sea between 0815 and 0924, the bombers reached Japan within four hours, catching the defenses by surprise, and dropped their bombs, including incendiaries, on Tokyo, Nagoya, and Kobe. They then flew on to China, aided by a tailwind. Unfortunately, by a misunderstanding, Chuchau Airfield was not ready to receive them, so that the crews had to make a crash landing or drop by parachute. Out of the 82 man total, 70 returned three who did not were executed by the Japanese for bombing civilian targets. The two carriers escaped unhurt, and reached Pearl Harbor on the 25th. Another piece of good fortune was that, despite the patrol boat's warning, the Japanese had expected the raid to come a day later than it did, on the 19th, when, as they reckoned, the carriers would be close enough to launch their naval bombers. By then the air forces would have been ready and Admiral Negumo's carriers would have reached their planned position for a counter-stroke. The prime result of the raid was the fillip it gave to American morale, which had been badly shaken by Pearl Harbor. 
but it also forced the Japanese to keep four army fighter groups at home for the defense of Tokyo and other cities, while another resultant diversion was the dispatch of a punitive expedition of 53 battalions to drive through Chekiang province, where the American bombers had landed. A still more important effect, inherently causing a diversion of strength, was the decision to forestall further raids by undertaking the midway operation as well as the thrust to cut Australia off from America. The dual effort was detrimental to concentration of effort and strength. Under the revised Japanese plan the first move, itself dual, was to be an advance steeper into the Solomon Islands to seize Tilagi as a seaplane base to cover a further leap southeastward, coupled with the capture of Port Moresby on the south coast of New Guinea which would bring Queensland within range of Japanese bombers. Then the combined fleet under Yamamoto was to carry out the occupation of Midway Island and key points in the western Aleutians. After the desired destruction of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, the third move would be a resumption of the advance in the southeast to block the sea routes from America to Australia. The first of these moves led to the Battle of the Coral Sea, the second to the Battle of Midway and the third to the prolonged and intense struggle for good Alcanal, the large island close to Tulagi. Unironical, and indirect, effect of this diverse Japanese plan was that it helped to cement a split in American planning and command arrangements. At the beginning of April the United States had assumed responsibility for the whole Pacific area, except Sumatra, while the British would remain responsible for Sumatra and the Indian Ocean area. China was a separate theater of war, under American tutelage. The American sphere was divided in two, the Southwest Pacific area under General MacArthur, whose headquarters were now established in Australia, and the Pacific Ocean area under Admiral Chester W. Nimitz. Both were strong and forceful men, likely to clash. The Japanese plan provided ample call on, and scope for, the activity of each. Moreover the borderline between their respective spheres came in the Solomon Islands, where the Japanese amphibious threat required the conjoint use of MacArthur's ground forces and Nimitz's naval forces. Thus they had to develop a working arrangement. The Battle of the Coral Sea The Japanese ground and air forces for the first move assembled at Rabaul in New Britain and the naval forces at Truk in the Caroline Islands, a thousand miles to the north. Behind the amphibious groups destined for the two invasions lay a carrier striking force ready to beat off any American intervention. It comprised the carriers Zuikaku and Shikaku, with an escort of cruisers and destroyers, and carried 125 naval aircraft, 42 fighters and 83 bombers. A further 150 aircraft at Rabaul could aid it. American intelligence, the Allies' chief advantage had discovered the main threads of the Japanese plan, and Admiral Nimitz sent all his available forces southward, the carriers Yorktown and Lexington from Pearl Harbor, with 141 aircraft, 42 fighters, 99 bombers, and two groups of cruisers to escort them. The two other American carriers, Enterprise and Hornet, returning from their part in the Tokyo raid, were also ordered to hurry down to the Coral Sea but arrived too late for the battle. On May 3 the Japanese landed on Tulagi and took that island unopposed, as the small Australian garrison, forewarned, had been withdrawn. At that moment the Lexington was refueling at sea while the Yorktown under Rear Admiral Fletcher was farther away from the scene. But the next day it launched a number of strikes when about 100 miles distant from Tulagi. These had little effect beyond sinking a Japanese destroyer. The Yorktown was fortunate in escaping retaliation. For the two Japanese carriers had been sent to deliver a handful of fighter planes to Rabaul, sent off the scene merely to save an extra ferrying mission. It was the start of a series of mistakes or misunderstandings on both sides from which the Americans eventually profited on balance. Admiral Takagi's carrier group now came south passing to the east of the Solomons and round into the Coral Sea, hoping to take in rear the American carrier force. Meanwhile the Lexington had joined the Yorktown and the two were steering north to intercept the Japanese invasion force that was on the way to Port Moresby. 
On May 6, the black day of Karajidores surrender, the opposing carrier groups searched for one another without making contact, although at one time they were only 70 miles apart. Early on the 7th the Japanese searching planes reported that they had spotted a carrier and a cruiser, whereupon Takagi promptly ordered an all-out bombing attack on the ships, and speedily sank both. But, actually, they were only a tanker and escorting destroyer, so that time and effort were wasted. That evening Tugaki tried another and lesser strike, but the result was that 20 of the 27 planes he employed were lost. Meanwhile Fletcher's carrier aircraft, likewise led astray by a false report, expended their effort in an attack upon the close covering force of the Port Moresby invasion. In this stroke they sank the light carrier Shoho, and did so in ten minutes, one of the quickest sinkings on record in the entire war. A more important effect was that the Japanese were led to postpone the invasion and order their force to turn back. It was an ironical benefit from the mistake of attacking the wrong ship. It was, also, one of several blind shots that day. On the morning of May 8 the two opposing carrier forces at last came to grips. The two sides were closely matched, the Japanese having 121 aircraft and the Americans 122, while their escorts were almost equal in strength four heavy cruisers and six destroyers on the Japanese side, five heavy cruisers and seven destroyers on the American side. The Japanese, however, were moving in a belt of cloud while the Americans had to operate under a clear sky. The primary consequence of this was that the carriers Uikaku escaped attention. The Shikaku, however, suffered three bomb hits and had to be withdrawn from the battle. On the other side, the Lexington suffered two torpedo hits and two bomb hits, and subsequent internal explosions compelled the abandonment of this much cherished ship, which sailors called the Lady Lex. The nimble Yorktown escaped with only one bomb hit. In the afternoon, Nimitz ordered the carrier force to withdraw from the Coral Sea, and the more readily as the threat to Port Moresby had vanished for the time being. The Japanese also retired from the scene in the mistaken belief that both the American carriers had been sunk. In absolute losses the Americans came off slightly better in aircraft, 74 compared with over 80, while their loss in men was only 543 compared with over a thousand, but they had lost a fleet carrier whereas the Japanese had lost only a light carrier. More important, the Americans had thwarted their enemy's strategic object, the capture of Port Moresby in New Guinea and now by a superiority in technical achievement they managed to repair the Yorktown in time for the next stage of the Pacific conflict, whereas neither of the two Japanese carriers in the Coral Sea fight could be got ready for use in the second and more decisive fight. The Battle of the Coral Sea was the first in history fought out between fleets that never came in sight of one another, and at ranges that had been extended, from the battleship's extreme limit of about 20 miles, to a hundred miles and more. A greater repetition was soon to follow. The Battle of Midway. Imperial General Headquarters in Japan had already set this next stage going by its order of May 5. The plan produced by the combined fleet staff was extraordinarily comprehensive and elaborate, but lacking in flexibility. Almost the entire navy was to be used in the operation. The total of some 200 ships included 8 carriers, 11 battleships, 22 cruisers, 65 destroyers, 21 submarines. They were assisted by more than 600 aircraft. Admiral Nimitz could scrape together only 76 ships, and of these a third, belonging to the North Pacific Force, never came into the battle. For the main, the midway operation. The Japanese employed, one, an advanced submarine force, patrolling in three cordons, and intended to cripple American naval counter moves, two, an invasion force under Admiral Kondo of twelve escorted transports, carrying five thousand troops, with close support by four heavy cruisers, and more distant cover from a force comprising two battleships, one light carrier and a further four heavy cruisers, three, Negumo's first carrier force of four fleet carriers, carrying over 250 planes, 
escorted by two battleships, two heavy cruisers and a destroyer screen, 4, the main battle fleet under Yamamoto, comprising three battleships, with a destroyer screen, and one light carrier. One of the battleships was the recently built giant, the Yamato, of 70,000 tons and mounting nine 18-inch guns. For the Aleutians operation the Japanese allotted, 1, an invasion force of three escorted transport, carrying 2,400 troops, with a support group of two heavy cruisers, 2, a carrier force of two light carriers, 3, a covering force of four older battleships. The battle was to open in the Aleutians, with their strikes against Dutch Harbour on June 3, followed by landings at three points on the 6th. Meanwhile, on the 4th, Negumo's carrier planes were to attack the airfield on Midway, and next day Curatol, 60 miles to the west, was to be occupied for a seaplane base. On the 6th, cruisers would bombard Midway, and the troops be landed, the invasion being covered by Kondo's battleships. The Japanese expectation was that there would be no American ships in the Midway area until after the landing and their hope was that the U.S. Pacific Fleet would hurry northward as soon as news came of the opening air strike in the Aleutians. That would enable them to trap it between their two carrier forces. But in pursuing this strategic aim, the destruction of the American carriers, the Japanese handicapped themselves by their tactical arrangements. Because of the favorable moon conditions of early June, Yamamoto was unwilling to wait until the Zuikaku had replaced her aircraft losses in the Coral Sea and could reinforce the other carriers. As for the eight available carriers, two were sent to the Aleutians and two more were accompanying battleship groups. At the same time, fleet movements were tied to the speed of slow troop transports. Moreover, it is hard to see the point of a diversionary move to the Aleutians if the Japanese main object was the destruction of the American carriers, and not merely the capture of Midway. Worst of all, by committing themselves to the capture of a fixed point at a fixed time, the Japanese forfeited strategic flexibility. On the American side, Admiral Nimitz's main worry was the Japanese superiority of force. Since the Pearl Harbor disaster he had no battleships left, and after the Coral Sea battle only two carriers fit for action, the Enterprise and the Hornet. But by an astonishing effort they were increased to three through the repair of the Yorktown in two days instead of an estimated 90. Nimitz's one great, and offsetting, advantage was the superiority of his means and supply of information. The three American carriers with their 233 planes, were stationed well to the north of Midway, so as to be out of sight of Japanese reconnoitering planes, while they could count on getting early word of Japanese movements from their long-range Catalinas based in Midway. Thus they hoped to make a flank attack on the Japanese forces. On June 3, the day after the carriers were in position, Air reconnaissance sighted the slow-moving Japanese transports 600 miles west of Midway. Gaps in the search patterns flown by Japanese aircraft allowed the American carriers to approach unseen, from the northeast. They were also helped by the belief of Yamamoto and Nagumo that the U.S. Pacific Fleet would not be at sea. Early on June 4, Nagumo launched a strike by 108 of his aircraft against Midway while a further wave of similar size was being prepared to attack any warships sighted. The first wave did much damage to installations on Midway, with little loss to itself, but reported to Nagumo that there was need for a second attack. Since his own carriers were being bombed by planes from Midway, he felt that there was still need to neutralize the island's airfields, so ordered his second wave to change from torpedoes to bombs for this purpose as there was still no sign of the American carriers. Shortly afterwards, a group of American ships was reported about 200 miles away, although it was at first thought to consist only of cruisers and destroyers. But at 0820 came a rather more precise report saying that the group included a carrier. This was an awkward moment for Nagumo, as most of his torpedo bombers were now equipped with bombs, and most of his fighters were on patrol. He had, also, 
to recover the aircraft returning from the first strike at midway. Nevertheless, the change of course northeastward which Neguma made on receiving the news helped him to avoid the first wave of dive bombers dispatched against him from the American carriers. And when three successive waves of torpedo bombers, relatively slow machines, attacked the Japanese carriers between 0930 and 1024, 35 of the 41 used were shot down by the Japanese fighters or anti-aircraft guns. At that moment the Japanese felt that they had won the battle. But two minutes later 37 American dive bombers from the Enterprise, under Lieutenant Commander Clarence W. McCluskey, swooped down from 19,000 feet, so unexpectedly that they met no opposition. The Japanese fighters that had just shot down the third wave of torpedo bombers had no chance to climb and counterattack. The carrier Akagi, Negumo's flagship, was hit by bombs which caught its planes changing their own projectiles and exploded many of the torpedoes, compelling the crew to abandon ship. The carrier Kaga suffered bomb hits that destroyed her bridge and set her on fire from stem to stern, she eventually sank in the evening. The carrier Soru suffered three hits with half-ton bombs from the Yorktown's dive bombers, which now arrived on the scene, and was abandoned within twenty minutes. The only still intact fleet carrier, the Heru, struck back at the Yorktown and hit her so badly in the afternoon as to cause her abandonment. She was weakened by the damage, hastily repaired, that she had suffered in the Coral Sea battles. But 24 American dive bombers, including 10 from the Yorktown, caught the Heru in the late afternoon and hit her so severely that she had to be abandoned in the early hours of the 5th, and sank at 0900 hours. This battle of the 4th of June saw the most extraordinarily quick change of fortune known in naval history and also showed the chanciness of battles fought out in the new style by long-range sea air action. Admiral Yamamoto's first reaction to the news of the disaster to his carrier force was to bring up his battleships, while bringing back his two light carriers from the Aleutians, still in the hope of fighting a sea battle more in the old style to restore the prospect. But the subsequent news of the loss of the Haru, and Negumo's gloomy reports, led to a change of mind, and early on the 5th Yamamoto decided to suspend the attack on Midway. He still hoped to draw the Americans into a trap, by withdrawing westward, but was foiled by the fine combination of boldness with caution shown by Admiral Raymond de Spruance, who commanded the two American carriers Enterprise and Hornet in this crucial battle. Meantime, the Japanese attack on the Aleutian Islands in the North Pacific had been delivered as planned early on June 3, when the two light carriers allotted for the operation launched 23 bombers, with 12 fighters, against Dutch Harbour. It was too small a force for serious effect except by luck, and did little damage, as cloud obscured the ground. A repetition next day, in clearer weather, achieved some hits but nothing drastic. Then on June 5 the carriers were called southward to help in the main operation. On the 7th, however, the small seaborne force of Japanese troops landed on, and captured unopposed, two of the three islands, Kiska and Itu, which had been assigned as objectives. Japanese propaganda made the most of this minor achievement, to offset the crucial failure at midway. Superficially, the capture of these points looked an important gain, as the Aleutian chain of islands stretching across the North Pacific lay close to the shortest route between San Francisco and Tokyo. But in reality these bleak and rocky islands, often covered in fog or battered by storms, were quite unsuitable as air or naval bases for a trans-Pacific advance either way. In sum, the operations of June 1942 were a crushing defeat for the Japanese. They had lost in the Midway Battle itself four fleet carriers and some 330 aircraft, most of which went down with the carriers, as well as a heavy cruiser, whereas the Americans lost only one carrier and about 150 aircraft. The dive bombers had been the key weapon on the American side, in contrast, over 90% of the torpedo bombers had been shot down while the large B.17 bombers of the army had proved quite ineffective against ships. Beside the basic strategic errors earlier mentioned, 
The Japanese also suffered from other handicapping faults of various kinds. Among command faults was Yamamoto's virtual isolation, on the bridge of the battleship Yamato, Negumo's loss of nerve, and the naval tradition that led Yamaguchi and other leaders to go down with their ships instead of seeking to recover the initiative. Nimitz, by remaining on shore, was able to keep an overall grip on the strategic situation, in contrast to Yamamoto. Japanese troubles were multiplied by a string of tactical errors, the failure to fly sufficient search planes to spot the American carriers, lack of fighter cover at high altitude, poor fire precautions, striking with the planes of all four carriers, which meant that they had to recover and rearm their aircraft at the same time, so that there was a period when their carrier force had no striking power, steering towards the enemy when the changes were taking place which gave the American planes the chance to locate Negumo's force more easily and to hit it before it could hit back or even defend itself with its fighters. Most of these faults could be traced to complacent overconfidence. Once the Japanese had lost these four fleet carriers, and their well-trained air crews, their continued preponderance in battleships and cruisers counted for little. These ships could only venture out in areas that could be covered by their own land-based aircraft, and the Japanese defeat in the long struggle for good Alcan was principally due to lack of air control. The Battle of Midway gave the Americans an invaluable breathing space until, at the end of the year, their new Essex-class fleet carriers began to become available. Thus it can reasonably be said that Midway was the turning point that spelt the ultimate doom of Japan the Southwest Pacific after Midway. Even so, although the outcome of the Midway battle severely handicapped, and, indeed, curbed, the Japanese advance in the Southwest Pacific, it did not halt it. While the Japanese could no longer use their fleet to press their advance, they still chose to continue it, and in a two-pronged way, in New Guinea, by overland attack across the Papuan Peninsula in the east of that vast island, and in the Solomons by a process of hopping from island to island, establishing airfields along the chain to cover successive short hops. New Guinean Papua When the Japanese entered the war in December 1941, most of Australia's operational forces were fighting with the British Eighth Army in North Africa, although they were to be recalled when the emergency developed. In New Guinea, so menacingly close to Australia itself, the only considerable force was one of brigade size posted at Port Moresby, the capital of Papua, on the south coast. The very small Australian garrisons on the north coast, as well as in the Bismarck Archipelago and the Solomons, were withdrawn as soon as the Japanese approached. But it was considered essential to hold on to Port Moresby, because Japanese air attacks from the could have reached Queensland itself on the Australian mainland. The Australian people were, naturally, sensitive to such a threat. Early in March 1942, the Japanese, from Rabaul, had landed at Leon the north coast of New Guinea, close to the Papuan Peninsula. But, as already related, their seaborne expeditionary force to capture Port Moresby was turned back in consequence of the otherwise indecisive Battle of the Coral Sea in May. Meanwhile General Douglas MacArthur had been appointed Allied Commander-in-Chief of the Southwest Pacific Area. And after the Battle of Midway early in June, the Allied position became much more secure, directly as well as indirectly, since most of the Australian troops had by now returned home, and new divisions were being formed, while the United States had placed two divisions and eight air groups in Australia. In Papua, too. Australia's strength was increased to more than the size of a division, two brigades at Port Moresby, and a third at Milne Bay on the eastern tip of the peninsula, while two battalions were pushing forward over the Kokoda Trail to Bunna, on the north coast, with the aim of establishing an airbase that to provide cover for the planned amphibious advance by the Allies westward along the coast of New Guinea. But on July 21 this move was forestalled, and the apparently fading Japanese threat revived, when the Japanese landed near Bunna, with some 2,000 men, as part of their renewed attempt to capture Port Moresby, this time by overland attack. The Allies had a further shock when, 
On the 29th, the Japanese took Kokoda, nearly halfway across the peninsula, and by mid-August, with a force built up to a strength of over 13,000 men, they were pressing the Australians back along the jungle track. But although the peninsula here was little more than a hundred miles wide, the trail had to cross the Owen Stanley Mountains, at a point 8,500 feet high, and the growing difficulties of supply across such difficult terrain, naturally worse for the attacking side, were multiplied by Allied air attacks. Within a month the Japanese advance was brought to a halt some 30 miles short of its objective. Meantime, a smaller Japanese force, of 1,200 men, reinforced to 2,000, had landed in Milne Bay on August 25, and succeeded in reaching the edge of the airstrip there after five days fierce fighting, but was then counter-attacked by the Australians and driven to re-embark. By mid-September MacArthur had concentrated in Papua the bulk of the 6th and 7th Australian divisions, and an American regiment, ready to take the offensive. On the 23rd General Sir Thomas Blamey, the Australian Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Land Forces, Southwest Pacific, arrived at Port Moresby to take control of the operations. His forces in their turn met fierce resistance as they strove to fight their way back to Kokoda, and on to Bunna, but their difficulties of supply were eased by increasing use of air transport. By the end of October the Japanese were dislodged from the last of the three successive positions they had constructed near Templeton's Crossing, at the top of the range, and on November 2 the Australians reoccupied Kokoda, reopening the airfield there. The Japanese tried to make a fresh stand on the Kumusi River, but their defence was overcome with the aid of bridging material dropped by air and the flank threat of fresh Australian and American troops who were brought forward by air to the north coast. Nevertheless the Japanese managed to make a prolonged final stand around Bunna throughout December, and it was not until further Allied reinforcements had arrived, by sea and air, that the last pocket of Japanese resistance on the coast was liquidated, on January 21, 1943. In the six months campaign they had lost over 12,000 men. The Australian battle casualties were 5,700 and the American 2,800, a total of 8,500, while they had suffered three times as many from sickness in the tropical damp heat and malarial jungles. They had proved, however, that they could successfully fight the Japanese even in such appalling jungle conditions, and that air power in all its varied forms provided a decisive advantage. Good Alcan. The Guadalcan campaign developed from the mutual, and natural, desire of General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz to exploit the midway victory by a speedy changeover from the defensive to the counteroffensive in the Pacific. Their desire was backed by their respective chiefs in Washington, General Marshall and Admiral King, insofar as such an offensive could be reconciled with the grand strategy, agreed with the British, of beat Germany first. For any early counter-offensive the only feasible area was the Southwest Pacific, and on that all were agreed. But a conflict of opinion arose, also quite naturally, as to who should direct and command the counter-offensive. Now that enemy pressure on the Hawaiian Islands, in the Central Pacific, had been not only relieved but removed, the Navy became all the more eager to play its full part in what basically had to be an amphibious operation. It was only with reluctance that Admiral King had accepted the policy of tackling Germany first and building up American strength in Britain for that purpose. British arguments against an early cross-channel attack, in 1942, had caused Marshall to veer round towards the idea of giving the Pacific priority, and King was delighted to welcome such a change of view, even if it were no more than temporary, and unlikely to be endorsed by President Roosevelt as a definite change of policy. But agreement about a change over to the offensive in the Southwest Pacific immediately sharpened the argument as to who should be in charge of it, and in the last part of June the debate became passionate. The outcome was a compromise, expressed in the Joint Chiefs of Staff Directive of July 2, inspired by Marshall. The offensive was to be carried out in three stages, the first being the occupation of the Santa Cruz Islands and the Eastern Solomons 
especially Talagi and Guadalcanal. For this purpose the boundary between the zones was shifted, so that this area came under Nimitz, who would therefore conduct the first stage of the offensive. The second stage would be the capture of the rest of the Solomons, and of the New Guinea coast as far as the Huon Peninsula, just beyond Lee, while the third stage would be the capture of Rabaul, the main Japanese base in the southwest Pacific, and the rest of the Bismarck archipelago, these two stages falling to MacArthur's direction under the redistribution of zones. The plan under this compromise did not please MacArthur who, immediately after the Midway victory, advocated a speedy and large-scale attack on Rabaul, confidently predicting that he could quickly capture it, with the rest of the Bismarcks, and drive the Japanese back to truck, in the 700 miles distant Caroline Islands. But he was brought to recognize that he could not hope to obtain the force he considered necessary, a marine division and two carriers, in addition to the three infantry divisions he already had. So the compromise three-stage plan was adopted, and took much longer to complete than any of the leaders had expected. The Allies' plan, for capturing the Eastern Solomons, was forestalled, as it had been in Papua. On July 5 reconnaissance planes reported that the Japanese had moved some forces from Tulagi to the larger nearby island of Guadalcanal, 90 miles long and 25 miles wide, and were building an airstrip at Lunga Point, this later came to be called Henderson Field. The obvious danger of Japanese bombers operating from the caused an immediate reconsideration of American strategy, and Guadalcanal itself became the primary objective. With its backbone of wooded mountains, heavy rainfall, and unhealthy climate it was not a favorable objective for any campaign. The overall strategic direction of the operation, under Nimitz, was entrusted to Vice Admiral Robert L. Gormley, the area C.N.C., while Rear Admiral Fletcher was in tactical command of it, he also controlled the three covering carrier groups built around the Enterprise, Saratoga, and Wasp respectively. Land-based air support came from Port Moresby, Queensland, and various island airstrips. The landing force, commanded by Major General Alexander A. Van de Grift, comprised the 1st Marine Division and a regiment of the 2nd, totaling 19,000 Marines carried in 19 transports, with escorts. No sign of the enemy was seen as the Armada approached and early on August 7 the air and naval bombardment opened, while the landings began at 0900 hours. By evening 11,000 marines were ashore, and the airfield was occupied next morning, it was found to be nearly completed. The 2,200 Japanese on Guadalcanal, who were largely construction workers, had mostly fled into the jungle. On Tulagi, the Japanese garrison of 1,500 troops had put up a tougher resistance, and it was not until the second evening that they were overcome and wiped out, by the 6,000 marines who had landed there. Japanese reaction was prompt, and, ironically, all the quicker because reports had led the Japanese to believe that the American landing force was only a fraction of its actual numbers. Thus they did not pause to prepare an adequate response but sent off a series of reinforcing driblets, repeatedly increased, so that what the two sides had conceived as a swift stroke and counter-stroke developed into a protracted campaign. The Japanese naval escorts were stronger, however, and their successive advances produced a series of momentous naval clashes. The first of these, and the worst for the Americans, was the Battle of Savo Island, off the northwest coast of Guadalcanal. On the evening of August 7 Vice Admiral Mikawa, the Japanese commander-in-chief at Rabaul, assembled a force of five heavy cruisers, with two light cruisers, and set off for Guadalcanal. Slipping undetected next day through what was called the slot, the narrow waters between the two chains of the Solomons, he approached Sivo Island in the evening, just after Fletcher had withdrawn the American carriers because their fuel and fighter strength were running short. Although the Allied cruiser and destroyer force had taken up precautionary dispositions for the night, cooperation and watchkeeping were poor. In the early hours of the morning Mikawa took by surprise in turn its southerly and northerly groups, 
and within an hour was steaming back through the slot, leaving behind four allied heavy cruisers sunk or sinking, and one badly damaged, five out of five, while his own were almost undamaged. The Japanese profited greatly from their superior skill at night fighting, helped by their superior optical instruments, and especially their 24-inch long lance torpedoes. It was one of the worst defeats that the U.S. Navy suffered at sea in the war. Fortunately for the Allies, Mikawa did not complete his mission by destroying the mass of transport and supply ships lying defenseless in Lunga roads, being unaware that the Allied carriers had been withdrawn, and thus expecting early counterattack from the air if he did not quickly regain the relative shelter of the slot. Moreover, he did not know that the American landing on Guadalcanal was on any such large scale as it actually was. A commander should be judged in the light of the information he has at the moment he makes his decisions. But all that remained of the Allied naval forces withdrew southward that afternoon to avoid further attack, although less than half the Marines' supplies of food and ammunition had been unloaded by then. Troop rations were reduced to two meals a day and for the next two weeks the marines were isolated, without naval support and also without air cover until Henderson Field was brought into use on the 20th with the arrival of the first squadrons of marine aircraft. Even then, such air cover was narrowly limited. The Japanese forfeited the opportunity largely because they still greatly underestimated the strength of the marine force landed on Guadalcanal, estimating it at 2,000 men and assuming that a force of 6,000 would be sufficient to overcome them and regain the island. They sent off two advanced detachments, totaling 1,500 men, carried in destroyers, which landed east and west of Lunga Point on August 18. These attacked without waiting for the follow-up convoy, and were promptly wiped out by the Marines. The follow-up convoy, of only 2,000 men, sailed from Rabaul on the 19th. While small in itself, it was given strong naval aid, being intended as a bait to draw the U.S. fleet into a trap, as had been the idea at Midway. The advance was led by the light carrier Ruo, itself part of the bait, while behind came two battleships and three cruisers under Admiral Kondo, and behind them the fleet carriers Zuikaku and Shikaku under Admiral Nagumo. This baited plan led to what was called the Battle of the Eastern Solomons but not to the achievement of the trap that the Japanese intended. For Admiral Gormley received timely warning of their approach from Coast Watchers, an organization composed mostly of Royal Australian Navy intelligence officers and local planters. He concentrated three naval task forces southeast of Guadalcanal, built round the carrier's enterprise, Saratoga, and Wasp. The Ruo was sighted on the morning of the 24th and sunk in the afternoon by aircraft from the American carriers. Meanwhile the two Japanese fleet carriers had also been sighted, so that when the expected attacks came from them the American carriers had their full fighter strength in the air to meet them, and took heavy toll, knocking out over 70 of 80 enemy planes employed, and losing only 17 of their own. The Enterprise was the only ship that suffered any serious damage. After this indecisive battle the Japanese fleet retired during the night, and so did the American. After this ineffectual naval effort there was a lull, except on land, where the weak Japanese forces made unsuccessful efforts to reach Henderson Field, being beaten off by the Marines, although they so fought to the death that almost all of them were killed. But they were replaced by a series of small detachments brought along by destroyers, in such regular succession that the process came to be called by the Marines the Tokyo Express. Thereby the Japanese ground strength on Guadalcanal was steadily increased, a further 6,000 men being shuttled there by early September. On the night of September 13-14 this force fiercely attacked the Marines' position, which came to be called Bloody Ridge, but all its attacks were repelled, and its loss was over 1,200 men. Meanwhile, however, the U.S. Navy in that area was badly depleted by the loss of the carriers Saratoga and Wasp to Japanese submarine attacks, the former badly damaged and the latter sunk. As the Enterprise was still under repair, this left only the Hornet to provide air cover. 
After the failure of the earlier Japanese attempts to retake Guadalcanal, Imperial General Headquarters issued a new directive on September 18 that gave this campaign priority to the one in New Guinea. But the Japanese still greatly underestimated the size of the Marine force there, putting it as no more than 7,500, and on this calculation reckoned that the dispatch of a division would suffice, in cooperation with the temporary use of their combined fleet. The preliminary seaborne move of the first reinforcing contingent led to another naval battle off the coast of Guadalcanal, on October 11-12. In this fight, called the Battle of Cape Esperance, the respective losses were not heavy but on balance favorable to the Americans, which came as a moral tonic. During the battle, however, the Japanese managed to land reinforcements that brought their total of troops up to 22,000. At the same time the Americans brought their strength up to 23,000, with 4,500 more on Tulagi. Even so, mid-October was the most critical period of the campaign for them, particularly when a bombardment from two Japanese battleships plowed up Henderson Field, set fuel stocks on fire, and reduced the number of their planes there from 90 to 42, while they also forced the U.S. Army's heavy bombers to fly back to the New Hebrides. Repeated Japanese bombing attacks were another strain, while the humid heat and inadequate diet were taking a heavy toll. On October 24 the Japanese land offensive developed, having been delayed by torrential rain and the dense jungle. The main attack came up from the south, but the marines were well posted in their defensive position and their artillery was well handled. The Japanese were beaten off their losses running into thousands compared with a few hundred on the American side, and by the 26th they were driven to retreat, leaving behind about 2,000 dead. Meanwhile the combined fleet under Yamamoto had advanced with two fleet carriers, two light carriers, four battleships, 14 cruisers, and 44 destroyers, and cruised to the northeast of the Solomons, awaiting the expected news that Henderson Field had been captured by the army. On the American side, the naval strength was barely half, despite the arrival of the new battleship South Dakota and several cruisers. In battleships, there was only one against four. But the carrier Hornet had now been reinforced by the repaired Enterprise, and that was more important in modern naval terms. Fresh figure also came with the appointment of Admiral Halsey to replace the overtired Gormley. The two fleets clashed on October 26 in what was called the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, a battle once again dominated by air action on either side. The Hornet was sunk and the Enterprise damaged, while on the other side the Shikaku was badly damaged and also the light carriers Uiho, before the two fleets retired from the scene on the 27th. But in planes lost the Japanese suffered much the worse, 70 of them failed to return, and in the 10-day period culminating in this battle they lost 200, to add to the 300 they had lost since the last week of August. Moreover the Americans soon received a reinforcement of over 200 planes, as well as the rest of the 2nd Marine Division and part of the American Division. Nevertheless the Japanese were also reinforced sufficiently to resume their efforts, impelled by pride and also gulled by absurdly optimistic reports of the damage they had inflicted. These efforts led to the two clashes known as the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal. The first took place in the early hours of Friday November 13, and although it lasted barely half an hour, the Americans had two cruisers sunk while the Japanese battleship Hiwai was so badly crippled that it had to be scuttled next day, the first Japanese battleship lost in the war. The second part of this naval battle came on the night of the 14th-15th, and with roles reversed, when the Japanese tried to bring down a reinforcement of 11,000 troops in a convoy with a large destroyer escort under the indomitable Rear Admiral Tanaka, covered by Admiral Kondo's heavier ships. Seven of the transports were sunk in the approach, and although the other four reached Guadalcan they were smashed by air attack in the morning so that only 4,000 of the troops were landed, and very few of the urgently needed supplies. In the accompanying naval battle, the American destroyers suffered badly, but then Kondo's remaining battleship, the Kairishima, was crippled when, at midnight, 
The radar-controlled guns of the U.S. battleship Washington opened fire on it at a range of 8,400 yards, and hit it so devastatingly that it was put out of action within seven minutes, and soon had to be scuttled. Meanwhile on land the Marines and the other American troops, having now the advantage in supplies, had gone over to the offensive, and were expanding their perimeter. By the end of the month the American air strength on the island had risen to 188, and the Japanese no longer dared to ship either reinforcements or supplies by slow convoy. In December they were reduced to sending driblets of both in submarines. The Japanese navy had suffered so heavily that its chief surged the abandonment of Guadalcanal, but the army chiefs, who had now assembled 50,000 troops at Rabaul, were still hoping to send them to reinforce the 25,000 now on the island. Meanwhile, however, the Americans had built up their strength on Guadalcanal to over 50,000 by January 7, 1943, which were now well supplied, while the Japanese, who had been reduced to one-third of normal rations, were so weakened by hunger and malaria that they could not hope to take the offensive tenaciously as they still fought on the defensive. So on January 4th Imperial GHQ reluctantly faced realities, and gave the order for them to be gradually evacuated. Unaware of this decision, the Americans pushed forward cautiously, so that the Japanese were able to take away all their troops in three moves, starting on the night of February 1st and completed on the night of February 7th, losing only one destroyer in the process. On balance, however, the prolonged struggle for Guadalcanal was a very serious defeat for Japan. She had lost some 25,000 men, including 9,000 from hunger and disease, while American losses were much smaller. Worse still she had lost at least 600 planes, with their trained crews. At the same time America's strength in all spheres was continually increasing, as her mobilization of manpower and industry got into its stride. Burma May 1942 May 1943, the riposte miscarries. By May 1942, with the British withdrawal from Burma into India, the Japanese had achieved the planned limit of their expansion in Southeast Asia, so they changed over to the defensive and sought to consolidate their conquests. Meanwhile the British made plans for a comeback when the next dry season came, in November 1942. None of them proved feasible, because of logistical difficulties. And the only one even attempted, the very limited Arakan offensive, resulted in a disastrous failure. The crucial area logistically, Assam and Bengal, had never been regarded or planned as a military base area. Airfields, depots, roads railways, and pipelines all had to be built, ports enlarged, and the whole region reorganized. First of the major difficulties facing the India command was shipping, as most of its needs had to come from overseas. But all other theaters of war had priority, and little shipping was left for India, even when threatened with invasion, after providing for the Atlantic and Arctic convoys, the Mediterranean and Pacific theaters. The amount allotted for India was only about one-third of what was necessary for the build-up of the area as the springboard for an offensive. Internal transport was also a major difficulty. The road and rail systems of northeast India were old and haphazard. They required great improvement before the supplies coming from Calcutta and the other ports could be carried to the front line. Shortages of all kinds hampered the progress of the work. So did the monsoons, which caused landslides and carried away bridges. Japanese air aids also contributed, while labor troubles and political unrest were worse hindrances, particularly the widespread disorder and risks that followed the failure of the Crips mission in the late summer of 1942, when the Indian Congress called for a civil disobedience campaign. This was fermented by pro-Japanese elements as well as by the worsening economic situation in India. The worst handicap of all was the lack of locomotives, Wavell had begged for at least 185, but was given four. Yet the logistical problem had been vastly multiplied by the decision that India was to be built up as a base, to hold 34 divisions and 100 air squadrons. 
over a million men were employed in building the 220 new airfields, thus greatly reducing the labor force available for other projects, of which road building was the primary need. Moreover the Sapoli problem was increased by the need to feed 400,000 civilian refugees from Burma. Although the Indian command now comprised a large number of divisions, most of them were newly formed ones produced by the wartime expansion of the Indian Army, they lacked equipment and training, as well as experienced officers and NCOS the few that had some battle experience were exhausted and depleted not only by the Burma campaign but by the ravages of malaria, while they had lost most of their equipment in the retreat. Only three of some fifteen divisions nominally available were in any respect fit for operations in the near future. Administrative problems were accentuated by command problems, especially with the Chinese forces which had withdrawn into India, with the 10th U.S. Army Air Force, and with the prickly General Stilwell. Another crucial factor was the need for air superiority, to protect India itself, to ensure continual supplies to China and to provide the air cover essential for the success of any attempt to reconquer Burma. Fortunately, as soon as the monsoon had come, in May 1942, the Japanese had sent a large number of their aircraft to help the Southwest Pacific campaigns, and had given the remainder a period of rest. That enabled the Allies to build up their own air strength and comparative peace. By September, 1942 there were 31 British and Indian squadrons in India. Of these, however, six were unfit for operations, nine were kept for the defense of Ceylon, and five were employed for transport and reconnaissance duties, leaving only seven fighter and four bomber squadrons for operations in northeast India. But the flow of aircraft, from both Britain and the USA, was increasing monthly, and by February 1943 there would be 52 squadrons. Moreover the aircraft themselves were being replaced by newer types, Mitchells, Hurricanes, Liberators, B-Fighters. Most of them could go straight to the new airfields in Assam and Bengal, as the possibility of a seaborne invasion of India had become slight after the naval battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. In April 1942 Wavell had reorganized the India Command. The Central Command HQ, now Atagra, was responsible for training and supply, while there were three regional army commands, the Northwestern, the Southern, and the Eastern, which was the operational one. Planning for the reconquest of Burma entailed cooperation with the Chinese armies, both those now in Assam and those in the Yunnan province of China. The Chinese plan, of October 1942, was for a converging advance on Burma by 15 Chinese divisions, so called, from Yunnan and three from Assam, together with some 10 British or Indian divisions. The role of the latter, in the Chinese plan, was not only to invade northern Burma but to launch a seaborne attack on Rangoon. Wavell agreed to the plan in principle although dubious whether what he considered the two essential requirements were obtainable, sufficiently powerful air forces to dominate the sky over Burma, and a strong British fleet, with four or five carriers, to dominate the Indian Ocean and cover the Rangoon attack. The second requirement was, in fact, impossible, in view of naval commitments elsewhere. Chiang Kai-shek regarding these essential conditions as Wavell's quibbles and as a sign that the British were not going to make a serious effort, angrily abandoned his part in the operation, at the end of 1942. The Arakan Offensive, December 1942 May 1943. Wavell nevertheless decided to carry out a limited offensive to recover the Arakan coastal region by a hundred mile advance down the Mayu Peninsula combined with a seaborne invasion of Akiab Island, at the tip of the next peninsula, to recapture the airfields there, from which Japanese squadrons could attack most of northeast India. If the Allied squadrons could be re-established though they could cover all of north and central Burma. This important part of the plan, however, was dropped because of the lack of landing craft. Even so, Wavell persisted with the overland advance into Arakan rather than do nothing. The 14th Indian Division started to advance in December 1942, but moved so slowly that the commander of the Japanese 15th Army, 
General Edda, was able to send reinforcements thither and halt the British advance by the end of January, while he sent still more in February. Yet Wavell insisted that the advance must be continued, despite the arguments and protests of General Noah Lowen, the commander of the Eastern Army, who warned him that the troops were badly depleted, and their morale affected, by malaria. Thus the Japanese were able to strike against the 14th Division's rear, and reached his on the Mayu River by March 18, thereby uncovering its flank and causing it to retreat. The 14th Indian Division was now replaced by the 26th, but the Japanese counterstroke continued, over the Mayu, reaching the coast at Indian early in April. The Japanese then pushed on northward, with the aim of capturing the line Mungdo Buthadon by May, when the monsoon season was due, and thus dislocate any British plans for a renewed advance into Burma during the next dry season, from November 1943 to May 1944. On April 14 Lieutenant General W. J. Slim, 15th Indian Corps, took over command of the forces in Arakan, and was appalled to find how badly their physical and moral state had suffered from the ravages of malaria and the battle losses due to frontal attacks on Japanese positions. While hoping to hold the Mungdo Buthadon line, between the sea and the Mayu River, he planned to withdraw farther if necessary to a line running inland from Cox's Bazaar, a further 50 miles northward and just over the frontier. Here the country was comparatively open, and thus more suited to the British advantage in artillery and tanks than the jungles and swamps of the Mayu Peninsula, while the Japanese communications up the coast would be more stretched and thus more vulnerable. But neither plan came into effect. For the Japanese drove the British to abandon Buthidang after dark on May 6, and that flanking threat led to the abandonment of Mungdor, on the coast. And the Japanese then decided to stop on the newly captured line, as the monsoon was due. In sum, the British attempt to recapture Akiab and its airfields, by an overland advance and without seaborne aid, had proved a complete, and dismal, failure. The Japanese had shown their skill in flanking moves and infiltrations through the jungle, while the British had damped the spirit of their troops by costly frontal attacks and blundering disregard for the indirect approach. By May 1943 they were back on the line they had held the previous autumn. The Chimdits The only glimmer of light in this starkly clouded phase of the war came, at the northern end of the Burmese theater, from the first Chindit operation, a name taken by its initiator, Ord Wingate, from a mythical beast, the Chinth, half lion and half eagle, of which statues are numerous in Burmese pagodas. His imagination was caught by the way this griffin like beast symbolized the close ground and air cooperation needed in such operations and by such forces. The fact that the first operations were carried out across and beyond the Chindwin River, in northern Burma, may have helped to engrave the name on the minds of the public. In the autumn of 1938 Ord Wingate, then a captain on leave from Palestine, had met, and made a strong impression on, a number of influential people, as he had earlier that year on General Wavell, then the commander in Palestine, and Brigadier John Evetts, who was in charge of the northern area. But on returning to Palestine in December he found that his political activities in Zionist circles had made him such an object of suspicion in British official quarters that Wavell's successor, General Haining, who had originally approved the SNS organization, had decided to remove him from control of it and appoint him to an innocuous job at his own headquarters. Then, in May 1938, he was sent home at Haining's request and given a minor staff post in anti-aircraft command. But in the autumn of 1940 he was rescued from this backwater and sent to organize a guerrilla campaign in Ethiopia against the Italian control of East Africa. The appointment, suggested by Leo Amory, who had joined the cabinet, was clinched by Wavell's prompt acceptance of the proposal. The successful conclusion of this East African campaign in May 1941 was followed by another slump in Wingate's personal fortunes, and to a state of depression that caused him to attempt suicide during a bout of malaria. But when convalescing at home he was rescued by a call to fresh opportunity, this time arising from the British disasters in the Far East. 
The opportunity was once again provided by Wavell, who had himself been removed from the Middle East Command in June, after the failure of the summer offensive the, and sent to India. At the end of the year Wavell found himself caught up in a greater crisis when the Japanese invaded Malaya and Burma successively. In February 1942, when the situation even in Burma was looking bleak, Wavell asked for Wingate to be sent to him with a view to developing guerrilla operations there. After his arrival Wingate urged the creation of what were called long-range penetration groups trained to operate in the Burmese jungle and strike at the Japanese communications as well as against the Japanese outposts. He argued that the force must be sufficiently large to strike with strong effect, while small enough to evade the enemy. Brigade size was considered suitable and the 77th Indian Brigade was reorganized for the purpose. These Chindits must be better jungle fighters than the Japanese, and they needed to comprise experts in such kinds of fighting, particularly experts in demolition and radio communication. They must also develop ground and air cooperation, as they would be dependent on supply by air, for that reason a small RAF section was attached to each column. Within the column, pack animals would provide the transport. Wingate pressed for an early operation, both to restore British morale by demonstrating their power to upset the enemy's morale, and as a test of the working of such long-range penetration groups. Wavell preferred that they should be used immediately before, and during, a British general offensive, but decided in response to Wingate's desire that an earlier experiment was worth risking because of the experience and the information that could be gained. The brigade comprised seven columns, and for the planned operation was divided into two groups, a northern group of five columns, totaling 2,200 men with 850 mules, and a southern group of two columns, totaling 1,000 men with 250 mules. The two groups crossed the Chindwin River on the night of February 14, 1943, assisted by diverting actions on the part of the regular forces. Moving on eastward, the groups split up into their prearranged columns, and then carried out a series of attacks on Japanese outposts, as well as to cut railway lines, blow up bridges and create ambushes on the roads. In mid-March the columns crossed the Irrawaddy a hundred miles east of the Chindwin. By then, however, the Japanese had awoken to the threat and deployed a large part of two divisions, of their five in Burma, to counter it. Under the counter-pressure and other difficulties the columns were forced to withdraw, and by mid-April were back in India, having lost one-third of their strength and left behind most of their equipment. The operation had little strategic effect and Japanese casualties had been slight, but it did show that British and Indian troops could operate in the jungle, and it had provided useful experience in air supply, as well as the need for air superiority. It also led General Mutagaki, commander of the Japanese 15th Army, to recognize that he could not regard the Chindwin as a secure barrier, and that to forestall the British counteroffensive he would have to continue his own advance. Thereby it led to the Japanese advance across the Indian frontier in 1944, and the crucial Battle of Imphal. Future Planning A serious British offensive in the dry season of 1942-43 had been annulled by the combination of administrative difficulties and lack of resources. The main plan for the next dry season, of 1943-44, as decided at the Casablanca Conference of January 1943, was intended to be a seaborne assault on Rangoon, called Operation Anakim, following British and Chinese offensives in the north of Burma and the capture of key points on the coast. Those aims meant that air superiority had to be gained, and a strong naval force assembled, with ample landing craft, as well as the solution of the administrative and overland transport problems. The difficulties of meeting all these requirements were, clearly, so great that in the spring of 1943 Wavell was inclined to turn away from Burma, and to favor a move against Sumatra as an indirect way of approach to the defeat of the Japanese. 
His talks with Churchill and the chiefs of staff on a visit to London in April convinced them that Operation Anakim must be deferred or discarded, and in its place the Sumatra move was chosen, a move codenamed Culverin, this indirect move became attractive to Churchill, but it had to be abandoned in its turn for the same reasons that Anakim had been given up and also because of American insistence on the importance of reopening the land route of supply to China as soon as possible. Hence southern operations were shelved, although planning for them continued. If anything at all was to be done in this theater of war, it would have to be in the north of Burma. Chapter 24, The Battle of the Atlantic the most critical period in the Battle of the Atlantic was during the second half of 1942 and the first half of 1943, but its long and fluctuating course was coexistent with the whole six years course of the war. Indeed, it can be said to have started before the war itself, as the first ocean-going U-boats sailed from Germany to their war stations in the Atlantic on August 19, 1939. By the end of that month, on the eve of the German invasion of Poland, 17 were out in the Atlantic, while some 14 coastal type U boats were out in the North Sea. Despite their late start in rearming themselves with submarines, the Germans had a total strength of 56, although 10 were not fully operational, on the outbreak of war, which was only one less than that of the British Navy, of these, 30 were North Sea ducks, unsuitable for the Atlantic. The first score achieved was the sinking of the outward bound liner Athnia on the evening of September 3, the same day that Britain declared war, two days after the German invasion of Poland. It was actually torpedoed without warning, contrary to Hitler's specific order that submarine warfare was to be conducted only in accordance with the Hague Conventions. The U boat commander justified his action by asserting his belief that the liner was an armed merchant cruiser. During the next few days several more ships were sunk. Then on the 17th a more important success was gained when the aircraft carrier Courageous was sunk by U.29 off the western approaches to the British Isles. Three days earlier the aircraft carrier Ark Royal had had a narrow escape from U.39, which, however, was promptly counter-attacked and sunk by the escorting destroyers. The manifest risks led to the fleet aircraft carriers being withdrawn from submarine hunting. U-boat attacks against merchant shipping also had considerable success. A total of 41 Allied and neutral ships, amounting to 154,000 tons, were sunk in the opening month, September, and by the end of the year the losses reached 114 ships, and over 420,000 tons. Moreover in mid-October the U-47 under Lieutenant Prien had penetrated the fleet anchorage at Scarpa Flow and sunk the battleship Royal Oak, causing the temporary abandonment of this main base until the defences were improved. It is significant, however, that in November and December, merchant shipping losses were less than half what they had been the first two months, and more shipping had been lost to mines than to U-boats. Moreover, nine U boats had been sunk, a sixth of the total strength. Air attacks on shipping had been a nuisance, but no worse. During this early part of the war, the German Navy placed great hopes in its surface warships, and not only in its U boats, but such helps were not borne out by experience. On the outbreak of war, the pocket battleship Admiral Graf Spee was in position in mid Atlantic, and her sister ship Deutschland, later renamed Lutzau, in the North Atlantic, although Hitler did not allow them to start attacks on British shipping until September 26. Neither of them achieved much, and the Graf Spee, cornered in the mouth of the River Plate, was driven to scuttle herself in December. The new battle cruisers Nisna and Schkarnhorst made a brief sortie in November, but after sinking an armed merchant cruiser in the Iceland Faroes Channel bolted for home. Allied ships were already sailing in convoy, after their experience in 1917-18, and although escorts were inadequate, and all too many ships still had none, they proved a remarkably effective deterrent. After the fall of France in June 1940 the danger to Britain's shipping routes became much more severe. 
all ships passing south of Ireland were now exposed to German submarine, surface, and air attack. Except at great hazard, the only remaining route in and out was round the north of Ireland, the northwestern approaches. Even that route could be reached, reported on, and bombed by the first of the German long-range aircraft, the four-engined Fock Wolf Condor, the FW200, operating from Stavanger in Norway and Merignac near Bordeaux. In November 1940 these long-range bombers sank 18 ships, of 66,000 tons. Moreover the U-boat's toll had risen greatly, to a total 63 ships, amounting to over 350,000 tons, in the month of October. The threat had become so serious that a large number of British warships were pulled back from anti-invasion duties and sent to the northwestern approaches. Even so, surface and air escorts were perilously weak. In June, the first month of the changed strategic situation, U-boat sinkings had bounded up to 58 ships of 284,000 tons, and although falling a little in July, they averaged over 250,000 tons during the months that followed. On the East Coast route, mine laying by air had caused more damage than U-boats in the later months of 1939, and after the German invasion of Norway and the Low Countries in the spring of 1940 its menacing pressure was intensified. Moreover in the autumn the pocket battleship Admiral Sear slipped out undetected into the North Atlantic, and on November 5 attacked a convoy homeward bound from Halifax, Nova Scotia, sinking five merchant ships and the sole escort, the armed merchant cruiser Jervis Bay, which sacrificed herself in gaining time for the rest of the convoy to escape. The Sear's sudden appearance on this vital convoy route temporarily disorganized the entire flow of shipping across the Atlantic, causing other convoys to be held up for two weeks, until it was known that the Sear had gone on into the South Atlantic. Here she found fewer targets, but raised her toll to 16 ships, of 99,000 tons. By the time she returned safely to Kiel on April 1st after a cruise of over 46,000 miles. The cruiser Admiral Hipper also broke out into the Atlantic at the end of November, but at dawn on Christmas Day had a rude shock when she attacked a convoy which she soon found to be strongly escorted, as it was a troop convoy bound for the Middle East. The escorting cruisers drove off the Hipper, and trouble in her own machinery led her to make for Brest. From here in February she made a second sortie, and was somewhat more successful sinking seven ships in an unescorted group steaming up the African coast, but her own fuel was running low and her captain thus decided to return to Brest. In mid-March the German naval staff ordered her to return home for a more thorough refit, and she got back to Kiel just before this here. The hip as low endurance had shown that, apart from mechanical defects, her type was not suited for commerce raiding. Next to the U-boats and mine laying, the Germans' most effective weapon in the war at sea proved to be disguised merchant ships converted for raiding purposes, which they had been sending out on long cruises since April 1940. By the end of that year the first wave of six had sunk 54 merchantmen, totaling 366,000 tons, largely in distant seas. Their presence, or possible presence caused as much worry and dislocation as the sinkings they achieved, while the threat was multiplied by the masterly way in which the Germans kept them refueled and supplied at secret rendezvous. The raiders were skillfully handled and their targets well chosen, only one of them had been brought to action, and that had escaped serious damage. Yet their captains, with one exception, had behaved humanely, allowing the crews of the ship's attack time to take to the boats and treating their prisoners decently. In face of the manifold threat, above all that of U-boats in the Atlantic approaches to Britain, the Royal Navy's escort resources were heavily strained, and overstrained. From the French Atlantic ports, Brest, Lorient, and La Palice near La Rochelle, U-boats were able to cruise as far as 25 degrees west whereas during the summer of 1940 the British could only provide escorts up to about 15 degrees west, some 200 miles west of Ireland, 
and outward bound convoys then had to disperse, or steam on unescorted. Even in October, close escort was only extended to about 19 degrees west, about 400 miles west of Ireland. Moreover, the usual escort was merely one armed merchant cruiser, and it was not until the end of the year that the average could be increased to two vessels. Only convoys to the Middle East were given more powerful protection. Here it should be mentioned that Halifax in Nova Scotia was the main western terminal for the Atlantic convoys, and that homeward bound convoys, carrying supplies of food, oil, and munitions, were escorted by Canadian destroyers for the first 300 400 miles, after which the ocean escort took over, until the convoy reached the better protected area of the western approaches. Valuable aid towards meeting the escort problem came from the advent of the corvettes in the spring of 1940. These small vessels, of a mere 925 tons, were exhausting for the crews in rough weather, and suffered the handicap of not being fast enough to overtake, or even to keep up with, a U-boat on the surface. But they did most gallant work in escorting convoys in all weathers. A larger raid came from the agreement which Churchill negotiated with President Roosevelt, in September, after two months' persuasive efforts, whereby fifty of the U.S. Navy's old and surplus destroyers from World War I were obtained in exchange for a 99-year lease of eight British bases on the far side of the Atlantic. Although these destroyers were obsolescent, and had to be fitted with the ASDIC submarine detecting device before they could be brought into use, they were soon able to make an important contribution to the escort problem and the anti-submarine campaign. Moreover the double transfer enabled the United States to prepare bases for the protection of its own seabound and coastal shipping, while taking the first of the steps which involved that great neutral country in the Battle of the Atlantic. The coming of winter, and bad weather, naturally brought an increase of the difficulties of convoy, and convoy escorts but also a diminution of German submarine activity. By July 1940 German figures show that U-boat strength had been increased 50% since the start of the war, that 27 had been destroyed, and 51 remained. By the following February the effective total fell to 21. But with the French bases the Germans could keep more U-boats at sea out of a reduced smaller total strength and could also use their smaller coastal type U-boats on the ocean routes. On the other hand, the Italian Navy's contribution to the struggle proved negligible. Although their submarines had begun to operate in the Atlantic from August on, and by November no less than 26 were out on the ocean, they achieved virtually nothing. Although the pressure of the U-boat campaign diminished during the winter, mainly due to bad weather, it was renewed early in 1941, and at the same time multiplied by Admiral Dinitz's introduction of wolf pack tactics, by several U-boats working together, instead of individually. These new tactics had been introduced in October 1940, and were developed in the months that followed. The way they operated was that, when the existence of a convoy had been approximately established, U-Boat Command HQ ashore would warn the nearest U-Boat group, which would send a submarine to find and shadow the convoy and home the others onto it by wireless. When they were assembled on the scene, they would launch night attacks on the surface, preferably upwind of the convoy, and continue these for several nights. During daylight the U-Boats would withdraw well clear of the convoy and its escort. Attacking on the surface, they had an advantage in speed over most of the escorts. Night surface attacks had been made in World War I, and Dönitz himself had described in a book before the Second War how he would do them. These new tactics took the British unawares, as they had been thinking mainly of submerged attack, and pinned their faith to the ISDIC device, the underwater detecting device, which had a range of about 1,500 yards. The ASDIC could not detect U-boats that were operating on the surface like torpedo boats near the convoy, and when these submarines were employed at night, escorts were virtually blindfolded. This German exploitation of the value of night attacks by surface U-boats thus nullified the British preparation for submarine warfare, and threw it off balance. 
The best chance of countering the new tactics lay in early location of the shadowing U-boat, the contact keeper, and driving it away. If the escort could make the U-boat dive, these would be handicapped, their periscopes being useless at night. A very important countermeasure to night attacks was the illumination of the sea. At first this was dependent on star shell and rocket flares, but these were superseded by a more efficient illuminant known all as snowflake, which went far towards turning darkness into daylight, while a powerful searchlight, called the Lee Light after its inventor, was fitted in aircraft that were employed in convoy escorts and anti-submarine patrols. Still more important was the development of radar to supplement visual sighting. Along with new instrumental devices came more thorough training for escort vessels and escort groups and a marked improvement in the intelligence organization. But all the improvements took time, and it was fortunate that the small number of U-boats at this period restricted the activity of the new wolf packs, before the war Admiral Dinitz had estimated that if the British adopted a worldwide convoy system Germany would need 300 U-boats for decisive results, whereas in the spring of 1941 she had an operational strength of only a tenth of that scale. That was the more fortunate because the commerce raids by other warships, and by aircraft, reached a new peak in March. The pocket battleships here and the battle cruisers Scharnhorst and Nisnau sank or captured 17 ships, the long-range bombers sank 41, and the U-boats the same number, from all causes a total of 139 ships, and over half a million tons of shipping, destroyed. After reaching Brest on March 22, however, the battle cruisers were immobilized there, by damaging British air attacks on the port during April. Just after the middle of May the new German battleship Bismarck, accompanied by the new cruiser Prinz Eugen, sailed out into the Atlantic to multiply the threat. British intelligence worked well and warning of their presence in the Kattegat was received in London early on May 21, while later the same day they were spotted by coastal command aircraft near Bergen. The battle cruiser Hood and the battleship Prince of Wales, under Vice Admiral L. Holland, at once sailed from Scarpa Flow to intercept their expected passage round the north of Iceland, and next evening, after air reconnaissance had shown they were no longer in the Bergen area, the main fleet, under Admiral Tovey, also sailed from Scarpa in the same direction. On the evening of the 23rd, the two German ships were sighted by the cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk in the Denmark Strait, between the west of Iceland and the edge of the ice fields east of Greenland. By that time Admiral Holland's force was close to the southerly end of the strait. On paper, this force had a big advantage, as the 42,000-ton Hood was nominally the largest ship in either navy, and mounted eight 15-inch guns, while it was accompanied by the new battleship Prince of Wales. 35,000 tons and 10 14-inch guns. But the Hood, built in 1920, before the Washington Treaty, had never been thoroughly modernized, the coming of war in 1939 had forestalled the Board of Admiralty's decision in March that year to give her better armor protection, horizontal and vertical, and the Prince of Wales was so new that her armament had not been fully tested. The German ships, Although supposed to conform to the treaty limitations, 35,000 tons for battleships and 10,000 for heavy cruisers, actually displaced about 42,000 tons and 15,000 tons respectively, which enabled them to be given heavier armor protection than appeared. Moreover their disadvantage in main armament, 8 15-inch guns in the Bismarck and 8 8-inch guns in the Prince Eugen was offset not only by defects in the guns of the Prince of Wales and superior range finding equipment on the German side, but by the way the British ships came into action. The Germans were sighted, in the twilight, at 5.35 am, an hour before sunrise, and at 5.52 all four ships opened fire, at a range of about 25,000 yards, 14 miles. On the British side the Hood was leading and both the German ships concentrated their fire on her. Besides being the flagship, she was the most vulnerable, 
and particularly vulnerable to plunging fire, a reason for seeking to close the range as soon as possible. The approach was nearly end on, so the British could not bring their after turrets to bear, whereas the Germans could use their entire broadsides. Their second or third salvo took effect, and such effect that at 6 a.m. the hood blew up, and sank within a few minutes, only three of her crew of over 1,400 surviving. That was all too grimly reminiscent of the fate of the British battle cruisers at Jutland a quarter of a century earlier. The Prince of Wales, on which both German ships were now able to concentrate, also suffered from damaging hits from the Bismarck, as well as three from the Prince Eugen, within a few minutes. So, at 6.13 am the captain of the Prince of Wales wisely decided to break off the fight, and turned away under cover of a smoke screen. The range was now down to 14,600 yards. Rear Admiral Way Quarker, commanding the two cruisers, and now the whole force since Holland's death, confirmed the decision, and decided merely to keep touch with the enemy until the main fleet under Tovey arrived on the scene. This was now about 300 miles away, and the prospects of catching the Germans were not good, since the visibility became worse during the morning. It was thus a relief to Tavi when he heard in the early afternoon that the Bismarck had altered course and dropped its speed to about 24 knots. For in the brief morning action the Prince of Wales had made two hits on the Bismarck, and one of these had caused an oil leak which reduced its fuel endurance, and led the German Admiral, Lutschens, to make for a western French port, abandoning his raid into the Atlantic and the alternative of turning back to Germany before the several British forces now converging towards the scene could intercept him. That afternoon Tovey detached the second cruiser squadron under Admiral Curtis and the aircraft carrier Victorious, which had been about to start for the Mediterranean with a cargo of fighters, to proceed to a position within 100 miles of the Bismarck and near enough to launch the Victorious's nine torpedo bombers. These took off soon after 10 p.m in very bad weather, and had difficulty in finding the Bismarck, but eventually delivered successive attacks on her soon after midnight. One hit was achieved, but did no serious damage to the heavily armored battleship. Moreover she managed to give her pursuers the slip early on the 25th, and the rest of that day was spent in fruitless efforts to find her again. Not until 10.30 am on the 26th was she spotted and reported, by a patrolling Catalina aircraft of Coastal Command, about 700 miles distant from Brest. Tovey's widely spread fleet was by then badly placed to catch her before she reached shelter, and was also running short of fuel. But Admiral Somerville's Force H, coming up from Gibraltar, was now close enough to intercept the Bismarck. Moreover this force included the large carrier Ark Royal. The first strike miscarried but a second one, around 9 p.m., was more successful. Two of the 13 torpedoes released reached their mark. Although one hit was on the Bismarck's armor belt and had little effect, the other, right aft, damaged her propeller, wrecked her steering gear, and jammed the rudders. That proved decisive. While Captain Vian's destroyers held the ring, as well as making further torpedo attacks during the night, the battleships King George V and Rodney arrived on the scene, and pounded the crippled Bismarck with armor-piercing shell from their heavy guns for one and one half hours. By 10.15 she was a flaming shambles. On Tovey's order the British battleships then withdrew, before U-boats or the Luftwaffe's heavy bombers arrived to endanger them, leaving the cruisers to finish off the sinking ship. The Dorsetshire did this, with three torpedoes and the Bismarck disappeared under the waves at 10.36. Before the end came she had suffered, and survived, at least eight, and possibly twelve, torpedo hits, and many more heavy shell hits. That was a remarkable tribute to her designers. The Prince Eugen had left the Bismarck on the 24th, to refuel in mid-Atlantic, but after doing so she had developed engine defects so her captain had decided to abandon his excursion and make for Brest. Although her approach to that port was detected, she reached it safely on June 1. However, 
In the end these dramatic events of May 1941 marked the climax, and final defeat, of the German plans and efforts to win the Battle of the Atlantic with surface ships. The U-boat campaign continued for a much longer time, and became a grave menace, although it ran a fluctuating course. In May U-boat sinkings rose sharply and in June again reached the high figure of over 300,000 tons, to be exact, 61 ships of 310,000 tons. That was as many ships as there were in a single large convoy. It was remarkable that sailors were not deterred from manning them, and there was never a shortage of crews. A number of important counteracting factors came into play, however, that spring. On March 11 the United States Lend-Lease Bill became law, and in that same month the American Atlantic Fleet Support Group, of destroyers and flying boats, was formed. In April, the American Security Zone, patrolled by U.S. Navy forces, was extended eastward from 60 degrees to 26 degrees west. Also in March, American air bases were opened on the east coast of Greenland, and installations in Bermuda, while in May the U.S. Navy took over the leased base at Arjunshu in the southeast of Newfoundland. Early in July U.S. Marines relieved the British garrison at Reykjavik in Iceland, and from then on U.S. naval forces protected American shipping to and from Iceland. American neutrality in the Atlantic was becoming markedly less neutral. The refitting of British ships in American yards had already been approved in April, while the building of warships and merchant ships on Lend-Lease account had started. Meanwhile Canada was becoming more strongly a relief to Britain in the Atlantic struggle. A Canadian escort force was created in June, and based on St. John's, Newfoundland. The Royal Canadian Navy now took the responsibility for ocean anti-submarine escort eastwards to a rendezvous south of Iceland. Thus the British Admiralty's plans for continuous escort became possible. In the summer of 1941, Canadian and British escorts met and handed over their convoys to one another at the mid-ocean meeting point in about 35 degrees west. The Iceland escorts and the Western Approaches escorts met, and handed over at the Eastern Ocean meeting point in about 18 degrees west. From July onwards, too, a close escort group accompanied Gibraltar convoys the whole way there, and continuous escort, down the West African coast, was also given to the Sierra Leone convoys. Convoys now could be provided with an average of five escort vessels. A convoy or 45 ships had a perimeter of over 30 miles to protect. Even so, each escort vessels as Dick would only sweep an arc of a mile so there were still wide gaps through which a U-boat could penetrate without being detected. As to air cover, the addition of Lend-Lease Catalina flying boats from the spring onward extended such cover to some 700 miles from the British Isles, forcing the U-boats away from western approaches, 600 miles from Canada, and 400 miles to the south of Iceland. But a gap about 300 miles wide remained in mid-Atlantic and the very long-range American Liberators, which could have covered it, were not regularly available until the end of March 1943, and by mid-April only 41 were in service. Meanwhile, the number of U-boats was increasing. By July 1941, 65 were operational and in October 80. The total U-boat strength on September 1 was 198 while 47 had been lost so far. In sum, new U-boats were entering service much faster than they were being sunk. Moreover U-boats were being made stronger. Their welded pressure hulls were proving more difficult to break than the British plated and riveted hulls and a depth charge had to explode much closer than before for a kill. During September four convoys suffered heavy losses, all of these lacking adequate air cover. That month, However, following an August meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill, cooperation between the two navies was increased still more by the President's approval of the well-planned American Western Hemisphere Defense Plan No. 4. Under this the U.S. Navy was permitted to escort convoys of non-American ships, 
and started to provide escorts for certain Atlantic convoys eastwards as far as the mid-ocean meeting point, while this meeting point was moved eastwards to about 22 degrees west. This helped to ease the British problem of providing adequate escorts between the British Isles and the mid-ocean meeting point. By the end of the year there had been increased to eight groups, each of three destroyers and about six corvettes. A further eleven groups, each of five destroyers, were nominally in reserve to reinforce the escort of any convoy that might be in trouble, or to deal with the U-boat concentrations, but were largely occupied with routine tasks. In October U-boat sinkings fell to 32 ships of 156,000 tons. Significantly no ships were sunk within 400 miles of a coastal command base. That showed the reluctance of U-boats to enter zones covered by long-range reconnaissance and bomber aircraft, although the drop was also due in part to the dispatch of U-boats to the Mediterranean to support Rommel's operations in North Africa. In November, U-boat sinkings fell again, to little more than a third of the October total, and in December they were smaller still in the North Atlantic. But the heavy losses in the Far East that followed Japan's entry into the war raised the total sinkings from all causes to 282 ships of nearly 600,000 tons. In the West, the German long-range bombers had become a greater menace than U-boats during the second half of 1941, especially to the Gibraltar convoys. This led to a realization of the need for fighters in close support of any convoy, and thus to the introduction of the first escort carrier, HMS Audacity, with catapult-launched fighters, in June. She played a key part in the successful defense of a homeward-bound Gibraltar convoy in December, although herself sunk in the nine-day fight. At the end of that year the total of operational U-boats was 86, and about 150 more were in training or running trials. But as 50 were now in the Mediterranean or its approaches, only 36 were left for use in the North Atlantic. A sweep for supply ships there in June had resulted in nine being intercepted, and to the withdrawal of U-boats from the South Atlantic. During the nine months April to December 1941 the total German and Italian submarine sinkings had been 328 ships of 1,576,000 tons but only one-third of these had been sailing in convoy. Moreover 20 of the 30 submarines lost had been destroyed by convoy escorts. It was clear that stronger escorting, and evasive routing, had temporarily gained the upper hand over the U-boats. It may be useful to give here a summary of the escort situation at the beginning of 1942. The three great operational bases of the Western Approaches Command under Admiral Sir Percy Noble were Liverpool, Greenock and Londonderry, and controlled 25 escort groups, totalling about 70 destroyers and 95 smaller craft. They were in four categories, I, short endurance destroyers for Middle East and Arctic convoys on the first part of their passage, and for the liners when they started bringing American troops across, two, long-distance destroyers and corvettes for the North Atlantic convoys, from the Western Ocean meeting point to Britain, and for the Gibraltar convoys, three, long-range sloops, destroyers, and cutters for the Sierra Leone convoys on the main part of their journey, four, anti-aircraft groups to back up escort of convoys within reach of German bombers, and for the Arctic and Gibraltar convoys. There were also the equivalent of two groups at Gibraltar for local escort, and the Freetown escort force of one destroyer flotilla and about two dozen corvettes. The Newfoundland escort force, provided mainly by the Canadian Navy, had 14 destroyers and about 40 corvettes, as well as a score of other vessels for local escort. But the improving prospect in the Battle of the Atlantic suffered bad handicaps in the early part of 1942. One was a lack of aircraft. On taking over coastal command in the previous summer, Sir Philip Dubuc de Lafferty had assessed its needs as approximately 800 aircraft of all types, and particularly emphasized the importance of long range bombers. But in the new year, coastal command's bombers were transferred to Bomber Command, and all the new ones allotted to it, 
to the air offensive against Germany. The clash of priorities became intense. Moreover the fleet air arm was having difficulties in obtaining fighters for the 31 new escort carriers that had been ordered. Another handicap was that the new frigates that were being built in America for the British were not entering service as fast as was hoped, largely because priority was being given to the landing craft needed for a cross-channel operation, which the Americans still hoped to launch in 1943, if not in 1942. This priority contributed greatly to the continuing weakness of British Atlantic efforts, and to the further heavy shipping losses. A third handicap came in the early months of 1942 from America's own maritime troubles, troubles which came not only in the Pacific, from the Pearl Harbor disaster, but also in the Atlantic, from the extension of U-boat activities and America's own consequent shipping losses. Admiral de Nitz and his staff estimated in May 1942 that to defeat Britain their sinkings must average 700,000 tons a month. They knew that in 1941 these had not reached such an average, although they did not know that the monthly average had actually been no more than 180,000 tons. But they had thought that America's entry into the war would give them increased freedom of action in the Western Atlantic and more opportunity of finding unescorted targets. Only a small number of U-boats could be sent to operate off the American coast, but these achieved disproportionately large results. For the American admirals were slow, and reluctant, to start convoys, as the British admirals had been in the First World War. The Americans were also slow to take other precautions. Lighted channel markers and the unrestricted use of ships' radio gave the U-boats all the help they wanted. Coastal resorts, such as Miami, continued to illuminate their sea fronts at night with miles of neon-lighted beaches, against which the shipping was clearly silhouetted. The U-boats lay submerged offshore during the day, and moved in to attack, with guns or torpedoes, on the surface at night time. Although there were never more than about a dozen U-boats operating off the American coast, they sank nearly half a million tons of shipping by the beginning of April, and 57% consisted of tankers. The reaction on Britain's situation was serious. The United States Navy was having to withdraw its escort vessels and aircraft to its own coastal waters, and British merchant ships, after surviving the crossing of the Atlantic, became an easy prey in American waters. Admiral de Nitz was so encouraged by the results that he wanted to send every U-boat he could to the American seaboard. Fortunately for the Allies, Hitler's intuition came to their aid at this critical moment. At his conference on January 22 he announced his conviction that Norway was the zone of destiny and insisted that every surface warship and U-boat available should be sent thither to ward off an Allied invasion. Three days later De Nitz received a completely unexpected order to dispatch an initial batch of eight U-boats to cover the sea approaches to that country. The new battleship Tirpitz was also moved to Norway in January, and was followed by the Seer, Prinz Eugen, Hippa, and Lutzow. There was something in his foresight, as in April Churchill did tell the British chiefs of staff to examine the feasibility of a landing in Norway with the aim of relieving German pressure on the Arctic convoys, but their doubts were reinforced by the Americans, and the project never matured. Another piece of good fortune for the Allies was that the severe winter of 1941-2 delayed U-boat training in the Baltic, with the effect that only 69 submarines in all were made ready for operations in the first half of 1942. Of these, 26 were eventually sent to northern Norway, 2 to the Mediterranean, and 12 replaced losses, so that the net gain in the Atlantic was only 29. Even as it was, Axis submarine sinkings increased monthly, in February to nearly 500,000 tons, in March to over 500,000 tons, in April there was a drop to 430,000 tons but in May 600,000 tons and in June sinkings reached the ominous figure of 700,000 tons. By the end of June the toll for the half year was over 3 million tons out of 4,147,406 tons sunk from all causes.
of which nearly 90% was in the Atlantic and Arctic. It was not until July that the monthly loss from submarines fell to just under 500,000 tons, thanks to an all-round improvement in anti-submarine methods, and the American adoption of convoy. The improvement in the summer of 1942 proved illusory. By August the advent of freshly built U-boats had raised the total strength to over 300, and of the total about half was operational. It comprised groups off Greenland, off the Canadian coast, off the Azores, off northwest Africa, in or near the Caribbean, and off Brazil. Sinkings by U-boats in August went above the 500,000 tons mark again. In the next few months they made a particularly large bag near Trinidad, where many ships were still traveling independently. A more dubious action, politically and in terms of grand strategy, was the sinking of five Brazilian ships in mid-August, which led to a prompt declaration of war by Brazil. The use of Brazilian bases enabled the Allies to exercise much stronger control of the whole South Atlantic, and drive out surface raiders from their non. That, however, mattered less than it would have earlier, as the place of the German armed merchant ship for commerce raiding in the far oceans was being taken over by new and larger U-boats, the so-called U-cruisers of 1,600 tons, whose radius of action was 30,000 miles. U-boats were now able to dive much deeper, to depths of 600 feet, or even more in emergency, an advantage that was soon offset, however, by the fact that depth charges were being set to explode at greater depths, as well as being produced in greater quantity. The U-boats were also benefiting from the way that the new U-tankers could refuel them on the oceans, and from increasingly efficient wireless intelligence. Moreover the Germans were now able to read many of the British ciphered convoy control signals again, as they had done up to August 1940. On the other side, the new 10 cm radar set, which the U-boats could not intercept, was paramount among all the achievements of British scientists. When it came into full use in aircraft early in 1943, in conjunction with the Lee Light, it restored the Allied initiative by night or in low visibility, and defeated the U-boats radar search receivers working on one and one half meters. Donitz's war diary for this period shows how worried he was about the effect of this new British location device, as well as about the increased number of British aircraft in the eastern Atlantic. Throughout the campaign Donitz had shown himself a very able strategist, always probing for the soft spots and concentrating to strike when the defense was weak. He had held the initiative from the outset, and the Allied anti-submarine forces were always a stage behind. In the second half of 1942 his plan focused on the air escort gap south of Greenland, aiming to locate Allied convoys before they reached it, to concentrate against them while they traversed it, and to withdraw when air cover was resumed. Moreover by the autumn Donitz had sufficient U-boats to allow a pack to strike on its own initiative whenever opportunity offered. Thus U-boat pressure increased from July on and in November sinkings rose to 119 ships of 729,000 tons. A large proportion, however, were caught by U-boats when sailing independently, out of convoy, off South Africa or South America. The call for escorts was increased by the naval requirements of Operation Torch, the American-British landings in Northwest Africa, which was carried out that autumn. The Gibraltar, Sierra Leone, and Arctic convoys had to be temporarily suspended. There was also fresh demand for escorts to the troop ship convoys carrying American troops from Iceland to Britain. These fast convoys had at least four destroyers to escort three troop ships. An exception to the demand for escort was provided by the conversion of the two giant 80,000 ton liners Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth into troop ships with a carrying capacity of 15,000 men and more, the major part of a division. Their speed, over 28 knots, was too high for any destroyers to accompany them except at the start and finish of their voyages, so it was on speed alone, combined with zigzagging and diva-changing routes, that such giant liners depended for their safety. 
the hazardous policy succeeded so well that no submarine ever managed to intercept them on their many transatlantic journeys from August onward. In general, the provision of naval escorts and air cover did not, and could not, keep up with the increasing menace from the output of U-boats. Of these an average of about 17 had entered the service each month, and at the end of 1942 there were 212 operational, out of a total of 393, compared with 91 operational, out of 249, at the start of the year. The number destroyed was 87 German, and 22 Italian, a total quite insufficient to offset the construction rate. During the year Axis submarines had sunk, in all waters, 1,160 ships totaling 6,266,000 tons, while the enemy's other weapons had raised the total loss to 1,664 ships and over 7,790,000 tons. Although about 7 million tons of new Allied shipping was put into service, even that left a further deficit of nearly a million tons to the adverse balance shown in each year's accounts since the outbreak of war. British imports during the year fell below 34 million tons, one third less than the figure in 1939. In particular, stocks of commercial bunker fuel in Britain had fallen precariously low, only 300,000 tons, compared with a monthly consumption of 130,000 tons. Although it could be eked out from the Navy's reserve stocks, that was a course to be avoided save in grave emergency. Thus when the Allied Conference assembled at Casablanca, on the Moroccan coast, in January 1943, to settle the next steps in Allied strategy, it was faced with a very disturbing balance sheet of mercantile tonnage. Until the U-boat menace was overcome, and the Battle of the Atlantic won, an effective invasion of Europe was not practicable. That battle had become as crucial as the Battle of Britain in 1940. The issue depended, basically, on which side could endure longer, materially and psychologically. The course of the struggle was affected by changes of command. In November, Admiral Sir Percy Noble was appointed head of the British Naval Mission in Washington and thus became the first Sea Lords representative on the American side of the Combined Chiefs of Staff organization. During his 20 months tenure as Sea. in Sea, of the Western approaches he had done much to improve the anti-submarine measures, and to keep up morale among the escort and aircraft crews by the understanding he showed of their problems and the close personal touch he established. His successor, fortunately, was well chosen. This was Admiral Sir Max Horton, who had been an outstanding submarine commander in World War I, and in command of Britain's home-based submarines since early 1940. He brought an expert knowledge of submarines, and submariners, to the anti-submarine campaign, coupled with driving energy and imagination. This combination of qualities made him a fit man to match to Nitz. Horton's plan was to develop a more powerful and concentrated counter-attack on the U-boats. The corvettes and other small craft had not got the speed sufficient to follow through in their fights with U-boats, for if they pursued them far they could not catch up with the convoys they were escorting. More destroyers and frigates were needed, working separately, to come to the aid of convoy escorts and, after making contact with the U-boats, hunt them to the death support groups for this purpose had already begun to be formed in September, but Horton at once developed them intensively, and even reduced the strength of the close escort groups in order to do so. He aimed to surprise the enemy in mid-Atlantic with a coordinated counter-attack by several of the new support groups and carrier-borne aircraft, working in cooperation with the escorts and with very long-range aircraft. He emphasized that the support groups should not waste time searching widely for the U-boats, the mistake in the past. The place to find them was near the convoys, and the support groups should work closely with the convoy escort groups. Each of these while in the Greenland air gap was to be reinforced by a support group, and whenever possible by aircraft. He reckoned that the U-boats, accustomed to being attacked from the direction of the convoy, 
would be thrown off balance when the support groups came in attacking from all quarters. On the German side Hitler was enraged by the ineffective result of a New Year's Eve attack on an Arctic convoy by the Hipper, Lutzow and six destroyers, emerging from all ten fjord, and this had important effects. In his disgust he expressed his firm and unalterable resolve to pay off his big ships. This brought about the resignation of Grand Admiral Reda a month later, and his replacement, as naval commander-in-chief, Bidenitz, who at the same time retained his title and office as commander, U-boats. Dönitz had a better knack of handling Hitler, and in the end obtained Hitler's agreement to the retention of the Tirpitz, Lutzow, and Schkarnhorst in Norway as a fairly powerful task force. There was a lull in the Atlantic during December and January, when U-boat sinkings fell to barely 200,000 tons. That was largely due to stormy weather. But the respite was offset by the dispersing effect and havoc caused to the merchant ships in convoy, especially the more weakly powered ones. In February the U-boat sinkings were almost doubled while in March they amounted to 108 ships of 627,000 tons, thus approaching once again the peak figures of June and November 1942. Most worryingly, nearly two-thirds were sunk in convoy. In the middle of March 38 U-boats were concentrated on two homeward-bound convoys, which happened to be close together, and sank 21 ships of 141,000 tons for a loss of only one new boat, before air cover was resumed on the 20th. This was one of the biggest convoy battles of the whole war. In retrospect, the Admiralty recorded that the Germans never came so near to disrupting communication between the New World and the Olders in the first 20 days of March, 1943. Moreover, the naval staff was brought to the point of wondering whether the convoy could continue to be regarded, and used as an effective system of defense. But in the last eleven days of March, the last third of that fateful month, a great change came over the scene. Only fifteen ships were sunk in the North Atlantic compared with one hundred and seven in the first two thirds. In April the month's toll was halved, and in May it was much less still. Max Horton's coordinated counteroffensive had come into effect and fulfilled its desired effect in a remarkably short time. The Americans, at the most critical time in March, had asked to withdraw from the North Atlantic escort system, taking responsibility for the South Atlantic routes, particularly to the Mediterranean. They also had the Pacific much in mind. However, the practical effect was not great. The U.S. government put the first support group carrier under British command and provided the vital VLR very long-range, liberators. So from April 1st, Britain and Canada had taken complete charge of all convoys between the American continent and Britain. During the spring of 1943, the U-boats met defeat in a series of convoy battles, and suffered heavy losses in them. In mid-May Donitz perceptively reported to Hitler, we are facing the greatest crisis in submarine warfare, since the enemy, by means of new location devices, makes fighting impossible, and is causing us heavy losses. For U-boat losses in May had more than doubled, rising to 30% of those at sea, a rate of loss that could not be borne for long. Hence on May 23rd Dönitz withdrew his U-boats from the North Atlantic until he had new weapons to use. By July, more allied merchant ships were being built than were being sunk. That was the crux of the matter and the proof that the U-boat offensive had been defeated. Yet, looking back, it is evident that Britain had herself narrowly escaped defeat in March. It is also evident that the primary cause of her danger was the lack of long-range aircraft for the protection of convoys. From January to May, only two ships were sunk in convoy, in the Atlantic, while an air escort was present. Once adequate air cover of this kind was provided for convoys, particularly by the long-range liberators, it became increasingly difficult for U-boats to operate in wolf packs. They might now at any moment suddenly find an aircraft over them, directing a support group to their position. But radar, on the new 10-centimeter wavelength that the U-boats could not intercept, 
was certainly a very important factor, as Dönitz realized and emphasized. New weapons such as the Hedgehog, an anti-submarine rocket device, and heavier depth charges, also contributed. So did the analytical work of the Western Approaches Tactical Unit set up early in 1942 to evolve the best tactical system for dealing with U-boats, and Professor P. M. S. Blackett's operational analysis of convoy deployment. Moreover a new cipher, for shipping control, introduced at the end of May 1943, deprived the Germans of their most valuable source of intelligence. Probably the most important factors in the victory, however, was the improvement in training standards of the escorts and aircraft, and the increased cooperation between sailors and airmen. Among individuals, the outstanding part in the defeat of the U boats was played by Admiral Sir Max Horton, as already emphasized. Much was also due to Air Marshal Sir John Slesser, who became Commander in Chief of Coastal Command in February 1943 the crucial period of the battle. Among the fine band of escort group commanders, two deserve special mention for their exploits, Captain F. J. Walker, from 1941 on, and Commander P. W. Later Vice Admiral Sir Peter Gretton in 1942-3. No convoys were attacked in the North Atlantic during the month of June 1943, while July was very costly for the U-boats particularly in the Bay of Biscay, where Coastal Command's air patrols had a rich harvest. Of 86 U-boats which tried to cross the bay that month, 55 were sighted, 17 were sunk, all save one by aircraft, and six forced to turn back. Their only outward route had become a narrow line in the Bay of Biscay, hugging the Spanish coast, as Dönitz gloomily reported to Hitler. The anti-submarine patrols, however, paid a considerable price for their successes, 14 planes being lost. During the three months June to August 1943, the German U-boats sank no more than 58 Allied merchant ships in all waters excluding the Mediterranean, and nearly half of them were off South Africa and in the Indian Ocean. They gained that very moderate result at a cost of 79 U-boats, of which no less than 58 were sunk by aircraft. In the hope of regaining the upper hand, Dönitz pressed Hitler for more long-range air reconnaissance in the Atlantic and stronger air cover on the transit routes, and did get a more sympathetic hearing than Reda had for his arguments towards overcoming Göring's unwillingness to provide air cooperation. Dönitz also obtained approval to increase U-boat production from 30 to 40 a month, and to give priority to new types of submarine which would be capable of higher speed when submerged. But the very promising Walter-type submarine, driven by a combination of diesel fuel and hydrogen peroxide, suffered so many teething troubles that none was ready for service before the war ended in 1945. A new and important development, however, came with the fitting of the Chinookal air intake and diesel exhaust mast, a device of pre-1940 Dutch origin that enabled submarines to charge their batteries while remaining at periscope depth. Thirty of them were fitted with it by the middle of 1944. Two other new German devices of the mid-1943 period were the homing torpedo, acoustically guided to ships' propellers, and the glider bomb. But during September and October, the first two months of the renewed U-boat campaign, the Allies lost only nine merchant ships out of the 2,468 which sailed in 64 North Atlantic convoys, whereas 25 U-boats were sunk. After that further heavy defeat Dönitz gave up working the U-boats in large mobile groups. On October 8 Britain took over two air bases in the Azores, by agreement with Portugal, and from then onward air cover could be provided over the whole North Atlantic. In the first three months of 1944 the U-boats suffered still worse losses. Only three merchant ships were sunk, out of 3,360 which crossed the North Atlantic, in, 105 convoys, whereas 36 U-boats were lost. 
Dönitz now cancelled all further operations against convoys, telling Hitler that they could not be renewed until the new types of U-boat and new defensive devices were available, and better air reconnaissance provided. At the end of March, 1944, Dönitz was ordered to form a group of 40 U-boats for inshore operations in the event of an Allied invasion of Western Europe. By the end of May he had concentrated 70 in Biscay ports, and only three remained in the North Atlantic, while these were merely kept on the task of weather reporting. The German abandonment of the U-boat campaign in the North Atlantic was a relief to Coastal Command, whose aircraft, of No. 19 Group, had sunk 50 U-boats and damaged 56, out of 2,425 passages in and out from the Biscay bases. By May 1944, during 41 months of anti-submarine operations, Number 19 Group had lost 350 aircraft in the bay during that period. Its losses would probably have been less, and its effect even greater, if Coastal Command had been allotted a larger scale of aircraft, more appropriate to the key importance of its task. Among other events of the period were two damaging attacks on the Tirpitz at her moorings in northern Norway by three midget submarines in September, 1943, and by the Fleet Air Arm in March 1944, which preceded her eventual sinking by RAF heavy bombers in November that year. She had only once fired her main armament in earnest, in a raid on Spitsbergen, but the amount of damage she survived was testimony to the design and strength of German naval construction. Moreover, her mere existence as a ship in being, and threat in the offing, had a great influence on Britain's maritime strategy, while absorbing a remarkably large amount of her naval strength. The threat of the Schkarnhorst had been brought to an end in the previous December, when she was intercepted and sunk by a strong force from the British home fleet, when herself attempting to intercept an Arctic convoy. During the first half of 1944, Britain's chief trouble in home waters came from the small motor torpedo boats, called D-boats, which the Germans had developed. Although their number was never more than about three dozen, they could be switched rapidly from one convoy route to another and, by choosing suitable opportunities, became a harassing nuisance. The U-boats that had been concentrated in the western ports of France to oppose an allied cross-channel move proved of little effect although they benefited from having been fitted with the Chinookal device by the time the Normandy invasion came in June, and were thus less vulnerable to air attack. When the American Third Army, breaking out from Normandy, arrived close to these western ports, Brest, Lorient, and Estinaz Air, in mid-August, most of the U-boats were moved to Norway. And from then shipping to and from Britain could again use the old, and normal, route round the south of Ireland, as well as the route round the north coast. From the later part of August onward, a stream of U-boats started to come out from Norway, and Germany, by passing round the north of Scotland and Ireland, and positioned themselves close inshore, at busy comers, as far south as Portland Bill on the south coast of England. But they achieved little by this inshore campaign, although, Thanks to constant submergence and use of their chinookles they suffered fewer losses than before. During the four months September to December 1944, they sank only 14 ships in British coastal waters. The Arctic Convoys British convoys to North Russia were started at the end of September, 1941. Ice blocked Archangel in the winter, so Murmansk was used. Russia's only important ice-free port. The Germans' failure to capture that port by a strong overland move was a strange strategic omission as it lost them the chance to strangle this northern supply route when it was most vulnerable. As the Germans came to realize the large scale on which British, and then also American, ships were carrying aid to Russia by this route, they hastened to reinforce their naval and air strength in Norway and developed a series of powerful attacks on the Allies' Arctic convoys in March, April, and May, 1942. The worst hit was eastbound convoy PQ-17, sailing at the end of June. The Admiralty, believing that the convoy and its escort were about to be overwhelmed by German warships, 
ordered the convoy to scatter in the Barents Sea on July 4. The helpless merchant ships were attacked by aircraft and U-boats, only 13 out of 36 surviving. Of the aircraft which this convoy was carrying 87 were delivered, but 210 lost, of the tanks 164 were delivered, but 430 lost, of non-fighting vehicles 896 were delivered, but 3350 lost, along with two-thirds of the other cargo, some 99,316 tons. After that disaster, the next convoy to Russia was not dispatched until September. It was given a much stronger escort and Admiral Redder, warned by radio intelligence, cautiously held back his larger warships, which might have overwhelmed the escorts. As it was, 27 of PQ-18's 40 merchant ships got safely through to Archangel, while the German aircraft and U-boats suffered badly. Never again did the Germans deploy such great air strength in the far north. After another interval, a few smaller convoys were sent in the winter. But the Russians, while repeatedly pressing for more convoys to be run, gave no help in protecting them on the long ocean passage and only a little at the receiving end. From March 1943 onward the C. In C. Home Fleet, Admiral Tovey, was unwilling to risk further convoys as the daylight lengthened. The critical situation in the Atlantic decided the argument, and the Arctic escorts were diverted to the Atlantic, where they played a great part in the decisive defeat of the U-boats that spring. By November, when the Arctic convoys were resumed, much stronger escorts were available, and included the new escort carriers. These inflicted heavy loss on the weakening Luftwaffe as well as on the U-boats, while bringing huge cargoes safely through to Russia. In the 40 outward Arctic convoys from 1941 on, 811 ships sailed, of which 58 were sunk and 33 turned back for one reason or another, while 720 came safely through, and delivered about 4 million tons of cargo to Russia. The deliveries included 5,000 tanks and over 7,000 aircraft. In delivering that large-scale aid the Allies had lost 18 warships and 98 merchant ships, including those on the homeward convoys, while the Germans had lost the battle cruiser Scharnhorst, three destroyers, and 38 U-boats in trying to stop it. The Last Phase During the early months of 1945 the size of the U-boat fleet was still increasing, through new production and reduced losses thanks to the Chinookal device as well as to the suspension of long-range operations in the Atlantic. In January, 30 new boats were put into service, compared with the recent monthly average of 18. Some of them were of the new and improved models with longer cruising range and higher speed when submerged, the ocean-going type 21 of 1,600 tons, and the coastal type 23 of 230 tons of which about two-thirds were of the larger type. In March, the U-boat fleet reached its peak strength, a total of 463. It was not until March that the bombing campaign began to have a serious effect on production. Fortunately for the Allies the air mine laying in the Baltic, although it did little material damage compared with the effort, had an important effect, more than was realized by their naval chiefs, in hindering U-boat trials and training and thus the operational advent of the new submarine types in large numbers. If the new types had ever got to sea in strength they might have revived the U-boat menace as dangerously as in 1943. But once the Allied armies crossed the Rhine in March, closing on Berlin in conjunction with the Russian advance from the east, all forms of pressure could be, and were, intensified, with crippling effect. During the last few weeks of the war, the U-boats' activity was mainly off the east and northeast coasts of Britain. Although they achieved little, it is significant that none of the new types was ever sunk in these waters. After Germany's capitulation in May, 159 U-boats surrendered, but a further 203 were scuttled by their crews. That was characteristic of the U-boat crews' stubborn pride and unshaken morale.
During the five and one half years of war, the Germans had built and commissioned 1,157 U-boats and 15 ex-foreign submarines were taken over by them, 789, including three ex-foreign, had been lost. They had also commissioned some 700 midget submarines. By far the largest proportion of those sunk at sea, 500 out of 632, were destroyed by British or British-controlled forces. On the other side, submarines, German, Italian, and Japanese, sank 2,828 ships, totaling nearly 15 million tons. Much the greatest proportion of that huge total was sunk by the Germans, whose U-boats also sank 175 Allied warships, most of them British. Of the Allied losses to U-boats, 61% of the total was made up of ships sailing independently of convoys, 9% was of stragglers from convoys, and only 30% came from ships in convoy, and very few were lost in convoy when air cover was available. The Germans' possession of the French naval bases on the Bay of Biscay, for four years, and Era's refusal to allow the Allies use of her western and southern coastlines, even though she herself depended largely upon the supplies the convoys brought her, contributed immensely to the Allied losses in the Atlantic. And it was largely the Allies' hold on Northern Ireland and Iceland that kept open the one remaining route to Britain. Part 6, The EBB 1943 Chapter 25. The Clearance of Africa. The first consequence of the Allied failure to capture Tunis in December 1942 was the abandonment of the original idea of trapping Rommel between the pursuing British Eighth Army and the new First Army in Tunisia pushing eastward to meet it. The two armies would now for a time have to deal separately with the respective forces of Rommel in Tripolitania and Arnhem in Tunisia while these, as Rommels drew nearer to Arnhem's, would enjoy the strategic advantage of a central position, enabling them to switch their combined weight against one or other of their assailants. When checked before Tunis at Christmas, and faced with the prospect of continued mud there until the rainy season ended, Eisenhower sought to develop a more southerly thrust to reach the coast near Sfax, thus blocking Rommel's line of supply and retreat. For this operation Saturn he planned to use mainly American troops, concentrating them around Tebasa to form what was entitled the U.S. Second Corps, Major General Fredendel. But when he reported his intention to the combined chiefs of staff, who came along with Roosevelt and Churchill to Africa in mid-January for a fresh Allied conference at Casablanca, to settle future aims, the riskiness of such a thrust by raw troops into an area where Rommel's veterans might soon be arriving was emphasized in discussion of Eisenhower's new plan, particularly by General Alan Brooke, and he was moved to cancel it. That decision left the next move to Montgomery, who had paused near Nophilia in mid-December to build up his strength before attacking the Burat position, 140 miles west to which Rommel had withdrawn the remnant of his army in the previous stage of his long retreat from Egypt. Montgomery launched his fresh offensive in mid-January. It was planned on the same pattern as before, a pinning attack on the enemy's front combined with an outflanking maneuver through the desert interior to close the way of retreat. This time, however, he eschewed any preliminary probing that would show his intention and scare the enemy off his present line. Moreover, only an armored car screen was used to watch the enemy's position, and the main bodies of Montgomery's force were held far back until the day before the attack, and then started on a long approach march from which they went straight into action, on the morning of the 15th. The 51st Division with armored support attacked along the coast road, while the 7th Armored and the New Zealand Divisions carried out the planned maneuver, but no opposition was encountered at first and when it was met west of Burat it came only from rear guards. Rommel had slipped away from the Burat position and, once again, out of the intended trap. That proved the easier because, as Alexander's dispatch remarked in gentle rebuke, the New Zealanders and the 7th Armoured Division felt with some caution round the southern end of the enemy's anti-tank screen. Rommel's main battle had also, once more, been with the Axis Supreme Command. 
Back in safely remote Rome, Mussolini had again lost touch with realities, and the week before Christmas had sent an order to resist to the utmost on the Burat position. Thereupon Rommel inquired by radio of Marshal Cavallero, the chief of the Commando Supremo, what he was to do if the British were to ignore that position, which was easy to bypass, and drive on westward. Cavallero did not answer the question, but emphasized that the Italian troops must not be left in the bag again as at Alam. Rommel pointed out to Bastico the obvious contradiction between Mussolini's order and Cavallero's stipulation. Like most servants of an authoritarian regime, Bastico sought to avoid making a choice and taking responsibility for a course that would not correspond to the hopes and dreams of his leader. But by persistence Rommel had got him to agree to, and give an order for, the withdrawal of the non-motorized Italian troops to the Tahuna Homs line, 130 miles farther back nearer Tripoli. Then, in the second week of January, Cavallero asked that a German division should be sent back to the Gabes defile to guard against the threatened American thrust there, which, as already related, did not mature. Rommel, naturally, was not unwilling to respond to a request that fitted in well with the plan he had conceived, and sent the 21st Panzer Division. That left him with only the 36 tanks of the 15th Panzer Division and the 57 obsolete Italian tanks of the Centro Division, to meet the 450 that Montgomery had brought up for his fresh thrust. Rommel had no intention of fighting a hopeless battle against such overwhelming strength, so withdrew from the Burat position as soon as he heard, through his wireless interception service, that the British would be ready to strike on January 15. After imposing checks on them in the first two days, during which they were made cautious not only by widely strewn mines but by losing some fifty tanks in efforts to pierce his screen, Rommel withdrew his motorized forces to the Tahuna Homs line on the 17th, and immediately told the Italian infantry already that to go back to Tripoli. The Tahuna Homs line was more defensible than the Burat position. But the weight of armor that Montgomery brought against its inland flank convinced Rommel by the 19th that a prolonged stand there would be hopeless, and imperil his line of retreat. So he began to withdraw his remaining forces during the night, while the port installations at Tripoli were blown up. Early in the morning a signal came from Cavallero conveying Mussolini's sharp disapproval of the withdrawal and insistent demand that the line must be held for at least three weeks. That afternoon Cavallero arrived on the scene to reinforce the message. Rommel caustically pointed out that any such time limit was dependent on the enemy's action in the absence of adequate reinforcements to counter it. He ended by putting the crux of the matter to Cavallero in the same way as he had done to Bastico in November over the demand to hold on to the Mercer Brega line, you can either hold on to Tripoli a few more days and lose the army or lose Tripoli a few days earlier and save the army for Tunis. Make up your mind. Cavallero avoided giving a definite decision, but provided it indirectly by telling Rommel that the army must be preserved although Tripoli must be held as long as possible. Rommel promptly started to withdraw the non-motorized Italian troops, and also most of the movable stores. Then on the night of the 22nd he withdrew the rest of the troops from the Tahuna Homs line going right back to the Tunisian frontier, a hundred miles west of Tripoli, and then to the Meath line, eighty miles beyond. The British follow-up from beyond the Burat line had been sticky, as Montgomery himself described it. That was due not only to mines and road demolitions but also to extreme caution in tackling the enemy's rearguard screens. Montgomery, in his memoirs, emphasizes that the advance on the coast road generally displayed a lack of initiative and ginger, reinforcing this comment by quoting a note in his diary on the 20th, sent for the GRC 51st, Highland, Division, and gave him an imperial rocket, this had an immediate effect. But, in fact, Rommel had already pulled back to the Tahuna Homs line and it was not the stronger push on the coast road but the weight of armor building up against his inland flank which had expedited his order, on the 22nd, to give up that line and withdraw to the Tunisian frontier. 
when the 51st Division advanced by moonlight, with the leading infantry riding on the tops of the tanks, they found that the enemy had vanished. By daybreak on January 23 the spear tips of the converging British columns had driven into Tripoli unopposed. The attainment of that objective, which had been the goal of successive British offensives since 1941, crowned the 1,400 mile advance from Alumn in pursuit of Rommel. It was reached exactly three months, to the day, after the launching of the offensive. For Montgomery and his troops it was an exhilarating achievement, but in him it also produced a sigh of relief, for, as he wrote, I was experiencing the first real anxiety I had suffered since assuming the command of the Eighth Army. A gale in the first week of January had played havoc in the harbour at Benghazi, reducing the intake of stores from 3,000 tons a day to less than a thousand, and compelling him to fall back on the use of Torbuk, nearly 800 miles from Tripoli, which meant considerably lengthening the already very long line of supply by road. To provide the extra lift he had grounded the 10th Corps and used its transport but feared that he would have to suspend the advance unless he could reach Tripoli within ten days of the start of his new push. The enemy, fortunately for him, were not aware of his time and supply problem, whereas it was clear to them that he was advancing on them with an overwhelming superiority in tanks, fourteen to one against those of the 15th Panzer Division, the only really effective tanks they had. If the 21st Panzer Division had not been called away to meet the threatened American thrust towards the Gabe's bottleneck, a thrust that was cancelled two days after the dispatch of this division, on the 13th, a stand on the Tahuna Homs line would have been more possible. In that case Montgomery, on his own evidence, might have had to break off the advance and withdraw to Burat, for when he entered Tripoli he was within two days of the expiry of his ten-day time limit. At Tripoli he paused for several weeks to build up and clear the demolition blocked harbour. It was not until February 3rd that the first ship was able to enter, and it was the 9th before the first convoy came in. Only light troops had followed up the enemy's withdrawal, and Montgomery's leading division did not advance across the Tunisian frontier until the 16th, Rommel's rearguard having withdrawn on the previous night into the forefield of the Meath line which the French had originally built to check an Italian invasion of Tunisia from Tripolitania. It consisted merely of a chain of antiquated blockhouses, and Rommel thought it better to rely on field entrenchments newly dug in the spaces between them. Indeed, after inspecting the Meath line, he urged that it would be wiser to base the defence of this approach route to Tunis on the line of the Wadi Akarat, 40 miles back and fifteen miles west of Gabes, which could not be outflanked, as its inland flank rested on the Saul Marsh area of the Chotel Jurid. But his proposal was not acceptable to distant dictators who were still hopefully erecting castles in the air, and his own stock was at its lowest point. Mussolini vented his spleen at the loss of Tripoli by recalling Bastico and dismissing Cavallero, who was replaced by General Ambrosio. Meanwhile Rommel had received a telegram, on January 26, notifying him that in view of the bad state of his health he would be relieved of command after consolidating his new position in the Meath line, and that his army was to be renamed the 1st Italian Army, with General Giovanni Mess as its commander. He was, however, left to choose the date of handover and departure, a concession of which he took advantage, to the Allies' detriment. Rommel was a sick man and the strain of the last three months had not improved his condition. But he was to show, in February, that he still had a strong kick in him. Instead of being dismayed by the Americans' close approach to his line of retreat through southern Tunisia, he scented a fine opportunity of striking the before Montgomery could again catch up with him. Although the Meath defences were poor, they did provide an obstacle to tank attack and should at least delay Montgomery. Moreover, Rommel's own strength was reviving. In retreating westward, he had come nearer to his supple ports and had gained more than he had lost during the long retreat, while in number of troops he had now as many as when the autumn battle of Alamn opened. At the time he arrived in Tunisia his army totaled close on 30,000 Germans, and about 48,000 Italians, 
although this role included the 21st Panzer Division, which had been sent back to the Gabesfax area, and also the Centro Armored Division, which was being sent to guard the El Geta defile, facing the American position at Gafsa. In armament, however, the situation was not nearly so good, the German units were about one-third of full strength in tanks, one-fourth in anti-tank guns, and one-sixth in artillery. Moreover, out of approximately 130 tanks, less than half were fit for action. Nevertheless the overall situation was relatively better than it was likely to become once Montgomery had time to make full use of the port of Tripoli and mass his superior strength on the Tunisian frontier. Rommel was eager to profit by the interval. So he now planned a double stroke in Napoleonic style to exploit what strategists term the interior lines theory, taking advantage of a central position, between two converging enemy forces, to strike at one of them before the other can aid it. If he could crumple up the Americans poised behind him, he would have both hands free to tackle Montgomery's 8th Army which was now thinned out by the way its lines of supply had been stretched. It was a brilliant plan, but Trommel's biggest handicap in putting it into effect was that it had to depend largely on forces which were not under his own control. He could spare only enough from the Mayerath line to form one large combat group, less than half the size of a division, under Colonel von Liebenstein. His famous and trusty 21st Panzer Division, sent back to Tunisia earlier, was right on the spot where he wanted to strike, but it had passed under the command of General von Arnim's army. It was thus left to Arnim, at the outset, to decide the aims of the main thrust and the strength that should be employed, while Rommel was limited to helping it on so far as he could. The American Second Corps, which included a French division, was the target of this counterstroke. Its front covered 90 miles, but was really focused on the three routes through the mountains to the sea, with spearheads at the passes near Gafsa, Fade, and Fonduc, where it linked up with the French 19th Corps under General Coelts. These passageways were so narrow that the occupiers felt secure, and the attention of the Allied Higher Command had been largely absorbed in checking a series of Axis probing attacks in the sector north of Fonduc. But at the end of January, the veteran 21st Panzer made a sudden spring at the Fade Pass, overwhelmed the poorly armed French garrison there before American aid belatedly arrived, and thus gained a sally port for the bigger attack to follow. This coup made the Allied Higher Commanders suspect that such an offensive was being planned by the enemy but they did not expect it where it came. Regarding the preliminary fade stroke as a diversion, they believed that the attack would be delivered near Fonduc. As General Omar Bradley remarked in his memoirs, this belief came to be a near-fatal assumption. It prevailed both at Eisenhower's headquarters and at those of the British First Army, under Anderson, who had now been placed in charge of the whole Allied front in Tunisia pending the arrival of Alexander. The latter had been appointed at the Casablanca conference to command, under Eisenhower, the new 18th Army group made up of the 1st and 8th Armies, which was to be constituted when the latter entered Tunisia. To guard the expected line of attack, Anderson was led to keep Combat Command B, with half the American armor, back in reserve behind Fonduc. That miscalculation helped to ease the way for the enemy's advance. By the beginning of February the Axis forces in Tunisia had risen to a total of 100,000, 74,000 Germans and 26,000 Italians, which was a much better ratio to the Allied strength than it had been in December, or was likely to be when the Allied concentration was completed. About 30% were administrative personnel. The available strength in armor, which was almost entirely dependent on the German contribution, was just over 280 tanks, 110 with the 10th Panzer Division, 91 with the 21st Panzer Division, exactly half the full complement on the existing establishment scale, a dozen Tigers in a special unit, while Rommel was bringing a battalion of 26 tanks in Liebenstein's combat group to reinforce 23 surviving Italian tanks of the Centro Division on the Gafsa Road. This total fell a long way short of the Allied strength, 
and even if the whole of it was employed would not provide a numerical superiority on the intended front of attack in the southerly part of Tunisia. For the U.S. 1st Armored Division supporting that sector, although still short of full strength, had about 300 tanks in operation, although 90 were Stuarts, and 36 tank destroyers, and was much stronger in artillery than a Panzer Division. But to Rommel's disappointment only part of the 10th Panzer Division, with one medium tank battalion and a company of four Tigers, was sent down to reinforce the 21st, and merely for the opening phase, as Arnhem was planning to use the 10th for a thrust he planned to deliver farther north. The establishment of a British armoured division had recently been reduced to approximately 270 tanks, exclusive of specialised ones, and American divisions, with certain exceptions, were reorganised on a similar scale later in the year. But in 1944 the British armoured divisions were raised to a scale of 310, by equipping their reconnaissance unit with tanks instead of armoured cars, and the actual strength of the allied armoured divisions, in number of tanks available for action, was usually two to three times as large as the German. To maintain a balance the Germans had to depend on a qualitative advantage. Rommel's attempt to outflank First Army on February 14 the real offensive opened, when the 21st Panzer Division pounced again, from Fade, together with the contingent from the 10th. Arnhem's deputy, General Ziegler, was in immediate charge of the attack. While the two small combat groups from the 10th Panzer Division swept forward from the Fade Pass, opening out like pincer arms to grip the advanced part of the U.S. 1st Armored Division, Combat Command A, two more from the 21st Panzer Division, each with a tank battalion as its core, made a wider circuit southward, during the night, to outflank and trap the Americans. Although fragments managed to escape before the ring was closed, around Sidi Bouzid, loss of equipment was very heavy. The battlefield was strewn with blazing American tanks, 40 being lost in this action. Next morning Combat Command C was hastily sent forward to deliver a counter-attack, and was promptly trapped by encircling German moves, only four of its tanks getting away. Thus two fine battalions of medium tanks had been wiped out successively in these piecemeal fights against the enemy's skillful concentration of superior force from inferior resources. Fortunately for the Allies, the Germans were slow in their follow-up. Rommel had urged Ziegler, on the 14th, to drive on during the night and exploit the opening success to the full. The Americans had no practical battle experience, and it was for us to instill them with a deep inferiority complex from the outset. But Ziegler felt bound to wait until he had obtained Arnim's authorization, and it was only on the 17th that he pushed forward 25 miles to Spitler, where the Americans had rallied. There, in consequence, the Germans met stiffer opposition, as Combat Command B, now led by Brigadier General Paul Robinet, had been rushed south. It kept the Germans at bay until late in the afternoon, and helped to cover the retreat of the battered remnants of the other two combat commands before withdrawing itself, as part of a general wheel back of the Allies' southern wing, ordered by Anderson, to the line of the western dorsal mountain ridges. Although the Germans' entry into Spitler had been delayed, their total bag had risen to more than a hundred tanks and nearly three thousand prisoners. Meanwhile the combat group brought up by Rommel, and directed against the Allies' extreme southern flank at Gafsa, had pushed into that road centre when it was evacuated on the 15th. Accelerating its pace, and swinging northwest, it advanced fifty miles farther by the 17th, through Fiorana, and captured the American airfields at Thalept. So it had now come up almost level with the 21st Panzer but 35 miles to the west of it, and thus closer to the Allies' communications. Alexander, who arrived on the scene that day, and took over charge of both armies on the 19th, said in his dispatch that in the confusion of the retreat American, French, and British troops had become inextricably mingled, there was no coordinated plan of defence and definite uncertainty as to command. Rommel heard that the Allies had set fire to their supple depots at Tebassa, 
40 miles on beyond the next mountain range. That appeared to him clear evidence that they were getting jittery. Now came the real turning point, although the Allied commanders imagined it was three days later. Rommel wanted to exploit the confusion and panic by a combined drive with all the available mechanized forces through Tebasa. He felt that such a deep thrust towards the Allies' main communications would force the British and Americans to pull back the bulk of their forces to Algeria, a prospect that was now prominent in the anxious minds of the Allied commanders. But he found that Arnim, who had already called off the 10th Panzer Division, was unwilling to embark on such a venture. So Rommel sent his proposals to the Commando Supremo, counting on Mussolini's desire for a victory to bolster up his internal political position, while Bayon won over the Air Force commander in Tunisia and gained his support for the plan. The hours slipped by, and it was not until almost midnight on the 18th that a signal came from Rome authorizing the continued attack, appointing Rommel to conduct it, and placing both panzer divisions under him for the purpose. But the order conveyed that the thrust should be made northward to Thala and Lugev, instead of northwestward through Tebasa. In Rommel's view that change was an appalling and incredible piece of short-sightedness, for it meant that the combined thrust was far too close to the front and bound to bring us up against the strong enemy reserves. So the attack came where Alexander was expecting it, as he had ordered Anderson to concentrate his armor for the defense of Thala, although on the erroneous calculation that Rommel would prefer to seek a tactical victory than to pursue a less direct strategic aim. This mistaken assumption turned out fortunately for the Allies as things went, thanks to the Commando Supremo, but the Allied forces would have been caught badly off balance had Rommel been allowed to drive the way he wished. For the bulk of the reinforcements, American and British, that had been rushed south were sent to Thala and the Spiba sector east of it while Tebasa was meagerly covered by what remained of the U.S. 1st Armoured Division. The main British reinforcement was the 6th Armoured Division. Its armoured component, the 26th Armoured Brigade, was posted at Thala while additional infantry and also the artillery of the now-arriving U.S. 9th Infantry Division were brought there to support it. The 1st Guards Brigade, the Lorried Infantry component of the 6th Armoured Division, was posted to guard the Spieber Gap due north of Spitler, along with three regimental combat teams from the U.S. 1st and 34th Infantry Divisions. Rommel's thrust was launched early on February 19, within a few hours of receiving the Commando Supremo's sanction. But the prospects were diminished both by the earlier delays and by Arnim's action in calling the 10th Panzer Division northward, so that it had to be recalled and could not arrive in time to play a part in the first phase of the new attack. Thus handicapped, Rommel decided to swing his Africa Corps combat group round to lead the advance on Lakef through Thala, while using the 21st Panzer Division for an effort to reach Lakef by the converging road through Spieber, so that the two lines of thrust might develop a mutual leverage helpful to both. The approach to Thala was through the Kasserain Pass, midway between Spitler and Firiana, and the position here was held by an American composite force under Colonel Stark. An initial attempt to rush the pass by surprise was checked, and in the afternoon various reinforcements arrived that brought Stark's force up to a strength considerably exceeding that of the Africa Corps group, three small battalions, one of tanks and two of infantry, which was carrying out the attack. But the defense was not well coordinated, so that the Germans managed to infiltrate at some points in the evening, and still far there after dark. Meanwhile the 21st Panzer Division's push for Spiebel had been blocked by a minefield and the strong Allied force deployed behind it, 11 infantry battalions against the attackers too, as well as a superior number of guns and tanks, for the 21st Panzer Division now had less than 40 in operation. So during the night Rommel decided to concentrate on forcing the Kasserine Pass, where the defense seemed more shaky, and to employ the the belatedly arriving 10th Panzer Division. The now shrinking prospect was diminished, however, as it included only one tank battalion, two infantry battalions, and a motorcycle battalion. Arnhem had kept back almost half the division, 
and its attached battalion of Tiger tanks, on which Rommel had been counting as a trump card in playing his hand. His concentrated attack on the Kasserine Pass could not be delivered until the afternoon of the 20th, as the elements of the 10th Panzer Division did not arrive until then, a delay which made him extremely angry. A morning attack had been checked by the defenders' fire, but at 4.30 pm, having come close up to the front himself, he threw all the available infantry, five battalions, including one, the 5th Bersigliere Battalion, of Italians, into a simultaneous assault, and this quickly broke through. But the attackers then met stubborn resistance from a very small British detachment, an armoured squadron, an infantry company, and a field battery, under Lieutenant Colonel A.C. Gore which had been sent to support the defence of the pass, and this was only overcome after a Panzer battalion had been brought up, and its eleven tanks had been knocked out. The American official history, with an honest error in the official histories of any country, not only emphasizes the exceptionally tough resistance put up by this detachment, but significantly remarks with reference to the easy breakthrough elsewhere, the enemy was amazed at the quantity and quality of the American equipment captured more or less intact. After capturing the pass, Rommel sent reconnoitering detachments up the road towards Thala and also up the Fork Road to Tebasa, in order to put the Allies on the horns of a dilemma in moving their reserves and also to explore the possibility of pursuing his own original aim of capturing the vast American supply dumps at Tebasa. The first aim, and effect, had already been produced by the news of Rommel's progress. For Friedendel, after ordering Robinet's combat command B in the morning to switch from the extreme right flank to Thala, had later diverted it to cover the fork road from Kasserine to Tebasa. Meanwhile, the British 26th Armoured Brigade Group, under Brigadier Charles Dunphy, with two armoured regiments and two infantry battalions, had moved south from Thala, and taken up a position about 10 miles from the Kasserine Pass, in expectation of Combat Command B's arrival to support it. Fortunately for the Allies, the attackers' strength was much weaker than they imagined. Next morning, February 21, Rommel at first stood fast in expectation of an allied counter-attack, to recapture the Kasserine Pass. That pause seemed surprising to his opponents, who did not realize how slender was his strength compared with what they had now gathered. When he found that they remained static, he pushed on up the road to Thala with such part of the 10th Panzer Division as he had under command, it amounted only to a combat group, comprising 30 tanks. 20 self-propelled guns and two panzer grenadier, motorized infantry, battalions. Dunphy's brigade group fell back gradually before the Germans, making a stand on successive ridges until outflanked and enfiladed. But when its tanks withdrew at dusk into the Thala position already prepared, a string of German tanks followed close on their tail, cunningly headed by a captured Valentine, so that they were assumed to be British stragglers. Thus the Germans burst into the position, overrunning part of the infantry, shooting up many vehicles, and spreading confusion. Although checked after a three-hour melee, they carried away 700 prisoners on withdrawing. In this series of fights up the road from Kasserine they had lost a dozen tanks, but had knocked out nearly 40 of the opposing tanks, including those of a squadron which lost direction and ran into the midst of their tank leaguer in a dawn counter-attack next morning. Expecting a larger counter-attack to follow, Rommel decided to await it, with the idea of following up its repulse. But, during the morning, air reconnaissance showed that large allied reinforcements had arrived on the scene and that more were approaching so it became evident that the prospect of further exploitation through Thala had waned, while the Axis left flank was now in growing danger. On the previous afternoon the Africa Corps combat group had pushed up the Tebasa Fork Road with the aim of securing the passes there, to cover the flank of the thrust for Thala, but had been checked by a heavy concentration of fire from the American artillery positions on the high ground. A renewal of the effort on the morning of the 22nd brought only slight gain and more serious losses than the attackers could afford, for in this sector they were now greatly outnumbered by the American forces assembled there.
Robinet's Combat Command B and part of Terry Allen's 1st Infantry Division. That afternoon Rommel and Kesselring, who had flown to see him, came to the conclusion that no further advantages could be achieved by pursuing the westward counterstroke, and that it should be broken off in order to switch the striking force back for the eastward counterstroke against the British Eighth Army. Following this decision, the Axis troops were ordered to begin withdrawing that evening, to the Kasserim Pass in the first place. Meanwhile Allen had been trying since early in the morning to organize a counter-attack against the Axis flank, but it was delayed by the difficulty of getting into communication with Robinet, and did not develop until late in the afternoon. It then hastened and hustled the Africa Corps group's withdrawal to the Kasserim Pass, the Italian elements retreating in disorder. Rommel was impressed by the growing tactical skill here shown by the American troops and the accuracy of their artillery fire, as well as by the abundance of their armament. His relatively weak forces would have been in grave danger if a larger and wider counter-attack had developed. But his weakness and the way that the situation had changed were not realized on the higher level of the Allied command. As the US official history remarks, Fred Endel's direction of ground operations against the retreating enemy became extraordinarily hesitant at just the time that the enemy was most vulnerable. Anderson, too, was still thinking defensively. Indeed, the large Allied force at Spiba was that night withdrawn some ten miles northward in fear that Rommel might break through at Thala and threaten its rear. Under a similar fear the evacuation of Tebasa on the other flank was being contemplated. Even when the enemy's withdrawal from Thala was discovered, on the morning of the 23rd, nothing was done to press upon it, and not until late that night were orders given for a general counter-attack to be mounted, for launching on the 25th. By that time the enemy had safely withdrawn through the Kasserim bottleneck, and the Allied effort to destroy the enemy and recapture the pass became merely a processional march meeting only the road demolitions and mines which the vanished enemy had strewn in his wake. When due account is taken of the balance of the forces, and the hardening resistance, it becomes clear that the termination of the Axis offensive was very well judged. To press it any further would have been folly in face of the vastly superior strength by now assembled on the Allied side. Materially, the profits of the offensive were large in comparison with its cost. Over 4,000 prisoners had been taken at the price of little more than a thousand casualties, and some 200 tanks destroyed or disabled at an even smaller ratio of loss. Thus as a limited objective stroke it had been a brilliant success. But it had fallen short of, although coming dangerously near to, the strategic object of producing an allied retreat from Tunisia. Such a result would have been probable if the whole of the 10th Panzer Division had been allotted for the counter-stroke and Drommel had been in charge of the operation from the outset with freedom to direct it against Tebasa. A swift seizure of that American main base and airfield center, with its huge accumulation of supplies, would have made it impossible for the Allied forces to maintain their position in Tunisia. The irony of fortune was demonstrated by the arrival of an order from Rome, on February 23rd, placing all the Axis forces in Tunisia under Rommel's command. While this appointment to command the newly constituted Army Group Africa showed how the dramatic effect of the counterstroke had revived his stock in the minds of Mussolini and Hitler, its timing had a bitter flavor for Rommel, since it came the morning after the withdrawal had begun and far too late to redeem the lost opportunity. It also came too late to cancel Arnhem's intended thrust in the north, for which Arnhem had kept back reserves that could have been much better employed in Rommel's. As planned, the capture of Medjez el Bab was to be the limited objective, and the attack was to be launched on the 26th, with two panzer battalions and six others. But at dawn on the 24th Arnhem, after sending one of his staff to inform Rommel about this limited plan, flew to see Kesselring in Rome and from their discussion a far more ambitious plan emerged later that day. Under it, attacks were to be launched at eight different points along the 70-mile stretch of front between the north coast and Pont du Fars, against the British 5th Corps, 46th, 78th, and Y divisions, with a French regimental group near the coast. The main thrust, by an armoured group, 
was to be aimed at the road center of Bidya, 60 miles west of Tunis, and combined with a short-range pincer attack to capture Medjez el Bab. Though all available forces were employed, the increase of strength was nowhere near equal to the extension of the assault. For the Bidja thrust the armored group, of two panzer battalions, was raised to a total strength of 77 tanks, including 14 tigers, but even this slender scale was only attained by Poloining 15 that had just arrived at Tunis on their way to the 21st Panzer Division in the south. Rommel was taken aback when informed of the new plan, and described it as completely unrealistic, although ascribing it mistakenly to the Italian commando Supremo, which had been as staggered as he was when informed of it. Arnhem's operation order was issued on the 25th, and the offensive was launched next day, thus keeping to the intended date of the smaller plan. That was remarkable testimony to the speed and elasticity of German planning, if too hurried for such extensive changes. Even so, the best performance was achieved by the newly added attacks carried out by Mantuffel's division, on the northernmost sector which almost reached the Allies' main lateral road at Jbalabiod, and took 1,600 prisoners from the French and British troops holding this sector. But the main attack by the German armoured group, after overrunning the British forward position near Sidinsa, became trapped in a narrow and marshy defile ten miles short of Bidja, where the British field and anti-tank guns took heavy toll. All save six of the German tanks were put out of action and the push petered out. The secondary attack to pinch off Medjez el Bab ended in failure, after some initial success, and so did the other attacks further south. Altogether Arnhem's offensive took 2,500 prisoners at a cost of just over 1,000 casualties, but that was outweighed by the fact that 71 of his tanks were destroyed or disabled, while the British lost less than a score for the Germans were already suffering from a shortage of tanks and theirs could not be so easily replaced. Worse still, this abortive offensive caused delay in releasing the divisions needed for Rommel's intended second stroke, against Montgomery's position at Medanine, facing the mayor at the line. For Kesselring had asked that the 10th and 21st Panzer divisions should stay near enough to the Americans' flank for long enough to deter them from sending reserves northward to help in meeting Arnhem's offensive. This delay made a vital difference to the prospects of Rommel's eastward counterstroke. Until February 26 Montgomery had only one division up forward at Medanine. He admitted that for once he was worried and his staff worked feverishly to redress the balance before Ommel could strike. By March 6, when the blow came, Montgomery's strength was quadrupled, the equivalent of four divisions with nearly 400 tanks, 350 guns, and 470 anti-tank guns. Thus, in the interval, Rommel's chance of striking with superior force had vanished. His three panzer divisions, the 10th, 15th, and 21st, mustered only 160 tanks, less than one would have had at full strength, and were supported in the attack by no more than 200 guns and 10,000 infantry, apart from the string of weak Italian divisions stationed in the Meath line. Moreover, Montgomery now had three fighter wings operating from forward airfields, so was assured of air superiority while Rommel's chance of achieving surprise was annulled when the Panzer Division's approach was spotted and reported on March 4, two days in advance of their attack. In such a situation, Montgomery was able to make the most of his ability for planning a well-woven defense, and the attack was shattered even more effectively than at Alamhafer six months earlier. The advancing Germans were soon pinned down and whittled away by the British concentration of fire. Realizing the futility of continuing, Rommel broke off his attack in the evening. But by that time he had lost more than 40 tanks, although in men the casualties were only 645. The defenders' losses were much slighter. This repulse dispelled any reasonable hopes that the outnumbered and outweeped Axis forces might be able to cripple one of the two allied armies before they linked up and developed a combined pressure. Already the week before, 
Rommel had sent Kesselring a sober and somber appreciation of the situation which embodied the view of his two army commanders, Arnhem and Mess, as well as his own. In it he had emphasized that the Axis forces were holding a front of nearly 400 miles against much superior forces, twice as strong in men while six times as strong in tanks, and were strung out perilously thin. He had urged that the front should be shortened to a 90-mile arc covering Tunis and Bizeta, but said that this could only be held if supplies were increased to 140,000 tons a month, and had pointedly asked for enlightenment as to the higher command's long-term plans for the Tunisian campaign. The reply he received, after several urgent reminders, simply said that the Führer did not agree with his judgment of the situation. Attached to it was a table setting forth the number of formations on either side, irrespective of actual strength and equipment, the same false basis of comparison which the Allied commanders used, then and later, in rendering account of their successes. After the failure at Medanine, Rommel came to the conclusion that it would be plain suicide for the German-Italian forces to stay in Africa. So on March 9, taking his long-deferred sick leave, he handed over command of the army group to Arnim, and flew to Europe in an effort to make his masters understand the situation. As it turned out, the result was merely to terminate his connection with the campaign in Africa. On landing in Rome he saw Mussolini, who seemed to lack any sense of reality in adversity, and spent the whole time searching for arguments to justify his views. Then Rommel went on to see Hitler who was impervious to Rommel's arguments and made it plain that in his view I had become a pessimist. He barred Rommel from returning to Africa for the moment, and told him that he might thus get fit in time to take command of operations against Casablanca. In view of Casablanca's remoteness on the Atlantic coast, it is evident that Hitler was still imagining that he could throw the Allies completely out of Africa, which showed his extreme state of delusion. Meanwhile a converging Allied offensive was being mounted with greatly superior strength to capture the southern gateway into Tunisia, enable the 8th Army to join up with the 1st, and pinch out Messe's 1st Italian Army, formerly Rommel's Panzer Army Africa. Bayonne, although nominally no more than Messe's German Chief of Staff, held direct and complete control of all the German components. Following the heavy repulse of the German counterstroke at Medanine, Montgomery did not try to exploit this defensive success and the enemy's shaken state by an immediate follow-up, but proceeded methodically to continue building up his forces and supplies for a deliberate attack on the Meath line. This was planned for delivery on March 20, two weeks after the Medanine battle. To aid it, by leverage on the enemy's back, an attack by the American Second Corps in southern Tunisia was launched three days earlier, on March 17. Its aims, prescribed by Anderson and endorsed by Alexander, were threefold, to draw off enemy resources that might be used to block Montgomery, to regain the forward airfields near Thalept for use in aiding Montgomery's advance, and to establish a forward supply centre near Gafsa, to help in provisioning him as he advanced but the attacking force was not asked to cut off the enemy's retreat by driving through to the coast road. That limitation of its aims was inspired by doubts of the Americans' capability for such a deep thrust, 160 miles to the sea from its starting points, and a desire to avoid exposing them to another German counterstroke such as they had suffered in February. But the restraint galled the aggressive ardor of Patton, who had been appointed to replace Friedendel as corps commander. The Second Corps now comprised four divisions and a strength of 88,000 men, which was about four times that of the Axis forces available to oppose them. Moreover in the target area there were estimated to be only 800 Germans and 7,850 Italians, the latter mainly with the Centro Division near Gafsa. The American attack started promisingly. On the 17th Allen's 1st Infantry Division occupied Gafsa without a fight, the Italians withdrawing nearly 20 miles to a defile position east of Elgeta, astride the forking roads to the coastal towns of Gabes and Mahers. On the 20th Ward's 1st Armoured Division drove down from the Kasserine area onto the flank of the 3rd route from Gafsa to the coast, 
and the next morning occupied station descend, prior to advancing eastward through Macnessy to the pass beyond. That day Alexander loosened the rein on Peyton by telling him to prepare a strong armoured thrust to cut the coast road, as a great raid to Montgomery's offensive against the Mayath line, which had just been launched. But it was stultified by the stubborn defence of the pass and surrounding heights by the very small German detachment posted there, under Colonel Rudolf Lang. Successive attacks on the 23rd to capture the dominating hill 322 were checked, although it was defended by only some 80 men composed of what had formerly been Rommel's bodyguard. A renewed attack next day, by three battalions of infantry supported by four battalions of artillery and two companies of tanks, was again repulsed, although the defending force had only risen to 350 men. A fresh attempt was made on the 25th, led personally by Ward, on a peremptory telephone order from Patton, who insisted that the attack had to succeed. But it did not succeed and had to be abandoned in face of the enemy's increased reinforcements. Patton had already complained that the division had dawdled, and Ward was subsequently relieved of command. But Patton was so attack-minded that he did not realize the inherent advantages of defense, even against much superior numbers, especially when conducted by highly skilled troops against inexperienced attackers. Those advantages meanwhile had another demonstration in the El Geta sector, and by troops who were comparatively inexperienced but particularly well trained, the US 1st Infantry Division. Here Allen's troops had broken into the Italian position on the 21st, and made some further progress next day, but on the 23rd were hit by a German counterstroke. This was delivered by the depleted 10th Panzer Division, the Army Group Africa's main reserve which had been rushed up from the coast. It comprised two tank and two infantry battalions with one motorcycle and one artillery battalion, the attackers overran the American forward positions but were then checked by a minefield, and then heavily hammered by Allen's artillery and tank destroyers. That blunted the edge of the attack, and a renewal of it in the evening had no better success, as an American infantry report exultantly put it. Our artillery crucified them with high explosive shells and they were falling like flies. Although the German loss in their second attack was not so heavy as here picturesquely reported, some 40 tanks were knocked out by fire or disabled by mines during the day. By drawing the enemy's main armored reserve into this costly counterstroke, the Americans' limited thrust had brought compensation for its own failure at Macnessy. It had not only drawn off an important counterweight to Montgomery's prospects, but drained away more of the enemy's scanty tank strength. For their ultimate victory the Allies owed more to the enemy's three unsuccessful counter-strokes, which followed the advantageous mid-February one at Fade, than they did to their own assaults. The possibility of gaining the ascendancy came only after the enemy had overstrained and drained his own strength. Later the enemy might still have protracted the struggle but for the way he continued to use up his remaining strength in abortive retorts. Montgomery's attack on the Meath line was launched on the night of March 20. For it he had brought up both the 10th and the 30th Corps, with about 160,000 men, 610 tanks, and 1,410 guns. While Messe's army comprised a nominal nine divisions compared with Montgomery's six, it mustered less than 80,000 men, with 150 tanks, including those with the 10th Panzer Division near Gafsa, and 680 guns. Thus the attacker had a superiority of more than 2 to 1 in men and guns, as well as in aircraft, and 4 to 1 in tanks. Moreover, the Meath line stretched for 22 miles, from the sea to the Matmata Hills, and beyond this range had an open desert flank. In the circumstances it would have been wiser for the relatively weak Axis forces to attempt merely a delaying defense of the Meath line, with mobile forces, and to make their stand on the Wadi Akarit position north of Gabes, a bottleneck barely 14 miles wide between the sea and the Saul Marshes. The Chots. That was the course Rommel had advocated, and the position he had proposed, ever since the retreat from Alamn in November. When he saw Hitler on March 10, 
he had succeeded in getting Hitler to agree, and to instruct Kesselring that the non-mobile Italian divisions in the Meerath line should be moved back to the Wadi Akarat to build a position there. But the Italian leaders preferred to hold on to the Meerath line, and Kesselring, who shared their views, induced Hitler to cancel the new orders. Montgomery's original plan was codenamed Pugilist Gallop. Under it the main blow was a frontal one, by the three infantry divisions of Oliver Lees's 30th Corps, intended to break through the defense near the sea and make a gap through which the armored force of Brian Horrocks's 10th Corps would drive to exploit success. At the same time, the provisionally formed New Zealand Corps under Bernard Freyberg made a wide outflanking march towards El Hammer, 25 miles inland from Gabes, to menace the enemy's rear and pin down his reserves. The frontal attack was a failure. Launched on a narrow sector near the coast, by one infantry brigade and a regiment of 50 infantry tanks, it made only a shallow dent in the enemy position, which was covered by the Wadi Zigzal, 200 feet wide and 20 feet deep, and an anti tank ditch beyond this. The soft bed of the Wadi, and the mines laid there, hindered the advance of the tanks and supporting guns, while the infantry foothold in the enemy's position beyond it became a concentrated target for enfilading fire. A reinforced renewal of the assault on the following night achieved some expansion of the bridgehead, and many of the Italian troops took the opportunity of surrendering when the British got in among them. But the arrival of the anti-tank guns was still delayed by the marshy ground they had to cross and in the afternoon the forward infantry were overrun by a German counter-attack while still inadequately supported, and under cover of darkness the British fell back across their wadi. Thus by the night of the 22nd the frontal attack had not only failed to make an adequate breach, but abandoned its lodgment in the enemy defences. Meanwhile the outflanking move had started well but then been held up. After a long approach march from the 8th Army's rear area, Across a difficult stretch of desert, the New Zealand Corps had brought its 27,000 men and 200 tanks close to the hill gap called Plum, 30 miles west of Gabes and 15 miles southwest of El Hammer, by the night of the 20th when the coastal assault opened. But after clearing the approaches it met a prolonged check at this hill gap, where the Italian defenders were reinforced successively by the 21st Panzer Division from the reserve and then by the four battalions of the 164th Light Africa Division, which was brought back from the right of the Meerath line. In the early hours of March 23rd, when there was clearly no chance of reviving the coastal attack, Montgomery decided to recast his plan, and concentrate all his resources on the inland flank, as there was better ground for hope there that a renewed attack in greater strength might break through to El Hammer. He ordered Horrocks with the headquarters of his 10th Corps and the 1st Armoured Division, commanded by Major General Raymond Briggs, 160 tanks, to start moving inland that night and make a long circuit through the desert to reinforce the New Zealanders. At the same time the 4th Indian Division, Major General Francis Tuca, was to sidestep inland from Mednine and clear the Halufa Pass, through the Matmata Hills the use of which would shorten by more than a hundred miles the supple route to the massive maneuver advancing on the desert flank. After clearing the pass, Tuca was to push northward along the hilltops, past the immediate flank of the Meerath line, thus producing an additional threat to the enemy's flank and opening an alternative line of thrust for exploitation if the wider maneuver through the plum gap was blocked. The new plan was a fine conception and masterly switch. It showed Montgomery's capacity for flexibility in varying his thrust point, and creating fresh leverage when checked, even better than at Alum, although, as was his habit, he subsequently tended to obscure credit due to him for such flexibility, the hallmark of generalship, by talking as if everything had gone according to plan from the outset. In many respects Meath was his finest battle performance in the war, despite the troubles ensuing from his initial plan in trying to force a breakthrough on a narrow and marshy sector near the coast, and disclosing the potentialities of the desert maneuver without using sufficient strength to ensure its speedy fulfillment. This premature disclosure became the chief handicap to the new plan of attack, 
called Supercharge 2 apostrophe, a name prompted by memories of the finally successful planet Alum. For having been alerted by the New Zealanders' arrival near Plum on the 20th, the Axis command was quick to deduce that the further movements in that direction which were spotted on the evening of the 23rd and again on the 24th, by observers on the hills, portended a change in Montgomery's plan and the switching of his weight to the desert flank. Accordingly, the 15th Panzer Division was brought back near to El Hammer, in readiness to support the 21st Panzer and 164th Light, two days before the British reinforcements reached that area, only just in time for the planned launch of the attack on the afternoon of March 26. The prospects of supercharge IT diminished when surprise vanished, but that loss was compensated by the combination of four other factors. The primary one was that Arnhem had decided, on the 24th, to withdraw Mess's army to the Wadi Akarit position rather than risk it being trapped, and overruled Mess's desire to cling on to the Mare Ath line, so that the defenders of the Hill Gap were only required to hold up the assault long enough to extricate the non mobile divisions in the Mare Ath line. The second factor was the way that the path of the assault was swept by an air barrage, produced by successive low level attacks with bombs and cannon fire, by 16 squadrons of fighter bombers, operating in 15-minute relays of two squadrons at a time. This defense-stunning adaptation of the German Blitz method was organized by Air Vice Marshal Harry Broadhurst, commanding the Desert Air Force, and worked very effectively, although frowned on by his distant RAF superiors as a breach of air staff doctrine. The third factor was the bold decision to press on the armoured advance during the night, a course which the Germans had often pursued with profit, but which the British had been reluctant to try. The fourth factor was a stroke of good luck, that a sandstorm blew up which cloaked the assembly of the British armour and the first stage of its advance through a hill gap bristling with enemy anti-tank guns on both flanks. The attack was launched at 4pm on the 26th with the sun low behind it to help in blinding the defenders. The 8th Armoured Brigade and the New Zealand Infantry led the way. Then Raymond Briggs's 1st Armoured Division passed through them about 6 p.m., penetrated 5 miles under cover of dust and dusk, paused at 7.30 p.m. when darkness fell, and drove forward again in a solid phalanx just before midnight when the moon rose. By daybreak, on March 27, it was safely through the bottleneck and had arrived on the edge of El Hammer. But here the British were checked for two days by the Germans' anti-tank screen, and a counter-attack against their flank by some 30 tanks of the 15th Panzer Division. The delay was long enough to allow the bulk of the Mare at line garrison, even though marching on foot, to escape the threatened cut-off and withdraw to the Wadi Akarat position. About 5,000 Italians had been taken prisoner, mainly in the earlier phase of the battle, and 1,000 Germans were captured in the fighting near El Hammer, but their sacrificial effort to cover the coastal corridor of retreat enabled the bulk of the Axis forces to withdraw safely, and with little loss of equipment. A quick switch of thrust line might have reached the coast and cut them off, but the opportunity was missed. More than a week's pause followed before Montgomery was ready to tackle the enemy's new position. Meanwhile Patton renewed his attack towards the coast and the enemy's rear, being reinforced for the purpose with the US 9th and 34th Infantry Divisions. While the main thrust was to be from El Geta towards Gabes, with the 1st and 9th Infantry Divisions opening a path for the 1st Armoured, the 34th was to capture the Fonduc Pass, a hundred miles to the north and thus open a further route into the coastal plain. But the Fonduc attack, made on March 27, was soon checked, by a thinly strung defence, and abandoned next day. The 34th Division then fell back four miles to the west to get out of range and reorganise, a withdrawal that led its opponents to draw the conclusion, in a battlefield report, that, the American gives up the fight as soon as he is attacked. The main attack, from El Geta, was delivered on the 28th but also suffered a check, after a small gain of ground in harder fighting. By that time Montgomery had broken through at El Hammer and reached Gabes, 
so Alexander directed Patton to launch his armored column towards the coast without waiting until the infantry had cleared its path. The attempt was balked by the enemy's well-knit chain of anti-tank guns, and after three days of ineffectual effort the infantry were again called on to clear the way, but achieved no better success, despite Patton's prodding. Nevertheless the threat of a breakthrough, into the enemy's rear, had led to the 21st Panzer Division being dispatched to this sector to support the 10th, and that additional distraction of the enemy's meager armored reserve was of great help to Montgomery's impending frontal assault on the Wadi Akarat position, for which he had 570 tanks and 1,470 guns. This was strong by nature, as the flat coastal strip is barely four miles wide, and covered by the deep trough of the Wadi Akarat while at the point where this wadi becomes shallow and narrow a range of steep-sided low hills rises from the plain and stretches to the verge of the salt marsh belt. But the Axis decision to quit the Mare Ath line had been taken so late that there had been scant time to fortify the position and extend it in depth. Worse still for the defenders, they were very short of ammunition, having used up most of their limited supply by making their stand prematurely and too far forward. Montgomery's first idea, as at Mayath, was to pierce the enemy's position on a narrow sector near the coast, and then pass the army through to exploit the penetration. The 51st, Highland, division was to make the breach, while the 4th Indian Division under Duca was to capture the eastern end of the hill barrier to cover its flank. But Duca urged that the attack frontage should be widened, and extended westward to capture the dominating heights in the center, following the mountain warfare axiom that the second highest ground is no good. He was confident that his troops had the trained skill in both hill and night fighting to tackle such a difficult obstacle. Montgomery accepted the proposal and extended the attack frontage, employing the three infantry divisions of 30th Corps in the breaching assault. Moreover, Rather than wait a further week for a moonlight period, he took the bold decision to launch it in the dark, relying on the advantage of obscurity to outweigh the risk of confusion. At nightfall on April 5, the 4th Indian Division started to advance, and long before dawn on the 6th had penetrated deeply into the hills, capturing some 4,000 prisoners, mainly Italians. At 4.30 a.m., the 50th and 51st Divisions launched their assault supported by a bombardment from nearly 400 guns. The 50th was checked on the line of the anti-tank ditch, but the 51st soon achieved a breach in the enemy's defenses, although not so large as that which the 4th Indian Division had made. The two-pronged penetration offered opportunity for speedy exploitation by the armored forces of the 10th Corps, under Horrocks which had been posted close behind the front for the purpose. At 8.45 a.m. Horrocks came forward to Duca's headquarters, and an office note recorded that, Commander 4th Indian Division pointed out to Commander 10 Corps that we had broken the enemy, that the way was clear for 10 Corps to go through, that immediate offensive action would finish the campaign in North Africa. Now was the time to get the whips out and spare neither men nor machines. Commander 10 Corps spoke to Army Commander on the telephone requesting permission to put in 10 Corps to maintain the momentum of the attack. But there was an unfortunate delay in starting the move, and a great 2 1 in starting the exploitation. Alexander's dispatch states that at 1,200 hours, General Montgomery put in 10 Corps. By that time, the German 90th Light Division had counterattacked and ejected the British 51st from some of the ground it had gained, partially closing the breach. Then, in the afternoon, when the leading armored elements of Horrocks's 10th Corps belatedly began pushing through it, they were checked by the deployment and counterattack of the 15th Panzer Division, the enemy's only available reserve. Meanwhile nothing was done that day to use the heavyweight punch of the 10th Corps in exploiting the gap made by the 4th Indian Division. Montgomery planned, in his characteristically deliberate way, to make his breakthrough the following morning, laying on a tremendous air attack and artillery bombardment to help in driving it through. But when morning came the enemy had vanished, 
and his intended knockout blow turned into another follow-up of an army which had slipped out of his grasp. But while he had lost his chance of a decisive victory, his opponents had lost their chance of sealing the breach, and maintaining their position on the Wadi Akarak line, because two of their three panzer divisions, the 10th and 21st, had been drawn away in turn to check the American threat to their ear. So on the previous evening, Mess had told Dunham that it was not possible to hold on at Wadi Akarit for another day, in the absence of such reinforcement, and had obtained his agreement for a withdrawal to the Enfidavil position, 150 miles to the north, the next line where the coastal plain was narrow, and also buttressed by a hill barrier. The Axis troops had begun withdrawing soon after dark on the 6th, and they reached the Enfidavil position safely on the 11th, although most of them had to march on foot. The leading troops of the 8th Army, advancing on the 2 Cal front, did not arrive there until two days later, although fully motorized and overwhelmingly strong compared with the weak German rearguards which occasionally deployed to put a break on their pursuit. In an effort to intercept the enemy's retreat, Alexander launched the 9th Corps, of the 1st Army, on an attack to capture the Fonduc Pass and then to thrust 50 miles eastward through Kerr Iron to the coast town of Sousse, some 20 miles south of Enfidaville. This newly formed corps, commanded by John Crocker, was given the British 6th Armoured Division, an infantry brigade of the 46th Division, and the US 34th Infantry Division, which had 250 tanks. The task of the infantry was to capture the commanding heights on either side of the Fonduc Pass, in order to clear a passage for the armoured drive. The attack, hurriedly mounted, was to start on the night of April 7 to the 8th. But the troops of the 34th Division were nearly three hours late in starting, and having lost the cloak of darkness were soon halted by the enemy's fire, being all the more inclined to stop and take cover because of the damping experience of their previous attack only ten days before. Their failure to advance enabled the enemy to switch his fire northward to check the brigade of the 46th Division, which had been making better progress towards gaining the higher ground north of the pass. So Crocker decided to throw in his armor to force the passage rather than wait for the infantry to clear it, since the whole point of the attack depended on a quick breakthrough to the coastal plain. This was delivered next day, April 9, by the 6th Armored Division under Major General Cately, with a loss of 34 tanks, but only 67 men, a loss which seemed heavy but was astonishingly light relatively to the difficulties it had to overcome in driving through minefields and running the gauntlet of the 15 anti-tank guns covering the narrow passage, all of which were knocked out. It was not until the afternoon, however, that the armor got through, so Crocker decided to suspend the exploitation until next morning, and called the units back to lie up for the night in protected leaguer at the mouth of the pass. That decision was a cautious contrast to the boldness of his earlier one. But the minefield had still to be gapped for the passage of the wheeled transport, and reports showed that the German armor withdrawing from the south, under Balen's control, was already approaching Kerr Iron. The 6th Armored Division resumed its eastward drive at dawn on April 10, but by the time it reached Kerr Iron, the enemy's retreating columns had already passed safely through this road center. The small German detachment, of two infantry battalions and an anti-tank company, holding the Fonduc sector had also slipped away, having fulfilled Bayon's order that it must keep the 9th Corps in check until the morning of April 10, to cover the retreat of Messe's army up the coastal corridor. Its successful extrication from such a precarious situation, threatened in front and rear by vastly superior forces, was a remarkable feat. The two Axis armies had now linked up for the defense of the hundred mile arc from the north coast to Enfidaville. While this had improved their situation temporarily, the benefit was diminished by the losses they had suffered, particularly in equipment, so that even the shortened line was too long for their shrinking strength in face of the Allies' mounting superiority in numbers and weapon power, now concentrated for the assault on this defensive arc. 
Moreover the ground that Arnhem's February counterstroke had gained near Medjez El Bab and northward had mostly been recaptured by the British in attacks carried out by Lieutenant General Alfrey's V Corps at the end of March and beginning of April, so that the Allies were well placed for the delivery of fresh easterly thrusts against Tunis and Bayezida. Political and psychological considerations strongly influence the choice of the area for the Allies' coming effort to settle the issue of the campaign by a knockout blow. In a letter to Alexander on March 23rd, and others that followed, Eisenhower had urged that the main effort should be made in the north, in the First Army's sector, and that Patton's corps should be transferred there to take part in the decisive thrust, so as to serve the needs of American morale. Alexander accepted the suggestion in drafting his plans, and on April 10 directed Anderson to prepare the main attack for delivery about the 22nd. He also bowed to Patton's vigorous protest against being placed under the First Army again, and arranged that the U.S. Second Corps should continue to operate separately under his own direction. At the same time he turned down Montgomery's request that the Sixth Armored Division which had just linked up with the 8th Army, should be transferred to it, while notifying Montgomery that the 8th Army's part would become subsidiary, and that he must release one of his two armored divisions, the 1st, to reinforce the 1st Army. On this occasion the interests of policy and strategy coincided. The northern sector provided more scope for exerting the Allies' superior strength, because of the wider avenues of attack and the shorter line of supply whereas the southern approach by Enfidaville was less promising for effective action, being more cramping to the deployment of armored forces. The troops of the U.S. Second Corps were brought from the southern to the northern sector of Tunisia on a staging schedule involving the movement of some 2,400 vehicles a day across the British rear arc, a complex feat of staff work. Omar Bradley now took over command of this corps from Patton, who returned to the task of planning the American part in the invasion of Sicily. The British IX Corps was also switched northward, in a shorter move, and inserted on the right centre between the British V and French XIX Corps, which now joined the VIII Army on the Allied right wing. Under the final plan, issued by Alexander on April 16, the offensive was to be a converging four-pronged thrust. The 8th Army was to strike on the night of April 19, with Horrocks's 10th Corps, through Enfidavel northward towards Hammamid and Tunis with the aim of cutting across the neck of the Capbon Peninsula and blocking access to it, in order to prevent the rest of the Axis forces withdrawing there for a prolonged stand. This aim called for an advance of at least 50 miles through a very difficult bottleneck area. The French 19th Corps, next in line, was to keep up a threatening pressure and exploit any opportunities arising from the advance of its neighbours. The British IX Corps, which had one infantry and two armoured divisions, was to strike in the early morning of April 22 between Pont du Fars and Goubelat, with the aim of opening the way for an armoured breakthrough there. The British V Corps on its left, with three infantry divisions and a tank brigade, was to make the main effort and strike at nightfall that same day near Medjez El Bab against the 15-mile sector held by two regiments of the German 334th Division. The U.S. Second Corps was to launch its attack in the northern sector a day later, this 40-mile stretch was held by the three regiments of the Mantuffel Division and one of the 334th but their strength was less than 8,000 men compared with the 95,000 of the U.S. Second Corps. The prospects of such a general offensive, delivered almost simultaneously on every sector, looked very favorable. On the Allied side there were now 20 divisions with a combat strength of well over 300,000 men and 1,400 tanks. The total strength of the nine German divisions which formed the backbone of the defense along the hundred-mile arc was estimated, correctly, by the Allied intelligence to be barely 60,000 men, and they had less than 100 tanks altogether, one German report gives the total fit for action as only 45. Moreover a spoiling attack that Arnhem launched south of Medjez El Bab on the night of April 20, although it penetrated some five miles in the dark was repulsed when daylight came, 
and failed to upset the mounting and delivery of the British attack in this sector. But the Allied general offensive, though delivered on time, did not go according to plan. In defense the Germans still proved very stubborn, and skillful in utilizing difficult ground to block superior strength. Thus Alexander's final plan miscarried, and had to be recast, becoming the penultimate one. The Eighth Army's attack at Enfidaville, with three infantry divisions, met tough opposition in the hills bordering the coastal strip, and suffered a costly check belying the optimistic belief of Montgomery and Horrocks that the enemy could be bounced out of this bottleneck. The Italians here fought as vigorously as the Germans. Farther inland, the massed armor of the British IX Corps succeeded in penetrating the enemy's front to a depth of eight miles in the Ursian area northwest of Pont du Fars, but was then brought to a standstill by the intervention of Arnim's only substantial mobile reserve, the depleted 10th Panzer Division which now had less than a tenth of the attacking force's tank strength, which was 360 fit for action. The main attack, by the British V Corps, made slow progress in face of the tenacious resistance of the two German infantry regiments defending this central sector, and after four days hard fighting was only six to seven miles beyond Mejez el Bab. It was then definitely stopped, and in places pushed back by the intervention of an improvised panzer brigade composed of most of the remaining tanks of Army Group Africa. On the northern sector, the U.S. Second Corps made little progress during the first two days of its attack, through very rugged country, and then found on April 25 that the enemy had slipped back stealthily to another defense line a few miles farther back. In sum, the Allied offensive had come to a halt everywhere without achieving a definite breach anywhere. But the Axis forces had strained themselves and their scanty resources to the limit in foiling it. By April 25th their two armies were reduced to about one quarter of a refill unit of fuel, that is only enough for 25 kilometers, while the ammunition remaining was estimated as barely sufficient for three days further fighting. Scarcely any supplies were now reaching them to replenish the ammunition and fuel on which their hope of partying thrusts depended. Here lay the decisive factor in the issue of the Allies' next offensive. Food supplies were also becoming desperately short. Arnim later said that even without the Allied offensive I should have had to capitulate by the 1st of June at the latest because we had no more to eat. At the end of February Rommel and Arnim had reported that at least 140,000 tons of supplies a month would be required to maintain the fighting power of the Axis forces if the Supreme Command decided to hold on to Tunisia. The authorities in Rome, acutely conscious of the shipping difficulty, put the figure at 120,000 tons, while reckoning that up to a third of the total might be sunk in transit. But in the event only 29,000 tons reached the Axis forces during the month of March, a quarter of it by air. By contrast, the Americans alone brought some 400,000 tons of supplies safely into North African ports that month. In April the Axis supplies dwindled to 23,000 tons, and in the first week of May to a trickle of 2,000 tons. That was the measure of the grip which allied air power and sea power, mainly British, aided by excellent intelligence evaluation of the enemy's shipping movements had established on the trans-Mediterranean supply routes. The figures amply account for the sudden collapse of the Axis forces resistance, and explain the collapse far more clearly than do any of the Allied leaders' accounts. Alexander's fresh final plan emerged, indirectly, from the block in the Enfidaval bottleneck. On April 21, when the failure of the three-division attack there had become painfully plain, Montgomery was driven to suspend it because of the mounting losses, a suspension that had helped Arnhem to shift all his remaining armor northward to stop the main British attack from breaking through east of Medjez el Bab, as already related. Montgomery planned to resume his effort on the 29th, concentrating it in the narrow coastal strip, without trying to secure high ground inland. This directive, though accepted by Horrocks, met with strong objection from the two foremost divisional commanders, Duker and Freyberg. 
their warning arguments were supported by the early check suffered when the fresh attack was delivered. Next day, April 30th, Alexander arrived on the scene to discuss the situation with Montgomery, and then gave orders that the two best available divisions of the 8th Army should be switched to the 1st Army for a fresh and reinforced thrust in the Medjez el Bab sector. That alternative course had been urged by Tuca before the abortive Enfidaval attack. It might well have been adopted earlier, for the Enfidaval attack had not even fulfilled the limited object of pinning down the Axis forces there and preventing the reinforcement of the central sector. The switch, once decided, was quickly put into effect. The two picked divisions, the 4th Indian and 7th Armoured, started on their long northwestward move before dark that same day. For the 7th Armoured, which was lying back in reserve, it entailed a circuitous journey of nearly 300 miles along rough roads, but this was completed in a couple of days, the tanks being carried on transporters. The two divisions were transferred to the 9th Corps, which was entrusted with the decisive stroke, and itself sidestepped northward to concentrate for the purpose behind the sector held by the 5th Corps. Horrocks himself was also included in the transfer, to take over command of the 9th Corps as Crocker had just been disabled by an accidental injury incurred in demonstrating a new mortar, a personal stroke of ill luck at a moment of great opportunity. Meanwhile Bradley's U.S. Second Corps had resumed its attack in the northern sector on the night of April 26. In four days of stiff fighting its efforts to advance through this hilly region were baffled by the enemy's obstinate resistance. But persistent pressure strained the enemy's resources so heavily, and produced such an acute shortage of ammunition on his side, that he was compelled to withdraw to a fresh and less easily defensible line east of Maitour. The withdrawal was skillfully carried out during the nights of May 1st and 2nd without interference, but the new line was only 15 miles from the base port of Bayezata, so that the defense had now become perilously lacking in depth, as it was, already, in the Medjez el Bab sector facing Tunis. Such lack of depth for defense made fatal the defender's extreme shortage of supplies, and this went far to assure the decisiveness of the fresh offensive that was now being mounted by the Allies for launching on May 6. For once the crust was pierced there would be no possibility of prolonging resistance by elastic defense and maneuver in retreat. Although the Axis forces had managed to frustrate the previous attacks they had succeeded at the price of almost exhausting their scanty stocks being left with only enough ammunition for a brief reply to the attacker's overwhelming fire and only enough fuel for the shortest of counter moves. Moreover they were devoid of air cover as the airfields in Tunisia had become untenable and almost all the remaining aircraft had been withdrawn to Sicily. The impending blow came as no surprise to the Axis commanders as they had intercepted Allied radio messages which revealed the switch of large forces from the 8th Army to the 1st. But awareness of the blow was of little help in meeting it when they lacked the means. In Alexander's new plan, Vulcan, the breakthrough was to be made by a hammer blow with the 9th Corps, passing through the 5th, and striking on a very narrow front, less than two miles wide, in the valley south of the Medjida River. The assault was to be delivered by a massive phalanx composed of the 4th British and 4th Indian divisions with four supporting battalions of infantry tanks closely followed by the 6th and 7th Armoured Divisions. The armoured strength comprised more than 470 tanks. After the two infantry divisions had penetrated the defence to a depth of some three miles, the two armoured divisions were to drive through and in their first bound reach the area of St. Cyprian, 12 miles from the starting line and halfway to Tunis. Alexander emphasized in his instructions that the primary object is to capture Tunis, so as to forestall any rally, and that there must be no pause for mopping up localities which the enemy continues to hold. As a preliminary to the 9th Corps assault, the 5th Corps was ordered to capture the flanking height of the Jbal Buakas on the evening of May 5th, a mission which was achieved after some stiff fighting. After that the chief task of the 5th Corps was to keep open the funnel through which the 9th Corps was thrusting. In the event it proved to be no problem, as the enemy no longer had the means of developing an effective counter-attack. 
Opening the funnel might have been more difficult if the 9th Corps assault had been launched in daylight as originally intended, in view of the 1st Army's lack of experience in night attacks. But on Duca's insistence the plan was altered and zero hour was fixed for 3 a.m., so as to gain full benefit from the cloak of obscurity provided by a moonless night. At his urging, too, the customary barrage was replaced by successive concentrations of fire, centrally controlled, on all known enemy strong points, and the provision of artillery ammunition was doubled, raising it to a thousand rounds per gun. These concentrated shoots put down a shell on every two yards of front, so that the defenses were plastered five times more thickly than by the barrage at Alum in the previous autumn. The paralyzing effect of these concentrated shoots, by the 400 guns immediately supporting the assault, was increased and extended by the terrific air attack starting at dawn, which comprised over 200 sorties. By 9.30 a.m. the 4th Indian Division had punched a deep hole, at a cost of little more than a hundred casualties, and reported that there was no sign of any serious opposition ahead, telling Corps headquarters that the armor could now go as fast and as far as it liked. Before 10 a.m. the leading troops of the 7th Armored Division had begun to pour through the line gained by the infantry. On the right wing, the British 4th Division was late in starting and slower in advancing, but was helped by the thrust of its left-wing neighbor, and reached its objective before noon. The armored divisions were then at last permitted to drive on. In mid-afternoon, however, they were halted for the night near Massacolt, which was barely six miles beyond the start line of the assault and three miles beyond the line gained by the infantry, while only a quarter of the way to Tunis. This extreme caution is explained in the divisional history of the 7th by the statement that the commander considered that it would be wiser to keep each brigade in the firm positions they both held rather than to loosen the hold of both and complicate the long task of replenishment, an explanation which shows all too clearly a failure to grasp the elementary principles of exploitation, and to fulfill its spirit. As at Wadi Akarit. Horrocks and the commanders of the armored divisions were slow to respond to the call of opportunity, and continued to operate at a temper more characteristic of infantry action than fitted to fulfill the potentialities of mechanized mobility. There was no need for such caution. The eight mile sector south of the Medjidi River, where the blow was struck, on a two mile frontage, had been held by two weak infantry battalions and an anti tank battalion of the 15th Panzer Division supported by a composite force of less than 60 tanks, almost all that remained of the Axis armor. This very thin shield had been stunned and pulverized by the tremendous concentration of shells and bombs supporting the assault. Moreover lack of fuel had prevented Arnhem from bringing northward the unarmored remainder of the 10th and 21st Panzer Divisions, as had been planned. That fatal lack of fuel had proved more effective in pinning them down than the elaborate deception plan which the British had designed to make it appear that they were again going to strike in the Urzia sector. The 6th and 7th Armoured Divisions resumed their advance at dawn, on May 7, but again showed excessive caution, and were held up until the afternoon by a handful of Germans, with ten tanks and a few guns, at St. Cyprian. It was 3.15 p.m. before the order was given to drive into Tunis. The armored cars of the 11th Hussars entered the city half an hour later, and thus fittingly crowned the leading role this regiment had played since the start of the North African campaign nearly three years earlier. The Derbyshire Yeomanry, the armored car regiment of the 6th Armored Division, entered almost simultaneously. They were followed up by tanks and motorborne infantry to extend and complete the occupation of the city. In the process, the troops suffered more embarrassment and obstruction from the hysterical enthusiasm of the population, pelting them with flowers and kisses, than from the sporadic resistance put up by small pockets of confused and disorganized Germans. A considerable number were taken prisoner that evening, and many more were rounded up next morning while a much larger proportion sought to escape by fleeing northward or southward from the city. What remained of the fighting formations on the perimeter also retreated in these divergent directions once they were split asunder by the thrust into Tunis. 
Meanwhile the U.S. Second Corps had resumed its attack in the northern sector to coincide with the British thrust. Progress on May 6 had been slow, and resistance seemed still stiff but on the next afternoon reconnaissance elements of the 9th Infantry Division found the road open and drove into Biza to at 4.15 pm, the enemy having evacuated the city and withdrawn southeastward. Formal entry into the city was reserved for the French Corps Franc d'Afrique, which arrived on the 8th. The 1st Armoured Division, advancing from May to Ur, had suffered checks on the first two days. So had the 1st and 34th Infantry Divisions farther south. But on the 8th the 1st Armoured found the defence collapsing and progress easy, as the enemy's ammunition and fuel became exhausted and the British 7th Armoured Division were swinging north from Tunis along the coast in his rear. Trapped between the British and American spearheads, and without means of resistance or retreat, mass surrenders began. The leading squadron of the 11th Hussars had some 10,000 prisoners on its hands before evening. Early next morning, the 9th, part of another squadron drove on to Porto Forina, near the Cape of that name 20 miles east of Bizeta, where it received the surrender of 9,000 more who were crowded on the beach, some of them pathetically trying to build rafts, and were relieved to be able to hand this crowd of prisoners over to the American armored force which arrived soon afterwards. At 9.30 am General von Veyst, commanding the 5th Panzer Army in the northern area, signalled to Arnim, our armour and artillery have been destroyed. Without ammunition and fuel. We shall fight to the last. The final sentence was a gallant bit of absurdity, for troops cannot fight without ammunition. Veyst soon learned that his troops, realising how nonsensical were such heroic orders, were giving themselves up. So by midday, he agreed to a formal surrender of his remaining troops, which raised the total bag in this area to nearly 40,000. A much larger part of the Axis forces, when the split was produced, lay in the area south of Tunis. This area was also more defensible by nature, and the Allied commanders expected that the enemy would make a more prolonged stand there. But there, too, the exhaustion of the enemy's ammunition and fuel produced a quick collapse after a short resistance. The collapse was accelerated by a general feeling of hopelessness, since even where some supplies remained the Axis troops were aware that no replenishments were possible, for the same reason that no escape was possible. Alexander's aim now was to prevent Messi's army, the southerly part of the Axis forces retreating into the large Cap Bon Peninsula and establishing a firm last-ditch position there. So the 6th Armoured Division, as soon as Tunis had been captured, was ordered to turn southeast and drive for Hammond Liff, the near corner of the peninsula's baseline, while the 1st Armoured Division converged in the same direction. At Hammond Liff the hills came so close to the sea that the flat coastal strip was only 300 yards wide. This narrow defile was held by a German detachment, supported by 88mm. Guns withdrawn from airfield defence, and for two days it blocked all efforts to force a passage. But the obstacle was eventually overcome by a well-combined effort. The infantry of the 6th Armoured Division captured the heights overlooking the town, the artillery swept the streets methodically block by block and a column of tanks was then sent along the beach at the edge of the surf, where they were better shielded from the fire of the one German gun that remained in action. By nightfall on the 10th the drive was extended across the baseline of the peninsula to Hammamet, thus cutting off the enemy's surviving forces. Paralyzed by lack of fuel, they had been unable to withdraw to the peninsula. Next day the 6th Armoured Division drove on southward into the rear of the Axis troops who were keeping the British 8th Army in check near Amphidaville. Although these still had some ammunition in hand, the definite proof that they were trapped and without hope of escape produced their speedy surrender. By the 13th all the remaining Axis commanders and their troops had submitted. Only a few hundred had escaped by sea or air to Sicily, beyond the 9,000 wounded and sick who had been evacuated since the beginning of April. As to the size of the final bag, there is a lack of certainty. 
On May 12 Alexander's headquarters reported to Eisenhower that the number of prisoners since May 5 had risen to 100,000 and it was reckoned as likely to reach 130,000 when the count was complete. A later report gave the total bag at about 150,000. But in his post-war dispatch Alexander said that the total was a quarter of a million men. Churchill in his memoirs gives the same round figure, but qualifies it with the word nearly, Eisenhower gives it as 240,000, of which approximately 125,000 were Germans. But Army Group Africa had reported to Rome on May 2 that its ration strength during the month of April had varied between 170,000 and 180,000, and that was before the heavy fighting in the last week of the campaign. So it is hard to see how the number of prisoners taken could have exceeded this strength by nearly 50%. Administrative staffs who are responsible for feeding troops do not tend to underestimate their numbers. Here it is worth remark that much larger discrepancies still, between the last known German ration strength and the allied claims about the number of prisoners captured, were manifest in the final stages of the war. But whatever may have been the exact number taken in Tunisia it was certainly a very large bag. The most important effect was that it deprived the Axis of the bulk of its battle-tested troops in the Mediterranean theater which could otherwise have been used to block the Allies' coming invasion of Sicily, the first and crucial phase of their re-entry into Europe. Chapter 26, Re-entry into Europe, Through Sicily After the event, the Allies' conquest of Sicily in 1943 looked an easy matter. But actually this initial re-entry into Europe was a hazard asleep, hedged with uncertainties. For its successful outcome it owed much to a series of long-hidden factors. First to the blind pride of Hitler and Mussolini jointly in trying to save face in Africa. Then to Mussolini's jealous fear of his German allies, and reluctance to let them take a leading part in the defense of Italian territory. Then to Hitler's belief, in disagreement with Mussolini, that Sicily was not the Allies' real objective, a mistaken belief that partly arose from a brilliantly subtle ruse planted by the British deception plan. The first factor counted most of all. One of the greatest ironies in the whole war was the way that Hitler and the German general staff, who had always feared to embark on overseas expeditions in reach of British sea power, abstained from sending Rommel sufficient forces to follow up his victories yet in the last lap sent so many troops across to Africa as to forfeit their prospects of defending Europe. Ironically, too, they were drawn into this fatal folly by their own unexpected success in halting Eisenhower's first drive for Tunis after they had been caught napping by the Anglo-American invasion of French North Africa in the previous November. While the Allies' spearhead was advancing rather cautiously eastward from Algeria, the Germans had quickly reacted to the threat by starting to fly troops across the Mediterranean in the hope of frustrating the Allies' early capture of the ports of Tunis and Bayezida. They succeeded in holding the mountain approaches and producing a prolonged stalemate. But the success of this forestalling move encouraged Hitler and Mussolini to believe that they could hold on to Tunisia indefinitely. So they decided to pour in reinforcements on a large enough scale to match Eisenhower's growing strength. The more their commitment increased, the more they felt that they could not withdraw without losing prestige. At the same time the difficulty either of withdrawing or of holding on increased as the Allies' superior naval and air forces began to develop a stranglehold on the straits between Sicily and Tunisia. The German-Italian bridgehead that was built up in Tunisia kept the Allies at bay throughout the winter, and provided shelter for the remains of Rommel's army at the end of his 2,000-mile retreat from Alam. Nevertheless, the Allies' early failure to capture Tunisia turned out immensely to their advantage in the long run. For Hitler and Mussolini would not listen to any argument for evacuating the German and Italian troops while there was still time and opportunity to get them away. In a final effort to convince Hitler of the necessity, Rommel flew to Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia on March 10, 1943. His journal records how futile it proved, I emphasized as strongly as I could that the African troops must be re-equipped in Italy to enable them to defend our southern European flank. 
I even went so far as to give him a guarantee, something which I am normally very reluctant to do, that with these troops, I would beat off any Allied invasion in southern Europe. But it was all hopeless. As the Allied armies closed in upon the bridgehead for the kill, the Axis troops had to sit there with sinking spirits, awaiting the blow, and foregoing the chance provided by a spell of misty weather in April that would have helped to screen their embarkation and transportation if they had been allowed to withdraw. They managed to check the Allies' first attempt to crack their defense, April the 20th to the 22nd, but collapsed when their front was penetrated in the next big attack, on May 6th. The complete breakdown that followed was largely due to the shallowness of the bridgehead and the defending troops' acute consciousness that they were fighting with their backs close to a hostile sea. The complete capture of the eight divisions in Tunisia, including most of Rommel's veterans and the pick of the Italian army, left Italy and the Italian islands almost naked of defensive covering. These forces would have provided a very strong defense for the Italian gateways into Europe and the Allies' chances of successful invasion would have been dim. The Allies, however, were not ready to take immediate advantage of the opportunity, although they had decided in January that a landing in Sicily should be the next step, and Tunis had been captured close to the time expected. Fortunately, for them, the opportunity was prolonged by dissension and divergent views in the opposing headquarters. Here we come to another point of evidence provided in the first place by General Westphal, who was then Chief of Staff to Field Marshal Kesselring, the Commander-in-Chief in Southern Italy. As Italy had no mobile mechanized forces left, her military chiefs besought the Germans to provide a strong reinforcement of Panzer-type divisions. At that moment Hitler was moved to meet this urgent need, and sent Mussolini a personal message offering him five divisions. But Mussolini, without telling Kesselring, sent Hitler a reply that he wanted only three, and that meant only one fresh division beyond the two improvised from drafts which had been in transit to Africa. He even expressed the wish that no further German troops should be dispatched. Mussolini's reluctance to accept this mid-May offer was due to a mixture of pride and fear. He could not bear to let the world, and his own people, see that he was dependent on German aid. As Westphal remarked, he wanted Italy to be defended by Italians, and shut his eyes to the fact that the appalling state of his forces made such an idea quite impracticable. But his further reason was that he did not want to let the Germans acquire a dominating position in Italy. Anxious as he was to keep out the Allies, he was almost as anxious to keep out the Germans. The new chief of the army staff, General Rota, previously commanding Sicily, eventually convinced Mussolini that larger German reinforcements were essential for any chance of a successful defense of Italy and its island outposts. So he agreed to further German divisions coming in, subject to the condition that they should be subordinated to the tactical control of Italian commanders. The Italian garrison of Sicily consisted of only four field divisions and six static coast defense divisions that were poor in equipment and morale. The German drafts in transit to Africa when the collapse occurred were formed into a division and given the title of the 15th Panzergrenadier Division, but it had only one tank unit. The similarly rebuilt Hermann Goring Panzer Division was sent to Sicily near the end of June. But Mussolini would not allow these two divisions to be constituted as a corps under a German commander. They were placed directly under the Italian army commander, General Guzzoni and distributed in five groups along the 150-mile diameter of the island as mobile reserves. The senior German liaison officer, Lieutenant General von Sengeron Dietelin, was provided with a small operations staff and a signals company so that he could exercise emergency control. By the time that Mussolini was willing to accept more German help, Hitler was becoming more dubious about providing it, and also tending to a different view about the danger point. On the one hand, he suspected that the Italians would throw over Mussolini and make peace, a suspicion that was soon borne out by events, and for that reason hesitated to push in more German divisions so deeply that they might be cut off if their allies collapsed or changed sides. On the other hand, he came to think that Mussolini, 
the Italian high command, and Kesselring were mistaken in their view that the Allies' next move from Africa would be a jump into Sicily. On that point he proved wrong. Hitler's greatest strategic disadvantage in meeting the Allies' re-entry into Europe lay in the immense stretch of his own conquests, from the west coast of France, on the Atlantic Ocean, to the east coast of Greece, on the Aegean Sea. It was very difficult for him to gauge where the Allies would strike. Their greatest strategic advantage lay in the wide choice of alternative objectives and power of distraction which they enjoyed, through sea power. Hitler, while having always to guard against a cross-channel stroke from England, had cause to fear that the Anglo-American armies in North Africa might land anywhere on his southern front between Spain and Greece. Hitler thought that the Allies were more likely to land in Sardinia than in Sicily. Sardinia would provide an easy stepping stone into Corsica, and a well-placed springboard for a jump onto either the French or Italian mainland. At the same time an allied landing in Greece was expected, and Hitler wished to have reserves kept back so that they could be rushed in that direction. These ideas were fostered by receiving from Nazi agents in Spain copies of documents found on a British officer whose body had been washed ashore on the Spanish coast. Besides identity papers and personal correspondence, the documents included a private letter, of which the dead man had been the bearer, written by Lieutenant General Sir Archibald Nye, the Vice Chief of the Imperial General Staff, to General Alexander. This letter referred to recent official telegrams about forthcoming operations, and its supplementary comments indicated that the Allies were intending to land in Sardinia and Greece while aiming by their cover plan to convince the enemy that Sicily was their objective. The corpse and the letter were part of an ingenious deception devised by a section of the British intelligence service. This was so well worked out that the heads of the German intelligence service were convinced of its genuineness. Although it did not alter the view of the Italian chiefs and Kesselring that Sicily would be the Allies' next objective, it appears to have made a strong impression on Hitler. On Hitler's orders the 1st Panzer Division was sent from France to Greece, to support the three German infantry divisions and the Italian 11th Army there, while the newly formed 90th Panzer Grenadier Division reinforced the four Italian divisions in Sardinia. Further reinforcement of that island was hindered by the difficulty of supply, since most of the piers in the few harbours had been destroyed by bombing, but as an additional insurance Hitler moved General Student's 11th Air Corps, of two parachute divisions, down to the south of France, ready to deliver an airborne counter-attack against an Allied landing in Sardinia. Meanwhile, Allied planning proceeded at a slower gait. The decision to land in Sicily had been born of a compromise, and unaccompanied by any conclusion as to further aims. When the American and British chiefs of staff met at the Casablanca conference in January 1943, their initial divergence of views was in contrast to their common title, the combined chiefs of staff. The Americans, Admiral King, General Marshall, and General Arnold, wanted to wind up what was regarded as the Mediterranean diversion, once North Africa was cleared, and get back on the direct line of action against Germany. The British, General Brooke, Admiral Pound, Air Chief Marshal Portal, considered that conditions were not yet ripe for a direct cross-channel invasion, and that such an attempt in 1943 would end in disaster or futility, an estimate that will hardly be questioned in historical retrospect but all agreed that some further action must be initiated in order to maintain pressure and draw away German forces from the Russian front. On the British side the joint planning staff advocated a landing in Sardinia, but both the British and the American chiefs of staff were inclined to prefer Sicily, which was also Churchill's preference, so that agreement on this line was quickly reached. The most potent argument was that the capture of Sicily would effectively clear the sea passage through the Mediterranean, and thus save a lot of shipping, for, since 1940, most of the troop and supply convoys to Egypt and India had been forced to go the long way round by South Africa. In coming to the decision, on January 19, to move against Sicily, the combined chiefs defined the object as I, 
making the Mediterranean line of communications more secure, 2. Diverting German pressure from the Russian front, 3. Intensifying the pressure on Italy. The question of how it should be exploited was left open. An attempt to decide on the next objective would have revived divergencies of view, but in such matters tactful deferment is apt to result in strategic unreadiness. Nor was there an emphatic sense of urgency in the planning of the Sicilian stroke. Although it was assumed that the conquest of Tunisia might be completed by the end of April, the combined chiefs set the moon period of July as the target date for the landing in Sicily. The British produced an outline plan on January 20 for this Operation Husky, a converging sea approach and invasion by forces coming from the eastern and western Mediterranean respectively. It was agreed that Eisenhower should be the supreme commander, while Alexander became his deputy. That was a significant acceptance of the United States as the senior partner in the alliance, for the British commander-in-chief was the senior in rank and experience, and in this campaign the British would still provide the larger part of the forces. A special planning staff was formed early in February, with headquarters in Algiers, but its branches were widely separated, and in the case of the Air Force the separation was not only in space but also in thought the outcome being that air action during the Sicilian campaign was not closely or well related to the needs of the land and sea forces. Much time passed while a draft plan was being carried to and fro. Eisenhower, Alexander, and the two chosen army commanders, Montgomery and Patton, were too occupied with the last lap of the North African campaign to give adequate attention to the next move. Montgomery did not find time to study the draft plan until late in April, and then called for numerous changes in it. The plan was recast on May 3, and final approval of it, by the combined chiefs of staff, was received on May 13, a week after the collapse of the German-Italian front at Tunis, and the day that the last enemy fragments surrendered. These delays in the planning were the more regrettable since only one of the ten divisions to lead the invasion of Sicily was engaged in the final stage of the North African campaign, and seven of them were fresh entries. A landing in Sicily soon after the Axis collapse in Africa would have found the island almost naked of defence. The long interval that the enemy was allowed for reinforcing the defence of Sicily might have been longer still but for Churchill who, at the Casablanca conference and subsequently, urged that the landing should be made in June. He gained the backing of the combined chiefs of staff but the commanders in the Mediterranean were not ready to launch the invasion earlier than July 10. The main change that had been made in the plan was that Patton's army, the Western Task Force, instead of landing at the western end of Sicily near Palermo, would land in the southeast close to Montgomery's army whose landing points would now be more concentrated. In view of the time that had elapsed for the enemy's possible reinforcement, this tighter massing of the invading forces was a sound precaution against the danger of a heavy counter-stroke, though in the event it proved an unnecessary precaution. But it forfeited the chance of capturing the port of Palermo at the outset a forfeit that would have been of serious effect but for the way that the new Duco amphibious vehicles in conjunction with the LSDs, landing ships, tank, proved capable of solving the problem of maintaining supply over the beaches. The revised plan also forfeited much of the distracting effect sought in the original one, and thereby helped the enemy to concentrate his dispersed reserves after the landing had taken place and block the Allies' advance across the mountainous centre of the island. If Patton had landed near Palermo on the northwest coast, he would have been well on the way to the Straits of Messina, the enemy's line of reinforcement or retreat, whereby all the enemy forces in Sicily could have been trapped. In the event, the escape of the German divisions had far-reaching ill effects on the Allies' further moves. To err on the side of security was, However, a very natural preference in this first bound back into Europe by the Allies, and first big seaborne assault on a coast held by the enemy. Here it is worth note that the assault landing, by eight divisions simultaneously, was larger in scale even than in Normandy eleven months later. Some 150,000 troops were landed on the first day and the next two days, 
and the ultimate total was about 478,000 to 250,000 British, 228,000 American. The British landings were made along a 40-mile stretch of coast at the southeast corner of the island, and the American along a 40-mile stretch of the south coast, with a 20-mile interval between the British left and the American right wing. The naval side of the operation was planned and conducted under the direction of Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham. It involved a complex pattern of moves leading up to a landing by night, yet went through from start to finish with a wonderful smoothness that did great credit to the planners and the executants. As an amphibious operation it worked much better than Operation Torch. The landings in French North Africa, the previous November, from which much had been learned. The Eastern Naval Task Force, British, under Vice Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, comprised 795 vessels, while a further 715 landing craft were carried with it for the beaching stage. The 5th and 50th Divisions, and 231st Infantry Brigade, came from the east end of the Mediterranean, from Suez, Alexandria, and Haifa, in ships. They were to land along the southerly stretch of Sicily's east coast between Syracuse and Cape Passero. The 51st Division came from Tunisia, in craft, part of its staging at Malta, it was to land on the southeast corner of Sicily. The 1st Canadian Division, to land just west of the corner, came from Britain in two convoys, the second and faster one, carrying the bulk of the troops, sailed from the Clyde on D-12. June 28. It passed through the mine protected channel near Biza to immediately ahead of the American convoys. The Western Naval Task Force, American, under Vice Admiral H. Kent Hewitt, comprised 580 vessels, while a further 1,124 landing craft were carried with it. The 45th Infantry Division, for the right wing landing at Scoglity, was brought across the Atlantic in two convoys and, after a brief pause at Oran, picked up its LSDs and smaller craft off Byzata. The 1st Infantry and 2nd Armoured Divisions, for the jailer landing, embarked from Algiers and Oran. The 3rd Infantry Division, for the left wing landing at Licata, embarked at Byzata and was carried entirely in landing ships and landing craft. The passages and assembly of the convoys in this vast armada were achieved, under naval and air cover, without any serious interference. Only four ships in convoy and two LSTs were lost, to submarine attack. No appreciable damage was suffered from air attack during the approach, and enemy aircraft were kept so well at bay that most of the convoys were not even sighted. The Allies' air superiority in this theater was so great, over 4,000 operational aircraft against some 1,500 German and Italian, that the enemy bombers were withdrawn in June to bases in north central Italy. From July 2 onward, the airfields in Sicily were so heavily and persistently attacked that only a few subsidiary landing strips remained usable when D Day came, and most of the undamaged fighters had retired to the mainland or Sardinia though the actual number of planes destroyed throughout the campaign was not more than 200, compared with the 1,100 claimed by the Allies. In the afternoon of July 9 the convoys began to arrive in their assembly areas east and west of Malta, and at the same time the wind rose sharply, stirring up the sea to such a steep pitch as to endanger the smaller craft and threaten to dislocate the landings. Fortunately, it moderated by midnight, though leaving a troublesome swell, and only a small proportion of the assault craft were late in reaching the beaches. The worst effect was on the airborne drop that preceded the seaborne landings, carried out by parts of the British 1st and American 82nd Airborne Divisions. The first large stroke of this kind that the Allies had attempted, it would have been difficult in any case, because of inexperience and the call to make it at night. The high wind increased the navigational complications for the transport and tow aircraft in reaching their goals, and then combined with the anti-aircraft fire to disturb the descent. The American parachute troops were scattered in small parties over an area 50 miles wide. The British glider troops were also very scattered, 
and 47 of the 134 gliders fell into the sea. Nevertheless the unintendedly widespread of these airborne troops helped to produce a widespread state of alarm and confusion behind the enemy's front, while some of the parties had a more concrete effect by seizing key bridges and road junctions. The trouble that the sudden storm caused the attackers was, on balance, more than compensated by the extent to which it disarmed the defense. For although in the afternoon five convoys were sighted advancing northward from Malta, and a series of reports were received before dark, the warnings from the higher command either failed to reach or failed to impress the lower headquarters. While all the German troops in reserve were alerted an hour after the first report, the Italians on the coast tended to assume that the whistling wind and rough sea guaranteed them another night's rest at least. Admiral Cunningham aptly remarked in his dispatch that the unfavorable conditions had the effect of making the weary Italians, who had been alert for many nights, turn thankfully in their beds saying tonight at any rate they can't come. But they came. But the Italians' weariness was more than physical. Most of them were tired of the war, and not many had shared Mussolini's belligerent enthusiasm. Moreover the coast defense troops were mostly Sicilian, the idea behind that choice being that they would be the more inclined to live up to their fighting reputation when defending their own houses. But this assumption did not take account of their long manifest dislike of the Germans, or of their practically minded realization that the harder they fought the less would be left of their homes. Their reluctance to resist was deepened when daylight came on July 10, and they could see the tremendous array of ships, filling the sea to the horizon, and the continual flow of landing craft with reinforcements to back up the assault waves that had poured ashore in the early hours. The beach defenses were quickly overrun, and the anguish that many of the assault troops had suffered from seasickness was amply offset by the slightness of their casualties from the enemy's fire on arriving ashore. The first stage of the invasion was summed up by Alexander in two sentences, the Italian coastal divisions whose value had never been rated very high, disintegrated almost without firing a shot and the field divisions, when they were met, were also driven like chaff before the wind. Mass surrenders were frequent. Thus from the first day onward almost the whole burden of the defense fell on the shoulders of the two scratch German divisions, subsequently reinforced by two more. There was one dangerous counterattack during the critical period before the invading armies were firmly established ashore. This was delivered by the Hermann Goring Division which, along with a detachment of the new 56-ton Tiger tanks, had been posted around Col de Garonne, 20 miles from the coast in the mountain belt overlooking the Jailer Plain, where the American 1st Infantry Division had landed. Fortunately this punch did not come until the second day. A small group of Italian light tanks of obsolete type made a gallant little counter-attack on the first morning, and actually penetrated into the town of Jaila before they were driven off, but the main German column was delayed on the way and did not appear on the scene until next morning. Even then only a few of the American tanks had been landed, owing to unloading troubles in the heavy surf and congestion on the beaches. There was also a shortage of anti-tank guns and artillery on shore. The German tanks came down over the plain in converging packets, overran the American outposts, and reached the sand dunes bordering the beaches. It looked as if the invaders might be driven back into the sea, but well-directed naval gunfire helped to break up the attack in the nick of time. A menacing thrust on the left flank of the 45th Division by another German column, with a company of Tigers, was stopped in the same way. Next day, Two battle groups of the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division arrived on the American front after a hurried march from the west of Sicily, but by that time the Hermann Goring Division had moved off to the British sector, on a call to stem the extending advance there, which at the time looked the most ominous, as it was already close to the port city of Catania, midway up the east coast, whereas the three American beachheads were still shallow and not yet linked up. The British landings had met as little opposition as the American landings, while progress was aided by the absence of any early counter-attack. Although there were troubles and delays in the unloading process, 
this went rather better on the whole than on the western beaches, which were more exposed. Air raids were more frequent, after the first day, but the air cover provided was also better, so that shipping losses were almost as small as on the American sectors. Indeed, to those who had seen the earlier years of the war in the Mediterranean it seemed, as Admiral Cunningham remarked, almost magical that great fleets of ships could remain anchored on the enemy's coast. With only such slight losses from air attackers were incurred. That degree of immunity was a key factor in the success of the amphibious invasion. But in the next stage its progress suffered a check from a different kind of air action. The British forces had cleared the whole southeastern part of the island in the first three days. Then Montgomery decided to make a great effort to break through into the plain of Catania from the Lentini area and ordered a major attack for the night of July 13th. Apostrophe. The key problem was to capture the Primusole Bridge over the River Sinto, a few miles south of Catania. A parachute brigade was used for this purpose. Only about half of it was dropped in the right place, but this portion succeeded in securing the bridge intact. The next phase is epitomized in the account provided by General Student, the commander of the 11th Air Corps, which comprised the German airborne troops. His two divisions had been stationed by Hitler in the south of France ready to fly to Sardinia if the Allies landed there as Hitler expected. But airborne troops formed a very flexible strategic reserve, easily switched to meet different situations, as students' story shows. When the Allies landed in Sicily, on July 10, I at once proposed to make an immediate airborne counterattack there with both my divisions. But Hitler turned this down, Jodl, in particular, was against it. So the 1st Parachute Division was merely flown, from the south of France to Italy in the first place, part to Rome and part to Naples, while the 2nd Parachute Division remained at Nîmes with me. The 1st Parachute Division, however, was soon sent on to Sicily, for use as ground troops to reinforce the scanty German forces which were there when the Italian troops began to collapse en masse. Part of, the division was flown by air, in successive lifts and dropped behind our front in the eastern sector south of Catania. I had wanted them to be dropped behind the Allied front. The first contingent was dropped about three kilometers behind our front, and by a strange coincidence it landed almost simultaneously with the British parachute troops who were dropped behind our front to open the bridge across the Simta River. It overcame these British parachute troops and rescued the bridge from their hands. This was on July 14. The main British forces, when they came up, succeeded after three days stiff fighting in recapturing the bridge and reopening the way into the plain of Catania. But their attempt to press on northward was blocked by increasingly strong resistance from the German reserves now concentrating to cover this direct east coast route to Messina, 60 miles distant, where the northeast corner of Sicily lies close to the toe of Italy. That frustrated the hope of a quick clearance of Sicily. Montgomery was forced to shift the weight of the 8th Army westward for a more circuitous push through the hilly interior and round Mount Etna, in combination with an eastward advance by the 7th Army, which reached the north coast and occupied Palermo on July 22, though too late to intercept the eastward withdrawal of the enemy's mobile troops. The new plan brought an important change of role for Peyton's army. Its action as shield to the flank of the 8th Army's intended decisive drive for Messina, and as a distraction to the enemy's concentration, was extended into that of an offensive lever, and, in the end, prime spearhead. For the new push, planned to start on August 1st, two fresh infantry divisions, the 9th US and 78th British, were brought over from Africa, raising the total to 12. Meanwhile the Germans were reinforced by 29th Panzer Grenadier Division, together with 14th Panzer Corps headquarters under General Hube, who now took control of the fight. His task would not be to maintain the defense of Sicily, but merely to conduct a delaying action and cover the evacuation of the Axis forces, a decision reached, by Gutsoni and Kesselring independently, soon after Mussolini's overthrow on July 25th.
and before the Allies renewed offensive. Such a delaying action was aided by the shape as well as by the ruggedness of northeastern Sicily, a triangle of mountainous country. While the ground favored the defense and each step back brought a shortening of the front, so that fewer defenders were needed, the Allied armies became increasingly cramped in deploying their full superiority of force. Patton made three attempts to quicken progress by small amphibious leaps, a landing at Sant'Agata on the night of the August 7-8, a second at Brollo on the 10th-11th, and a third at Spadafora on the 15th-16th, but in each case they were too late to be effective. Montgomery tried a small one on the 15th-16th, but by then the enemy's rear guard had gone north of it, and most of the enemy troops had already crossed the straits to the mainland. The ably organized withdrawal across the straits was carried out, for the main part, in the course of six days, and seven nights, without suffering any serious interception or loss from the Allied air or sea forces. Nearly 40,000 German troops and over 60,000 Italian were safely evacuated. Although the Italians left behind all except some 200 of their vehicles, the Germans brought away nearly 10,000 vehicles as well as 47 tanks, 94 guns, and 17,000 tons of supplies and equipment. About 6.30 am on August 17 the leading American patrol entered Messina, and not long afterwards a British party appeared, to be greeted with gleeful cries of where have you tourists been? The success of this well-planned getaway gave a rather hollow sound to what Alexander said that day in reporting the completion of the campaign to the Prime Minister, by 10 a.m. this morning, August 17, 1943, the last German soldier was flung out of Sicily. It can be assumed that all Italian forces in the island on July 10 have been destroyed, though a few battered units may have escaped to mainland. So far as can be gauged from the records, the number of German troops in Sicily was a little over 60,000 and the Italian troops 195,000, Alexander's estimate at the time was 90,000 German and 315,000 Italian. Of the German troops 5,500 were captured, while 13,500 wounded were evacuated to Italy before the withdrawal, so that the number killed can hardly have been more than a few thousand. The British estimate was 24,000 killed. The British losses were 2,721 killed, 2,183 missing, and 7,939 wounded, a total of 12,843. The American losses were 2,811 killed, 686 missing and 6,471 wounded, a total of 9,968. Thus, in all, the Allied losses amounted to approximately 22,800. It was not a very heavy cost for the great political and strategic results of the campaign, which caused Mussolini's downfall and Italy's surrender. But the bag of Germans could have been larger, with a consequent smoothing of the path beyond if the Allies had made fuller use of amphibious outflanking moves. That was Admiral Cunningham's view, and in his dispatch he pointedly remarked that after the opening days, no use was made by the Eighth Army of amphibious opportunities. The small LSIS were kept standing by for the purpose. And landing craft were available on call. There were doubtless sound military reasons for making no use of this, what to me appeared priceless asset of sea power and flexibility of maneuver, but it is worth consideration for future occasions whether much time and costly fighting could not be saved by even minor flank moves which must necessarily be unsettling to the enemy. Much to Kesselring's relief, the Allied High Command had not attempted a landing in Calabria, the toe of Italy, behind the back of his forces from Sicily, to block their withdrawal across the Straits of Messina. He had been anxiously expecting such a stroke throughout the Sicilian campaign, while having no forces available to meet it. In his view, a secondary attack on Calabria would have enabled the Sicily landing to be developed into an overwhelming Allied victory. 
until the close of the Sicilian campaign and the successful escape of the four German divisions engaged there, Kesselring had only two German divisions to cover the whole of southern Italy. Chapter 27, The Invasion of Italy, Capitulation and Czech Nothing succeeds like success is a very well-known saying, based on an old French proverb. But it often proves true, in a deeper sense, that nothing succeeds like failure. Religious and political movements which reigning authority crushed have frequently been revived and come out on top in the long run after their leaders gained the halo of martyrdom. The crucified Christ became more potent than the living one. Conquering generals have been eclipsed by the conquered, that is shown by the immortal fame of Hannibal, Napoleon, Robert E. Lee, and Rommel. In the history of nations the same effect can be seen, though in a subtle way. Everyone knows the saying that in a war the British only win one battle, the last. It expresses their characteristic tendency to start with disasters but end with victory. The habit is hazardous, and costly. Yet it happens, ironically, that the final outcome can often be traced to the initial way this the early defeats suffered by the British and their allies, by making the enemy overconfident, have led him to overreach himself. Moreover, even when the scales have turned, a failure to gain immediate success has at times turned out very advantageously by helping towards fuller success and making final success more sure. That happened twice, most strikingly, in the Mediterranean campaigns of the Second World War. It was due to the frustration of the Allies' original advance on Tunis, from Algiers, in November 1942, that Hitler and Mussolini were encouraged to send a stream of reinforcements there, across the sea, where the Allies were eventually able to trap them six months later and put two Axis armies in the bag, thus removing the chief obstacle to their own cross-sea jump from Africa into southern Europe. The next case of a miscarriage turning out well was the invasion of Italy itself. After the swift capture of Sicily, and the downfall of Mussolini, the second and shorter jump into Italy had looked a comparatively easy matter. The prospects were all the brighter because Italy's surrender had been secretly arranged, unknown to the Germans, and was timed for announcement simultaneously with the main Allied landing. At that moment there were only six weak German divisions in the south of Italy, and two divisions near Rome, to cope with the double burden of meeting the Allied invasion and at the same time holding down their own Italian ex-allies. Field Marshal Kesselring, however, managed to keep the invaders in check while disarming the Italians, and then brought the Allied armies to a standstill on a line a hundred miles short of Rome. Eight months passed before the Allies succeeded in reaching the Italian capital, and then they were again held up, for a further eight months, before they could break out of the narrow and mountainous peninsula into the plains of northern Italy. Yet that long postponement, of the end that had seemed so close in September 1943, carried important compensations for the Allies' prospects in general. Hitler had at first intended to extricate his forces from southern Italy, and establish a mountain blocking line in the north, but Kesselring's unexpectedly successful defense induced Hitler, contrary to Rommel's advice, to pour resources southward with the aim of holding on to as much of Italy as possible, and for as long as possible. That decision was taken at the expense of the resources which Hitler soon needed to meet the more dangerous menace of the two-sided advance on Germany by the Russians from the east and by the western allies from Normandy. Relative to its own strength, the Allied force in Italy absorbed a higher proportion of the Germans' resources than those on other fronts. Moreover, the Italian front was the one where the Germans could afford to yield ground with least risk while the more they strained their strength to hold an extended front on every side, the more liable they became to a fatal collapse through overstretch. Such reflections helped to console the Allied troops in Italy, under Alexander, for the prolonged frustration of their own hopes of early victory. Even so, it should be realized that great expeditions are not launched in the hope of reaching a frustration that may ultimately become profitable. It is not in human nature to desire and seek a failure. So it is worthwhile to explore what happened and the way it did.
The first important factor in the Allies' frustration was their delay in exploiting the opportunity offered by the anti-war coup d'état in Italy which overthrew Mussolini. This took place on July 25, yet more than six weeks passed before the Allies moved into Italy. The causes of delay were both military and political. At the conference of the Anglo-American Service Chiefs in Washington at the end of May, the Americans had opposed the idea of going on from Sicily to Italy, lest such a step might interfere with the plans for invading Normandy and defeating the Japanese in the Pacific. It was not until July 20, when the Italian forces in Sicily had shown their eagerness to surrender, that the American Chiefs of Staff agreed to a follow-up advance into Italy but that was too late for making ready an immediate follow-up. The political demand for unconditional surrender, formulated by President Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill at the Casablanca conference in January, was also a hindrance. The new Italian government under Marshal Badoglio was naturally anxious to see if more favorable conditions could be obtained in negotiation with the Allied governments but found that it was difficult to get in touch with them. The British and American ministers at the Vatican were an obvious channel, and easily accessible, but proved useless owing to an extraordinary double case of official short-sightedness, as Badoglio's account reveals. The British minister informed us that unfortunately his secret code was very old and almost certainly known to the Germans, and that he could not advise us to use it for a secret communication to his government. The American charge d'affaires replied that he had not got a secret code. So the Italians had to wait until in mid-August they found a plausible pretext for sending an envoy on a visit to Portugal, where he could meet British and American representatives. Even then this roundabout way of negotiation entailed further delay in settling the matter. Hitler, by contrast, had wasted no time in taking steps to counter the likelihood that the new Italian government would seek peace and abandon the alliance with Germany. On the day of the coup d'état in Rome, July 25, Rommel had arrived in Greece to take command there, but just before midnight he received a telephone call telling him that Mussolini had been deposed, and that he was to fly back at once to Hitler's headquarters in the East Prussian forests. Arriving there at noon next day he received orders to assemble troops in the Alps and prepare a possible entry into Italy. The entry soon began, in a partially disguised way. Fearing that the Italians might make a sudden move to block the Alpine passes with the help of Allied parachute troops, Rommel gave orders on July 30 for the leading Germans to move across the frontier and occupy the passes. This was done under the excuse of safeguarding the supple routes into Italy against sabotage, or paratroop attack. The Italians protested, and for a moment threatened to resist the passage, but hesitated to open fire and precipitate a conflict with their allies. The German infiltration was then extended on the pretext of relieving the Italians of the burden of defending the northern part of their country so that they could reinforce the south where it was manifest that the Allies were likely to land at any moment. Strategically, this argument was so reasonable that the Italian chiefs could hardly reject it without showing their own intention to change sides. So by the beginning of September eight German divisions under Rommel were established inside Italy's Alpine frontier wall as a potential support or reinforcement to Kesselring's forces in the south. Moreover the 2nd Parachute Division, a particularly tough force, was flown from France to Ostia, close to Rome. General Student, the commander-in-chief of the German airborne forces, went with it. When interrogated after the war, he said. The Italian high command was given no previous warning of its arrival, and was told that the division was intended for the reinforcement of Sicily or Calabria. But my instructions, from Hitler, were that I was to keep it near Rome and also take under my command the 3rd Panzer Grenadier Division, which had moved down there. With these two divisions I was to be ready to disarm the Italian forces around Rome. The presence of these divisions nullified the Allies' plan to drop one of their own airborne divisions, the 82nd American, General Matthew Ridgeway, on Rome itself to support the Italians in holding the capital. If that reinforcement had come, Kesselring's own headquarters would have been in jeopardy, for it was located at Frascati, 
barely 10 miles southeast of Rome. Even so, students allotted task looked a very difficult one, before the event. Marshal Badoglio had kept five Italian divisions concentrated in the Rome area despite the Germans' efforts to persuade him to send some of these divisions to help in defending the coast in the south. Unless and until they could be disarmed Kesselring would be in the awkward situation of having to face two Anglo-American invading armies with a third hostile army already lying astride the line of supply and retreat of his six German divisions in southern Italy. These had just been formed into what was called the Tenth Army, commanded by Vietinghoff, and included four divisions which had escaped from Sicily, badly depleted by the losses they had suffered in that campaign. On September 3rd, the invasion was opened by Montgomery's Eighth Army crossing the narrow straits of Messina, from Sicily, and landing on the toe of Italy. That same day the Italian representatives secretly signed the armistice treaty with the Allies. But it was arranged that the fact should be kept quiet until the Allies made their second and principal landing, which was planned to take place on the Shin of Italy, at Salerno, south of Naples. At midnight on September 8 the Anglo-American Fifth Army under General Mark Clark began to disembark in the Gulf of Salerno, a few hours after the BBC had broadcast the official announcement of Italy's capitulation. The Italian leaders had not been expecting the landing to come so soon, and they were warned about the delivery of the broadcast only late in the afternoon. Badoglio complained, with some justification, that he was caught unready to cooperate before his preparations were complete. But the Italians' state of unreadiness and trepidation had already become so evident to General Maxwell Taylor, who had been sent to Rome secretly by Eisenhower, that Ridgway's intended airborne descent on Rome had been cancelled after Eisenhower had received that morning a warning message from Taylor that the prospects were poor. It was then too late to revert to the original plan of dropping Ridgway's troops along the Volturno River, on the north side of Naples, to block enemy reinforcements from moving southward, to Salerno. The broadcast announcement of the Italian capitulation also took the Germans by surprise, but their action in Rome was prompt and decisive, despite the simultaneous emergency in the south produced by the landing at Salerno. The outcome might well have been different if Italian action had matched Italian acting which had gone a long way to conceal intentions and lull Kesselring's suspicions during the preceding days. A piquant account of this is given in a narrative written by his chief of staff, General Westphal. On September 7 the Italian Minister of Marine, Admiral Count de Corurton, called on Field Marshal Kesselring to inform him that the Italian fleet would put out on the 8th or 9th from Spezia to seek battle with the British Mediterranean fleet. The Italian fleet would conquer or perish, he said, with tears in his eyes. He then described in detail its intended plan of battle. These solemn assurances made a convincing impression. The next afternoon Westfland and another general, Tau Saint, drove to the headquarters of the Italian army at Monte Rotundo, 16 miles northeast of Rome. Our reception by General Rota was very cordial. He discussed with me in detail the further joint conduct of operations by the Italian 7th and German 10th armies in southern Italy. While we were talking a telephone message came through from Colonel von Waldenburg with the news of the broadcast announcement of the Italian capitulation to the Allies. General wrote to assure us that it was merely a bad propaganda maneuver. The joint struggle, he said, would be continued just as had been arranged between us. Westphal was not altogether convinced by these assurances and when he got back to the German headquarters at Frascati late in the evening he found that Kesselring had already signalled to all subordinate commands the code word Axis, the pre-arranged signal which meant that Italy had quitted the Axis and that the appropriate action must be taken to disarm the Italians immediately. The subordinate command supplied a mixture of persuasion and force according to the situation and their own disposition. In the Rome area, where the potential odds against him were heavy, student used shock tactics. I made an attempt to seize the Italian general headquarters by dropping on it from the air. This was only a partial success. 
while 30 generals and 150 other officers were captured in one part of the headquarters, another part held out. The chief of the general staff had got away, following Badoglio and the king, the night before. Instead of trying to overcome students' couple of divisions, the Italian commanders hastened to withdraw out of reach, falling back eastward to Tivoli with their forces, and leaving their capital in the hands of the Germans. That also cleared the way for negotiations, in which Kesselring applied a more gentle form of persuasion, proposing that if the Italian troops laid down their arms they should be allowed to go back to their homes immediately. That offer was contrary to Hitler's order that all Italian soldiers should be made prisoners, but it proved more effective at less cost of life and time. The results can be related in Westphal's words. The situation around Rome calmed down completely when the commander of the Italian forces accepted in its entirety the German capitulation suggestion. This eliminated the danger to the supply of the 10th Army. It was a further relief to us that Rome no longer needed to become a battlefield. In the capitulation agreement, Field Marshal Kesselring undertook to regard Rome as an open city. He undertook that it should be occupied only by police units two companies in strength, to guard telephone communications, etc. This undertaking was always observed up to the end of German occupation. Through the capitulations it was now again possible to resume the wireless signals link with OKW the German Supreme Command, which had been broken off since the 8th. A further consequence of the bloodless elimination of the Italian forces was the possibility of immediately moving reinforcements by road from the Rome area to the 10th Army in the south. Thus the situation around Rome, after so many initial worries, had been resolved in a manner which one could hardly hope to better. Ibid, p. 361. Until then, Hitler and his military advisers at OKW had tended to regard Kesselring's army as doomed. Westfler has contributed significant evidence on this score. Dot supplies and replacements of personnel, arms, and equipment were almost completely cut off from us from August onward. All demands were at the time brushed aside by OKW with, we'll see later on. This unusually pessimistic attitude probably also played a part in the employment of, Rommel's, Army Group B in Upper Italy it was told to take into the Apennine position such parts of our forces as had managed to escape the joint attack of the Allies and the Italians. Field Marshal Kesselring, similarly, took a grave view of the situation. But in his view it was still capable of being mastered in certain circumstances the farther south that the expected large-scale landing took place, the better the chances would be. But if the enemy landed by sea and air in the general area of Rome, one could hardly bank on saving the 10th Army from being cut off. The two divisions we had near Rome were far from sufficient for the double job of eliminating the strong Italian forces and repelling the Allied landing, and in addition keeping open the rear communications of the 10th Army. As early as September 9th it was becoming unpleasantly apparent that the Italian forces were blocking the road to Naples, and thus the supply of the 10th Army. The army could not have held out against this for long. And so the commander-in-chief heaved a sigh of relief when no air landings took place on the airfields round Rome on the 9th and 10th. On both these days we hourly expected such a landing to be made, with the cooperation of the Italian forces. Such an air landing would undoubtedly have given a great stimulus to the Italian troops and to the civil population that was unfavorably disposed towards us. Kesselring himself put the matter in a nutshell, saying, an air landing on Rome and sea landing nearby, instead of at Salerno, would have automatically caused us to evacuate all the southern half of Italy. Ibid, p. 361. Even as it was, the days that followed the Allies landing at Salerno were a period of intense strain on the Germans, and all the more nerve-wracking through lack of information as to what was happening there. Never was the fog of war so thick, that being due to the fact that the Germans were fighting in the country of an ally who had suddenly deserted them. The effect can best be conveyed by again quoting Westphal's account. The commander-in-chief could at first learn very little about the position at Salerno. Telephone communication broke down, 
as it was on the Italian postal network. It could not be easily restored, as we had not been allowed to examine Italian telephone technique. Wireless communication could not be arranged at first because the signal personnel of the newly formed 10th Army headquarters were not familiar with the peculiar atmospheric conditions in the south. It was fortunate for the Germans that the main Allied landing came in the area where they had expected it, and where Kesselring could most conveniently concentrate his scanty forces to meet it. The British 8th Army's advance up the toe of Italy also ran according to expectation, and was too remote to carry an immediate danger to his forces. He benefited much from the Allied commander's reluctance to venture outside the limits of air cover and in his calculations was able to reckon on their consistency in observing such conventional imitations. As a result the Allied landings at Salerno, optimistically styled Operation Avalanche, suffered a costly check. Indeed, Mark Clark himself speaks of it as a near disaster. Only by a narrow margin did the landing force hold off the German counter-attack and avoid being driven back into the sea. In the original planning, Mark Clark had proposed that the landing should be made in the Gulf of Gaeta on the north side of Naples, where the country was more open and there was no mountainous ground as at Salerno to hinder the advance inland from the beaches. But when Teda, the Allied air commander-in-chief, told him that air support could not be so good if stretched to the Gaeta sector, Clark gave way and agreed to the choice of Salerno. In some Allied quarters it had been urged that the most effective way to take the Germans off their guard, and throw them off their balance, was to make a landing beyond these limits, and it was argued that a landing on the heel of Italy, in the area of Taranto and Brindisi, would be the line of least expectation while entailing little risk, and promising the early possession of two fine ports. Such a landing was added to the plan at the last moment, as a subsidiary move but the Taranto force consisted only of the British 1st Airborne Division, which was hurriedly collected from rest camps in Tunisia, and rushed across in such naval vessels as were available at short notice. It met no opposition, but arrived without any tanks, and with scarcely any artillery or motor transport. In fact, it lacked the very things it needed to exploit the opportunity it had gained. From this broad survey of the Allied invasion we come to a closer examination of the course of the operations, which started with the crossing of the narrow Straits of Messina by Montgomery's 8th Army on September 3rd. The orders for this landing in Calabria, Operation Baytown, were not issued until August 16th, when the last German rearguard was in process of withdrawing from Sicily. Even then, no object was specified in the orders as Montgomery caustically pointed out in a signal to Alexander on the 19th. In reply, the object was belatedly defined, and he was told. Your task is to secure a bridgehead on the toe of Italy, to enable our naval forces to operate through the Straits of Messina. In the event of the enemy withdrawing from the toe, you will follow him up with such force as you can make available bearing in mind that the greater the extent to which you can engage enemy forces in the southern tip of Italy, the more assistance will you be giving to Avalanche, the Salerno landing. This was a meager object, and a rather hazy one, to set the veteran 8th Army. Montgomery remarks in his memoirs, no attempt was made to coordinate my operations with those of the 5th Army, landing at Salerno. For the secondary purpose of giving assistance to this army, the landing of the 8th was made at the most unsuitable place, over 300 miles from Salerno, along a very narrow and mountainous approach, ideally suited to obstruction by the enemy. There were only two good roads up the tow, one skirting the west coast and the other the east coast, so that only two divisions could be employed, with a single brigade heading each, and it was often difficult to deploy more than one battalion on either line of advance. There was thus no need for the enemy to keep large forces in this area, and all the less incentive to do so since he could be sure that the larger part of the Allied forces would be landing elsewhere. Once the 8th Army was committed to the Calabrian Peninsula, any chance of surprise by the 5th was diminished, as the alternative possibilities with which the enemy had to reckon were reduced. The toe was the worst possible place for creating an effective distraction. 
the enemy could safely bring his forces back from there, and leave the invasion to suffer from operational cramp. Despite the unlikelihood of meeting any strong opposition, Montgomery's assault landing on the toe was mounted with his habitual carefulness and thoroughness. Nearly 600 guns were assembled, under the command of the 30th Corps, to provide an overwhelming barrage from the Sicilian shore to cover the crossing of the Straits and the landings on the beaches near Reggio, which were carried out by General Miles Dempsey's 13th Corps. The process of assembling this mass of artillery delayed the assault for days beyond the intended date. The bombardment was further increased by the fire of 120 naval guns. During the previous days, intelligence reports showed that the Germans had left not more than two infantry battalions near the toe, and even these were posted over ten miles back from the beaches, to cover the roads up the peninsula. That information of the enemy's withdrawal caused critical observers to remark that the preparatory barrage was a case of using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. The comment was apt, but not exact, as not even a nut was left to crack. It was a tremendous waste of ammunition. At 4.30 am on September 3, the two divisions employed in the assault, the 5th British and 1st Canadian, landed on empty beaches devoid even of mines and barbed wire. A Canadian note jocularly recorded that the stiffest resistance of the day came from a puma which had escaped from the zoological gardens in Reggio, and was seemingly taking a fancy to the brigade commander. No casualties were suffered among the assaulting infantry, and by evening the toe of the peninsula had been occupied, to a depth of more than five miles, without meeting resistance. Three German stragglers and 3,000 Italians had been picked up as prisoners. The Italians readily volunteered to help in unloading the British landing craft. No serious resistance was met in the days that followed, as the invaders pushed up the tow, and there were only brief contacts with enemy rearguards. But numerous demolitions, which the Germans skillfully executed in withdrawing, imposed repeated checks on the Eighth Army's advance. By September 6, the fourth day, it was barely 30 miles beyond the beaches where it had landed, and it did not reach the toe joint, the narrowest part of the peninsula, until the 10th. That was less than one third of the distance to Salerno. Yet according to Montgomery, Alexander was most optimistic when he visited the 8th Army on September 5, and brought the news that the Italians had privily signed an armistice two days before. Montgomery remarks that Alexander was clearly prepared to base his plans on the Italians doing all they said, that confidence was questioned by Montgomery, I told him my opinion was that when the Germans found out what was going on, they would stamp on the Italians. Events confirmed that comment, recorded in Montgomery's diary. Alexander's confidence in the prospects of Operation Avalanche is the more surprising because two weeks before it took place the German military commentator, Sertorius, had broadcast a forecast that the Allies' main landing would be in the Naples-Salerno sector, with a subsidiary landing on the Calabrian Peninsula. A week earlier still, on August 18, Hitler had issued his orders to meet the threat, and these significantly said. One. Sooner or later, the capitulation of Italy before enemy pressure is to be expected. 2. In preparation for this, 10th Army must keep the line of retreat open. Central Italy, especially the Rome area, is to be held until then by OBS. 3. In the coastal area from Naples to Salerno, which at first is the most threatened, a strong group consisting of at least three mobile formations from 10th Army is to be assembled. All no longer mobile elements of the army are to be moved to this area. At first fully mobile elements may remain between Catanzaro and Castro Villari to take part in mobile operations. Elements of one paradif may be employed for the protection of foyer. In the case of an enemy landing the area Naples Salerno must be held. South of the defile of Castro Villari there is only to be delaying action. Kesselring put six of his eight divisions in the south, under General von Wietinghoff's newly formed 10th Army, which established its headquarters at the inland town of Pola, southeast of Salerno. 
for Hitler had personally told Vietinghoff on the 22nd, to regard Salerno as the center of gravity, as that army's war diary records. Kesselring's two other divisions were held in reserve near Rome, ready to seize control of the capital and keep open the 10th Army's line of retreat in the event of Italian treachery. The six divisions in the south comprised two which had newly arrived in Italy, the 16th and 26th Panzer, and the four which had escaped from Sicily. The two of these which were most depleted by losses, the Hermann Goring and the 15th Panzer Grenadier, had been brought back to the Naples area to refit, and the first parachute went to Apulia while the 29th Panzer Grenadier had been left in the toe of Italy facing Montgomery. To help it keep him in check, the 26th Panzer, which had arrived without any tanks, was temporarily sent to Calabria. The 16th Panzer Division, the best armed of the batch, was posted to cover the Gulf of Salerno, the most likely sector for a large landing and it could be quickly reinforced there by the other divisions. Even so, it comprised only one tank battalion and only four infantry battalions, although strong in artillery. Like most of the German armored divisions at this period, it had only two tank battalions, one equipped with Panther tanks and one with the lighter Mark IV tanks, and of these the Panther battalion had not been sent to Italy while the other had been kept near Rome to help in overawing the Italians. This battalion had about 80 tanks, of Mark IV type. Its missing Panther battalion had been replaced by an armored assault gun battalion, of 40 self-propelled pieces, which could be mistaken for tanks on a distant view. Even so, it is difficult to understand how General Mark Clark in his book of war memoirs, Calculated Risk, can have arrived at his calculation that the Germans originally had probably about 600 tanks at Salerno, p. 199, which was nearly eight times the actual number. That was a slender force to meet the armada which was sailing towards the Gulf of Salerno, with some 700 ships and landing craft, carrying some 55,000 troops for the initial landing, and further a 115,000 for the follow up. The landing was to be made by the U.S. 36th Infantry Division on the right, and the British 46th and 56th Divisions on the left, while part of the U.S. 45th Infantry Division provided a flanking reserve. These divisions were grouped respectively under the U.S. 6th Corps, General Dawley, and the British 10th Corps, General R. L. McCreary. The latter was to land on a seven-mile stretch of the beaches just south of Salerno, near the main road to Naples, which crosses the neck of the mountainous Sorrento Peninsula through the Carver Gap, by a low but awkward pass. Its early success was thus of key importance, both in opening the way north to the great port of Naples and in blocking the arrival of German reinforcements from the north. To ease its task two British commandos and three battalions of American rangers were employed for the quick capture of this defile and of the Chianzi Pass on a neighboring route. The main British assault convoy sailed from Tripoli on September 6, and the main American one from Moran the previous evening. Others sailed from Algiers, Bizeta, and the North Sicilian ports of Palermo and Termini. Although their destination was a heavily guarded secret, it was not difficult to deduce or guess in view of the practicable limits of air cover and the need for early capture of a large port, two conditions which here coincided in such a way as to provide a very obvious pointer. The Chinese cook of a water boat at Tripoli caused some palpitation by his farewell shout see you in Naples. But he was only echoing what was a matter of common talk among seamen and soldiers. A fostering factor was the unfortunate choice of the titles Force N and Force S for the northern and southern attack forces. Nor was it only a matter of guesswork, for one of the administrative orders which had a wide circulation mentioned by name a number of places in and around Salerno. Since the objective was so obvious, a greater handicap was that the army commander, Mark Clark, persisted in counting on surprise to such an extent that he forbade any preliminary naval bombardment of the defences, despite strong arguments from the commander of the naval task force escorting and supporting the landing force, 
Vice Admiral H. Kent Hewitt USN who clearly saw that it was fantastic to assume we could obtain tactical surprise. But it can be argued, on the other hand, that the advantage of softening up the coast defenses might have been offset by a quicker concentration of the enemy's reserves if the intended landing site had been more definitely made clear in this way. The approach of the convoys, made round the west and north coasts of Sicily, was spotted and reported to the German headquarters early in the afternoon of the 8th, and at 3.30 pm their troops were put on the alert in readiness for the expected landing. At 6.30 pm the announcement of the armistice with Italy was broadcast by Eisenhower on Radio Algiers, and at 7.20 pm repeated by the BBC News. One or other of these broadcasts was heard by the Allied troops on board the convoys. This news, despite warnings from some of their officers that they still had to deal with the Germans, unfortunately gave them the impression that the landings would be a walkover. They were soon disillusioned. So were those Allied planners who had optimistically forecast the capture of Naples by the third day a goal that was reached only after three weeks of struggle and a narrow escape from disaster. During the afternoon of the 8th the approaching convoys came under air attack several times, and again after dark, when German bombers flew over them dropping parachute flares, but the armada was fortunate in suffering little damage. Just after midnight the leading transports arrived at the release points, 8 to 10 miles offshore and began lowering their landing craft. These reached the beaches at all close to the scheduled H hour of 3.30 am two hours earlier, a coastal battery taken over by the Germans had opened fire on the landing craft approaching the northern flank, but had been tackled and silenced by the escorting destroyers, and the final stage had been aided by a short but intense bombardment of the beach defenses by naval guns and rocket craft a new aid which here made its debut. But in the southern sector no such supporting fire was provided as the American divisional commander stuck to the army commander's no-fire instructions in the hope that local surprise might still be achieved by a silent landing. The result was that, in the last lap to the beach, the landing craft came under a hail of fire from the shore, and many casualties were suffered by the troops. As the prospects of a quick advance to Naples turned on the capture of the road northward from Salerno through the mountains, it is appropriate to recount the landings from left to right, starting with the northern flank. Here the American rangers landed unopposed on a small beach at Mayari and within three hours secured the Chianzi Pass, while establishing themselves on the ridges overlooking the main Salerno-Naples road. The British commandos also had an easy landing at Vietri, where the road leaves the coast and starts to mount. But the enemy reacted quickly, delaying the clearance of the town, and the commandos were then held up just north of it in the low pass of Lamolino at the start of the Carver Gap. The main British landings, on beaches a few miles south of Salerno, met a stiff resistance from the start and their progress was also adversely affected because part of the 46th Division was put ashore by mistake on the beaches of its right-hand neighbor, the 56th, causing confusion and congestion. Although some of the leading troops pushed two miles inland, they suffered many casualties and fell short of securing the important first-day objectives, Salerno Harbor, Monte Corvino Airfield, and the road junctions at Battipaglia and Eboli. Moreover, at the end of the day there was still a seven-mile gap between the British right flank north of the cell and the American left flank south of that river. The American landings were made on four beaches close to the famous Greek temples at Bestum. The strain of approaching the shore under heavy fire, without support from their own ships, was followed by running into further curtains of fear after landing, as well as a battering from successive German air attacks on the beaches. It was a severe ordeal for the troops of the 36th Division, who had no previous experience of battle. Fortunately, they were now given good support by naval gunfire, from destroyers which drove in boldly through minefields to aid them, and this proved particularly helpful both here and on the British sector in checking counter thrusts by small groups of German tanks, which were the chief menace to the invaders.
By nightfall the American left wing had pushed about five miles inland, to the hill town of Capixio, but the right wing was still pinned down close to the beaches. The second day, September 10, was a quiet one on the American sector, as the 16th Panzer Division had moved most of its meager strength northward to the British sector, which was strategically the greater menace to their hold on the Salerno area. The Americans profited by the opportunity to expand their bridgehead, and to land the bulk of the 45th Division, their floating reserve. Meanwhile the British 56th Division had occupied Monte Corvino airfield and Battipaglia early in the morning, but was later driven back by vigorous counter-attack from two German motor infantry battalions along with some tanks, which produced a local panic, even in part of the Guards Brigade, before the tanks of the Royal Scots Greys came to provide support of a similar kind. That night the 56th Division mounted a three-brigade attack to capture the dominating heights of Mount Eboli, but it made only slight progress, which included a re-entry into Battipaglia. The 46th Division occupied Salerno and sent a brigade to relieve the commandos, but did not develop a northward push. On the American sector the fresh 45th Division advanced some 10 miles inland up the east bank of the cell through Person O and came near to reaching the road center of Ponticell, the apex of the desired beach headline. But it was checked and then led to withdraw by a counter-attack from a German motor infantry battalion and eight tanks, switched back across the river from the British sector. Thus at the end of the third day the four allied divisions that had landed, with extra units equivalent to a fifth, were still confined in two shallow and separate beachheads while the Germans held both the surrounding heights and the approach routes to the flat coastal strip. Allied helps of reaching Naples on the third day had vanished. The 16th Panzer Division, barely half of the scale of an Allied division in fighting units, had succeeded in curbing the invasion and gaining time for the arrival of German reinforcements. The first to arrive were the 29th Panzer Grenadier Division, which was already on its way back from Calabria, and a battle group, with two infantry battalions and some twenty tanks, that the refitting Hermann Goring Division had managed to raise. This battle group, coming from the Naples area, counter-attacked and broke through the British line above the Lamolina Pass, coming close to Vietri before it was stopped, on the 13th by the re-entry of the commandos, into the fight. Even so, the pass was now firmly sealed. It had become all too clear that the British X Corps was penned into the very narrow coastal strip near Salerno with the Germans ensconced on the surrounding heights. Meanwhile Mark Clark's initial confidence was being still worse shaken by events in the southern sector. For the 29th Panzer Grenadier Division along with part of the 16th Panzer thrust into the gap between the British and Americans. On the evening of September 12, the British right wing was again driven out of Battipaglia, and suffered heavy loss, particularly in prisoners. On the 13th, the Germans exploited the widened gap between the two allied Kalfor a stroke against the American left wing, driving it out of person O and producing a general withdrawal. In the confusion that ensued, the Germans penetrated the line in several places and at one point came within about half a mile of the beaches. That evening the situation looked so grim that the unloading of all merchant ships was stopped in the southern sector. Moreover Mark Clark sent Admiral Hewitt an urgent request to prepare for re-embarking 5th Army headquarters and to make all available craft ready to evacuate the 6th Corps from the beachhead and re-land it in the British sector, or alternatively to transfer the 10th Corps southward. Such a large-scale emergency shift was hardly practicable, and the suggestion drew a horrified protest from McCreary and his naval colleague Commodore Oliver, while it caused consternation in higher quarters when reported to Eisenhower and Alexander. But it helped to produce an accelerated reinforcement of the troops on shore additional landing craft being provided for the purpose by diverting 18 LSTS which were en route to India. The 82nd Airborne Division was put at Mark Clark's disposal, and in swift response to his emergency call in the afternoon Matt Ridgway managed to drop the first installment in the southern beachhead that evening. The British 7th Armoured Division began to land in the northern beachhead on the 15th. 
but by then the crisis had passed, thanks largely to the quicker emergency relief given by Allied Sea Power and Air Power. On the 14th all available aircraft, of the strategic as well as the tactical air forces, in the Mediterranean theatre were turned on to bombing the German troops and their immediate communications. They carried out more than 1,900 sorties during the day. Even more effective in checking the Germans' drive for the beaches was the hammering they received from naval gunfire. Vietinghoff said in his retrospective account. The attack this morning pushed on into stiff and resistance, but above all the advancing troops had to endure the most severe heavy fire that had yet been experienced, the naval gunfire from at least 16 to 18 battleships, cruisers and large destroyers lying in the road instead. With astonishing precision and freedom of maneuver these ships shot with very overwhelming effect at every target spotted. With such powerful support, the American troops succeeded in maintaining the rearward defense line to which they had been withdrawn during the previous night. There was a lull on the 15th, while the Germans were reorganizing their shell and bomb battered units for a fresh effort, with the aid of some reinforcements. The still tankless 26th Panzer Division had now arrived from Calabria, after slipping away from Montgomery's front as ordered by Vietinghoff on the day of the Salerno landing. Detachments of the 3rd and 15th Panzer Grenadier Divisions had also arrived, from Rome and Gaeta respectively. But even with these additions the German strength was the equivalent of only four divisions, with little more than a hundred tanks whereas by the 16th the 5th Army had on shore the equivalent of seven divisions, of larger scale, with some 200 tanks. So the Allied command had no cause for worry except for the possibility of a crack in morale before their manifold superiority took effect. Moreover the 8th Army was now close at hand, to augment this superiority and threaten the enemy's flank. Alexander arrived at Clark's headquarters that morning on a visit, having come across from Bizeter in a destroyer, and toured the beachheads. In his characteristically tactful way he squashed the idea of evacuating either of them. A fresh material reinforcement was provided by the arrival about 10 a.m. of the British battleship War Spite and Valiant, which had sailed from Malta the previous afternoon, along with six destroyers. They did not come into action until seven hours later, owing to communication delays with forward observers, but then bombarded targets up to a dozen miles inland, and the very heavy shells from their 15-inch guns had a shattering effect both physically and morally. Another arrival that morning was a group of war correspondents from the 8th Army. Feeling that its advance to the aid of the 5th Army was too slow and needlessly cautious. They had gone ahead on their own the previous day in a couple of jeeps, using minor roads and tracks to avoid the blown up bridges on the main road, and came through the 50 mile stretch of enemy country without meeting any Germans. 27 hours later the leading reconnaissance unit of the 8th Army arrived to make touch with the 5th. On the morning of the 16th the Germans launched their renewed effort, starting on the British sector, with a thrust from the north towards Salerno and another toward Battipaglia. These thrusts were stopped by the combined effect of artillery fire, naval gun fire, and tanks. This failure and the approach of the 8th Army led Kesselring to the conclusion that the possibility of throwing the invaders back into the sea had passed. So, that evening, he authorized a disengagement on the coastal front, and a gradual retreat northward. The first stage was to be a withdrawal to the line of the Volturno, 20 miles north of Naples, which, he laid down, was to be held until mid-October. In view of the way that naval gunfire had helped thwart the Germans' counter-attack, although largely before the big ships came on the scene, it was some consolation to them that the war spite was disabled that afternoon by a direct hit from one of their new FX.1400 radio-guided gliding bombs. By the same new means they had also delivered a parting kick at the main fleet of their late Italian ally when this sailed from Spezia on September 9 to join the Allied navies, sinking its flagship, the Roma, with one of these guided bombs. In analysis it is evident that once the German efforts to throw the invaders back into the sea had been curbed, 
a German withdrawal from Salerno became inevitable. For although Kesselring had striven to exploit the opportunity allowed by what he termed Montgomery's very cautious advance, it was very clear that he could not hang on to this stretch of the west coast when the British Eighth Army arrived 011 the scene and became able to outflank his position by advancing through the interior, after emerging from the narrow Calabrian Peninsula. He had far too few troops to cover such a widening front. But the threat did not develop fast enough to endanger or hustle the German withdrawal. For it was not until the afternoon of September 20 that a Canadian spearhead of the 8th Army drove into Potenza, the main road centre on the ankle of Italy, 50 miles inland from the Gulf of Salerno. A hundred German paratroops, rushed to Potenza the previous afternoon, had imposed an overnight pause and caused the mounting of a brigade attack, with about 30 times their strength, in order to overcome their resistance a significant example of the delaying power of skillful defence in a hazy situation. The attack which forced the retreat of this tiny detachment brought the capture of only 16 Germans, but nearly 2,000 of the Italian inhabitants had been killed in the preliminary air attacks on the town. Canadian patrols pushed on cautiously during the next week to Melfi, 40 miles northward, having only fleet in contact with enemy rearguards. Meantime the main body of the 8th Army had halted, as its supplies were becoming short, while switching its line of supply to Taranto and Brindisi in the southeast corner of Italy. For the landings here, on Italy's heel, had been achieved without meeting any opposition. Taranto had been among the possible objectives considered in June, after the combined chiefs of staff had instructed Eisenhower to prepare plans for following up the capture of Sicily but it had been rejected largely because it did not fit the cardinal principle which his staff had immediately laid down, that no opposed landing could be contemplated outside the limit of fighter cover. Taranto, like Naples, was just beyond the 180-mile radius of action of Spitfires operating from airfields in the northeast of Sicily, whereas Salerno was just inside that radius. The Taranto project was only revived when the armistice with Italy was signed on September 3. It was then added to the invasion plan as an improvised subsidiary move, codenamed Operation Slapstick, following information that only a handful of German troops was posted in the heel of Italy, and a belated realization that the port of Naples, even when captured and made usable, would not suffice to maintain an advance up the eastern side of the Apennines as well as up the western side. Admiral Cunningham, who took the initiative in suggesting this move, told Eisenhower that if the troops were produced for the purpose he would provide ships to carry them. At that moment the British 1st Airborne Division was available in Tunisia, owing to a lack of sufficient transport aircraft for employing it in an airborne role so it was hurriedly embarked at Bizeta in five cruisers and a mine layer, which sailed for Taranto on the evening of September 8. The next afternoon, as the convoy approached Taranto, it passed the Italian squadron based on Taranto sailing to surrender at Malta. At dusk the convoy entered the port, and found most of its facilities intact. Two days later the success was extended over the heel by the occupation of Brindisi, to which King Victor Emmanuel and Marshal Badoglio had fled from Rome, and also of Bari, sixty miles farther up the coast, on the back of Italy's ankle. Thus three large ports had been secured in this area, for the maintenance of an advance up the east coast, long before any comparable one had been captured on the west coast, and it was all too clear that the long delay in reaching Naples, from Salerno, would allow the Germans ample time to demolish the port before abandoning it. But the wonderful opportunity thus presented on the east coast went begging through want of foresight, and inadequate effort subsequently to redeem it. The codename Slapstick became painfully apt. Visualized as merely an operation to secure ports, the 1st Airborne Division was dispatched without transport vehicles, except for half a dozen jeeps and remained in this destitute state until the 14th. During these five days a few patrols in jeeps and requisitioned cars had pushed north as far as Bari without finding any enemy troops in the broad coastal belt. 
for the depleted German 1st Parachute Division had been the only one in this area, and part of it had been called away to the Salerno sector, while the rest had been ordered to withdraw to Foyer, 120 miles north of Taranto, to cover Kesselring's deep eastern flank. Yet even when transport arrived to restore mobility to the British troops they were still held in leash while the planning and preparation for a large-scale advance up the east coast proceeded in a methodical way. Adherence to this cautious habit was the more unfortunate in such a period of far-reaching opportunity as the German 1st Parachute Division was too far back to counter-attack, and its entire fighting strength was only 1,300 men while that of the British was already four times as large, with much larger reinforcements on the way to back up a forward move. But habit prevailed. The conduct of operations here had been given to the commander of the 5th Corps, General Alfrey, who had been in charge of the two cautious, and abortive, advance on Tunis the previous December, and his task had been defined by Alexander as being to secure a base in the heel of Italy covering the ports of Taranto and Brindisi and if possible Bari, with a view to a subsequent advance. Any likelihood of an early thrust beyond these bounds diminished when, on the 13th, Alfre's corps was placed under the 8th Army, for Montgomery could always be counted on to mass his forces and make sure of ample resources before advancing. On September 22, the 78th Division began to disembark at Bari, followed by the 8th Indian Division at Brindisi, while Dempsey's 13th Corps was being brought over to the east coast. But it was not until September 27 that a small mobile force, sent forward from Bari to explore the enemy's situation, occupied Foyer, which the Germans promptly evacuated as soon as the British approached, so that the much-desired airfields were captured without a fight. Even then Montgomery adhered to his earlier order that no main bodies were to advance before October 1st, and when his advance began he used only the two divisions of the 13th Corps, keeping the three divisions of the 5th Corps back to ensure a firm base and protect his inland flank. The German 1st Parachute Division was now holding a line along the Bifano River, covering the small port of Termoli, a very wide front for its slender strength. Montgomery's attack on this line was well designed to crack it open, by a seaborne stroke in its rear. In the early hours of October 3rd, a special service brigade was landed beyond Termoli and, with the advantage of night surprise, in driving rain quickly captured the port and town, then linking up with a bridgehead over the river gained by the direct advance. During the next two days two more infantry brigades, of the 78th Division, were brought up by sea, from Barlata to Termoli, to reinforce the bridgehead and continue the advance. But the German army commander, Vietinghoff, benefiting from the British delay in building their east coast advance, had already, on the 2nd, dispatched the 16th Panzer Division from the Volturno line on the west coast to reinforce the thin screen of paratroops which had been covering the distant left flank of his army's withdrawal. Hurrying across the mountain spine of Italy they arrived near Termoli early on the 5th and promptly launched a counter-attack which drove the British back to the edge of the town and came close to cutting their line of communications southward. But the Germans were checked and then pushed back as the 78th Division brought its seaborne reinforcements into action, supported by a stronger body of tanks, British and Canadian. The Germans then disengaged and withdrew to positions covering the next river line, the Trigno, a dozen miles northward. The impression made by their sharp counter-attack led Montgomery to pause for two weeks for a further build-up of his strength and supplies before tackling the Trigno line. Meanwhile Mark Clark's 5th Army had been slowly pushing forward from Salerno up the west coast and trying to hustle the withdrawal of Vietinghoff's German 10th Army. The first stage was the stickiest, as the German right wing held on stubbornly to the hill barrier north of Salerno to cover the extrication of the left wing as this wheeled back from the southerly coastal stretch around Battipuglia and Pestum. Nearly a week passed after the beginning of that withdrawal before the British 10th Corps, on September 23 developed an offensive to force the passage from Salerno to Naples. 
In this offensive the 10th Corps employed not only the 46th and 56th Divisions but the 7th Armoured Division, and an additional armoured brigade, against the small German force of 3 to 4 battalions which was holding the passes. Little progress was made until September 26, when it was found that the opposing Germans had vanished during the previous night, having fulfilled their mission of gaining time for the wheel back of their comrades in the south. After that, demolished bridges were the main hindrance to the Allied advance. On the 28th the 10th Corps emerged into the plain at Nocera, but it was not until October 1st that its leading troops entered Naples, 20 miles on. Meanwhile the American 6th Corps had come up level with the 10th Corps after a slow advance along the demolition blocked inland roads, during which it had averaged only 3 miles a day, and entered Benvento on October 2nd. This corps now had a new commander, Major General John P. Lucas, who had been brought in to replace Dawley. The 5th Army had taken three weeks since the landing to reach Naples, its initial objective, at a cost of nearly 12,000 casualties, close on 7,000 British and 5,000 American. That was the penalty paid for choosing a too obvious line of attack and place of landing, at the sacrifice of surprise on the ground that the Salerno sector was just within the limit of air cover. Another week passed before the 5th Army closed up to the line of the Volturno River, to which the Germans had withdrawn. Muddy roads and sodden ground put a break on the advance as rainy weather had set in during the first week of October, a month earlier than expected. 5th Army's attack on the Volturno line, held by three German divisions, was launched on the night of October 12, three nights later than intended. The U.S. 6th Corps gained a bridgehead over the river above Capua, but its development was cramped by the check which the right wing of the British 10th Corps suffered in trying to force a crossing at Capua, on the main road from Naples to Rome. The small crossings which the two other British divisions gained nearer to the coast were curbed by speedy counter-attacks. Thus the German forward troops fulfilled Kesselring's order to stay on this river line until the 16th before beginning to withdraw to the next line of defence, 15 miles northward, a hurriedly improvised line starting near the mouth of the Garigliano River and continuing through the cluster of rugged hills which cover the approach, along Highway 6 and through the Mignano defile, to the upper reaches of the Garigliano and the valleys of its tributaries, the Rapido and the Lirai. Kesselring hoped to hold this outpost line while he was fortifying, for a prolonged defense, a carefully planned line along the Garigliano and Rapido, pivoted on the Casino defile. This slightly rearward position was called the Gustav, on winter line. Bad weather and demolitions delayed the 5th Army's attack on the first of these lines for a further three weeks, until November 5th and then the Germans' resistance proved so tough that after ten days' struggle, with little progress except on the coastal flank, Mark Clark was driven to pull back his weary troops and reorganize them for a stronger effort. This was not ready for launching until the first week of December. The 5th Army's losses had risen to 22,000 by mid-November, of which nearly 12,000 were Americans. During these long pauses Hitler's view changed in a way that was of far-reaching effect. Encouraged by the slowness of the Allied advance from Salerno and Bari he had come to feel that it might not be necessary to withdraw to northern Italy, and on October 4 he issued a directive that the line Gaia to Ortona will be held, promising Kesselring that three divisions from Rommel's army group B in northern Italy would be sent to help him in holding on south of Rome as long as possible. Hitler was becoming more inclined to favor Kesselring's case for a prolonged stand, but it was not until November 21 that he definitely committed himself to this course by putting all the German forces in Italy under Kesselring's command. Rommel's army group was dissolved, and its remaining troops were now at Kesselring's disposal. Even so, Kesselring still had to keep part of them in the north to guard and control that large area, while four of the best divisions, three of them armoured, were sent to Russia and replaced by three depleted ones which needed to recuperate. A smaller but valuable reinforcement came from the arrival of the 90th Panzergrenadier Division. This division had been in Sardinia at the time of the Italian armistice, but had been evacuated to Corsica, 
across the narrow strait of Bonifacio, and then successfully carried by air and sea to the Italian mainland at Leghorn, in driblets over a period of two weeks, evading interception by the Allied air and sea forces, whose efforts to interfere were slight and spasmodic. Although the division was not put at Kesselring's disposal until more than six weeks later, he then rushed it southward in time to help in checking the Eighth Army's delayed offensive up the east coast of Italy. Hitler's decision to place all the German forces in Italy under Kesselring's command, now named Army Group C, was taken the morning after Montgomery began a probing attack against the German position along the Sangro River, covering Ortona and the Adriatic extension of the Gustav Line. After the tough resistance he had met on getting across the Bifino in the first week of October, Montgomery had brought up the 5th Corps to take over the coastal sector and shifted the 13th Corps to the hilly sector inland, where German rearguards were imposing repeated checks on the Canadians' advance. After this regrouping the 5th Corps pushed onto the Trigno, 12 miles beyond the Bifano, and gained a small bridgehead on the night of October 22 which had expanded by a large night attack on the 27th. But it was checked by a combination of mud and fire, so that it did not break into the enemy's main position until the night of November 3rd. The Germans then withdrew to the Sangro, 17 miles northward. Another long pause followed, while Montgomery was mounting his attack and bringing up the recently arrived 2nd New Zealand Division a powerful reinforcement which increased his attacking strength to five divisions and two armoured brigades for the Sangro offensive. Meantime the so-called 76th Panzer Corps opposing the 8th Army had received the 65th Infantry Division, to take over the coastal sector from the 16th Panzer Division, which was being dispatched to Russia. But beyond this it had only the remnants of the 1st Parachute Division and a battle group of the 26th Panzer Division which was now returning bit by bit to the Adriatic side as the Allied Fifth Army's pressure weaned. Montgomery's aim in the Sangro offensive was to smash the Germans' winter line, then drive on 20 miles to Pescara, get astride the east-to-west highway from the to Rome, and threaten the rear of the German forces which were holding up the Fifth Army. For Alexander still hopefully adhered to his directive of September 21, two months earlier, which had set the objectives to be attained by the Allied armies, in four successive phases, the first to consolidate the Salerno-Bari line, the second to capture the port of Naples and the foyer airfields, the third to capture Rome, its airfields, and the important road and rail centre of Terni, and the next having as its objective the port of Ligorne and the communications centres of Florence and Arest so, 150 miles north of Rome. The speedy capture of Rome had been reiterated as the key point of the fresh directive which Alexander issued on November 8, after receiving a similar one from Eisenhower. Montgomery's offensive was planned for delivery on November 20, but the worsening weather and swollen river compelled him to reduce the initial assault to a limited effort which, after several days fighting, gained a bridgehead about six miles wide and a mile deep. This was maintained under great difficulties until the big attack was launched on the night of the 28th, a week behind schedule. Yet Montgomery still showed complete confidence in the outcome, and in a personal message to his troops on the 25th declared, the time has now come to drive the Germans north of Rome. The Germans are, in fact, in the very condition in which we want them. We will now hit the Germans a colossal crack but it seemed ominous that he delivered this message after stepping down from his caravan to stand in the rain under an outsize umbrella. The attack started well, under cover of a tremendous air and artillery bombardment, backed by a 5 to 1 superiority in numbers. The enemy's 65th Division, a raw and ill-equipped division of mixed nationalities, gave way under the impact, and the ridge beyond the Sangro was cleared by the 30th, but the Germans rallied on retiring to their main line farther back, and were helped by the way that their pursuers complied with Montgomery's oft-repeated emphasis on establishing a firm base. A particularly good opportunity for exploitation went begging at Orsogna on the inland flank during December 2nd and 3rd. 
Thus time was allowed for the arrival of the rest of the 26th Panzer Division and of the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division, which Kesselring brought down from the north. Thus the advance became increasingly sticky. There was always one more river, one more river to cross. It was not until December 10 that the 8th Army succeeded in crossing the Mirror, eight miles beyond the Sangro, and it did not clear Ortona, two miles beyond the Mirror, until December 28. Then it was checked at the Risio, barely halfway to Pescara, the Pescara River, and the lateral highway to Rome. That was the stalemate situation at the end of the year, when Montgomery handed over command of the 8th Army to Oliver Lees, and returned to England to take over the 21st Army Group in preparation for the cross-channel invasion of Normandy. Meanwhile Mark Clark's renewed offensive west of the Apennines had started on December 2. By this time the 5th Army's strength had risen to the equivalent of 10 divisions. But two of these, the British 7th Armoured and the US 82nd Airborne, were being withdrawn to England for the coming cross-channel attack. Kesselring's strength had also risen, and four divisions now held the front west of the Apennines, with one in reserve. In the first phase of the renewed offensive the objective was the mountain buttress west of Route 6 and the Mignano Gap. The British 10th Corps and the newly arrived US 2nd Corps, under Major General Geoffrey Keyes, were employed in this attack, supported by over 900 guns, which fired over 4,000 tons of shells onto the German positions in the first two days. The British came near to reaching the 3,000-foot summit of Monte Camino by December 3 but were driven back by counterattacks and did not secure it until the 6th. That brought them up to the Garigliano River line. Meanwhile the Americans, on their right, had captured Monte La Difenza and Monte Maggiore, which were lower, but closer to the highway through the gap. In the second phase, starting on December 7, the U.S. 2nd and 6th Corps attacked towards the Rapido on a wider front, hoping to clear the enemy off the mountain buttress east of Highway 6, by a deep thrust on each side of it. But they met increasing resistance, achieving only a few miles inching progress in successive efforts during the next few weeks. By the second week of January this offensive had petered out, while still short of reaching the Rapido and the forward edge of the Gustav Line. The 5th Army's battle losses had risen to nearly 40,000, a total far exceeding the enemy's. In addition the Americans alone had suffered a loss of 50,000 in sick during the two months duration of this bitter winter struggle in the mountains. The sequel to the invasion of Italy had been very disappointing. In four months the Allied forces had advanced only 70 miles beyond Salerno, mostly in the first few weeks and were still 80 miles short of Rome. Alexander himself described the process as slogging up Italy. But a more general description that came to be used in the autumn was inching. Knowing would have been an even more apt term in view of the country's geographical resemblance to a leg. Even when full allowance is made for the difficulties of the terrain and the bad weather, it becomes evident in examining the campaign that favorable opportunities of faster progress were repeatedly missed through the Allied commander's heavy emphasis on consolidating each advance and establishing a firm base before pressing on, together with their predominant concern to ensure ample strength and supplies before advancing. Time after time they were too late from fear of having too little. In comment on the campaign, Kesselring significantly remarked, the Allied plans showed throughout that the Allied High Command's dominating thought was to make sure of success, a thought that led it to use orthodox methods and material. As a result it was almost always possible for me, despite inadequate means of reconnaissance and scanty reports, to foresee the next strategic or tactical move of my opponent, and thus to take the appropriate countermeasures so far as my resources allowed. But the original source of the trouble which the Allies suffered lay in their choice of Salerno and the toe of Italy as their landing sites, a choice which conformed all too closely to the opponent's expectation, from experience of their cautious habit. Kesselring and his chief of staff, Westfall, the beneficiaries of that too obvious decision, considered that the Allies had paid heavy strategic forfeit for their desire to ensure tactical security against air attack 
and that this was an over-insurance in view of the then scanty strength of the German air force in southern Italy, they felt, too, that the Allied High Command's habit of limiting the scope of its strokes to the limits of constant air cover had been the defender's salvation, by simplifying the multiple problems of the defense. As to the course that the Allies should have taken, Westfl expressed the view that if the forces employed in the landing at Salerno had been used instead at Civitavecchia, 30 miles north of Rome, the results would have been much more decisive. There were only two German divisions in Rome and no others could have been brought up quickly enough to defend it. In conjunction with the five Italian divisions stationed at Rome, a combined sea and air landing would have taken the Italian capital inside 72 hours. Quite apart from the political repercussions of such a victory this would have resulted in cutting off at one blow the supplies of the five German divisions retreating from Calabria. That would have brought all Italy south of the line Rome Pescara into allied hands. Westfall also considered it was a mistake to land Montgomery's 8th Army on the toe of Italy, where it had to push up the whole length of the foot while the greater opportunity on the exposed heel of Italy and along the Adriatic coast went begging. The landing of the British Eighth Army should have taken place in full strength in the Taranto sector, where only one parachute division, with only three batteries of divisional artillery, was stationed. Indeed, it would have been even better to have carried out the landing in the sector Pescaro Ancona. No resistance to this landing could have been provided from the Rome sector owing to our lack of available forces. Likewise no appreciable forces could have been brought down rapidly from the Po Plain, in northern Italy. Ibid, p. 365. It would also have been impossible to switch Kesselring's forces quickly from the west coast to the southeast coast if the main landing, by the Allied Fifth Army, had been made at Taranto instead of Salerno. In sum, the Allies failed to profit either initially or subsequently from their greatest advantage, amphibious power, and its neglect became their greatest handicap. The evidence of Kesselring and Westphal supports, and in a wider way, the scaling conclusion which Churchill expressed in a telegram, from Carthage, to the British Chiefs of Staff on December 19. The stagnation of the whole campaign on the Italian front is becoming scandalous. The total neglect to provide amphibious action on the Adriatic side and the failure to strike any similar blow on the west have been disastrous. None of the landing craft in the Mediterranean have been put to the slightest use, for assault purposes, for three months. There are few instances, even in this war, of such valuable forces being so completely wasted. What he did not see was that the doctrine of war on the Allied side was at fault from following the cautious banker's principle of no advance without security. Chapter 28, The German EBB in Russia At the start of 1943 the German armies in the Caucasus looked likely to suffer the same fate as the Stalingrad armies. They were far deeper in the nose of the bag than the latter had been. Yet they had already been made to remain there for more than a month after the Stalingrad encirclement while winter was deepening and danger extending. It was a grim outlook for the 1st Panzer Army and the 17th Army, composing Army Group A, in command of which General Clist had succeeded Field Marshal List. In the first week of January, the precarious situation of Army Group A was emphasized by the development of multiple enveloping threats. The most direct was where its head stuck into the Caucasus Mountains. The Russians struck first at its left cheek near Mozdok, and then at its right cheek near Nalkik, regaining both places. More dangerous was a simultaneous Russian move across the Kamuk steppes 200 miles behind its left flank, at the joint between its and army group Don. Capturing Elista, the Russians drove down past that end of Lake Manich towards Armavia, through which ran Klist's communications with Rostov. Most dangerous of all was a sudden surge southward down the Don line, from the Stalingrad direction, towards Rostov itself. One of the Russian spearheads came within 50 miles of that bottleneck. 
This alarming news reached Kliss on the same day that he received an emphatic order from Hitler that he was not to withdraw his front in any circumstances. At that moment his first Panzer army stood nearly 400 miles east of Rostov. The next day he received a fresh order, to retreat from the Caucasus, bringing all his equipment away with him. That requirement added to the handicap of distance in a race with time. To leave the Rostov routes clear for the 1st Panzer Army, the 17th Army was ordered to withdraw westwards along the Cuban River towards the Taman Peninsula, whence it might if necessary be transported back across the Kerch Straits into the Crimea. That withdrawal was not a long step, and the Russian forces recently besieged in the coastal strip around Tuaps were not strong enough to exert a dangerous pressure on the retreating 17th Army. By contrast, the retreat of the 1st Panzer Army was beset with perils, both direct and indirect. The most dangerous phase was from January 15 until February 1, by which time the bulk of that army had reached Rostov. Even so, the continuation of its line of retreat, though not so narrowly constricted, was menaced by a series of Russian thrusts ranging over a further 200 miles. On January 10 General Rokosovsky had launched a concentric assault on the encircled German forces at Stalingrad, following the rejection of a Russian ultimatum to surrender. Paulus's troops were so enfeebled by hunger, cold, disease, depression, and shortage of ammunition that they were in no state to offer strong or prolonged resistance. Still less were they capable of breaking out of the ring. Thus the Russians were able to spare part of the investing forces to reinforce the southward drive to cut off the Germans' Caucasus forces, and more were released as the ring was contracted. As this final act at Stalingrad began, Klist's forces, having withdrawn from the nose of their Caucasus salient, were standing on the Kuma River, between Pyatigorsk and Budinovsk. Ten days later the Russian thrust south from Elista reached a point more than a hundred miles in rear of the Kuma line. But by then Klist's retreating columns were nearing Armavia, and thus passing the immediate point of danger. Nevertheless, farther back an acute danger was developing from the more powerful Russian drive down both sides of the Don towards Rostov. On the east side the Russians were now close to the managed river and the rail junction of Solsk. On the west side they had reached the Don it's not far from the point where it entered the lower Don. Klist's rearguards had still three times as far to go as the Russians before they could reach Rostov. Moreover, Manstein's exhausted forces, striving to cover the flank of Klist's escape corridor, were now so hard pressed that they seemed on the verge of cracking under the strain. The retreating forces won the race, however, and managed to slip out of the trap. Ten days later Klist's rearguards were close to Rostov, and their would-be interrupters had been baffled. Luckily for the Germans the desolate snow-covered country had limited even the Russians' capacity to push on beyond their distant trailheads fast enough and in force enough to close the trap. But its jaws had only been held open by a narrow margin. Manstein's forces had clung on so long to exposed positions that their own chances of withdrawal were jeopardized and some of Klist's divisions had to be rushed back to help in extricating them, as well as reinforcing them. The German forces from the Caucasus safely crossed the Don at Rostov just as the Stalingrad forces collapsed. Paulus himself and a large section of them surrendered on January 31. The last remaining fragment surrendered on February 2. In all, 92,000 had been taken prisoner since the start of the assault three weeks earlier, while the total loss had been nearly three times that figure. Among those who surrendered were 24 generals. Although the German generals on the Eastern Front had been provided with little tubes of poison in case they fell into Russian hands, few seem to have used these until after the failure of the general's plot to assassinate Hitler on July 20, 1944 when they began to do so rather than risk delivery into the hands of the Gestapo. But Stalingrad henceforth worked like a subtle poison in the minds of the German commanders everywhere, undermining their confidence in the strategy which they were called on to execute. Morally even more than materially, 
the disaster to that army at Stalingrad had an effect from which the German army never recovered. Yet there was justification for Hitler's consoling declaration that the sacrifice of the army at Stalingrad had given the supreme command time for, and the possibility of, countermeasures on which depended the fate of the whole Eastern Front. If the army at Stalingrad had surrendered any time during the first seven weeks after its encirclement, a much greater disaster might have overtaken the other German armies. For Manstein's scanty forces could not possibly have withstood the Russian flood that would have poured down the Dom to Rostov, and the forces in the Caucasus would have been cut off. Their fate might also have been sealed if the army at Stalingrad had succeeded in breaking out of the trap and retreating westward. Moreover, although its resistance during the last fortnight of January was not strong enough to prevent the Russians pushing down towards Rostov in great strength, it still detained a proportion of their strength sufficient to make a vital difference to the chances of the Caucasus forces reaching Rostov in time to slip through the bottleneck. Even with this help the retreat from the Caucasus was achieved by the narrowest of margins. In terms of time, space, force, and weather conditions it was an astonishing performance, for which Clist was made a field marshal. While the skill and tenacity with which it was conducted deserves due recognition, its greatest significance lies in the proof it provided of the extraordinary resisting power inherent in modern defense so long as commanders and troops keep cool heads and stout hearts. Further proof came in the weeks that followed. For after the retreating armies had passed safely through the Rostov bottleneck they had still to deal with dangers that were developing far back on their line of retreat. In the middle of January General Vatutin's left wing had resumed its push southward from the central Don to the Dunitz behind Rostov. Besides producing the collapse of Milerovo, after that tough obstacle had been bypassed, the Dunitz itself was crossed at and east of Kamensk. In the same week two fresh Russian offensives had been launched. One was far away in the Leningrad sector. This broke the 17 months encirclement of that great city, lifting the pressure of the siege. Although it did not go far enough to wipe out the German salient that had projected to Lake Ladoga, across the rear of the city, it cut a hole through to Schlusselburg along the lake shore and that strategic tracheotomy created a windpipe through which the garrison and population could breathe more freely. The other fresh offensive menaced the Germans' breathing space in the south. It was launched on 12 January by General Glikov's armies from the western stretch of the Don below Voronezh, and broke through the front of the Second Army and the Second Hungarian Army. Within a week it had penetrated a hundred miles, halfway from the Don to Kharkov, General Vatutin's right wing delivered a converging thrust eastward down the corridor between the Don and the Dunitz. In the last week of January the offensive was extended afresh. While attention was focused on the southwesterly drive towards Kharkov, the Russians struck westward from Voronezh on a broad front, upset the local withdrawal that the Germans were making there, and turned this into a widespread reflux. In barely three days the Russians had advanced nearly halfway to Kursk, the spring board from which the enemy had launched his summer offensive. During the first week of February they threw their right shoulder forward, and drove a wedge deep across the railway and road between Kursk and Orel. Then they drove another wedge across the line between Kursk and Belgrade. Having thus outflanked Kursk on both sides they captured the city on February 7 by a sudden bound forward. In the same way the second wedge they had driven was used as a means to produce the collapse of Belgorod two days later. This gain, in turn, became a threat to the northern flank of Kharkov. Meanwhile, the apparently direct advance on Kharkov had developed a more southwesterly bias, towards the sea of as often the line of retreat from Rostov. On the 5th Vatutin's forces captured Izum, where the Germans had created their decisive flanking lever ridge in the spring, and exploited their crossing of the Donitz to form a lever ridge the other way round. After driving a wedge across the railway south of the Donitz, they spread westwards and captured the important trail junction of Lozovaya on the 11th. These fresh gains undermined the situation of Kharkov itself, which fell into Glikov's hands on the 16th. 
that was a triumph, yet the more immediate danger to the German situation as a whole came from the Russians' continued southward push from the Dunitz towards the Sea of Azov. Four days earlier, a mobile force had reached Krasnoarmysk, on the main line from Rostov back to Dnepropetrovsk. Such a development threatened to cut off the retreat of the armies that had just escaped from the Caucasus trap. The alternating pattern and rhythm of the Russian offensive had become even more marked than during its earlier stage. It is easy to appreciate what a strain was thus placed on the Germans' resisting power, and their already overstretched resources, taking account of the wideness of the front which they had to cover with a shrinking margin of reserves. The progressive and variable way in which the Russians had played on that weakness provided an illuminating demonstration of the Russians' improved technique and the way they had learned to exploit their new superiority. Examining the process by which they had captured such an important succession of key places, it can be seen that in each case the capture, even when it followed upon an advance in the immediate neighborhood, was the sequel to an indirect move which virtually made the place untenable or at best crippled its strategic value. The effect of that series of indirect leverages can be clearly traced in the pattern of operations. The Red Army command might be likened to a pianist running his hands up and down the keyboard. While this alternating rhythm of the Russian offensive was similar to that carried out by Marshal Fock in 1918, it was a more subtle as well as a more speedy application of that strategic method. The striking point was more deceptive each time, and the process was punctuated by shorter pauses. While the preparatory moves were never directly aimed at the place which they were intended to threaten, the completing moves were often direct in the geographical sense, and thus had a psychological indirectness, because they came from the least expected direction. But a dramatic change came over the scene in the last fortnight of February. The Russians' advantage began to pass when they wheeled down over the Dunitz towards the Sea of Azov and the Dnieper Bend, to cut off the southern German armies. The Russians' aim here was now obvious, while it carried them into the same area for which the Germans were making. The next stage thus became a race, the issue of which turned on the question whether the Russians could establish themselves across the Germans' escape corridor before the latter could arrive and concentrate to check the downstroke. Unfortunately for the Russians, an early thaw hampered them at this moment, and added to the handicap which ensued from their prolonged advance. When they had planned their winter offensive they had found that the administrative side of the plan did not fit the strategic side, since there was not sufficient transport to carry even half the minimum supplies of petrol, ammunition, and food required for such an extensive range of thrusts. With characteristic boldness they decided that, instead of modifying the plan, they would bank on obtaining the larger part of their necessities from the enemy. That policy succeeded, as a large number of supply depots and dumps were overrun in each breakthrough. But when the enemy's resistance stiffened, and such captures became fewer, the Russians became more subject to the transport handicap the farther they advanced beyond their railheads. Thus the law of overstretch came into operation again, this time to the Russians' disadvantage. There were few railways in the Domdunitz corridor, and these ran at right angles to their line of advance southwest ward. By contrast, the east-to-west run of the relatively numerous rail routes south of the Donitz helped the Germans to hasten their assembly at the danger point. The latter also began to profit by the contraction of their front, now 600 miles shorter than it had been in the autumn. Brought to a halt by this combination of causes, the Russians were left in a very awkward position. They had driven a large wedge 80 miles beyond the Donitz towards the Dnieper, but stopping 30 miles short of it, at Pavlograd. They had driven a narrow wedge 70 miles beyond the Dunitz southwards, to Krasnoarmysk, across the corridor between that river and the Sea of Azov. The Germans, gathering all their available forces, quickly mounted a three-pointed counterstroke under Manstein's direction. It was designed to take advantage of the irregularity of the Russians' salient position, and particularly of its two projections. A left-hand thrust was delivered from the Dnieper against the southwestern tip, 
a right hand thrust was made against the southeastern tip, a central thrust was made into the sagging front between them, towards Lozavaya. Both tips were broken off and German armored wedges were driven deep into the body of the salient. These counterstrokes in the last week of February developed into a general counter-offensive as the Germans' westward withdrawal from Rostov provided more reinforcements. By the first week of March the German drive had reached the Dunitz again on a wide frontage around Ism, the Russian salient had been almost wiped out, and a large portion of the Russian forces had been cornered south of Kharkov. If the Germans could have crossed the Dunitz quickly, and cut astride the rear of the Russian armies that were advancing west, they might have produced a Russian disaster comparable to their own at Stalingrad. But they were balked in the attempt, lacking sufficient weight to carry by assault any strongly held obstacle. After this check, the center of gravity was shifted northwest, where the Germans enveloping pressure squeezed the Russians out of Kharkov, once again, on March 15. Four days later a rapid German drive north of Kharkov regained Belgrade. But that was the limit of the Germans' success. Their counter-offensive petered out the following week in the slush of the spring thaw. While the Germans had been delivering their counter-offensive in the south, they had been falling back in the north. It was the first significant retreat for more than a year. After the Whiter campaign of 1941-2, the German front facing Moscow had the shape of a clenched fist, with the Russians lapping round the wrist, where Smolensk lay. In August the Russians had struck hard at the left knuckle, the fortified center of Zef, in an effort to create a diversion in aid of Stalingrad by cracking the enemy's central front. Their offensive had been baffled by the stubborn resistance of Zef, though they had cut into its flanks and left the knuckle exposed. A fresh effort in November had increased its exposure, so that it came to look like a peninsula with a narrow isthmus. At the end of the year the Russians attacked from the tip of their own great salient north of the German salient, and captured the junction of Valikaluki, 150 miles due west of Zef, on the line from Moscow to Riga. As a result the danger, not only to Zef, but to the whole fist, became more manifest. A month later the danger was indirectly emphasized by the surrender of the forces at Stalingrad, while the subsequent spreading collapse in the south showed the price of trying to hold over extended fronts. Zietzel now achieved his only significant piece of persuasion in dealing with Hitler. Much as the leader hated any withdrawal, and particularly one that would be a step back from Moscow, he was induced to agree that the front must be straightened in that sector to avoid a collapse and to free reserves. Zef was evacuated at the beginning of March, just as a fresh Russian attack was opening, and by the 12th the whole fist was abandoned, including the important communications center of Vyazma. The Germans withdrew to a straighter line covering Smolensk. The smaller fortified salient of Demyansk, between Valikyluki and Lake Ilmen, was also abandoned at the beginning of March. The significance of this step back was obscured in the West by the way that British and American newspaper maps had for over a year shown a straight line here, with Demyansk well inside the Russian front. What the German armies gained by this shortening of the front in the north was, however, more than offset by the fresh extension, and temptation, created by the success of their counteroffensive in the south. It nullified the general's hope that Hitler might be led to sanction a long step back to a line where they could consolidate and reorganize well out of reach of the Russians. It provided a new old set of offensive springboards that looked all too promising to a man whose instincts were predominantly offensive, and whose mind was intensely reluctant to give up the idea that an offensive gamble might still turn the whole situation in his favor. The success of the counter-offensive had removed any urgent necessity for leaving the Dunitz Basin. By standing on his last year's line south of the Dunitz, near to Ganrog, Hitler could preserve that industrial asset while also preserving the hope of a fresh bid for the Caucasus. By the recent return to the banks of the Dunitz farther west, between Kharkov and Ism, Hitler could picture the development of a fresh flanking leverage there. 
by recapturing Belgrade and maintaining or L. He had excellent flank positions for a pincer stroke against the Russians' nearby captured position at and around Busk. By pinching off that great salient, he would produce a yawning hole in the Russian front, and once his panzer divisions poured through it anything might develop. The Russians' strength was greater than he had reckoned earlier, but their losses had been very heavy. It was only the old generals who deemed their resources inexhaustible. Pursuing this line of thought, biased by his natural inclination, it increasingly appeared to Hitler that a breakthrough at Busk might again turn the balance in his favor, and provide a solution for all his problems. He found it easy to convince himself that his troubles were due to the Russian winter, and that he could always count on having the advantage in summer. The prospect became his midsummer night's dream. While the main offensive was to be on the Busk sector, his summer program also included the attack on Leningrad that had been twice postponed, it is curious how closely his plan repeated the lines, and points, of the 1942 pattern. A parachute corps of two divisions had now been formed, and this was to be used for a swoop on Leningrad to open the way for the land attack. Hitler was growing more venturesome as his chances faded. For a year before he had hesitated to accept General Student's proposal for an airborne stroke at Stalingrad. But after the Tunisian collapse this corps was dispatched to the south of France, ready to deliver an airborne riposte against the anticipated Allied landing in Sardinia. And then the defeat of the Kursk offensive led to the complete, and final, abandonment of the Leningrad attack. Opinion among the generals was divided over the Kursk plan. An increasing number of them had come to doubt whether victory in the East was possible, and the doubters this year included such a thruster as Klist. But he was not directly concerned with the offensive on this occasion. In regrouping during the winter campaign Manstein was placed in charge of the main part of the Southern Front. The 1st Panzer Army had been transferred to his army group at the beginning of the year, while Klist was merely left in charge of the Crimea and the Cuban bridgehead. The offensive against the Gorsk salient was to be carried out by Manstein's left wing against its southern flank, and by the right wing of Kludge's army group center against its northern flank. Both these commanders talked beforehand as if they were hopeful of the chances of success. But help is commonly fostered by professional opportunity. Keen soldiers have a natural inclination to develop faith in a venture of which they are placed in charge and a natural reluctance to express doubts that would weaken a superior's faith in their powers. The whole trend of military education also contributed to stifle doubts. While many of the generals would now have favored a long withdrawal to shake off the Russians, as Rundstedt had advocated more than a year before, the leader forbade any such step. As the line on which the German armies were standing, at the end of the winter, was not well chosen for defense. The generals were the more inclined to rely on the principle which they had been taught, that attack is the best defense. By attacking they might iron out the defects of the position, and upset the enemy's dispositions for resuming his offensive. So all efforts were concentrated on making a success of the attack without regard to the consequences of failure, and to the way that the expenditure of Germany's newly accumulated reserves would bankrupt any subsequent defense. The shrinkage of Germany's assets was veiled by a policy of extreme internal secrecy combined with an increased dilution of units and formations. The number of divisions was so nearly maintained at the old level that the falsity of the figure, as an index of strength, was not apparent. By the spring of 1943 they averaged little more than half their establishment in men and weapons but many divisions were left much below that level while others were brought almost up to establishment. Commanders were kept in such watertight compartments under the security policy that few of them had any clear idea of the general situation, and they were taught that it was healthier not to inquire. But the dilution policy was dictated by other factors besides the camouflage motive. Hitler was fascinated, and intoxicated, by figures. To his demagogic mind, numbers spelt power. As the division was the standard unit of military measure, he was obsessed with the importance of having the largest possible number of divisions, 
although his victories in 1940 had essentially been gained by the qualitative superiority of the mechanized fraction of his forces. Before he invaded Russia, he had insisted on the dilution policy in order to produce the maximum number of divisions, and he had subsequently increased the dilution in order to avoid a decrease in that misleading total. The consequence of such dilution was a perilous degree of inflation in the sphere of military economics. In 1943 the extent of this inflation went far to nullify the advantage furnished by qualitative improvements in the German equipment, notably the production of the new Tiger and Panther tanks. Whenever divisions suffer heavy losses, the spearheads tend to shrink out of proportion to the overheads, since the loss is incurred mainly by the fighting troops. In an armored division, the highest ratio is normally borne by the tanks and tank crews, a lower ratio by the infantry component, and the lowest by the administrative troops. It is thus uneconomic in fighting power to maintain divisions, particularly armored divisions, at a level below their establishment. Unless the wastage is promptly made up, the body remains unprofitably large by comparison with the punch it can produce. These handicaps of the German army were accentuated because the Russian army was now much better qualitatively than in 1942, as well as numerically stronger. Its performance profited from the increasing flow of equipment from the new and expanded factories in the Urals, and from its western allies. Its tanks were at least as good as those of any other army, most German officers considered them better. While they suffered from a lack of supplementary fittings, such as wireless equipment, they reached a high level of efficiency in performance, endurance, and armament. The Russian artillery was excellent in quality, and there had been a large-scale development of rocket artillery that was remarkably effective. The Russian rifle was more modern than the German, and capable of a higher rate of fire, while most of the heavier infantry weapons were equally good. The main deficiency was the motor transport and that vital need was now being met by an increasing stream of American trucks. Hardly less important for mobility was the quantity of American canned food that was poured in, for it also helped to solve the supperly problem that, because of the huge size of Russia's forces and the scarcity of communications, formed the biggest check on her capacity to exert her strength. It would have been a much worse problem if the Russian troops had not been accustomed to live and fight on a lower standard of provisioning than any of the Western armies. While the Red Army never reached an equal level of mobility, it was more mobile than they were relatively to its technical means, because it could operate on a much lower scale of requirements. Its primitiveness was an asset as well as a deficit. Russian soldiers could subsist where others would have starved. Thus the Red Army's spearheads could now attain a deeper penetrative power, through being endowed with more ample resources, while its masses could follow them up, through needing so little in the way of transport and food. The Red Army had also improved greatly in tactical ability. Whereas 1942 had seen a deterioration, owing to the loss of a high proportion of its best trained troops in 1941, Increasing battle experience had largely repaired this defect by 1943 and given the new formations a better grounding than the old ones had received in pre-war training. The improvement began at the top. A drastic elimination of the original leaders had made room for the rapid rise of a generation of dynamic young generals, mostly under 40, who were more professional and less political than their predecessors. The average age of the Russian higher commanders was now nearly 20 years less than the German, and the lowering of the age level brought a heightening of efficiency as well as of activity. The combined effects of fresher leadership and ripening battle experience were reflected both in the staff work and the tactical ability of the troops. The improvement would have been even more effective but for the tendency of the generals, from fear or desire for favor, to continue attacks pressing attacks unprofitably at points where strong opposition was met. Rather than admit failure, their troops were often hurled again and again at unbreakable obstacles, with mounting cost. Such abortive assaulting is a common tendency in armies because of the combination of a hierarchical system with military discipline, but it was naturally accentuated in the Red Army by Soviet conditions, Russian traditions, 
and Russia's resources. Under such a system only the best established commanders could venture to exercise a sense of the limits of the possible, while the abundance of human material encouraged lavish expenditure. It was easier to be ruthless in sacrificing men than to risk the wrath of the man above. On the whole, the vastness of space went far to balance these battering ram tendencies. There was generally room for maneuver, and the Russian high command had become skilled in choosing soft spots in the enemy's far-stretched front. Since the Red Army had now a general superiority in numbers, the high command could count on enjoying odds higher than 4 to 1 on any sector where it decided to concentrate for a thrust, and once a breakthrough was made the room for maneuver further expanded. Vain frontal assaults, and the wasteful repetition of them, were more common in the north where the German defenses were more closely knit and better established. In the south, the Russians had their best commanders and troops, along with the space to exploit their skill. Nevertheless, the extent to which the Germans still held firm in face of such odds was evidence, even before two years prolongation of the war confirmed it, that the Russian forces were still a long way from overtaking the German forces' technical superiority. A consciousness of that professional advantage colored the outlook of both sides in the spring of 1943. It encouraged Hitler, and even his military advisers, in the hope that the scales might still be turned in Germany's favor if the mistakes of the past were avoided. It left a doubt underlying the confidence which the Russian leaders had gained from their winter successes, for they could not forget that the hopes raised by their successes in the previous winter had been dispelled in the summer following. With another summer at hand, they could not feel sure that the issue was certain. That underlying uncertainty may have accounted for a significant interlude of diplomacy before the battle was joined. In June, Molotov met Ribbentrop at Kirovograd, which was then within the German lines, for a discussion about the possibilities of ending the war. According to German officers who attended as technical advisers, Ribbentrop proposed as a condition of peace that Russia's future frontier should run along the Dnieper, while Molotov would not consider anything less than the restoration of her original frontier, the discussion became hung up on the difficulty of bridging such a gap, and was broken off after a report that it had leaked out to the Western powers. The issue was then referred back to the judgment of battle. The opening of the summer campaign was later than in either of the previous years. Over three months pause occurred after the close of the winter campaign. That prolonged delay was due, in part at least, to the Germans' increasing difficulty in refitting their forces and accumulating the reserves necessary for another offensive. But there was also an increased desire to see the Russians take the offensive lead, and become hooked, so that the German offensive might have the effect of a counterstroke. That desire was disappointed not so much by Hitler's impatience as by the Russians' decision to adopt a similar angling strategy this time. The retrospective view of the German leaders was that their offensive might have achieved a great success if the striking forces had been ready in time to launch it six weeks earlier. When their pincer stroke became hung up in a deep series of minefields, and they found that the Russians had withdrawn their main forces well to the rear, they ascribed their frustration to the fact that the Russians had got wind of their preparations during the interval, and thus been able to make appropriate dispositions. That view overlooked the obviousness of the Bosque salient as an objective. It offered as clear an invitation to a German pincer stroke as the Germans adjoining salient round or L offered to a Russian pincer stroke. Thus there was little room for doubt as to the sight of a stroke by either side and the main question was which would strike first. That had been in debate on the Russian side. There, the argument for striking first was that the Russian defense had been overcome two summers running by the German attack, and the confidence generated by the Russians' many offensive successes from Stalingrad onwards made their leaders more eager to take the initiative in the summer. On the other hand, it was pointed out that in 1942 time Mishenke had, in fact, led off with his Kharkov offensive in May, to which the Russian collapse between there and Bosk in June had been a disastrous sequel. At his first conference with the Russian general staff at the end of May, the new head of the British military mission, Lieutenant General G. Le Q. Martel, 
gained the impression that the balance was tilted in favor of initiating the offensive. He frankly said that he thought they were asking for trouble if they launched it while the renewed German Panzer forces were still uncommitted, and that the Russians would be hit for six if they tried anything of the kind. A few days later he was asked about British tactics in North Africa, and explained to them that our success at Alamn was largely due to the fact that we had let the Germans smash up, or at any rate blunt, their armoured forces on our defences. When they were committed and had been badly knocked about, then was the time to assume the offensive. At the next conference he had the impression that the Russian general staff were inclining to that plan. He took the opportunity to impress on them another lesson of British experience, the importance of holding the haunches on each side of a hostile tank penetration, and using all available reserves to stiffen the flanks of the breach, as an indirect check, rather than to meet the torrent head on. In tracing the origins of any plan it is usually difficult to assess the influences that determined it, even where all the files are open to examination, for documents rarely register the real originating causes. They do not show how ideas are sown, and grow, in the minds of the actual planners. While some who sow ideas are apt to overestimate the effect of their particular seed, those in whose minds they grow are even more inclined to discount the effect, however influential it may have been. That applies with special force in official quarters, and most of all where national pride is concerned. Among allies, it is normal for each to minimize the help received, and maximize the help given, whether material or intangible. It is thus unlikely that history will throw any clear light on the way that the Russians' plan of 1943 was determined, while it is manifest that their strategic planners had ample experience from their own campaigns to draw the conclusions that were implicit in the plan they came to adopt. The greater significance lies in the dramatically decisive outcome of following the defensive-offensive method. The German attack was launched at dawn on July 5 against the two flanks of the Gorsk salient. The straight face of that salient was nearly a hundred miles wide, the southern side was about fifty miles deep, the northern side was over one hundred and fifty miles, since it coincided with the flank of the German Zorl salient which projected in the opposite direction. The main stretch of the salient was held by Rokosevsky's troops, while Vatutin's right wing embraced the southern corner. Manstein's southern pincer and Kludge's northern pincer were approximately equal in strength, but Manstein had a larger proportion of armor. In all, 18 Panzer and Panzergrenadier divisions were committed to this offensive. They formed nearly half of the total force engaged, and nearly the whole of the German armor that was available on the Eastern Front. Hitler was gambling for high stakes. The southern pincer penetrated about 20 miles at some points in the first few days, that was not a rapid penetration. The Germans were slowed down by the deep minefields they met, and found that the mass of the defending forces had been withdrawn to the rear, so that their bag of prisoners was disappointingly small. Moreover, the wedges which they drove in were hindered in expansion by the stubborn defense of the haunches. Kludge's pincer on the north made a still more limited penetration and did not succeed in breaching the Russians' main defensive position. After a week of struggle, the panzer divisions were much reduced in strength. Kludge, alarmed by signs of an imminent threat to his own flank, began to pull out his panzer divisions. At the same moment, July 12, the Russians launched their offensive, against the northern flank and the nose of the Orl salient. The northern stroke penetrated 30 miles in three days, towards the rear of Orl, while the other advance, which had not so far to go, came within 15 miles of the city. But four of the panzer divisions which Kludge had disengaged came up just in time to check the Russians' northern wing from establishing itself astride the railway from Orl back to Bryansk. After that the offensive became a process of hard pushing relying on superior weight to force the Germans back. It was a costly effort, but was helped by Rokosovsky's forces changing over to the offensive on the southern flank, from the Orsk salient. The Germans were at last squeezed out of Orl on August 5. 
or L had not only been one of the main and most formidable bastions of the German front since 1941, but while it remained intact renewal of the menace to Moscow remained possible. Or L's strategic situation had combined with its proved strength to make it a military symbol, and its evacuation was thus as depressing to German confidence as it was stimulating to the Russians. Meanwhile Vatutin's troops had followed up the Germans' withdrawal from the breach on the southern side of the Gorsk salient, to the original line. On August 4 Vatutin launched an attack on that weakened line, and captured Belgorod next day. Exploiting the enemy's exhaustion, he drove 80 miles deep in the next week, wheeling down towards the rear of Kharkov and its communications with Kiev. This side stroke opened up a prospect of dislocating the Germans' whole southern front. Ten days later Konyev's forces, on Vatutin's left, crossed the Dunitz southeast of Kharkov and threatened to complete the encirclement of the city. Konyev had created the opening for this threat by audaciously choosing the Lubotan marshes as his point for crossing the Dunitz. If either of the strokes had reached Poltava Junction it might not only have trapped the garrison of Kharkov but spread confusion among all the German forces forming the extended right arm along the Dunitz. At that moment the 3rd Panzer Corps was almost the only considerable reserve left. With the three SS Panzer divisions it had just been sent to meet a threat to the fingers, on the Meuse River near to Ganrog. It was now rushed back up to the arm and just sufficed to check the danger around Poltiva. This enabled the bulk of the troops at Kharkov to be safely withdrawn before the city fell, on August 23. At other points, too, the depleted panzer divisions showed that, though they had little punch left, they were still able to keep a curb on the advancing Russian masses. The crisis was weathered and the situation became stabilized, though not static. The Russians continued to make headway but at a slow pace. In the six weeks that followed the launching of their offensive they took 25,000 prisoners. It was a small total for such a vast battle, covering many sectors, and an indication that any collapses of the defense had been local and limited. In the second half of August the Russian offensive was more widely extended. While Popov's forces were advancing gradually from Oil on Bryansk, a push towards Smolensk was begun by Ermenko's forces on their right flank. On their left flank a deeper thrust towards the Dnieper near Kiev was developed by Rokosovsky, while Vatutin was also converging thither. In the extreme south, Tolbukhin crossed the Meuse River, and forced the abandonment of Taganrog. Then early in September Malinovsky struck south across the Dunitz towards Stalino and this flanking leverage produced a hasty retreat of the Germans from the projecting arm south of the Dunitz. Significantly, however, they managed to hold on to the points that immediately covered the flank of their long retreat, and to the railways, until most of their troops were safely out of the trap. Lozovaya Junction, in the armpit, was not yielded until the middle of September. The pattern, and rhythm of the Russian operations came to appear still closer to Fox General Offensive in 1918, with its alternating series of strokes at different points, each temporarily suspended when its impetus waned in face of stiffening resistance, each so aimed as to pave the way for the next, and all time to react on one another. In 1918 it had led the Germans to scurry reserves to the points that were struck while simultaneously restricting their power to move reserves in time to the points that were going to be struck next. It paralyzed their freedom of action, while progressively draining their balance of reserves. The Russians were repeating it a quarter of a century later under more favorable conditions and in an improved form. This is the natural method for an army which is limited in mobility but possesses a general superiority of force. It is all the more suitable when and where the lateral communications are too sparse to make it possible to switch reserves quickly from one sector to another to back up a particular success. As it means breaking into a fresh front each time, the cost of this broad exploitation tends to be higher than with a deep exploitation. It is also less likely to be quickly decisive, but the end may be surer, provided that the army which applies it has an adequate balance of material superiority to maintain the process.
In that offensive process the Russian losses were naturally heavier than the Germans, but the Germans lost more than they could afford, following the costly failure of their own offensive. For them attrition spelt ruin. Hitler's unwillingness to sanction any long step back retarded their retreat but hastened their exhaustion. In September the thinning of their front, and the diminution of their reserves, was reflected in an acceleration of the Russians' pace of advance. Skillful commanders such as Vatutin, Konyev, and Rokosovsky, were quick to take advantage of weak spots in the wide front. Their momentum was helped by the ever-increasing flow of American trucks. Before the end of the month the Russians had reached the Dnieper not only at its great easterly bend near Dnepropetrovsk, but along most of its course as far up as the Pripyat River, beyond Kiev. Crossings were quickly made at a wide range of points, and bridgeheads established. That was ominous for the Germans' chances of being able to rest and reorganize behind the shelter of that wide river barrier, which military spokesmen had incautiously described as their winter line. The ease with which crossings had been gained by the Russians was helped by their commander's skill and boldness in exploiting the potentialities of space. The important bridgehead established around Krumenchug, southwest of Poltava, owed much to Konyev's decision that, instead of concentrating his effort on one line, crossings were to be made at a wide range of points, 18 altogether on a stretch of 60 miles. The unexpectedness of this calculated dispersion was increased by the way that the crossings were made under cover of fog. Similar methods enabled Vatutin to gain a series of footholds north of Kiev that were subsequently linked up. The fundamental factor in the situation was, however, that the Germans no longer had enough troops to cover the whole of their front even when thinly spread, and had to rely on counter-attack to prevent the expansion of enemy footholds. That was bound to be a precarious policy when their own reserves were so scanty, and the attackers so numerous. 300 miles to the north of Kiev the Germans abandoned Smolensk on the 25th, and had been squeezed out of Bryansk a week earlier. They were falling back slowly on the chain of bastion towns that stretched along the upper Dnieper, Zlobin, Rogagev, Mojilev, and Orshaw, to Vitebsk on the Dvina. In the far south they evacuated their bridgehead in the Kuban, and withdrew across the Kerch Straits into the Crimean Peninsula which itself was now in danger of being isolated by the Russian tide on the mainland. Klist had received orders to bring his forces back from the Kuban to take over the sector between the Sea of Azov and the Dnieper bend at Zaporozhye. The decision was taken a fortnight too late. By the time his troops began to arrive in their new positions in mid-October, the Russians had broken through at Melitopol, and the whole sector was in a state of flux. After the initial crossings of the Dnieper, that sector was relatively uneventful during the first half of October, while the Russians were bringing up reinforcements, accumulating supplies, and building the bridges to carry them forward. Most of these were pile or trestle bridges, and they were quickly constructed from trees felled near the site of the crossing. The Russians were masters in this art of improvising bridging, like Sherman's troops in the march through Georgia and the Carolinas. Four days was the average time required for a bridge to span this great river, and carry the heaviest transport. While attention was focused on Kiev, where the storm was expected to break, the next phase opened with a stroke almost midway in the long stretch between the Dnieper Bend and Kiev. Konyev suddenly burst out of the Kromenchug bridgehead, southwest of Poltava, and drove a massive wedge southward across the baseline of the Great Salient. There were few German troops that to meet him at the outset, but Manstein quickly switched reserves thither and slowed him down, thus gaining time to withdraw the imperiled German forces within the bend. These helped to hold up the Russians outside Krivoyrog, 70 miles south of their jumping offline and midway across the salient. But the collapse south of the Dnieper bend was part of the price since Manstein had been compelled to draw off troops from that sector before Klist's troops arrived to replace them. Exploiting the penetration at Melitopol, the Russians swept across the Nogaysk steppe to the lower reaches of the Dnieper, in the first week of November, cutting the exits from the Crimea and isolating the enemy forces that remained there. Results
however, did not fulfill the optimistic assumptions that a million men had been trapped east of the Dnieper. Only 6,000 prisoners were taken in the two fastest days of the pursuit, and the bulk of the German forces, which was far less than the imagined scale, had tuned to withdraw across the Dnieper. Altogether only 98,000 were claimed by the Russians during the whole four months since the campaign opened, and over half of these were wounded. A remarkable inconsistency, though few allied commentators remarked it, was revealed in the simultaneous Russian claim that 900,000 of the enemy had been killed and 1,700,000 wounded in the same period. For in any breakthrough a large part of the wounded usually fall into the attacker's hands, and the more severe the defeat the smaller the proportion that can be evacuated. More remarkable still was Stalin's statement on November 6 that the Germans had lost 4 million men in the past year. If that had been true, or even half true, the war would have been over. It had still a long course to run, but it was running down. In the last half of October little news came from the Kiev sector, but the Russians were extending their bridgehead north of the city until it formed a wide springboard wide enough for a powerful outflanking stroke to be mounted. This was launched by Vatutin in the first week of November. It found soft spots in the now widely overstretched frontage, penetrated westward through these, then swung inwards to cut the roads out of Kiev, and took the city from the rear. The Germans once again succeeded in slipping out of the trap, leaving only 6,000 prisoners in the Russians' hands but they were incapable of stemming the Russians' onrush, as most of the panzer divisions had been drawn southward by Konyev's thrust in the Dnieper bend. On the day after the capture of Kiev the Russian armoured forces reached fast of 40 miles to the southwest. That was a stroke at pursuit pace. After overcoming opposition on that line, they drove on 60 miles in the next five days to capture Zitama Junction on the one remaining lateral railway east of the Pripyat Marshes. Then they spread northward and on the 16th captured Karosin Junction. At that moment the German resistance was on the verge of a breakdown, and that might have brought early fulfillment of Stalin's declaration of the 6th that victory is near. For Manstein had no reserves at hand. In this emergency he told Mantuffel, the dynamic commander of the 7th Panzer Division, to collect such units as he could find to add to his own remnant, and deliver an uppercut from Berdichev with this scratch force. Daringly handled on a zigzag course, Mantuffel's light stroke succeeded brilliantly, piercing the Russians' flank and recapturing Zatuma by a night attack on the 19th, after which it drove on to Karosin. The distribution of the force in a number of small armoured groups, moving wide, had helped to magnify the impression of its strength. They darted between the Russian columns, and cut across their rear, striking at headquarters and signal centres, so that they spread a paralysing confusion along their track. In an effort to develop the opportunity thus created, Manstein now launched a definite counter-offensive against the still invitingly large Russian salient west of Kiev. He was helped by the arrival of several fresh panzer divisions from the west. The plan was for a pincer stroke, by an armoured thrust from the northwest aimed at Fastov and a converging thrust from the south. The former was delivered by Balk's panzer corps of three divisions, including Mantuffel's. But Vatutin's advanced troops had now been reinforced by an increasing volume of artillery and anti tank guns, poured across the Dnieper bridges, as well as by reserve divisions. The German counter offensive achieved no such striking results as the initial repost. It looked more dangerous on the map than it was on the ground, for it no longer enjoyed the advantage of surprise to compensate its limited strength, and was further handicapped by bad weather. Early in December it faded out in the mud. During the lull that followed Vatutin massed his armies for a further drive with mounting weight. The most apt comment on the situation was provided unconsciously by Hitler when, to mark his appreciation of Mantuffel's saving stroke, he invited the latter to spend Christmas with him at Angerberg, and then said, as a Christmas present, I'll give you fifty tanks. That was the best reward Hitler could conceive and a big one relatively to his resources. 
for the strongest and best favored Panzer Division existing only had a strength of 180 tanks, and few exceeded half that figure. The northern stretch of the German front had also been subjected to severe and prolonged strain during the autumn. But here repeated Russian offensives had failed to crack the line in front of the upper Dnieper to which the Germans had withdrawn after evacuating Smolensk. The Russians' frustration here was due to the inherent power of modern defense combined with the fact that they had less room for maneuver than in the south, and also made their aim too obvious. In these battles the air forces played an insignificant part, being curbed by snow and ice. This limitation relieved the defense of the overhead pressure that might have multiplied the tremendous odds against them on the ground. While it also restricted the defenders' air reconnaissance the latter were able to deduce the likely direction of the Russians' main thrust point, and to confirm it by a vigorous use of raiding patrols. The brunt of the attack was borne by Heinrich's 4th Army, which with 10 depleted divisions held the 100-mile front between Orshaw and Rogakev. The Russians delivered five offensives against it between October and December, each lasting five or six days, with several renewed efforts every day. They employed some twenty divisions in the first offensive, when the Germans had just occupied a hastily prepared position comprising a single trench line. They employed thirty divisions in the next offensive, but by that time the Germans had developed their defenses. The subsequent offensives were made with some 36 divisions. The main weight of the Russian assault was concentrated against Torshaw, on a frontage of a dozen miles astride the Great Moscow-Minsk Highway. As a thrust point it had obvious advantages for supply and potential exploitation. But its obviousness helped the Germans to concentrate in meeting it. Their defensive methods here are worth study. Heinrich used three and one half divisions on this very narrow sector, leaving six and one half to cover the remainder of his extensive front. He thus had a fairly dense ratio of force to space at the vital point. His artillery was almost intact, and he concentrated a mass of 380 guns to cover the crucial sector. Controlled by a single commander at 4th Army headquarters, it was able to concentrate its fire at any threatened point of the sector. At the same time the army commander made a practice of milking the divisions on the quiet part of his front in order to provide one fresh battalion daily, during the battle, for each of the divisions that were heavily engaged. This usually balanced the previous day's loss while giving the division concerned an intact local reserve that it could use for counter-attack. The drawbacks of mixing formations were diminished by working a system of rotation within the divisions, which now consisted of three regiments, each of two battalions. For the second day of battle the reinforcing battalion would be the sister of the one that was brought in the day before, and was accompanied by the regimental headquarters. After two more days a second completely new regiment would be in the line, and by the sixth day the original division would have been relieved altogether and have gone to hold the quiet sector from which the replacement had been drawn unit by unit. These repeated successes of the defense against numerical odds of over six to one were a remarkable achievement. They indicated how the war might have been spun out and the Russians' strength exhausted, if the defensive strategy had matched the tactics. But the prospect was wrecked by Hitler's insistence that no withdrawal was to be made without his permission, and his accompanying reluctance to give such permission. Army commanders who used their discretion were threatened with a court-martial, even in cases where it was a matter of withdrawing a small detachment from a dangerously isolated position. The veto was pressed so hard that juniors were still worse paralyzed, and it came to be said that battalion commanders did not dare to move a sentry from the window to the door. With parrot-like reiteration the supreme command recited every man must fight where he stands. That rigid principle had helped to bring the German army through the nerve crisis of the first winter in Russia, but it became fatal in the long run when the German troops had overcome their acute fear of the Russian winter, but were more and more short of the forces with which to fill the Russian spaces. It cramped the essential flexibility of the commanders on the spot in slipping out of reach, regrouping their forces and fulfilling the principal regular Pormaiux Sota. 
the disastrous results of rigidity had been registered on the Southern Front in 1943. In 1944 they were to be repeated in the North, in the very sector where the German defense had previously proved so hard to overcome. Chapter 29 the Japanese EBB in the Pacific. The first phase of the war in the Pacific had seen Japan's conquest of the whole western and southwestern area of that ocean, all the islands there, and of the adjoining countries in Southeast Asia. The second phase had seen Japan's attempt to extend her control to the American and British bases in the Hawaiian Islands and Australia, and her decisive repulse in the naval air battle of Midway and at Goodalcanal, in the Solomon Islands, on the approach to Australia. In the third phase the Japanese were on the defensive, as was emphasized by the orders to their commanders in the southwest Pacific that they were to retain all positions in the Solomons and New Guinea. Only in Burma did they pursue offensive operations against the Western Allies, and these were defensive in essence, to forestall and frustrate a British counter-offensive from India. The possibility of effectual action by the Japanese had been annulled by their loss of four fleet carriers at Midway, of two battleships and many smaller craft at Goodalcanal, together with their loss of hundreds of aircraft in both these crucial operations. The Western Allies had regained the advantage. The real question now was whether and how they could use it. The Japanese offensive plan, and action had profited greatly by the strategic advantage of Japan's geographical position. They had, and their plan had exploited, this basic advantage both offensively and defensively. For the outcome of their rapid conquests was that they had covered Japan with concentric rings of defense that provided formidable obstacles to any counter move towards Japan that the Western Allies attempted. On the map there appeared to be numerous alternatives, but in closer analysis these were few. Examining them from the top of the map downwards, the North Pacific route was ruled out by the lack of adequate bases as well as by the frequency of storms and fogs along that route. A counter-offensive from Soviet Russia's position in the Far East was annulled by Stalin's unwillingness to cooperate and engage in a fight against Japan as long as Russia was hard-pressed by the German attack on her western flank. An allied counter-move through China was made impossible by the difficulties of supply, under existing circumstances, as well as by the unreliability of the Chinese. The still more distant route of return through Burma was nullified by the extent to which the British had been driven back, over the Indian frontier, and their all too evident lack of adequate resources for an early comeback. Thus it soon became clear that any effective counter-offensive must depend on the Americans, and be by a route suitable to them. There were two main alternatives, along a southwestern Pacific route from New Guinea to the Philippines, or through the Central Pacific. General Douglas MacArthur, as Commander-in-Chief, Southwest Pacific, naturally favored and urged that line of comeback. He argued that it would be the quickest way to deprive Japan of her newly gained southern possessions on which she depended for the raw materials essential to her war effort. In his view, the Central Pacific route would be exposed to attack from the cluster of mandated islands that Japan had captured, and in which she had quickly built sea and air bases. Moreover, Australian anxieties would not be allayed by such a remote line of counter-offensive action. The American naval chiefs, however, favored a Central Pacific route. They argued that this would enable them to use their large and growing numbers of fast aircraft carriers more effectively than in the more crowded waters around New Guinea, and would better fulfill their new concept of employing carrier task forces to isolate, and dominate, a group of islands. It would also fit their new idea of a seaborne supply system, instead of having to send their carriers back to port at intervals. They also argued that it would avoid the risk that the southerly route would suffer by being exposed to flank attacks from the Japanese forces lying among the mandated islands, while an advance along the southerly route, being more obvious and predictable, was itself likely to meet tougher and more continuous opposition. A more potent, if more private reason, was that the admirals wanted to keep the bulk of their new carrier strength out of MacArthur's control, and his monopolizing tendencies. Eventually, it was decided at the Trident Conference in Washington in May 1943,
to carry out a double-pronged thrust, advancing along both routes, which would keep the Japanese in a state of uncertainty, and keep their forces dispersed, while hindering them from concentrating or switching their reserves from one route to the other. Both routes would eventually converge off the Philippines. That decision fulfilled the aim of threatening alternative objectives, a vital advantage in the strategic concept of indirect approach. But the compound, and compromise, decision did not take sufficient account of the fact, and lesson of history, that such dilemma producing duality is apt to be more economically attained by taking a single line of advance that threatens alternative objectives, each of which the opponent is anxious to preserve while itself being a single line of operation. The two-pronged thrust inevitably required much larger, and thus longer, preparation, in terms of forces, shipping, landing craft, naval bases, and airfields. This prolonged preparatory period gave the Japanese more time to develop their own defensive preparations, and make the American task harder, especially in carrying out land, and landing, operations. During this lengthy lull, the only operation of any importance was the American expedition to regain the Aleutian Islands, in the northern Pacific. Strategically, this move was so remote as to carry no promise of effect on the course of the war. It was secondary without being supplementary or diversionary. Its only value was psychological, as a reassurance to the American public which had been alarmed at the apparent threat to the security of Alaska brought by the seizure of Kiskunda to buy a small Japanese landing force the previous June. But the tonic was purchased by a very large and uneconomic use of the still limited American resources. An early reaction to the seizure of the two islands had been a naval bombardment of Kiska at the beginning of August, then at the end of that month American troops had landed on the island of Adak some 200 miles east of Kiska, and built an airfield there to assist an attack on that captured island. In January 1943 they had gone on to reoccupy the island of Amkitka, 90 miles east of Kiska, for the same purpose. But then the local American commanders decided to tackle Latu, the farthest west of the Aleutian island chain, as they had discovered that it was more weakly defended than Kiska. An interruption came at the end of March when the naval blockading force encountered a slightly more powerful Japanese force that was escorting three troop transports. After a three-hour fight at long range, the Japanese withdrew. No ships were sunk on either side, but the reinforcing transports were turned back. On May 11 the Americans landed a division on a two, cloaked by a fog and supported by a bombardment from three battleships. With odds of more than four to one in its favor this division gradually pushed the Japanese garrison, of about 2,500, back into the mountains in a fortnight's tough fighting, and then the Japanese solved the problem of overcoming them the by launching a suicidal assault on the American positions in which they were wiped out, only 26 prisoners being taken. The Americans now concentrated on Kiska. Constant pressure, from air and sea. On this now isolated island led the Japanese to evacuate their garrison, of some 5,000 troops, on the night of July 15, under cover of the frequent fog. The Americans continued to bombard the island for a further two and a half weeks, and landed a large force of some 34,000 troops, who spent five days in searching the island until they were convinced that it was empty. Thus the Aleutians were cleared but the Americans had employed 100,000 troops in all, supported by large naval and air forces, in this trivial task, a flagrant example of bad economy of force, and a good example of the distraction that can be caused by diversionary initiative with slight expenditure. The apparent stalemate in the Southwest Pacific continued until the summer of 1943. Fortunately for the Americans, and their allies, for stalling and frustrating action by the enemy was hindered and hampered by the acute differences of view between the Japanese army and navy chiefs. While both were intent on maintaining all the Japanese conquests, they were sharply divided as to the best way of doing so. The army chiefs favored land operations in New Guinea, 
an advanced position which they considered necessary for the security of their captured territory in the Dutch East Indies and the Philippines. The Navy's chiefs wanted priority for the Solomon and Bismarck Islands, as strategic cover for the great naval base at Truk, in the Carolines, 1,000 miles to the north. In the strategic decision the army, as usual, got its way. The eventually agreed line of defense was from Santa Isabel and New Georgia in the Solomon Islands, westward of Guadalcanal, to Lynn, New Guinea, that is the area west of the Papuan Peninsula. The Navy was to be in charge of the Solomon's sector, and the Army of the New Guinea sector. Army Commander Trabal, the headquarters of the whole area, directed the operations of the 17th Army in the Solomon's and the 18th Army in New Guinea the 7th Air Division being attached to the former, and the 6th Air Division to the latter. The naval forces comprised the 8th Fleet and the 11th Air Fleet, both being directed by the naval headquarters at Rabaul. The naval forces were light, consisting of cruisers and destroyers, but could be reinforced by heavier ships from Turok. The army forces in the theater were of larger scale, three divisions of the 18th Army in New Guinea, totaling 55,000 troops, and two divisions plus a brigade and other troops of the 17th Army in the Solomons and Bismarcks. Although Japanese air strength had been heavily depleted in the struggle for Guadalcanal, the Army had 170 aircraft and the Navy 240 available. Within six months, it was reckoned, the theater could be reinforced by from 10 to 15 divisions and upward of 850 aircraft. So there was reason to feel that a holding, or containing, strategy was quite possible. American planning was complicated by the earlier decision to divide this theater between a Pacific Ocean area and a Southwest Pacific area, with the Solomon Islands in the line of division. In the effort to make this more workable the Joint Chiefs of Staff decreed that MacArthur would have strategic command of the whole New Guinea Solomons part of the theater, but that Admiral Halsey, C. In C. South Pacific, would have tactical control, while naval forces from Pearl Harbor operating in that area would remain under Admiral Nimitz's Pacific Ocean Command. The American strategic aim was to break down the barrier formed by the Bismarck Archipelago, and capture the main Japanese base at Rabaul. This was to be achieved by alternating strokes on both approach routes, to keep the Japanese on the hop. First, Halsey's forces were to occupy the Russell Islands, just west of Guadalcanal, as an air and naval base. Then two islands in the Trobriand group east of New Guinea would be seized to provide air bases for the Rabaul attack, and intermediate staging points for switching air forces from one line to the other. In the second phase, Halsey would advance to New Georgia, in the Solomons west of Guadalcanal, and capture the key airfield of Munda while MacArthur was to capture the Japanese footholds around Lee on the north coast of New Guinea. By then, it was hoped, Halsey would have secured the island of Bougainville, at the west end of the Solomons. In the third phase, MacArthur's forces, turning northward, were to cross the sea gap to New Britain in the Bismarck Archipelago, the great island where Abaul was situated, at the northern end. Then, in the fourth phase, the Allied attack on Rabaul itself was to be launched. It was a very gradual process, even as planned, the calculation being that the attack on Rabaul would be launched within eight months of the opening moves in the campaign. MacArthur had seven divisions, three of them Australian, in his southwest Pacific area, and about 1,000 aircraft, a quarter of these Australian, with two more American divisions to come as well as eight Australian divisions in training. Halsey had seven divisions, two being marine divisions and one New Zealand, and 1,800 aircraft, of which 700 were U.S. Army planes. The naval strength varied, for while an amphibious force was being built up for each prong of attack, a large number of the warships were on short loan from Nimitz's vast force at Pearl Harbor. At the outset, Halsey had six battleships and two carriers, as well as many smaller ships. In all, there was now ample strength for success, even though it was not so much as MacArthur wished, he had asked for some 22 divisions and 45 air groups. During the preliminary or stalemate period, 
Halsey landed a force on the Russell Islands on February 21, but found no trace of the Japanese garrison that was believed to be there. Moreover, his naval forces put a stop to the Japanese practice of raiding runs down the slot. In New Guinea, a Japanese attempt to capture the airfield at war, near the Huon Gulf, was foiled by the Australians, who airlifted a brigade there, and when the Japanese dispatched the bulk of a division there as reinforcement, the convoy, of eight transports escorted by eight destroyers, was promptly spotted and caught by the Allied Air Force in New Guinea, losing all its transports and half its destroyers, along with over 3,600 troops, half the total. After this disastrous battle of the Bismarck Sea, the Japanese only ventured to send supplies to their troops in New Guinea by submarines or in barges. Admiral Yamamoto then sought to retrieve the adverse Japanese situation in the air by sending the carrier aircraft of the 3rd Fleet from truck to Rabaul in the hope of wearing down the Allies' air strength by constant raids on their bases. But this harassing operation, which began, ominously, on April 1, actually cost the Japanese almost twice as many planes as the defenders in a fortnight, contrary to the optimistic reports of the attacking pilots. And then Yamamoto himself was ambushed and shot down on a flying visit to Bougainville, of which the US intelligence had gained advance news. His successor as C. In C. Of the Japanese combined fleet was Admiral Koga, but he did not prove as formidable as Yamamoto. The long planned American offensive was due to open on June 30, with a threefold stroke, when General Kruger's U.S. Army force would land on the Kiruina and Woodlark, or Marua, islands in the Trobriand group. The New Guinea force, mainly Australian, under General Herring, would land near Salama in the Huon Gulf and the troops under Admiral Halsey would land in New Georgia. The landing in the Trobriands proved easy, as no opposition was met, and the building of airfields began at once. The fresh and New Guinea moves started well, and the American landing in support of the Australians met no serious opposition, but the Japanese force in this part, about 6,000, was not pushed back to the outskirts of Salima until the middle of August, and the American advance force here was then told to wait for the intended main landings on the Huon Peninsula, prior to the attack on Lee. The main objective, the third prong stroke, by Halsey's forces against New Georgia, proved still more difficult. The large island of New Georgia had a Japanese garrison of about 10,000 troops, the formidableness of which was multiplied by the mountainous jungle and wet climate. The obstacle was made worse by the orders of Imperial GHQ that it was to be held as long as possible. Moreover, the difficulties of invasion were increased by the reefs on the northeast coast and the surrounding belt of islands on the south and west. The American plan was to carry out a three-piece landing. The main one, of divisional scale, was to be made on the west coast island of Rendeva whence it was intended to cross the Five Mile Straits and land near the important airfield at Munda Point. As soon as this hop had been achieved, a smaller force was to land on the north coast of New Georgia, ten miles from Munda, and thereby cut the Japanese off from seaborne reinforcements. There were also to be three subsidiary landings in the south. The naval covering force comprised five carriers, three battleships, nine cruisers and 29 destroyers, while the air force allotted was about 530 planes. A coast watcher's report that the Japanese were moving into the southern part of New Georgia led Halsey to begin the initial landing there on June 21, instead of waiting until the 30th, but no opposition was met, and the other subsidiary landings in that sector were successfully made on the 30th. As for the main landing on Rendezvous Island, the 6,000 American troops employed in it soon overcame its garrison of only 200 Japanese, and the follow-up landings near Munda were made during the first week of July. That week and the next, small Japanese naval forces made several riposts, as in the Guadalcanal campaign, and managed to inflict considerable damage on the cruisers, while slipping ashore in all some 3,000 troops. Onshore, 
The inexperienced American division employed in this operation made very slow progress in its jungle advance on Mundo after crossing the straits from Rendeva, despite immense air, artillery, and naval gun support. Reports on its state of poor morale led to a further one and a half divisions being ordered to New Georgia. By August 5, however, Mundo and the surrounding area were at last captured, although most of the Japanese garrison was able to withdraw to the adjoining northerly island of Columbangara. Moreover, in further sea actions the American domination of the sky caused the Japanese to suffer disadvantageous naval losses. By far the most important effect of the Americans' slow progress in New Georgia was that it led Halsey, and other American leaders, to recognize the drawbacks of such a step-by-step -step advance, and to realize that it gave the enemy ample time to strengthen his next line of defense. Such a process was forfeiting the great advantage of air and naval superiority. So it was now decided that Kolombangara, with its garrison of over 10,000 Japanese, should be scaled off, and left to wither on the vine, while the American forces moved on to the large but lightly defended island of Velia Lavla, which the Japanese held with a garrison of only 250 men. This was a case of planned bypassing, and an improvement on what had happened in the Aleutian Islands, moreover, to establish an airfield on Velia Lavla would bring them within a hundred miles of Bougainville, the most westerly islands of the Solomons. The landing on Velia Lavla took place on August 15, even before the occupation of New Georgia was completed. Moreover, the hopes of General Sasaki, the local Japanese commander, that he might maintain a prolonged resistance in Kolombangara, were also annulled by higher level orders to abandon the Central Solomons and fall back to Bougainville. At the end of September and early October, in successive nights, the large garrison of Kolombangara, and the small garrison of Velia Lavla, were evacuated. In all, the Japanese lost about 2,500 killed in the New Georgia campaign, and 17 warships, while the Allies lost about 1,000 killed, though many more from sickness, and about six warships. In the air, moreover, the Japanese losses were much heavier. The Allies' pressure on Salamaya in August had been maintained largely to cloak, and distract Japanese attention from, the preparations for their attack on Li and the Huan Peninsula, whose ports and airfields were wanted for the coming bound northward into the island of New Britain, as well as to cover their flank during that bound. In tackling the Huan Peninsula, MacArthur's plan was to combine an amphibious, an airborne, and an overland attack. This threefold nature made it a complex operation, and he had sufficient resources to rely on one kind had it been desired. On September 5 his amphibious force landed the bulk of the 9th Australian Division just east of Lee. Next day the 503rd US Parachute Regiment was dropped on the disused Nadzab airfield northwest of Lee, the first airborne operation by the Allies in the Pacific and as soon as this airfield was made usable the 7th Australian Division was flown in by transport aircraft. Meanwhile the overland Australian-American advance on Salamaya was resumed. The converging attacks met little opposition. For the Japanese Imperial GHQ had realized that their one division in the area was likely to be cut off, and sanctioned the withdrawal of this division across the mountainous peninsula towards Kiari, some 50 miles beyond Lee. So Salamaya was evacuated on September 11th, and Lee on the 15th. But Japanese helps of holding on to the port of Finch if I'm at the tip of the peninsula were frustrated by the landing there on the 22nd of an Australian brigade from the amphibious force. Although the Japanese brought another division forward as reinforcement they were gradually pushed back along the coast. Meanwhile the 7th Australian Division was advancing, more quickly, up the Markham River Valley from Lee and early in October reached Dumpu, barely 50 miles from the next important point, and port, Madang, 160 miles northwest of Lee. By the end of 1943 the Allied forces were poised to launch a two-pronged threat, along the coast and through the interior, at Madang, although their progress was behind schedule. By September, 1943, 
it was at last clear to Imperial GHQ that its previous optimistic estimates of the situation, and the prospect, would have to be revised. Japan's forces were stretched too thinly over too large an area, and the Americans had recovered from their early defeat in an unexpectedly short time. Both in the air and on the sea they now had the upper hand. It became clear to the Japanese they would have to draw in their horns and shorten their defensive arc. For beyond the pressure this was suffering on its flanks, there was the potential menace from Pearl Harbor, in the center, where Admiral Nimitz now had the largest number of ships ever amassed since Admiral Jellicoe's Grand Fleet of World War I. Japan's precarious military situation was accentuated by her weak economic foundations. Her production of aircraft was inadequate to meet America's challenge, and she was proving unable to protect her merchant shipping. The new operational policy laid down by Imperial GHQ in mid-September was based on an estimate of the minimum area essential for the fulfillment of Japan's war aims. In this the minimum, termed the absolute national defense sphere, extended from Burma along the Malay barrier to western New Guinea, and from the to the Carolines, the Marianas, and up to the Kuriles. This contraction of the defensive arc meant that most of New Guinea, and all the Bismarcks, including Rabaul, the Solomons, the Gilberts, and the Marshals were now considered, and classed, as non-essential, although they were to be held for a further six months. By then, it was hoped, the minimum or absolute area would have been developed into an invulnerable barrier, Japan's aircraft production trebled, and the combined fleet built up sufficiently to challenge the US Pacific Fleet in battle once again. Meanwhile the Japanese forces in the southwest Pacific were called on to hold back an allied strength now amounting to some 20 divisions, supported by nearly 3,000 aircraft. The Japanese had three divisions in eastern New Guinea, one in New Britain, one in Bougainville, while a sixth was on the way. Yet there were still 26 divisions in China, and 15 in Manchuria, to face the possibility of a Russian invasion, so that in land forces the Japanese weakness lay not in numbers but in distribution. On the Allied side, the slow progress made MacArthur all the more eager to press on especially since he knew that the American Joint Chiefs of Staff were now inclined to give priority to the Central Pacific Drive, as shorter in distance and likely to be shorter in time. His sense of urgency was increased by their expressed view that the capture of Rabaul was not essential and that this strongly defended point might well be bypassed and left isolated. Admiral Halsey, too, was a natural thruster and his eagerness to expedite his advance through the Solomons was increased by the fact that many of his ships, as well as the 2nd Marine Division, were being recalled to help the Central Pacific Drive. The Bougainville Campaign This large island, the most westerly of the Solomons, had a Japanese garrison of nearly 40,000 troops, and 20,000 sailors, the bulk in the south of the island. Halsey was by now so reduced in ships and landing craft that he could only land one reinforced division at the outset. Its landing place, shrewdly chosen, was in Empress Augusta Bay on the weakly defended west coast, and with good terrain for building airfields. After heavy air bombardment of the Japanese air bases on Bougainville, and the preliminary seizure of the islands on the approach to Bougainville, the landings were made on November 1st to the surprise of the Japanese, who felt sure that the attack would come in the south, where the surf was slighter. Japanese air and naval counterattacks were beaten off, while inflicting much less damage than they suffered themselves. Air attacks on Rabaul by the American carrier forces, as well as by the Allied Air Force in New Guinea, were also of great effect in nullifying the intervention of the recently reinforced Japanese air strength at Rabaul. A significant lesson for the future was the way that fast carrier forces proved able to operate in areas that were apparently well covered by the Japanese land-based aircraft. On land, the American troops, reinforced by a further division, gradually expanded their beachheads into a comfortably large bridgehead more than 10 miles wide, and by mid-December had 44,000 ashore to hold it. The reaction of the Japanese was slow because they continued to believe that the main American effort would come elsewhere. 
even when they came to realize that the Empress Augusta Bay landing was the main threat, their counter moves were further delayed by having to bring their forces back through 50 miles of jungle from the main position in the south. As a consequence they did little until the end of February, and there was a prolonged state of stalemate. The capture of the Bismarcks and the Admiralties. Meanwhile the Allied advance in New Guinea continued. On January 2, 1944, MacArthur landed a U.S. force of nearly 7,000 men at Stir, midway between the Huon Peninsula and Madang, and that force was soon doubled. Thus the weak and weary remains of the Japanese force, of similar size, which was trying to hold on at Sayo, just west of the peninsula, had its coastal line of retreat blocked. It only managed to wriggle out of the trap by a long and roundabout march through the mountainous jungle, a retreat in which it lost several thousand more men. At the same time the converging Australian pincer was pressing on again from Dumpu in the Markham Valley towards the coast, which it reached on April 13. On April 24 MacArthur's forces occupied Madang, without meeting serious opposition for Japanese Imperial GHQ had been driven to accelerate the withdrawal, and order their troops in New Guinea to fall back to Uak, nearly 200 miles farther to the west. MacArthur launched his next stroke even before the Huon Peninsula was cleared. On December 15 General Kruger's Alamo force had begun landing on the southwest coast of New Britain near Aror and then just after Christmas the bulk of this force of two divisions landed on the western tip near Cape Gloucester, to gain the airfield there. For although the idea of attacking Rabaul had been discarded, MacArthur wanted to obtain two-sided control of the Straits as a safeguard to the flank of his continued westward drive in New Guinea. The western end of New Britain, where the Americans landed was held by a detachment of about 8,000 Japanese troops recently arrived from China, but they were separated by a wide stretch of wild country from Rabaul, 300 miles distant at the other end of this large crescent-shaped island and they could only be given scanty air support as the 7th Air Division had just been moved back to the Celebes area, 2,000 miles farther west. Thus the Japanese force near Cape Gloucester offered little resistance and soon set out on a long retreat towards Rabaul. Then at the end of February a reconnaissance force of the dismounted 1st Cavalry Division landed in the Admiralty Islands, 250 miles north of Cape Gloucester, which had several airfields, and room for many more, while there was also a very large sheltered anchorage. The Japanese garrison, of some 4,000, put up a stiffer fight than had been expected but was overcome after the main part of the U.S. force had landed on March 9, and taken the Japanese in rear. By mid-March the Americans had secured their principal objectives, and could start work on converting the Admiralties into a major base, although the remains of the Japanese continued fighting until May, when they were completely wiped out. Thus Rabaul, with its garrison of more than 100,000 Japanese, was now isolated and likewise left to with there on the vine. The barrier presented by the Bismarcks had been effectively pierced, with much less loss than would have been incurred in a direct attack. In Bougainville Islands nearly four months passed after the landings before the Japanese commander belatedly came to realize that the American landings on the west coast were their main ones. In March 1944 he brought a force of about 15,000 up there through the jungle and attacked the American beachhead now held by over 60,000 men. He had estimated the American strength as about 20,000 troops and 10,000 aircraft ground crews, a figure which, even as an estimated total, ought to have made him see that his belated counter-attack had a poor chance. In his abortive 1-4 assault, starting on March 8 and continued for two weeks, he suffered the loss of over 8,000, more than half his force while the American loss was less than 300. After this shattering repulse, what remained of the Japanese garrison, now hopelessly isolated, was also left to wither. The Central Pacific Advance This thrust, like the one through the Southwest Pacific, was directed towards the Philippines, and the recovery of America's position there, not direct towards Japan herself. At this stage of the war, 
The basic idea of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington was that after reconquering the Philippines the American forces would move on to China and there establish large air bases from which the American Air Force could dominate the sky over Japan and pulverize her power of resistance, as well as cutting off her supplies. This strategic plan was an underlying factor in American efforts to help the Chinese nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek, and sustain their resistance to the Japanese. Likewise it explained American anxiety to see the British resume their advance in Burma and reopen the Burma Road into southern China, so as to send war supplies to Chiang Kai-shek and give him armed reinforcement. In the event, the Central Pacific advance proceeded so rapidly that Admiral Nimitz's forces were led to switch their line of operation northward, and seize the Mariana Islands while the development of the new long-range B.29 Superfortress bombers made it possible to strike direct at Japan, for the Marianas were less than 1,400 miles from the Japanese mainland. Moreover by the time the Marianas were captured, in October 1944, it had become clear to the American chiefs of staff that there was little prospect of Chinese nationalist help, or of the British reaching southern China, in the near future. The Capture of the Gilbert Islands In settling the plan of a Central Pacific advance, Admiral King had wanted to start with a thrust at the Marshall Islands, but this idea was discarded for the lack of shipping and of trained troops needed to ensure success. Instead, it was decided to begin by a stroke at the Gilbert Islands, although they were a little farther from America's Hawaiian base at Pearl Harbor as their capture seemed a less exacting task while it would provide practice in amphibious operations and bombo bases for a subsequent attack on the Marshall Islands. In the Gilberts, the two most westerly islands, Makin and Tarawa, were to be the main objectives. Nimitz, as overall C. In C, chose Vice Admiral Raymond Spruance to command the attacking force. The ground troops, called the 5th Amphibious Corps, were under Major General Holland Smith of the Marines, while the force that conveyed the troops was put in charge of Rear Admiral Richard Turner, who had already acquired much experience of such operations in the Solomons. The whole was divided into two attack forces, a northern one to take Megan, with six transports carrying about 7,000 troops of the 27th Division, and a southern one to take Tarawa with 16 transports carrying the 2nd Marine Division of over 18,000 men. Besides escort carriers with the transports, the invasion was covered by Rear Admiral Charles Pownall's fast carrier force, comprising six fleet carriers, five light carriers, and six new battleships, as well as smaller warships. In addition to 850 aircraft in the carriers, there were 150 land-based, army, bombers. The most important development here employed was the mobile service force to maintain the fleet in operations, and meet all its needs except for major repairs to the larger warships. It had tankers, tenders, tugs, minesweepers, barges, lighters, ammunition ships. Later, hospital ships, barrack ships, a floating dry dock, floating cranes, survey ships, pontoon assembly ships and others were added. This floating train greatly increased the range and power of the Navy in amphibious operations. After preliminary bombing, the attack on the Gilberts, codenamed Operation Galvanic, began on November 20, 1943, which happened to be the anniversary of the epoch-making offensive with massed tanks at Cambrai in 1917. The Gilberts were very weakly defended as reinforcements promised under Japan's new operational policy of September had not yet arrived. On Makin, there was a garrison of only 800, and on the atoll of Apamama, a subsidiary objective, only 25. But Trawa had a garrison of over 3,000 and was strongly fortified. At Makin, the small garrison held out for four days against a U.S. Army division, which was handicapped by inexperience. Far more effective was the action of a few Amphtraks, amphibious tracked vehicles that surmount coral reefs, but the landing force had only a few of these new vehicles. Tarawa, much more strongly defended and fortified, 
was given a heavy naval bombardment, 3,000 tons of shells in two and one half hours, as well as massive air bombing before being attacked by the 2nd Marine Division, which had distinguished itself at Good Alkinl. Even so, a third of the 5,000 landed on the first day were knocked out in crossing the 600-yard strip between the coral reef and the beaches. But the survivors were indomitable and forced the Japanese to withdraw to two interior strong points, and that withdrawal enabled the Marines to spread over the island and hem in the defending strong points. Then on the night of the 22nd the Japanese solved the Marines' still difficult problem by switching over to repeated counter-attacks, in which they were wiped out. After that the remaining islands were soon cleared. The Navy lost an escort carrier, but on the whole the carrier groups proved that they could beat off Japanese air attacks both by day and night, while the Japanese surface warships did not challenge Admiral Spruance's large fleet. The American people were shocked by the losses suffered, and the attack on the Gilberts became a source of violent controversy. But the experience gained proved valuable in many detailed respects, and led to important improvements in the technique of amphibious operations. Rear Admiral S. E. Morrison, the official naval historian, called it the seedbed of victory in 1945. Nimitz and his staff were already busy in planning the next bound to the marshals, but it was only after the attack on the Gilberts that a key change was made in the plan, at Nimitz's insistence. Instead of a direct attack on the nearest, most easterly, islands in the group, they were to be bypassed, and the next leap made to Kwajalein Atoll, 400 miles far thereon. After that, if all went well, Spruance's reserve would be sent on to see Zenidok, at the far end of this 700-mile chain of islands. The command was organized similarly to that for the attack on the Gilberts, but two fresh divisions were employed for the assault, which totaled 54,000 assault troops as well as 31,000 garrison troops to occupy the conquered territory. On the naval side, there were four carrier groups, which included 12 carriers and eight battleships. Many more Amphtraks were used, and these were both armed and armored while fighter aircraft and gunboats were equipped with rockets. The preparatory bombardment was to be four times as great as the attack on the Gilberts. The success of the plan was helped by the way that the Japanese sent such reinforcements as they could provide to the easterly islands of the group, thus being caught unawares by the remodeled American strategy, of indirect approach and bypassing moves. After a brief return to Pearl Harbor for a rest and refit, the fast carrier forces came back at the end of January 1944, and by sustained sorties, over 6,000 in all, paralyzed Japanese air and sea movements throughout the attack on the marshals, while destroying some 150 Japanese aircraft. The first move in the attacks was the capture on January 31 of the undefended island of Majuro, in the easterly chain which provided a good anchorage for the American supporting service force. Then the small islands flanking Kwajalein were captured, and the main attack promptly followed on February 1. The garrison assisted the process of overcoming it by repeated suicidal counter-attacks, charging in the wild and sacrificial Banzai spirit. Although the Japanese garrison had totaled over 8,000 men, of whom some 5,000 were combat troops, only 370 Americans were killed in achieving this victory. As the Corps Reserve, of some 10,000 men, had not been called on, it was sent on to see Zenidok. There the Americans would be still a thousand miles short of the Marianas, while less than 700 miles from Druk, the major Japanese base in the Carolines. So as a flank safeguard to the move against Enidok a heavy raid on truck was delivered from nine of the American carriers on the same day as the Enidok landings. A further stroke was delivered that night, with the aid of radar to identify the targets, and a third the next morning. Although Admiral Cogger had prudently withdrawn most of his combined fleet, two cruisers and four destroyers were sunk, as well as 26 tankers and freighters. In the air the Japanese suffered much worse losing over 250 planes, for an American loss of 25. The strategic effects were even more striking, 
as this shattering triple raid caused the Japanese to withdraw all aircraft from the Bismarcks, leaving Rabaul helpless, thus proving that the Central Pacific advance could assist, and not retard, MacArthur's progress in the Southwest Pacific. Above all, the operation showed that carrier forces could cripple a major enemy base without occupying it, and without the help of land-based aircraft. In these circumstances, the capture of Enidoc proved easy. The surrounding islands were quickly taken, and even the garrison of the main island was overcome in three days, by a landing force of less than half a division's strength. The building of new airfields in the Marshalls, for American use, then proceeded fast. The Gilberts and the Marshalls had been gained in only just over two months, whereas the Japanese had hoped that this delaying zone could be held for six months, and the key position of truck in their absolute, or essential, barrier zone had been badly impaired. Burma, 1943-1944 The season's campaign in Burma ran a very different course from expectation, and formed a depressing contrast to the now rapid allied advance in the Pacific, especially the Central Pacific. For the main feature of the war in Burma was another Japanese offensive, and the only one in the war that saw the Japanese cross the Indian frontier, into southern Assam, whereas the British had been counting on, and planning, an offensive that would clear the invaders out of northern Burma and open the road to China. The great improvement in communications from India, and the growing strength of their forces, had appeared to offer a good prospect. The Japanese attack was aimed to forestall and dislocate the British offensive, and it came uncomfortably close to tactical success, despite inferior strength, while even its eventual failure had the strategical effect of postponing the British advance until 1945. But once it was foiled, in the spring of 1944, by the tough defense of Imphlen Kohima, both 30 miles inside the Assam border, it soon became evident that the Japanese had exhausted so much of their scanty strength in this last offensive effort that they could offer no strong resistance to the immediate British counter-offensive, nor to the larger-scale British offensive that followed in 1945. In preparation for the campaign the Allies had agreed among themselves that the reoccupation of northern Burma was to be the primary objective, as the shortest way to renew direct touch with China and resume supplies to her over the Burma road across the mountain barrier. After prolonged discussion, other schemes were put aside, such as amphibious operations against Taekyab, Rangoon, or Sumatra. The British offensive in northern Burma was to be preceded by a renewed attack in Arakan, and a diversionary attack by the Chindits in the north. At the end of August 1943 a new and unified Southeast Asia Command was set up under Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, previously Chief of Combined Operations. The respective service heads under him were Admiral Somerville, General Giffard, and Air Chief Marshal Pierce, while General Stilwell, the American, was to be Deputy Supremo to Mountbatten. The India Command was separated from SEAC, and made responsible for training as distinct from operations, Wavell was pushed upstairs to become Viceroy of India and Orchin Lek appointed to succeed him as C.N.C. India. The main part of the army strength under General Giffard, 11th Army Group, was the newly formed 14th Army of which General Slim was given command. It comprised Christensen's 15th Corps in Arakan and Schoons's 4th Corps on the Central Front, in northern Burma, while having operational control of the Chinese divisions in this theater of war. The naval strength remained small, but the air strength was increased to some 67 squadrons, of which 19 were American, an effective total of about 850 aircraft. It was this large increase of Allied strength, and the obvious offensive move that it portended, which spurred the Japanese to embark on a fresh and preventive offensive, into Assam, when they would otherwise have been content to stay on the defensive and consolidate the area, in Burma, they had conquered early in 1942. Wingate's first Chindit foray had made them realize that the Chindwin River was not a secure defensive shield. 
the object of the Japanese offensive was to foil an Allied offensive in the dry season of 1944 by occupying the Imphal Plain and controlling the mountain passes from Assam, not to attempt a far-reaching invasion of India, or a march on Delhi. The Japanese command system, too, was reorganized during the preparatory period. Under General Kawab, the top commander in the Burmese theater, there were three so-called armies, they were barely equivalent to Army Corps scale, the 33rd, under General Honda, of two divisions, in the northeast, the 28th, under General Sakurai, of three divisions, on the Arakan front, and the 15th, under General Mutagaki, on the central front, consisting of three divisions and an Indian national division which had only 9,000 men little more than half the strength of a normal Japanese division. Mutagaki's army was to carry out the Mfl offensive, after preliminary attacks in Arakan and Yunnan. Each side had planned a limited offensive in Arakan before a larger thrust on the central front. On the British side, it provided General Slim with an opportunity of trying out new jungle tactics based on the idea of creating strongholds into which the troops would withdraw and be maintained by airborne supply, while reserves were brought up to crush the intruding Japanese between them and the strongholds. This technique was a contrast to the previous practice, and habit, of retreating when outflanked. By the beginning of 1944 Christensen's 15th Corps was gradually advancing southward, in three columns, towards Eki Ab. But then, early in February, its progress was interrupted when the Japanese launched their planned attack, although with only one of their three divisions in Arakan. Helped by British negligence, they were able to capture Tongbazar and then, turning south, put the advancing British columns in an awkward situation, until relieved by fresh reinforcements that were flown in. But despite local blunders the value of the new British technique was proved, and the Japanese running short of food and ammunition, were driven to abandon their counter-offensive, even before the monsoon intervened in June and halted operations. Wingate's forces had been quiescent since the first Chindit operation had ended, with a withdrawal, in May 1943. But during the interval their strength had been increased from two brigades to six, largely owing to the way that Wingate's ideas and arguments had fired Churchill's imagination and had come to be regarded favorably by the previously skeptical chiefs of staff when he was summoned to attend the Quadrant Conference at Quebec in August 1943. Ord Wingate himself was promoted Major General, and his forces were given an air unit of their own, Number 1 Air Commando, a force much exceeding the scale implied by its official title, being equivalent to 11 squadrons. It was commonly called Cochrane's Circus after its young American commander, Philip Cochrane. The later months of 1943 and the early months of 1944 were spent in the specialized training of the newly allotted brigades. Although still called the 3rd Indian Division, as camouflage, the force did not comprise any Indian troops and now amounted to the equivalent of two divisions, the chief new element being provided by the British 70th Division. Wingate's ideas, too, had changed and developed, from guerrilla hit and run tactics to a more concrete and prolonged kind of long range penetration. His LRP groups were to seize Indore and the area around it on the Irrawaddy, some 150 miles north of Mandalay, the space between the British Fourth Corps and Stillwell's Chinese forces, two divisions and disrupt the Japanese communications by establishing a string of strongholds that would be supplied by air. They were to fight it out with the enemy forces, not merely harass them. In essence, the Chindits would become the spearhead, and the Fourth Corps the supporting, and mopping up force. Wingate visualized, and aimed to have eventually, several LRP divisions operating far ahead of the main army. The operation was launched on the evening of March 5th, and had an ominous start when many of the 62 gliders used by the initial contingent miscarried or crashed on landing at Broadway, a spot 50 miles northeast of Indoor, while another chosen site was found to be obstructed by felled tree trunks and a third soon discarded for various reasons. 
Nevertheless the construction of an airstrip went ahead at Broadway and the bulk of Mike Calvert's 77th, LRP, brigade was successfully landed during the next few nights, and was followed by Lentaine's 111th, LRP, brigade. By March 13, some 9,000 men had been put down deep in the enemy's rear. In addition, Bernard Ferguson's 16th, LRP, Brigade had set off on an overland march from Assam early in February, and despite the appalling difficulties of the country was approaching Indore soon after the middle of March. Although the Japanese had been taken by surprise, they soon managed to assemble an improvised force under General Hayashi, amounting to the equivalent of a division, to deal with this airborne invasion. Part of it arrived at Indore by March 18, and the bulk of it before the end of March. Moreover the Japanese air force in a counter-stroke on the 17th destroyed most of the half-dozen Spitfires that were now operating from Broadway, and after that its air defense depended on fighter patrols flown from the distant airfields around Imphal. Then on March 24 Wingate himself was killed when his plane crashed in the jungle. But even before that tragic accident his over-elaborate yet rather ill-thought-out plan was becoming disjointed. On the 26th a direct attack on Indore by the overland marching 16th, LRP, brigade, ordered by Wingate, was repulsed by the Japanese in their prepared position, and they also succeeded in countering the threat of the other LRP brigades. Wingate's development of the concept from guerrilla action into long-range penetration of a more concrete kind had not proved a success although it is true that he was not given the main force backing up he had intended. After Wingate's death, Lentaine was appointed to replace him as commander of the special force, and early in April he agreed in discussion with Slim and Mountbatten that the Chinese should be moved northward to assist Stillwell's advance, with the Chinese, as they were not hampering the Japanese thrust to Emphal. Although Stillwell did not welcome their transfer, Feeling that they would draw Japanese forces in his direction, they helped his advance to some extent by capturing Moghong, although even then Stillwell's Chinese troops failed in the effort to reach the enemy's key position at Maitkeena. The northward move of the Chindits was made just before a fresh Japanese division arrived on the scene. The preventive Japanese offensive into Assam, to capture Imphal and Kohima, had been launched in the middle of March, by three divisions. Its launch and progress was not affected, contrary to expectation, by the Chind its descent into the Irrawaddy Valley on its easterly flank and rear, a threat which was too remote to endanger its own northward line of advance and communications. At the end of January, Schoons had broken off the gradual southward advance of his own 4th Corps, from Imphal and taken up defensive positions in view of reports and evidence that the Japanese were regrouping and concentrating on the upper reaches of the Chindwin for an offensive of their own towards Imphal. Even so, Schoons's three divisions were still rather scattered, while the Sunmost, the 17th, was bypassed near Tidham and then found its road of withdrawal to Imphal blocked. The situation looked so precarious that a 4th British division, just back from Arakan, was hastily made ready for an emergency switch by air to Imphal, as well as other reinforcements. The Japanese flanking advance from the Chindwin was also making progress and hustling the withdrawal of the 20th Division. Then the British position at Ugrul, some 30 miles northeast of, and behind, Imphal, was attacked on March 19 and it became uncomfortably evident that this Japanese deep flank thrust was aimed at Kohima, 60 miles north of Imphal, on the road back across the mountains into India. The Imphal Kahima road was actually cut, for a time, on March 29. Two more fresh divisions were then sent forward as a safeguard and stopgap. In sum, Japanese nimbleness and thrustfulness had once again thrown their numerically superior opponents of balance and put them in an awkward plight. Although the British managed to get back to the Imphal plain, and had they got more than four divisions defensively deployed, Kohima was held by only 1,500 troops, under Colonel Hugh Richards. It was fortunate for the British that the top Japanese commander, General Kawab, refused permission to General Mutagaki, the local army commander, to push on a force to seize Dimapur, 
30 miles beyond Kehima, at the exit from the mountains. Such a coup would have forestalled, and disrupted, any British counter-offensive to relieve Imphal. In the breathing space thus allowed, Lieutenant General Montagu Stopford and the leading part of his 33rd Corps was brought forward from India, and on April 2nd he was put in charge of the Dimapur Kehiman area, pending the arrival of the bulk of his corps. The Japanese attack on Kehima, by their 31st Division, began on the night of the 4th, and it quickly seized the dominating heights, so that by the 6th the small garrison was cut off from the brigade that had been sent to reinforce it, while this brigade in turn was cut off from Dimapur by a roadblock at Zubza that the Japanese established behind it. General Slim, however, ordered a general counter-offensive on the 10th. By the 14th a fresh brigade sent forward by Stopford captured the roadblock at Zubza, and on the 18th the two relieving brigades broke through to the tiny and exhausted Kahima garrison just as it was making its last stand. In the next phase, they drove the Japanese off the surrounding heights. Around Imphal, also, there was hard fighting when two of the British divisions the counter-attacked, northward to clear the road to Kohima and northeastward to recapture Ukrul and threaten the rear of the Japanese division attacking Kohima. The other two British divisions at Imphal were thrusting southward. Fortunately for the British they now had almost complete command of the air, the Japanese had less than 200 aircraft in the whole of Burma, and were thus able to keep their large force at Imphal supplied by air during these crucial weeks. They had about 120,000 men at Imphal even after 35,000 wounded, sick and non-combatants had been flown out. In May, Stopford's now reinforced troops cleared the road to Imphal, after driving off the Japanese who were clinging on to their positions around Kohima and Schoons's troops came close to cornering the Japanese south of Imphal. But the Japanese could have withdrawn comfortably, and without further loss, if Mutagaki had not insisted on pursuing his offensive efforts long after any prospect of success had passed, and in face of the protests of his executive subordinates. In his furious persistence he sacked all three of his divisional commanders, and was subsequently sacked himself. During July the British 14th Army under Slim continued its counter-offensive and eventually reached the Chindwin. Its progress was delayed by the advent of the monsoon more than by the resistance of the Japanese, now only an exhausted and hungry remnant. During their excessively prolonged offensive the Japanese losses had amounted to over 50,000 out of the 84,000 troops they had brought into action. The British, handled more carefully, lost less than 17,000, out of a larger initial strength, and much larger ultimate strength. In all they had employed six divisions and a number of smaller formations, while benefiting greatly from control of the air, whereas the Japanese had only employed three of their divisions plus a so-called division of Indian nationalists, low in strength and poor in quality. On the other hand, the Japanese had forfeited their advantage in tactical skill by blind conformity to an unrealistic military tradition, and would pay for such folly still more clearly in the next stage of the war. Part 7, Full EBB 1944 Chapter 30, Capture of Rome and Second Czech in Italy The Allied situation in Italy at the opening of 1944 was disappointing compared with the high hopes that accompanied the landings there in September 1943. Both the invading armies, the 5th, United States, and the 8th, British, had lost heavily and become palpably exhausted by their successive frontal attacks up the leg of the Italian peninsula, on the left and right sides respectively of its Shinbone, the Apennin mountain range. Their slow, crawling progress up the length of the peninsula had become all too like the battering ram process of the Allied armies on the Western Front in the First World War. The great disadvantage at which the Germans had been placed in September by their Italian allies' simultaneous capitulation and change of sides, coupled with the triple Anglo-American landings, at Reggio, Taranto, and Salerno, had been retrieved by their speedy reaction. 
Kessel Ring's temporarily disjointed and confused forces had met the multiple emergency so well that Hitler was soon able to cancel the initial idea and plan, of abandoning the Italian peninsula and falling back to the north of Italy, in favor of a prolonged defense of the peninsula. From the autumn of 1943 onward, the most that the Allies could hope to achieve was a negative aim, that of keeping as many German divisions as possible pinned down in Italy, and away from the force available to meet the coming Anglo-American invasion of France, through Normandy, in mid-summer 1944. The Tehran Conference of the three major Allied powers in November 1943, and immediately preceding the Anglo-American Conference at Cairo, confirmed this conclusion by the decision that Operation Overlord, the cross-channel attack through Normandy was to have priority, along with Anvil the supplementary landing in the south of France, while the aim in Italy was confined to the capture of Rome and a subsequent advance to the Pisa-Rimini line in the peninsula leg. Exploitation northeastward into the Balkans was not to be undertaken. Indeed, it does not appear to have been a major point, or consideration, of British policy at this time. In spite of the basic agreement on priority for Overlord and Anvil, there was still much underlying disagreement between the American and British leaders over the importance of the campaign in Italy. The British view, as held by Mr. Churchill and Sir Alan Brooke, was that the more forces the Allies put into Italy the more German forces they could draw thither, away from Normandy, a view that proved mistaken, but was inspired by Churchill's hope of a great and primarily British success in the theatre of war. The Americans' view, insofar as it differed, was governed by their concern that any reinforcement of the Allied strength in Italy should not subtract from its strength in France which they considered, rightly, the decisive theatre. They recognized more realistically than Churchill, or the British military chiefs, the difficulties of terrain that were likely to hinder any quick success in Italy, and its exploitation. They were also deeply suspicious of a British inclination to focus on Italy as an evasion of an invasion of France the harder task. Kessel Ring now had 15 divisions in the 10th Army, apart from a further 8 with the 14th Army in the north, to hold his front, on what was called the Gustav Line, against a continuation of the Allied offensive. Although most of the German divisions were of weaker strength, and some badly reduced, they looked capable of holding on against any direct frontal assault by the 18 Allied divisions which had been landed in Italy by the end of 1943. So the natural solution was an amphibious landing behind the Gustav Line, and that promised to be all the easier since the Allies had both air and naval superiority. If launched in conjunction with a fresh attack on the Gustav Line, it should be able to lever the Germans out of that line and break their hold south of Rome. Such a plan, named Operation Shingle, was already on the stocks, and Churchill, who had been feeling impatient at the slow progress in Italy, gave it fresh impetus. He obtained the necessary shipping at the Cairo Tehran Conference by agreeing to the American desire for Anvil, the south of France landing planned for the summer, and then asking that the assault craft should remain in the Mediterranean until that time so that they would be available for the amphibious landing at Anzio, just south of Rome, which was projected for January. The plan drawn up by Alexander and his staff was well designed in broad outline. The offensive on the existing peninsula front, the Gustav Line, was to be launched by Mark Clark's 5th Army, about January 20. The U.S. 2nd Corps was to strike across the Rapido River, and up the Lirai Valley as soon as the French Corps on its right and the British Tenth Corps on its left had drawn off most of General Senja's 14th Panzer Corps by preliminary thrusts. Once the main advance got going, the seaborne U.S. Sixth Corps would be landed at Anzio. It was hoped, and expected, that the German reserve divisions would then be hurrying southward, and would turn back to meet the Allied landing forces at Anzio, while in the confusion, the 5th Army should be able to break through the Gustav Line and link up with the 6th Corps at Anzio. Even if the German 10th Army was not crushed between the two, the Allied command hoped that it would have to withdraw to the Rome area to reorganize. But the plan did not work out. 
the German troops were not so confused or exhausted as the Allied command hoped, and they fought with their usual tenacity. On the other hand, the Allied preparations had been rushed and the 5th Army's offensive was disjointed in delivery. It started well with a successful assault crossing of the Garigliano River, on the 9th of January 17-18, by McCreary's British 10th Corps on the westerly sector. And this led Kesselring to dispatch a large proportion of his reserves, 29th and 90th Panzer Grenadier Divisions, and parts of the Hermann Goring Division, to that front. But the attack, on the 20th, of the U.S. Second Corps across the Rapido, in the left center, proved a costly failure, the two leading regiments being largely destroyed. The Lirai Valley was strongly held, and any attack up it was in full view of Monte Cassino, the formidableness of which position had been underestimated. The Rapido itself had a very fast current and even an unopposed crossing would have been difficult, while in this case the U.S. 36th Division was launched at it after only five days for rest and preparation since its capture of the outlying Monte Trocchio on the approach to the Rapido. The assault attempted by the British 46th Division advancing on its immediate left was also a failure. The 5th Army's offensive was still proceeding, but looking gloomy, when the seaborne force landed at Anzio on January 22. The Anzio sector offered the only suitable beaches for a landing behind the German flank, unless the Allied planners ventured to choose a site north of Rome, and that would be considerably farther from the main front on the Gustav line. Even so, Kesselring was taken by surprise, considering a north of Rome landing more dangerous to him strategically, and had only one unit in the Anzio area when the Allied landing took place a battalion of the 29th Panzer Grenadier Division that was in rest there. Fortunately for him the commander of the invading force, Major General John P. Lucas, who had taken over the command of the 6th Corps during the last part of the Salerno battle, was extremely cautious and also deeply pessimistic, he had expressed his pessimistic views, even before the operation was launched, not only in his diary but also to his subordinates and allies including Alexander himself. His 6th Corps comprised for the initial landing two infantry divisions, the 1st British and 3rd US, assisted by commando and ranger units, a parachute regiment, and two tank battalions, while they were to be followed up by the American 1st Armored Division and 45th Infantry Division. That strength would assure not only overwhelming superiority at the landing places but the prospect of powerful exploitation, which Churchill hoped would quickly reach the Alban Hills south of Rome and cut the strategically vital routes 6 and 7, thus cutting off the German 10th Army in the Gustav Line. The landings, by the British just north of Anzio, and the Americans just south of the town, were easily achieved, being almost unopposed but the Germans' reaction was rapid and resolute. Their forces in the Gustav line were ordered to stand fast, on the defensive, while the Hermann Goring division was switched back northward and other available units rushed down from Rome. Kesselring was told by OKW that he could call on any of the divisions in northern Italy, and that in addition he was to be sent two divisions, three independent regiments, and two heavy tank battalions for Hitler was anxious, and eager, to give this allied seaborne move such a knock as would frighten off the Allies from further landings in Italy, and from their prospective landings on the coast of France. Kesselring's reshuffle of his forces was a remarkable feat. Elements of eight German divisions were brought to the Anzio sector in the first eight days. The command setup was also reorganized at the same time. Mackensen's 14th Army took over the Anzio sector, controlling the 1st Parachute Corps and 76th Panzer Corps that now respectively held the areas north and south of the Allied beachhead. Vietinghoff's 10th Army was left to hold the Gustav Line, with the 14th Panzer Corps and the 51st Mountain Corps. In all, eight German divisions were assembled round the Anzio beachhead. Seven were under Senja's 14th Panzer Corps opposing Mark Clark's allied 5th Army, and only three were under the 51st Mountain Corps to check the British 8th Army on the Adriatic side of Italy, 
while six divisions were left in northern Italy under General von Zangen. The British Eighth Army was now commanded by Sir Oliver Lees, with Montgomery's recall to England to take charge of the plans and preparations for the coming Allied invasion of Normandy. Churchill's hope of a speedy thrust from Anzio to the Alban Hills was nullified by Lucas's obstinate determination, backed by Mark Clark, to concentrate on consolidating the beachhead before thrusting inland. But in view of the Germans' swift reaction and superior skill, along with the clumsiness of most of the Allied commanders and troops, Lucas's super caution may have been a blessing in disguise. An inland thrust, in such circumstances, could have been an easy target for flank attacks, and have led to disaster. While the planned beachhead area was secured by the second day, and the supplely problem thereby simplified, the first real attempt to push inland did not start until January 30, more than a week after the landing. It was soon brought to a halt by the German forces on the spot. Moreover the whole beachhead could now be harassed by German artillery fire, and Allied aircraft, which were operating from the Naples area, were unable to prevent Luftwaffe raids on the crowded shipping around Anzio. So Mark Clark's forces on the Gustav Line, instead of being aided by the Anzio Lever, again tried a direct attack to aid the hemmed in seaborne force at Anzio. This time the U.S. Second Corps sought to overcome the Gustav Line by an attack on Casino from the north side. On January 24 the American 34th Division led the assault, with the aid of the French on its flank. But it was not until after a week's heavy fighting that it managed to secure a firm bridgehead, and before then Sanger had brought more of his reserves into the sector, making this strong defensive position stronger than ever. On February 11 the Americans were withdrawn, heavily depleted and badly exhausted. After that abortive effort the newly formed New Zealand Corps, Lieutenant General Bernard Freyberg, was brought up, composed of the 2nd New Zealand and 4th Indian Divisions, both of them veteran divisions that had greatly distinguished themselves in the North African campaign. The 4th Indian, of combined British and Indian units, had been rated by the Germans as the best division there. Freyberg's plan for a converging assault on Casino offered no real change from the past procedure of costly frontal assaults on well-sighted and stubbornly defended German positions. Francis Duker, commanding the 4th Indian, urged an indirect approach and wider maneuver, through the mountains, which the French also favoured, but his influence was diminished by him falling ill. His division was cast to tackle Monte Cassino itself, and after the rejection of his proposals for a wider maneuver he asked that the historic monastery, which crowned this height, should be neutralized by a concentrated air bombardment. While there was no evidence that German troops were using the monastery, and ample proof subsequently that they abstained from entering it, the great edifice so dominated the scene as to have a sinister and depressing effect on troops who had to attack the height. The request was granted, after endorsement by Freyberg and Alexander, and on the 15th of February a tremendous bombing attack was delivered that demolished the famous monastery buildings. The German troops then felt justified in moving into the rubble, which enabled them to establish a still firmer defense. That night, and the following one, repeated attacks by the 4th Indian Division made no important progress. So on the next night, February 17-18, the New Zealand Corps reverted to the original plan. The 4th Indian Division succeeded in capturing the oft-disputed point 593, but was pushed out by counter-attacks from German parachute troops, and the 2nd New Zealand Division was driven out next day from its bridgehead over the Rapido by a counter-attack from German tanks. Pending the arrival of the large reinforcements that OKW had promised, to help in wiping out the Allied bridgehead, Mackenzie launched counter-attacks to hinder the Allied forces from expanding it. The first, on the night of February 3rd, was against the salient created by the British 1st Division in its abortive push towards Campoleone on January 30. Fortunately the leading brigade of the British 56th Division had just landed, and the thrust was held. 
A further and heavy counterattack came on the 7th and although it was held at bay British losses were so heavy that the 1st Division had to be replaced by the US 45th Division, which had now arrived. By mid-February Mackenzie was ready to launch his counterstroke, having now 10 divisions surrounding the five Allied divisions in the bridgehead, and a strongly reinforced Luftwaffe to give him good support. Goliaths, the new remote-controlled, explosive-filled, miniature tanks, were to be used to cause confusion among the defenders. The build-up had not been affected by the Allied attacks at Casino, nor was it seriously hindered by Allied air power. The German attack on the bridge had began on February 16, with probes all along the perimeter, and frequent raids by the Luftwaffe. By evening a gap developed in the sector held by the US 45th Division. It was the opportunity for which the Germans had been waiting, 14 battalions, led by Hitler's favorite, the Infantry Le Regiment, supported by tanks thrust forward on the 17th to expand the gap and push down the Albano Anzio Road. Victory was in sight. But the amount and mixture of forces crammed on this one road became an internal hindrance while offering a crowded target for the Allied artillery, aircraft, and naval bombardment squadrons. And the Goliath tanks were a failure. However, despite the heavy losses suffered, the weight of the assault pushed the Allied forces back, and on the 18th a renewed assault, reinforced by the 26th Panzer Division, made further progress towards the beaches. But the 56th and 1st British and 45th US divisions fought desperately, and successfully, to hold the final defence line of the bridgehead. The German thrust was checked at the Carosato Creek, and the assaulting troops wilted under the strain. The Panzer Grenadier divisions made their final effort on the 20th, but it was soon brought to a halt. The conduct and success of the defence was helped by the arrival of General Lucien K. Truscott, first as deputy, and then as successor, to Lucas. On the British sector Major General W. R. C. Penny, commander of the 1st Division, had been wounded, and replaced by Major General Gerald Templer, who ably coordinated the defence of both this and the 56th Division. Galled at the repulse, Hitler ordered a fresh offensive, opening on February 28, with diversionary attacks and the main thrust, by four divisions, down the Cistina Road. But this was held in check without difficulty by the American 3rd Division, and when, after the first three days, the low cloud cleared, the Allied air forces pulverized the attacking troops. On March 4 Mackensen was compelled, by his losses, to stop the offensive. Five German divisions were left to hold the ring, while the others were withdrawn to rest. The Allies now embarked on still another attack on Casino, in order to clear the way for their spring offensive. This time the attack was even more direct than before. The New Zealand division was to push through the town, and then the 4th Indian was to take over the assault on Monastery Hill. A very heavy bombardment from the ground and the air, 190,000 shells and 1,000 tons of bombs, was used with the aim of paralyzing the German troops in the town. This bombardment was delivered on March 15, when the weather was clear enough. But the defenders of the sector, a regiment, three battalions, of the elite 1st Parachute Division, not only endured the dual bombardment without flinching but survived it well enough to check the follow-up of the assaulting infantry. They were helped by the massive rubble created by the bombardment, which blocked the way for the Allied tanks. Although Castle Hill was captured, the 4th Indian Division's further advance up the height was hampered by torrential rain that came down in a deluge to the aid of the defenders. A company of Gurkhas got as far as Hangman's Hill, below the monastery, but was there isolated. Meanwhile fierce fighting continued in the town. Fresh efforts by both sides proved abortive on the 19th, and next day Alexander decided that if success was not achieved within 36 hours the operation should be abandoned, for losses were becoming heavy. On the 23rd it was definitely broken off, with Freyberg's agreement. So the third battle of Casino ended in disappointment. After that the New Zealand Corps was disbanded, its units being given a rest and then dispersed to other corps.
while the casino sector was taken over by the British 78th Division and the 1st Guards Brigade of the 6th Armoured Division. Alexander had proposed on February 22 that Operation Diadem should be delivered up the Lirai Valley in conjunction with a breakout and converging thrust from the Anzio Bridgehead. It would be broadly similar in pattern to the January offensive, but better planned and coordinated, and was to be launched about three weeks before Overlord, the cross-channel attack from England into Normandy, so that it might draw German divisions from France. The plan devised by Alexander's chief of staff, John Harding, concentrated extra punch into the blow by leaving only one corps on the Adriatic side of Italy, and sidestepping the rest of the 8th Army westward, to take over the Casino Lirai Valley sector. The 5th Army, including the French, would be in charge not only of the Garigliano sector on the left flank but of the Anzio bridgehead. An accompanying proposal was that Operation Anvil the south of France landing, should be abandoned. While the British chiefs agreed to the plan, rather naturally, the American chiefs of staff opposed it, as they considered that a landing in the south of France would be a better diversion to help the Normandy invasion. Eisenhower then proposed a compromise, by which the Italian offensive should be given priority, but planning for Anvil be continued. If, by March 20, it was clear that a major amphibious operation could not be mounted, most of the shipping in Italian waters should be withdrawn to aid Overlord. The compromise was agreed by the combined chiefs of staff on February 25. As the date for a decision approached, General Maitland Wilson, who had been given the new post of Supreme Commander, Mediterranean, heard from Alexander that the spring offensive in Italy could not be mounted before May and it was emphasized that no troops should be withdrawn for Anvil before the main forces facing the Gustav line had broken through and linked up with the Anzio force. This meant that, allowing ten weeks for regrouping and preparation, Anvil could not take place before the end of July, nearly two months after the Normandy landing, instead of being a preliminary diversion to help it. So Maitland Wilson and Alexander felt that the circumstances set them free to drop Anvil and concentrate on an effort to complete the Italian campaign decisively. That view accorded with the preference of Churchill and the British chiefs of staff. Eisenhower tended to agree with them, if on the somewhat different ground that most of the Mediterranean shipping could now be transferred to Overlord. But the American chiefs of staff, while reluctantly accepting a delay in launching Anvil until July, were opposed to its abandonment, and doubted the value of pursuing the offensive in Italy beyond the limits already set. They also doubted its effect in drawing off German divisions from Normandy, in which respect they were soon proved right. A prolonged wrangle ensued, being carried on and up in an interchange of lengthy telegraphic arguments between Mr. Churchill and President Roosevelt. Meanwhile, in Italy, preparations for the spring offensive went forward, this being in the British sphere of command. The move and redeployment of the 8th Army along with other factors, including shipping shortages, delayed the launching of the offensive until May 11. The 8th Army's task was to break through at Cassina while the 5th Army was to assist it, on the left flank, by thrusting across the Garigliano and by a breakout from the Anzio bridgehead towards Valmontone on Route 6. At Anzio there were now six Allied divisions facing five German, with four more German divisions in reserve around Rome. On the Gustav Line 16 Allied divisions, of which four lay close up in readiness for the exploitation, were assembled against six German divisions, with one in reserve. Much the larger part of the Allied strength on this front was concentrated on the stretch from Cassina to the mouth of the Garigliano, a total of twelve divisions, two American, four French, four British and two Polish, for the break-in, with four more close behind to exploit this by a thrust up the Lirai Valley, in the hope of piercing the Hitler line, some six miles in the rear, before the Germans could rally on it and build it up. The nine divisions of the 8th Army were supported by over 1,000 guns, and they benefited still more by a spell of dry weather which enabled their tanks and other motor vehicles to follow up the advance, in contrast to the mud-bound conditions prevailing in the winter offensive. 
so the three armoured divisions, the 6th British, 5th Canadian and 6th South African, had better prospects of suitable action than ever before. In the attack, the Polish Corps, of two divisions, was to tackle Casino, while the British 13th Corps, of four divisions, advanced on its left, towards Est Angelo. The Allied offensive as a whole on the main front was to be supported by over 2,000 guns, while the Allied air forces in this theatre cooperated by heavy and widespread attacks on the enemy's rail and road network, before turning on to battlefield targets in the final stage. This Operation Strangle, however, did not seriously affect the German communications and supply system, as had been hoped, extensive sabotage activities were also mounted, but had disappointing results. As a deception, Allied troops openly rehearsed amphibious landings in the hope of making Kesselring believe that they were to come, particularly near Civitavecchia just north of Rome but he was already so strongly convinced that the Allies ought to use their seaborne advantage in such a way that these attempts at deception seem to have had no marked effect. The offensive opened at 11pm on the night of May 11 with a massive artillery bombardment, promptly followed up by the advance of the infantry. But for the first three days the attack made little progress against stiff resistance on most sectors. The Polish Corps under General Anders suffered heavily in its assault at Casino despite great determination and skill in using less direct routes of approach. The British 13th Corps also made slow progress, and would have suffered heavy losses but for the way the Poles focused the enemy's attention. The US 2nd Corps on the coast sector likewise gained little ground. But the French Corps, under Juin, which lay between these two, found only one division opposing its four, and made relatively fast progress through the mountainous region beyond the Garigliano, where the Germans had not expected a serious thrust. On the 14th the French broke into the Ozenti Valley, and the German 71st Division began falling back fast before them. That helped the American 2nd Corps which now began to push faster along the coast road against the German 94th Division. Moreover these two German divisions were now on lines of retreat split by the almost roadless Oransi Mountains. Juin, seizing the opportunity, sent his mountain-bred Moroccan Gums, a force of divisional strength under Guillaume, into the gap and across the mountains to pierce the rearward Hitler line in the Lirai Valley before it could be properly manned. The German right flank, or western wing, was now collapsing and its prospects of rallying were all the worse because Senger, its able commander, was away on a course when the Allied offensive was launched. Moreover Kesselring, this time, was slow to send reserves southward until he saw how the situation in the north developed, and it was not until the 13th that one division was moved south, to the Lirai Valley. Although three more soon followed they were sucked into what soon became a whirlpool battle and arrived too late to stabilize the front. The Germans in the Casino sector continued to hold on for several days more, although the Canadian Corps was thrown in on the 15th for the exploitation, but on the night of the 17th these indomitable German paratroops at last withdrew, and the Poles entered the long-sought ruins of the monastery next morning, having lost nearly 4,000 men in their gallant efforts. As most of the scanty German reserves had at last been drawn southward, the time was ripe for the planned breakout from the Anzio bridgehead, which was now reinforced by another American division, the 36th. Ordering this breakout attack for the 23rd, Alexander hoped there would be a strong and rapid thrust to Valmontone, to cut Route 6, the main inland road, and thus cut off most of the German 10th Army that had been holding the Gustav Line. If that was achieved Rome should fall like a ripe apple. But the prospects were marred by Mark Clark's differing views, and his eagerness that the troops of the 5th Army should be the first to enter Rome. The US 1st Armoured and 3rd Infantry Divisions reached Curry, just beyond the coastal Route 7, but well short of Route 6, by the 25th, after a 12-mile advance, and had linked up with the 2nd Corps that was driving northward along Route 7, Kesselring's one remaining mobile division, the Hermann Goring, was rushing to the scene to stop this thrust, 
and being badly harassed by Allied air attacks. But at this stage Mark Clark swung his drive direct towards Rome, with four divisions, while only one was allowed to continue towards Valmontone, and this was held up three miles short of Route 6 by the larger part of three German divisions. Alexander's appeals to Churchill did not succeed in changing the direction of Mark Clark's thrust, and that was slowed down by the Germans' resistance in the Caesar line defences just south of Rome. Moreover the 8th Army's armoured divisions had found that their exploiting drive up the Lyrai Valley was not as easy as had been hoped and they failed to pin the retreating German 10th Army against the mountain spine formed by the Apennines. Instead the Germans were able to slip away to safety by roads running through the mountains, while their escape was helped by the absence of intervention from the Allied forces at Anzio. Indeed, for a few days the Germans seemed to have a chance of establishing themselves and stabilizing their front on the Caesar line because of the tough resistance put up, under Senja's direction, on the Ars Seprano sector along Route 6, coupled with the size and cumbrousness of the transport tail of the armored divisions which was striving to drive up that overcrowded road. But the gloomy prospect of another deadlock was annulled by the success of the U.S. 36th Division on May 30 in capturing Villatry on Route 7, in the Alban Hills, and piercing the Caesar line. Exploiting the opportunity, Mark Clark ordered a general offensive by the 5th Army, in which his 2nd Corps took Valmontone and thrust on up Route 6 towards Rome while the bulk of his 6th Corps backed the thrust up Route 7. Under pressure from 11 divisions the comparatively small German forces holding the approaches were forced to give way, and the Americans entered Rome on June 4. The bridges were found intact, as Kesselring had declared it an open city rather than risk the holy city's destruction in prolonged fighting. On June 6, two days later, the Allies' invasion of Normandy opened, and the campaign in Italy receded into the background. Their spring offensive in Italy, Operation Diadem, had cost the Americans 18,000 casualties, the British 14,000, and the French 10,000 by the time it was crowned by the capture of Rome. The German loss was about 10,000 in killed and wounded, but about 20,000 more were taken prisoner in the successive actions. In comparative absorption of strength, 30 Allied divisions in this theatre against 22 German, and about 2 to 1 in actual troops, the continuation of the Allied offensive in Italy had not proved a good strategic investment. Nor did it make possible the invasion of Normandy by drawing the German forces away from there. Indeed, it did not succeed in preventing the enemy from reinforcing northwest Europe. Their strength in the northern part of France, north of the Loire, and in the Low Countries was increased from 35 divisions at the beginning of 1944 to 41 when the Allied Cross Channel invasion was launched in June. The claim that can more justly be made for the strategic effect of the Italian campaign, as an aid to the success of the Normandy landing, is that without its pressure the German strength on the Channel front could have been increased even more. The scale of the assault and immediate follow-up forces there were limited by the number of landing craft available, so that the Allied forces employed in Italy could not have added to the weight of the Normandy landing during its crucial opening phase. On the other hand, the use in Normandy of the German forces detained in Italy might have been fatal to the prospects of the landing. This is a valid claim which, strangely, many of its British advocates have failed to make in trying to claim too much. But even this claim is subject to a doubt whether a large movement of troops to Normandy would have been possible in face of the Allied interdiction bombing of the railways. In the political sphere the most notable feature of the period was the abdication of King Victor Emmanuel in favour of his son, and the replacement of Marshal Badoglio as Italy's Prime Minister by the anti-fascist Signor Bonomai. For the Allied armies in Italy the sequel to the long-sought capture of Rome was very disappointing. That was partly due to higher decisions and partly to the Germans' recovery and counter-moves. Although Maitland Wilson had accepted the American view that Anvil, even though delayed, was the most effective operation that the Mediterranean command could undertake to draw German divisions from northern France, 
and thereby aid the progress of the Normandy advance, Alexander had a different view. On June 6, two days after the entry in Rome, he set forth his plan for exploiting Diadem. He considered that if his forces were left intact, they would be able to attack the Germans' Gothic line north of Florence, on the thigh of the Italian peninsula, by August 15, the same date that Wilson had fixed for Anvil, and would be able to break through this barrier line unless Hitler diverted eight or more divisions to reinforce it. After that he considered that he would soon be able to overrun the northeast of Italy and have a good chance of driving on through the Ljubljana Gap, as it was called, into Austria. It was a remarkably optimistic view of the possibilities of speedily overcoming the series of mountain obstacles between Italian Venetia and Vienna, with their many potential delaying positions, and the more optimistic in view of the repeated repulses that the Italians had suffered the during the First World War even in the initial approaches. But the plan appealed to Churchill and the British chiefs of staff, particularly Alan Brooke, as an alternative to the heavy losses, and even catastrophe they feared in Normandy. In advocating the plan Alexander had better ground in emphasizing the moral value of impressing his troops with the importance of the Italian campaign. The American chiefs of staff, under General Marshall's guidance, opposed this dubious new extension of the offensive in Italy, but Alexander succeeded in winning over Maitland Wilson. Then, however, Eisenhower intervened in favor of Anvil. Once more, Churchill and Roosevelt were brought into the dispute. By July 2, the British had to give way, and Wilson was ordered to launch Anvil, now more modestly renamed Dragoon, on August 15. The decision entailed the departure of the U.S. Sixth Corps, with its three divisions, and then of the French Corps, of four divisions, whose chiefs and members naturally preferred to help in the liberation of their motherland. The 5th Army was thus reduced to five divisions, and the army group lost about 70% of its air support. Meanwhile Kesselring and his men were already striving with much effect to check the Allies' exploitation of the partial victory they had gained. The German losses in Diadem had been serious, four of the infantry divisions having to be withdrawn to refit, while a further seven had been seriously reduced. But four fresh divisions were on the way as well as a regiment of heavy tanks. Most of these reinforcements were sent to the 14th Army, which was covering the easier routes of advance. Kesselring's plan was to slow down the Allied advance by a series of delaying actions throughout the summer, and retreat to the strong Gothic line for the winter. About 80 miles north of Rome there was a natural line of defense near Trasimene, the scene of Hannibal's most skillful trap which offered a suitable position for the first stand. The skilled demolition work of the German engineers would help to slow down the Allied advance. This advance began on June 5, the day after the Americans entered Rome. But it was not pushed very hard at the moment when it could have been most dangerous. Then the French took over the lead in the 5th Army's sector. Meanwhile the British 13th Corps was pressing up routes 3 and 4, further inland but it met increasingly stiff opposition, and came to a standstill along the Trasimene line. The advance in other sectors was also brought to a standstill. Thus in barely a fortnight after the withdrawal from Rome, Kesselring had stabilized the momentarily very dangerous situation. Moreover he had been told that OKW was sending him four more divisions, which were on or earmarked for the Russian front as well as drafts to resuscitate his more battered divisions. And this was in addition to the four fresh divisions and one heavy tank regiment that were already arriving. Ironically, this large addition to Kesselring's strength came at a time when Alexander was faced with the depressing fact of having to part with seven of his divisions, and the larger part of his air support as well as much of the logistical elements of the Allied Army Group in Italy. Kesselring had proved himself a very able commander, and he was now rewarded by good fortune. He had decided to make a stand, on a convenient natural line of defense, just as the Allies' exploiting drive was running out of steam. The two months of the summer following June 20 were a period of disappointment and frustration for Alexander's armies. 
advances were piecemeal and never looked decisive. Battles were a series of isolated actions between individual Allied and German corps, in which the German policy was to hold a position until the Allied corps opposite was seen to be deploying for a massive attack and to slip away to the next obstacle line. The upshot of Kesselring's rapid regrouping meant that the 14th Panzer Corps, on the west coast, now faced the 2nd U.S. Corps, the 1st Parachute Corps faced the French Corps, not yet withdrawn for Anvil, the 76th Panzer Corps faced both British Corps, the 13th and 10th, while the 51st Mountain Corps faced the Polish 2nd Corps on the Adriatic coast. By the beginning of July, the Allied Center hindered by bad weather, was at last pushing through the Trasimene line, but after a few days was again checked, on the Erestso line. By July 15 the Germans slipped away from that, and gradually retired to the Arno line, from Pisa through Florence and eastward. Here the Allied armies were forced to a prolonged halt, with their goal, the Gothic line, only a short distance beyond. Some compensation for their frustrations was the Poles' capture of Ancona, on July 18, and the Americans' capture of Lagorn on the 19th, which shortened their supply lines. In view of the British desire, especially Alexander's and Churchill's, to press on with the campaign in Italy, despite repeated disappointments and reduced forces, plans went ahead for mounting a great autumn offensive against the Gothic line. It was hoped that it would still be of value in drawing off German forces from the principal theatres, or, alternatively, that if a collapse occurred on the Western Front this would lead to a German withdrawal from Italy and thereby enable Alexander's forces to exploit a breakthrough in northern Italy by a drive towards Trieste and Vienna. The previous plan for an attack on the Gothic Line, devised by Alexander's Chief of Staff, Harding, and the Army Group Staff, had been based on the idea of a surprise thrust through the center of the German front, in the Apennines, but on August 4 Oliver Lees, commanding the 8th Army, persuaded Alexander to adopt a different plan. The basis of this was to switch the 8th Army back to the Adriatic side, secretly, and for it to break through the towards Rimini. Having thus focused Kesselring's attention on the Adriatic coast, the 5th Army would strike in the left center, with Bologna as its objective. Then, when Kesselring reacted to this fresh thrust, the 8th Army would thrust forward again and break into the plain of Lombardy, where its armoured forces would have more scope for manoeuvre than they had ever enjoyed since landing in Italy. Despite the administrative problems it would involve, this new plan was the more welcome since the prospects of the original one were impaired by the removal of the French, with their skilled mountain troops. Lise also considered that the 5th and 8th armies would function better when they were not aiming at the same objective. Alexander was quick to agree with his arguments, and adopt the new plan, which was codenamed Operation Olive. But it had drawbacks which became more evident after the operation was launched. While the 8th would no longer be faced with a series of mountain ridges it would now have to overcome a series of awkward river crossings that would slow down its advance. By contrast, Kesselring profited from having a good lateral highway for switching his forces, in Route 9, the trunk road from Rimini westward through Bologna. The planners also seem to have been unduly optimistic about a continuance of dry weather. In any case, the country north of Rimini, although flat, was boggy, and far from suitable for a fast drive by armoured forces. Alexander's offensive opened well on August 25, ten days later than originally promised. The Germans were again taken by surprise, as the move of the British V Corps, of five divisions, and the Canadian I Corps, of two divisions, into positions of readiness behind the Polish II Corps had not been detected. The British X Corps continued to hold the mountain sector near the centre, while the XIII Corps moved farther westward to support the V Army's coming attack. Only two low-grade divisions, although backed by the 1st Parachute Division, held the Adriatic sector, German troop movement at the time was mostly going from east to west. The Polish Corps advances up the Adriatic had attracted little attention, 
and it was only on August 29, after four days' progress by these three Allied corps on the broad front, by which time they had advanced some ten miles, from the Metro to the Foglia, that the Germans began to react. By next day, parts of two more divisions had arrived on the scene, to help in checking the Allied advance, but they were too late to prevent the Allied thrust reaching the Kinka River line, about seven miles farther on, by September 2nd. But the 8th Army's momentum was flagging. The key battle was for the Coriano Ridge behind the Ossa, two more rivers further, on September 4th. Here the British advance came to a halt and crumbled. Meanwhile the Germans were getting some reinforcements, and heavy rains came to their aid on September 6th. Kesselring had ordered a general withdrawal of his other divisions into the Gothic line positions, which had shortened his front and set free some of his troops for the Adriatic sector. That partial withdrawal opened the crossings of the armour so that the 5th Army was now ready to strike. From September 10 onward the US 2nd Corps and British 13th Corps attacked the weakly held but stubbornly defended German positions, and eventually, a week later, broke through the Ail Gioga Pass north of Florence. Once again Kesselring seems to have been taken by surprise, as he did not recognize that this was a major offensive until the 20th, ten days from the start, when two divisions were rushed to that sector. By then, however, the Americans' reserve division, the 88th Infantry, was thrusting forward to attack Bologna from the east. Even then, Although the Germans had lost the Gothic line and a rearward key feature in Monte Battaglia, they proved capable of checking the Allied attacks. In late September Mark Clark was led to revert to the idea of a more direct attack on Bologna. Meanwhile the 8th Army was still in difficulties on the Adriatic flank. By September 17, elements of 10 German divisions were on the scene and helping to slow it down. Although the Canadians succeeded in reaching Rimini by the 21st, and thus the Po Valley Delta, the Germans fell back to another defence line, the River Yuso, the historic Rubicon of ancient times. There were still 13 rivers to cross in this flat and waterlogged region before the Po itself, and in the effort nearly 500 tanks had been knocked out, bogged, or broken down, while many of the infantry divisions had been reduced to skeletons. So the Germans were able to move a large proportion of their strength to check the 5th Army. On October 2, Mark Clark's renewed offensive towards Maloney opened, this time along Route 65. All four divisions of his 2nd Corps were thrown in, but the defending Germans fought with such tenacity that during the next three weeks the American advance averaged no more than a mile a day, and on October 27 the offensive was abandoned. By the end of October the 8th Army advance had also petered out, after only five more rivers had been crossed, and the Po was still 50 miles distant. The only notable changes of the period were command changes. Kesselring was injured in a motor accident and replaced by Vietinghoff. McCreary replaced Lees, who was being sent to Burma, in command of the 8th Army. Towards the end of November, Maitland Wilson was sent to Washington, and succeeded by Alexander, while Mark Clark took over the army group in Italy. The Allied situation at the end of 1944 was very disappointing in comparison with the high hopes of the spring, and the summer. Although Alexander still showed optimism about an advance into Austria, the slow crawl up the Italian peninsula made such distant horizons appear increasingly unrealistic. Maitland Wilson himself admitted as much in his report of November 22 to the British Chiefs of Staff. The disbelief, and discontent, of the Allied troops was manifested in a growing rate of desertions. A final Allied offensive in 1944 sought to gain Bologna and Ravenna as winter bases. The Canadians, in the 8th Army, succeeded in capturing Ravenna on December 4 and their success led the Germans to send three divisions to check the 8th Army's further progress. That seemed to offer the 5th Army a better chance. But this was forestalled by an enemy counter-attack in the Senio Valley on December 26, prompted by Mussolini with the idea of emulating Hitler's counter-offensive in the Ardennes. 
and largely carried out by Italians who remained loyal to him. This attack was soon, and easily, stopped. But the Eighth Army was now exhausted, and very short of ammunition, while the Germans were known to have strong reserves near Bologna. So Alexander decided that the Allied armies should go on the defensive, and prepare for a powerful spring offensive. A further damper to the hopes placed in the Italian campaign was the decision of the combined chiefs of staff to withdraw five more divisions from that theater to the Western Front, in order to give the Allied armies the more punch for their spring offensive into Germany. As a consequence, the Canadian Corps of two divisions was dispatched thither, although further divisions did not have to go. Chapter 31 The Liberation of France Before its launching, the invasion of Normandy looked a most hazardous venture. The Allied troops had to disembark on a coast that the enemy had occupied during four years, with ample time to fortify it, cover it with obstacles and sow it with mines. For the defense, the Germans had 58 divisions in the west, and 10 of these were panzer divisions that might swiftly deliver an armored counterstroke. The Allies' power to bring into action the large forces now assembled in England was limited by the fact that they had to cross the sea, and by the number of landing craft available. They could disembark only six divisions in the first seaborne lift, together with three airborne, and a week would pass before they could double the number ashore. So there was cause to feel anxious about the chances of storming what Hitler called the Atlantic Wall, an awesome name and about the risks of being thrown back in the sea. Yet, in the event, the first footholds were soon expanded into a large bridgehead, 80 miles wide. The enemy never managed to deliver any dangerous counterstroke before the Allied forces broke out from the bridgehead. The breakout was made in the way and at the place that Field Marshal Montgomery had originally planned. The whole German position in France then quickly collapsed. Looking back, the course of the invasion appears wonderfully easy and sure. But appearances are deceptive. It was an operation that eventually went according to plan, but not according to timetable. At the outset the margin between success and failure was narrow. The ultimate triumph has obscured the fact that the Allies were in great danger at the outset, and had a very narrow shave. The common idea that the invasion had a smooth and sure run was rosted by Montgomery's subsequent emphasis that the battle was fought exactly as planned before the invasion, and the fact that the Allied armies reached the Seine within 90 days, the line shown on the forecast map, produced in April, as the line to be gained by D plus 90. It was Monty's way to talk as if any operation that he had conducted had always proceeded exactly as he intended with the certainty and precision of a machine, or of divine providence. That characteristic has often obscured his adaptability to circumstances, and thus, ironically, deprived him of the credit due to him for his combination of flexibility with determination in generalship. In the original plan, Kahn was to be captured the first day of the landing, June 6. The start was good and the coastal defences were overcome by 9 am but Montgomery's account has covered up the fact that the advance inland took and did not start until the afternoon. That was due partly to a paralysing traffic jam on the beaches but also to the excessive caution of the commanders on the spot, at a time when there was hardly anything to stop them. When they eventually pushed on towards Kn, the key point of the invasion area, a panzer division the only one in the whole invasion area of Normandy, arrived on the scene and produced a check. A second panzer division came up next day. More than a month passed before Kahn was at last secured and cleared, after much heavy fighting. Montgomery's original intention, also, was that on the British right wing an armoured force would make an immediate drive inland to Villers Bocage, 20 miles from the coast, and so cut the roads running west and southwest from Kahn but this is not mentioned in his story. The fact is that this push was very slow to get going, although opposition west of Kn was negligible once the coast defences had been penetrated. Prisoners subsequently revealed that until the third day a ten-mile stretch of front was covered by one solitary German mobile unit, a reconnaissance battalion. A third panzer division then began to arrive on the scene, and was put in here. 
Although the British managed to push into Villers Bocage on the 13th, they were pushed out again. Then a fourth Panzer division reinforced the block. Two months passed before Villers Bocage was finally captured. The original idea, too, was that the whole of the Cotentin Peninsula, along with the port of Cherbourg, would be captured within two weeks, and that the breakout would then be made, by D plus 20, on this western flank. But the advance inland from the American landing points, on this flank, also proved much slower than expected, although the larger part of the German forces, and later arriving reinforcements, were absorbed in checking the British advance on the eastern flank near Kn, as indeed Montgomery had calculated. While the breakout ultimately came on the western flank, as Montgomery had planned, it did not come until the end of July, D plus 56. It had been clear beforehand that, if the Allies could gain a bridgehead sufficiently wide and deep to build up their strength on the far side of the channel, their total resources were so much greater than the enemy's that the odds were heavily on a breakout sooner or later. No dam was likely to be strong enough to hold the invading flood in check permanently if the Allies gained enough space to pile up their massed power. As things turned out the prolongation of the Battle of the Bridge had worked out to their advantage. It was the proverbial blessing in disguise. For the bulk of the German forces in the west was drawn there, while arriving bit by bit owing to divided views in their high command and constant hindrance from the vast allied force that dominated the sky. The panzer divisions, arriving first and used to plug gaps, were ground down first, thus depriving the enemy of the mobile arm he needed when it came to fighting in the open country. The very toughness of the resistance that so much delayed the Allies' breakout ensured them a clear path through France once they broke out. The Allies would have had no chance of ever getting established ashore but for their complete supremacy in the air. They owed much to the support from naval gunfire, but the decisive factor was the paralyzing effect of the Allied air forces, directed by Air Chief Marshal Tedder, Eisenhower's deputy as Supreme Commander. By smashing most of the bridges over the Seine on the east and over the Loire on the south, they turned the Normandy battle zone into a strategical isolation zone. The German reserves had to make long detours, and were so constantly harried on the march, that they suffered endless delays and only arrived in driblets. But almost as much was owed to a conflict of ideas on the German side, between Hitler and his generals, and among the generals themselves. Initially, the Germans' main handicap was that they had 3,000 miles of coastline to cover, from Holland round the shores of France to the Italian mountain frontier. Of their 58 divisions, half were of a static type, and anchored to sectors of that long coastline. But the other half were field divisions, and of these the 10 panzer divisions were highly mobile. That provided the enemy with the possibility of concentrating an overwhelming superiority to throw the invaders back into the sea before they became established and grew too strong for eviction. On D-Day the one panzer division that was in Normandy, and near the stretch where the Allies landed, succeeded in frustrating Montgomery's hope of capturing the key point of Kn that day. Part of it actually pierced the British front and drove through to the beach but the thrust was too small to have a wide effect. If even the three panzer divisions, out of ten, that were on the scene by the fourth day had been at hand and able to intervene on D-Day the allied footholds could have been dislodged before they were joined up and consolidated. But any such strong and prompt counterstroke was frustrated by discord in the German command, both about the probable site of the invasion and the method of meeting it. Before the event, Hitler's intuition proved better than his general's calculation in gauging where the Allies would land. After the landing, however, his continual interference and rigid control deprived them of the chance of retrieving the situation, and eventually led to disaster. Field Marshal von Rundstedt, the commander-in-chief in the West, thought the invasion would come across the narrower part of the channel, between Calais and Dieppe. His view was based on a conviction that this course was the more correct strategy for the Allies to follow. But it was fostered by a lack of information. Nothing important leaked out from the tight-lipped island where the invasion armies were assembling. 
Rundstedt's chief of staff, General Blumentritt, later related in interrogation how badly baffled was the German intelligence. Very little reliable news came out of England. Intelligence, gave us reports of where, broadly, the British and American forces were assembling in southern England, there were a small number of German agents in England, who reported by wireless transmitting sets what they observed but they found out very little beyond that. Nothing we learnt gave us a definite clue where the invasion was actually coming. Hitler, however, had a hunch about Normandy. From March onward he sent his generals repeated warnings about the possibility of a landing between Kn and Cherbourg. How did he arrive at that conclusion, which proved correct? General Wallemont, who was on his staff, said that it was inspired by the general layout of the troops in England with the Americans in the southwest, along with his belief that the Allies would seek to capture a big port as early as possible, and that Cherbourg was the most likely for their purpose. His conclusion was strengthened by observers' reports of a big invasion exercise in Devon where the troops disembarked on a stretch of flat and open coastline similar to the intended area in Normandy. Rommel, who was in executive charge of the forces on the Channel coast, came round to the same view as Hitler. In the last few months he made feverish efforts to hasten the construction of underwater obstacles, bomb-proof bunkers, and minefields, and by June they were much denser than they had been in the spring. But, fortunately for the Allies, he had neither the time nor the resources to develop the defences in Normandy to the state he desired, or even to the state of those east of the Seine. Rommel also found himself in disagreement with Rundstedt over the method of meeting an invasion. Rundstedt relied on a plan of delivering a powerful counteroffensive to crush the Allies after they had landed. Rommel considered that this would be too late, in face of the Allies' domination of the air and their capacity to delay the German reserves in concentrating for such a counteroffensive. He felt that the best chance lay in defeating the invaders on the coast before they were properly ashore. Rommel's staff said that he was deeply influenced by the memory of how in Africa he had been nailed down for days on end by an air force not nearly so strong as that he now had to face. The actual plan became a compromise between these different ideas, and fell between two stools. Worse still, Hitler insisted on trying to control the battle from remote Berchtesgaden, and kept a tight hand on the use of the reserves. There was only one Panzer division at Rommel's disposal in Normandy, and he had brought this close up behind Kn, so it was able to check the British there on D-Day. He had begged in vain for a second one to place near Estilo, where it would have been close to the beaches where the Americans landed. On D-Day precious hours were wasted in argument on the German side. The nearest available part of the general reserve was the 1st SS Panzer Corps which lay northwest of Paris, but Rundstedt could not move it without permission from Hitler's headquarters. Blumentritt stated. As early as 4 a.m. I telephoned them on behalf of Field Marshal von Rundstedt and asked for the release of this corps, to strengthen Rommel's punch. But Jodl, speaking for Hitler, refused to do so. He doubted whether the landings in Normandy were more than a feint and was sure that another landing was coming east of the Seine. The battle of argument went on all day until 4 p.m., when this corps was at last released for our use. Two other startling facts about the opening day are that Hitler himself did not hear of the landing until very late in the morning, and that Rommel was off the scene. But for these factors, action might have been more prompt and more forceful. Hitler, like Mr. Churchill, had a habit of staying up until long after midnight, a habit very exhausting to his staff, who could not sleep late but were often in a sleepy state when they dealt with affairs in the morning. Jodl, reluctant to disturb Hitler's late morning sleep, took it upon himself to resist Rundstedt's appeal for the release of the reserves. They might have been released earlier if Rommel had not been absent from Normandy. For, unlike Rundstedt, he often telephoned Hitler direct and still had more influence with him than any other general. But Rommel had left his headquarters the day before on a trip to Germany. 
as the high wind and rough sea seemed to make invasion unlikely for the moment he had decided to combine a visit to Hitler, to urge the need of more panzer divisions in Normandy, with a visit to his home near Ulm for his wife's birthday. Early next morning, before he could drive on to see Hitler, a telephone call told him that the invasion had begun. He did not get back to his headquarters until the evening, by which time the invaders were well established to sure. The commander of the army in that part of Normandy was also away, directing an exercise in Brittany. The commander of the Panzer Corps that lay in reserve had gone on a visit to Belgium. Another key commander is said to have been away spending the night with a girl. Eisenhower's decision to proceed with the landing despite the rough sea turned out greatly to the Allies' advantage. A strange feature of the weeks that followed was that, although Hitler had correctly guessed the site of the invasion, once it had taken place he became obsessed with the idea that it was only a preliminary to a second and larger landing east of the Seine. Hence he was reluctant to let reserves be moved from that area to Normandy. This belief in a second landing was due to the intelligence staff's gross overestimate of the number of Allied divisions still available on the other side of the channel. That was partly due to the British deception plan. But it was also another result of, and testimony to, the way that Britain was watertight against spying. When the initial counter moves broke down, and had obviously failed to prevent the Allies' continued build up in the bridgehead, Rundstedt and Rommel soon came to realize the hopelessness of trying to hold on to any line so far west. Relating the sequel, Blumenthal said. In desperation, Field Marshal von Rundstedt begged Hitler to come to France for a talk. He and Rommel together went to meet Hitler at Soissons on June 17, and tried to make him understand the situation. But Hitler insisted that there must be no withdrawal, you must stay where you are. He would not even agree to allow us any more freedom than before in moving the forces as we thought best. As he would not modify his orders, the troops had to continue clinging on to their cracking line. There was no plan any longer. We were merely trying, without hope, to comply with Hitler's order that the line Knivaranches must be held at all costs. Hitler swept aside the field marshal's warnings by assuring them that the new V weapon, the flying bomb, would soon have a decisive effect on the war. The field marshals then urged that, if this weapon was so effective, it should be turned against the invasion beaches, or, if that was technically difficult, against the invasion ports in southern England. Hitler insisted that the bombardment must be concentrated on London so as to convert the English to peace. But the flying bombs did not produce the effect that Hitler had hoped, while the Allied pressure in Normandy increased. When asked one day on the telephone from Hitler's HQ, what shall we do? Rundstedt retorted, end the war. What else can you do? Hitler's solution was to sack Rundstedt, and replace him by Kludge, who had been on the Eastern Front. Field Marshal von Kludge was a robust, aggressive type of soldier, Blumentritt remarked. At the start he was very cheerful and confident, like all newly appointed commanders. Within a few days he became very sober and quiet. Hitler did not like the changing tone of his reports. On July 17 Rommel was badly injured when his car crashed, after being attacked on the road by Allied planes. Then, three days later, on the 20th, came the attempt to kill Hitler at his headquarters in East Prussia. The conspirators bomb missed its chief target, but its shockwave had terrific repercussions on the battle in the West at the critical moment. Blumentritt recalled. When the Gestapo investigated the conspiracy, they found documents in which Field Marshal von Kludge's name was mentioned, so he came under grave suspicion. Then another incident made things look worse. Shortly after General Patton's breakout from Normandy, while the decisive battle at Avranches was in progress, Field Marshal von Kludge was out of touch with his headquarters for more than twelve hours. The reason was that he had gone up to the front and they'd been trapped in a heavy artillery bombardment. Meantime, we had been suffering bombardment from the rear. For the field marshal's prolonged absence excited Hitler's suspicion immediately, in view of the documents that had been found. 
Hitler suspected that the field marshal's purpose in going right up to the front was to get in touch with the Allies and negotiate a surrender. The field marshal's eventual return did not calm Hitler. From this date onward the orders which Hitler sent him were worded in a brusque and even insulting language. The field marshal became very worried. He feared that he would be arrested at any moment, and at the same time realized more and more that he could not prove his loyalty by any battlefield success. All this had a very bad effect on any chance that remained of preventing the Allies from breaking out. In the days of crisis Field Marshal von Kludge gave only part of his attention to what was happening at the front. He was looking back over his shoulder anxiously, towards Hitler's headquarters. He was not the only general who was in that state of worry for conspiracy in the plot against Hitler. Fear permeated and paralyzed the higher commands in the weeks and months that followed. On July 25 the US First Army launched a fresh offensive, Cobra while the recently landed Patton's 3rd Army was ready to follow it up. The last German reserves had been thrown in to stop the British. On the 31st the American spearhead burst through the front of the ranches. Pouring through the gap, Patton's tanks quickly flooded the open country beyond. On Hitler's orders the remnants of the Panzer forces were scraped together, and used in a desperate effort to cut the bottleneck at the ranches. The effort failed, whereat Hitler caustically said, it only failed because Kludge didn't want to succeed. All that remained of the German armies now tried to escape from the trap in which they had been kept by Hitler's ban on any timely withdrawal. A large part were trapped in the fillet's pocket, and the survivors had to abandon most of their heavy arms and equipment in crossing back over the Seine. Kludge was then sacked. On the way home he was found dead in his car, Having swallowed a poison capsule, as his chief of staff explained, he believed he would be arrested by the Gestapo as soon as he arrived home. It was not only on the German side that stormy recriminations arose within the high command. Fortunately those on the Allied side had no such serious consequences on the issue or to individuals although they left sore feelings that were of ill effect later. The biggest blow up behind the scenes occurred over an ear break out by the British a fortnight before the Americans actually burst open the front of ranches. This British blow, by the Second Army under Dempsey, was struck on the extreme opposite flank, east of Kn. It was the most massive tank attack of the whole campaign, delivered by three armoured divisions closely concentrated. They had been stealthily assembled in the small bridgehead over the Orne, and poured out from it on the morning of July 18, after an immense carpet of bombs had been dropped, for two hours, by 2,000 heavy and medium bomber aircraft. The Germans on that sector were stunned, and most of the prisoners taken were so deafened by the roar of the explosions that they could not be interrogated until at least 24 hours later. But the defences were deeper than British intelligence had thought. Rommel, expecting such a blow, had hurried their deepening and reinforcement, until, on the eve of the attack, he was himself caught and knocked out by British aircraft, near the aptly named village of saint Ifoy de Montgomery. Moreover the enemy had heard the massive rumble of tanks as the British armour moved eastwards by night for the attack. Dietrich, the German corps commander, said that he was able to hear them over four miles away despite diverting noises, by pressing his ear to the ground, a trick he had learned in Russia. The brilliant opening prospect faded soon after passing through the forward layers of the defense. The leading armored division became entangled amid the village strongholds behind, instead of bypassing them. The others were delayed by traffic congestion in getting out of the narrow bridgehead, and the spearhead had come to a halt before they came on the scene. By the afternoon the great opportunity had slipped away. This miscarriage has long been enshrouded in mystery. Eisenhower in his report spoke of it as an intended breakthrough, and as a drive. Exploiting in the direction of the same basin and Paris. But all the British histories written after the war declare that it had no such far-reaching aims, and that no breakthrough on this flank was ever contemplated. They follow Montgomery's own account. 
which insisted that this operation was merely a battle of position, designed to create a threat in aid of the coming American breakout blow and secondly to secure ground on which major forces could be poised ready to strike out to the south and southeast, when the American breakout forces thrust eastwards to meet them. Eisenhower in his post-war memoirs tactfully glides over the matter by avoiding any mention of this battle, while Churchill makes only the barest reference to it. Yet anyone behind the scenes at the time was acutely aware of the violent storm that blew up. The air chiefs were very angry, especially Tedder. The state of temper is revealed in the diary of Captain Butcher, Eisenhower's naval aide. Around evening Tedder called Ike and said Monty had, in effect, stopped his armor from going further. Ike was mad. According to Butcher, Ted the next day telephoned Eisenhower from London and conveyed that the British chiefs of staffs were ready to sack Montgomery if requested, although this is denied by Ted in his own account of the affair. It was thus natural that on Montgomery's side the immediate reaction to such complaints should have been to assert that the idea of a breakout on this flank had never been in mind. That assertion soon became an article of belief and has since come to be accepted without question by military chroniclers. Yet it did not tally with the racy note of the code name given to this attack, Operation Goodwood, after the English race course. Nor with the term broke through that Montgomery used in his first announcement of the attack on the 18th. Moreover his remark that he was well satisfied with the progress made on the first day seemed hard to reconcile with the absence of renewed effort of similar scale on the second day. That infuriated the air chiefs, who would not have agreed to divert the heavy bomber armada to the aid of a ground operation had they not believed that the aim of Goodwood was a mass breakout. Montgomery's later assertion was a half-truth, and did himself an injustice. He had not planned to break out on this flank, and was not banking on it. But he would have been foolish not to reckon with the possibility of a German collapse, under this massive blow, and exploit it if it occurred. Dempsey, who commanded the Second Army, thought a speedy collapse was likely, and had moved up himself to the Armoured Corps HQ so as to be ready to exploit it. What I had in mind was to seize all the crossings of the Orne from Kent to Argenton that would establish a barricade across the Germans' rear, and trap them more effectively than any American breakout on the western flank could do. Dempsey's hope of a complete breakthrough was very close to fulfillment at midday on July 18. In view of his revelation of what he had in mind it is amusing to note the many assertions that there was no idea of trying to reach Falaise, for Argentin. His prospective goal, was nearly twice as far. Dempsey, too, was shrewd enough to realize that the disappointment of his hopes might be turned to compensating advantage. When one of his staff urged him to protest against press criticism of the failure of Goodwood, he replied, Don't worry, it will aid our purpose, and act as the best possible cover plan. The American breakout on the opposite flank certainly owed much to the way that the enemy's attention had been focused on the threat of a breakout near Kn But the breakout at Avranches, far to the west, carried no such immediate chance of cutting off the German forces. Its prospects depended on making a very rapid sweep eastward, or on the enemy clinging on to his position until he could be trapped. In the event, when the breakout came at Avranches, on July 31st, only a few scattered German battalions lay in the 90-mile-wide corridor between that point and the Loire. So American spearheads could have driven eastward unopposed but the Allied High Command threw away the best chance of exploiting this great opportunity by sticking to the outdated pre-invasion program, in which a westward move to capture the Brittany ports was to be the next step. Telling me later what happened after the breakout, Wood said, there was no conception of far-reaching directions for armor in the minds of our top people, nor of supplying such thrusts. I was still under the First Army, and it could not react fast enough. When it did react, its orders consisted of sending its two flank armored divisions back, 180 degrees away from the main enemy, to engage in siege operations against Lorient and Brest. August 4th was that black day. I protested long, loud, and violently, and pushed my tank columns into Chate Briant, without orders, 
and my armored cavalry to the outskirts of Angers and along the Loire, ready to advance, east, on Chartres. I could have been there, in the enemy vitals, in two days. But no. We were forced to adhere to the original plan, with the only armor available, and ready to cut the enemy to pieces. It was one of the colossally stupid decisions of the war. The diversion to capture the Brittany ports brought no benefit. For the Germans in Brest held out until September 19, 44 days after Patton had prematurely announced its capture, while Orient and Street Nazaire remained in the enemy's hands until the end of the war. Two weeks passed before the American forces pushed eastwards far enough to reach Argentan and come up level with the British left wing, which meanwhile was still held in check just beyond Kn. This caused fresh recriminations. For when Patton was told that he must not drive on North Ward to close the gap and bar the Germans' escape route, for fear of a collision with the British, he exclaimed on the telephone, let me go on to Falaise and we'll drive the British back into the sea for another Dunkirk. It is evident that the German forces would have had ample time to pull back to the Seine, and form a strong defensive barrier line there, except for Hitler's stubbornly stupid orders that there should be no withdrawal. It was his folly that restored the Allies' lost opportunities and enabled them to liberate France that autumn. The war could easily have been ended in September 1944. The bulk of the German forces in the West had been thrown into the Normandy battle, and kept the by Hitler's no withdrawal orders until they collapsed, and a large part were trapped. The fragments were incapable of further resistance for the time being, and their retreat, largely on foot, was soon outstripped by the British and American mechanized columns. When the Allies approached the German border at the beginning of September, after a sweeping drive from Normandy, there was no organized resistance to stop them driving on, into the heart of Germany.